creation the first day in the beginning God created heaven and earth the earth was without form and empty with darkness on the face of the depths but God's spirit moved on the water surface God said there shall be light and light came into existence God saw that the light was good and God divided between the light and the darkness God named the light day and the darkness he named night it was evening and it was morning one day the second day God said there shall be a sky in the middle of the water and it shall divide between water and water God thus made the sky and it separated the water below the sky from the water above the sky it remained that way God named the sky heaven it was evening and it was morning a second day the third day God said the waters under the heaven shall be gathered to one place and dry land shall be seen it happened God named the dry land earth and the gatherings of water he named seas God saw that it was good God said the earth shall send forth vegetation seed bearing plants and fruit trees that produce their own kinds of fruits with seeds shall be on the earth it happened the earth sent forth vegetation plants bearing their own kinds of seeds and trees producing fruits containing their own kinds of seeds God saw that it was good it was evening and it was morning a third day the fourth day God said there shall be lights in the heavenly sky to divide between day and night they shall serve as omens and define festivals days and years they shall be lights in the heavenly sky to shine on the earth it happened God thus made the two large lights the greater light to rule the day and the smaller light to rule the night he also made the stars God placed them in the heavenly sky to shine on the earth to rule by day and by night and to divide between the light and the darkness God saw that it was good it was evening and it was morning a fourth day the fifth day God said the water shall teem with swarms of living creatures flying creatures shall fly over the land on the face of the heavenly sky God thus created the great sea monsters along with every particular species of living thing that crawls with which the waters teem and every particular species of winged flying creature God saw that it was good God blessed them saying be fruitful and become many and fill the waters of the seas let the flying creatures multiply on the land it was evening and it was morning a fifth day the sixth day God said the earth shall bring forth particular species of living creatures particular species of livestock land animals and beasts of the earth it happened God thus made particular species of beasts of the earth particular species of livestock and particular species of animals that walk the land God saw that it was good God said let us make man with our image and likeness let him dominate the fish of the sea the birds of the sky the livestock Animals and all the earth, and every land animal that walks the earth. God thus created man with his image in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. God said to them, Be fertile and become many. Fill the land and conquer it. Dominate the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every beast that walks the land. God said, Behold, I have given you every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth, and every tree that has seed bearing fruit, it shall be you. You for food for every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and everything that walks the land that has in it a living soul. All plant vegetation shall be food. It remained that way. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was evening, and it was morning. The sixth day, the seventh heaven and earth, and all their components were thus completed. With the seventh day, God finished all the work that he had done. He thus ceased on the seventh day from all the work that he had been doing God blessed the seventh day and he declared it to be holy for it was on this day that God ceased from all the work that he had been creating so that it would continue to function man the first sin these are the chronicles of heaven and earth when they were created on the day God completed earth and heaven all the wild shrubs did not yet exist on the earth and all the wild plants had not yet sprouted this was because God had not brought rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground a mist rose up from the earth and it watered the entire surface of the ground God formed man out of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life man thus became a living creature God planted a garden in Eden to the east there he placed the man that he had formed God made grow out of the ground every tree that is pleasant to look at and good to eat including the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden from there it divided and became four major rivers the name of the first is Pishon it surrounds the entire land of Avila where gold is found the gold of that land is especially good also found there are pearls and precious stones the name of the second river is Gin it surrounds the land of Cush the name of the third river is the Tigris which flows to the east of Assyria the fourth river is the Euphrates God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch it God gave the man a commandment saying you may definitely eat from every tree of the garden but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil do not eat for on the day you eat from it you will definitely die God said it is not good for man to be alone I will make a compatible helper for him God had formed every wild beast and every bird of heaven out of the ground he now brought them to the man to see what he would name each one whatever the man called each living thing would remain its name the man named every livestock animal and bird of the sky as well as all the wild beasts but the man did not find a helper who was compatible for him God then made the man fall into a deep state of unconsciousness and he slept he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh in its place God built the rib that he took from the man into a woman and he brought her to the man the man said now this is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh she shall be called woman Isha because she was taken from man Ish a man shall therefore leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and they shall become one flesh the man and his wife were both naked but they were not embarrassed by one another man the first sin the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild beasts that God had made the serpent asked the woman did God really say that you may not eat from any of the trees of the garden the woman replied to the serpent we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden but of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden God said do not eat it and do not even touch it or else you will die the serpent said to the woman you will certainly not die really God knows that on the day you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and desirable to the eyes and that the tree was attractive as a means to gain intelligence she took some of its fruit and ate it she also gave some to her husband and he ate it the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves long cloths they heard God's voice moving about in the garden with the wind of the day the man and his wife hid themselves from God among the trees of the garden God called to the man and he said where are you trying to hide I heard your voice in the garden replied the man and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid God asked who told you that you are naked did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat the man replied the woman that you gave to be with me she gave me what I ate from the tree God said to the woman what is this that you have done the woman replied the serpent seduced me and I ate it God said to the serpent because you did this cursed are you more than all the livestock and all the wild beasts on your belly you shall crawl and dust you shall eat all the days of your life I will plant hatred between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he will strike you in the head and you will strike him in the heel the woman's curse to the woman he said I will greatly increase your anguish and your pregnancy it will be with anguish that you will give birth to children your passion will be to your husband and he will dominate you man's curse to Adam he said you listen to your wife and ate from the tree regarding which I specifically gave you order saying do not eat from it the ground will therefore be cursed because of you you will derive food from it with anguish all the days of your life it will bring forth thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the grass of it field by the sweat of your brow you will eat bread finally you will return to the ground for it was from the ground that you were taken you are dust and to dust you shall return the man named his wife eat because she was the mother of all life God made leather garments for Adam and his wife and he clothed them the expulsion from Eden God said man has now become like one of us in knowing good and evil now he must be prevented from putting forth his hand and also taking from the tree of life he can eat it and live forever. God banished man from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken he drove away the man and stationed the cherubim at the east of Eden along with the revolving sword blade to guard the path of the tree of life Cain and Abel the man knew his wife Eve she conceived and gave birth to Cain she said I have gained a man with God she gave birth again this time to his brother Abel Abel became a shepherd while Cain was a worker of the soil and air and Cain brought some of his crops as an offering to God Abel also offered some of the firstborn of his flock from the fattest ones God paid heed to Abel and his offering but to Cain and his offering he paid no heed Cain became very furious and depressed God said to Cain why are you so furious why are you depressed if you do good will there not be special privilege and
Whoever kills Cain will be punished seven times as much God placed a mark on Cain so that whoever would find him would not kill him. Cain went out from before God's presence. He settled in the land of Nod to the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife. She conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was building a city and he named the city Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son. Arad Arad had a son. Mechagil Mechagil had a son. Methushel Methushel had a son. Lemek Lemek married two women. The first one's name was Ada and the second one's name was Tilaida. Gave birth to Yubal. He was the ancestor of all those who live in tents and keep herds. His brother's name was Yubal. He was the ancestor of all who play the harp and flute. Tilaida also had a son. Tubal Cain, a maker of all copper and iron implements. Tubal Cain's sister was Namalemek. Said to his wives Ada and Tilaida, Hear my voice, wives of Lemek. Listen to my speech. I have killed a man by wounding him and a child by. Bruising him if Cain shall be revenged seven times then for Lemek it shall be seventy-seven times Adam knew his wife again and she gave birth to a son she named him Seth, because God has granted, Shif, me other offspring in place of Abel whom Cain had killed his son was also born to Seth and Seth named him and Nashit was then initiated to pray with God's name the first and second generations this is the book of the chronicles of Adam, on the day that God created man he made him. In the likeness of God he created them male and female he blessed them and named them man, Adam, on the day that they were created Adam lived one hundred and thirty years and he had a son in his likeness and form he named him Seth Adam lived eight hundred years after he had Seth and he had sons and daughters all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years and he died the third generation Seth lived one hundred and five years and he had a son and Nash Seth lived eight hundred and seven years after he had Anash and he had sons and daughters all of Seth's days were 912 years and he died the fourth generation and Anash lived 90 years and he had a son Kenan and Anash lived 815 years after he had Kenan and he had sons and daughters all of Anash's days were 905 years and he died the fifth generation Kenan lived 70 years and he had a son Mahalalil Kenan lived 840 years after he had Mahalalil and he had sons and daughters all of Kenan's days were 910 years and he died the sixth generation Mahalalil lived 65 years and he had a son Yur. Mahalalil lived 830 years after he had Yur and he had sons and daughters all of Mahalalil's days were 895 years and he died the seventh generation Yur lived 162 years and he had a son Enoch Yur lived 800 years after he had Enoch and he had sons and daughters all of Yur's days were 962 years and he died the eighth generation Enoch lived 65 years and he had a son Methuselah Enoch walked with God for 300 years after he had Methuselah and he had sons and daughters all of Enoch's days were 365 years Enoch walked with God and he was no more because God had taken him the ninth generation Methuselah lived 187 years and he had a son Lemek Methuselah lived 782 years after he had Lemek and he had sons and daughters all of Methuselah's days were 969 years and he died the tenth generation Lemek lived 182 years and he had a son he named him Noah saying this one will bring us relief from our work and the anguish of our hands from the soil that God has cursed Lemek lived 595 years after he had Noah and he had sons and daughters all of Lemek's days were 777 years and he died Noah's children and the titans Noah was 500 years old and Noah fathered Shem Ham and Yephev Noah's children and the titans man began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good and they took themselves wives from whomever they chose God said my spirit will not continue to Judge man forever since he is nothing but flesh his days shall be 120 years the titans were on the earth in those days and also later the sons of God had come to the daughters of man and had fathered them the titans were the mightiest ones who ever existed men of renown the decree against humanity God saw that man's wickedness on earth was increasing every impulse of his innermost thought was only for evil all day long God regretted that he had made man on earth and he was pained to his very core God said I will obliterate humanity that I have created from the face of the earth man livestock land animals and birds of the sky I regret that I created them but Noah found favor in God's eyes Noah and his times these are the chronicles of Noah Noah was a righteous man faultless in his generation Noah walked with God Noah fathered three sons Shem Ham and Yepheth the world was corrupt before God and the land was filled with crime God saw the world and it was Corrupted all flesh had perverted its way on the earth. The great flood God said to Noah, If the end of all flesh has come before me, the world is filled with man's crime. I will therefore destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Divide the ark into compartments. Caulk the inside and outside with pitch. This is how you shall construct it. The ark's length shall be 300 cubits. It's with 50 cubits and it's high 30 cubits. Make a skylight for the ark. Make it slanted so that it is one cubit wide on top. Place the ark's door on its side. Make a first, second, and third deck. I myself am bringing the flood water shall be on the earth to destroy from under the heavens all flesh having in it a breath of life. All that is on land will die, but I will keep my pledge that you will come into the ark. You will be together with your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. From all life, all flesh bring two of each kind into the ark to live with you. They shall be male and Female from each separate species of bird, from each separate species of livestock, and from each separate species of land animals bring to yourself two of each kind to live. Take with you all the food that will be eaten and keep it in storage. It shall be food for you and the animals. Noah did all that God had commanded him. He did exactly the great flood God said to Noah. Come into the ark you and your family. I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take seven pairs of every clean animal, each consisting of a male and its mate of every animal that is not clean. Take two a male and its mate of the birds of the heaven. Also take seven pairs each consisting of a male and its mate. Let them keep seed alive on the face of all the earth because in another seven days I will bring rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights I will obliterate every organism that I have made from the face of the earth. Noah did all that God had commanded Noah. Was six hundred years old when the flood occurred. Water was on the earth. Noah, along with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, came into the ark ahead of the waters of the flood. The clean animals, the animals which were not clean, the birds, and all that walked the earth came two by two to Noah to the ark. They were male and female, as God had commanded. Noah seven days passed, and the flood waters were on the earth. It was in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventeenth of the month. On that day, all the well springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. It would continue to rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah boarded the ark along with his sons Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons were with them. They came along with every separate kind of beast, every separate kind of livestock, every separate kind of land animal, and every separate kind of flying creature, every bird. And every winged animal of all flesh that has in it a breath of life, they came to know to the ark two by two. Those who came were male and female of all flesh. They came as God had commanded. No God then sealed him inside. There was a flood on the earth for forty days. The waters increased, lifting the ark, and it rose from on the ground. The water surged and increased very much, and the ark began to drift on the surface of the water. The waters on the earth surged upward very, very much, and all the high mountains under the heavens were covered. The waters had surged upward fifteen cubits, and all the mountains were covered. All flesh that walked the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild beasts, and every lower animal that swarmed on the land, as well as every human being, everything on dry land whose life was sustained by breathing, died. The flood thus obliterated every organism that had been on the face of the land. Humanity, livestock, land, animals, and birds of the heaven. They were obliterated from the earth. Only Noah and those with him in the ark survived. The water surged on the earth for 150 days. The great flood God gave special thought to Noah and to all the beasts and livestock with him in the ark. God made a wind blow on the earth and the waters began to subside. The well springs of the deep and the floodgates of heaven were sealed. The downpour from the heavens thus stopped. The waters receded from the earth. They continued to recede. And at the end of 150 days, the water had visibly diminished. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark came to rest on the Ararat mountains. The waters continued to diminish visibly until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first of the month, the mountain peaks became visible. After 40 days, Noah
Take out with you every living creature from all flesh, birds, livestock, and all land animals that walk the earth. Let them swarm on the land. They shall breed and multiply on the earth. Noah left the ark along with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, every beast, every land animal, and every bird, all that walk the land. Left the ark by families. Noah built an altar to God. He took a few of all the clean livestock and all the clean birds, and he sacrificed completely burnt offerings on the altar. God smelled the appeasing fragrance, and God said to himself, Never again will I curse the soil because of man, for the inclination of man's heart is evil from his youth. I will never again strike down all life as I have just done, as long as the earth lasts. Seed time and harvest cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall never again cease to exist. Aftermath of the flood, God blessed Noah and his children. He said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There shall be a fear and dread of you instilled in all the wild beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all that will walk the land and in all the fish of the sea I have placed them in your hands. Every moving thing that lives shall be to you as food like plant vegetation I have now given you everything but nevertheless you may not eat flesh of a creature that is still alive. Only of the blood of your own lives will I demand an account I will demand such an account from the hand of every wild beast from the hand of man, even from the hand of a man's own brother. I will demand an account of every human life he who spills human blood shall have his own blood spilled by man for God made man with his own image. Now be fruitful and multiply swarm all over the earth and become populous on it. The rainbow God said to Noah and his sons with him I myself am making a covenant with you and with your offspring after you and will also include every Living creature that is with you among the birds, the livestock, and all the beasts of the earth with you, all who left the ark, including every animal on earth, I will make my covenant with you, and all life will never be cut short by the waters of the flood. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign that I am providing for the covenant between me you and every living creature that is with you for everlasting generations. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, the rainbow will be seen among the clouds. I will then recall the covenant that exists between me you and every living soul in all flesh. The rainbow will be in the clouds, and I will see it to recall the eternal covenant between God and every living soul in all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have made between me and all flesh on. The earth Canaan is cursed. The sons of Noah who emerged from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's sons, and from them the whole world was repopulated. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, making himself drunk, and uncovered himself in the tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked, and he told it to his two brothers outside. Shem and Yepheth took a cloak and placed it on both their shoulders, walking backwards. They then covered their father's nakedness. They faced away from him and did not see their father naked. Noah awoke from his wine and sleep, and he realized what his youngest son had done to him. He said, "Curses, Canaan! He shall be a slave, slave to his brothers." He then said, "Blessed be God, the Lord of Shem. Canaan shall be his slave. May God expand Yepheth, but may he dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be their slave." Noah lived 350 years after the flood. All of Noah's days were 950 years, and he died. Descendants of Yepheth and Ham. These are the chronicles of Noah's sons. Shem, Ham, and Yepheth. Children were born to them after the flood. The sons of Yepheth were Gomer, Magog, Mate, Yob, and Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Raphaith, and Togrim. The sons of Yob were Elishatars, Hishkitim, and Dodanim. From these, the isolated nations branched out into their lands. Each had its own language for its families and its nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Sbha, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabka. The sons of Ramah were Sheba, and Adon. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who was the first to amass power in the world. He was a mighty trapper before God. There is thus a saying like Nimrod, a mighty trapper before God. The beginning of his kingdom was Babylon along with Erechakot and Kelmed in the land of Shinar Asher left that land and he built Nineveh, Rukovath, Iyar and Kalish as well as reason between Nineveh and Kalish. Nineveh is a great city Mitzrayim fathered the Ludim, the Anamim, the Lahapim, the Nephishim, the Patruzim and the Kaslashim, from whom the Philistines descended, and the Kaphtarim descendants of Canaan, Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Hate as well as the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gergashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Samarites, and the Kamathites. Later the families of the Canaanites became scattered. The Canaanite borders extended from Sidon toward Gerar until Gaza and toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Seboim until Lisha. These are the descendants of Ham according to their families and languages by their lands and nations. Descendants of Shem's sons were also born to Shem. He was the ancestor of the Hebrews and the Brother of Yepheth, the eldest, the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lut, and Aram, the sons of Aram, were Uzchul, Geder, and Mash, Arpachshad had a son, Shalash, Shalash had a son, Ever, Ever had two sons, the name of the first was Pelet, because the world became divided in his days, his brother's name was Yachtim, Yachtim was the father of Almodad, Shalash, Shatz, Armeh, Bethurak, Hedora, Muzel, Dikla, Abdullah, Bimel, Shbha, Ofer, Havila, and Yobab, all these were the sons of Yachtim there. Settlements extended from Mesha towards Sefer, the eastern mountain. These are the descendants of Shem according to their families and languages by their lands and nations. Such were the families of Noah's sons according to their chronicles in their nations. From these, the nations spread over the earth after the flood. The Tower of Babel, the entire earth had one language with uniform words. When the people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and they settled. There they said to one another, Come, let us mold bricks and fire them. They then had bricks to use as stone and asphalt for mortar. They said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top shall reach the sky. Let us make ourselves a name so that we will not be scattered all over the face of the earth. God descended to see the city and the tower that the sons of man had built. God said, They are a single people all having one language and this is the first thing they do. Now nothing they plan to do will be unattainable for them. Come, let us descend and confuse their speech so that one person will not understand another's speech from that place. God scattered them all over the face of the earth and they stopped building the city. He named it Babel because this was the place where God confused the world's language. It was from there that God dispersed humanity over all the face of the earth. The eleventh generation, these are the chronicles of Shem. Shem was one hundred years old when he had a son, Arpachshad, two years after. The flood Shem lived five hundred years after he had Arpachshad and he had sons and daughters. The twelfth generation, Arpachshad was thirty five years old when he had a son, Shalash. Arpachshad lived four hundred and three years after he had Shalash and he had sons and daughters. The thirteenth generation, Shalash was thirty years old when he had a son, Ever. Shalash lived four hundred and three years after he had Ever and he had sons and daughters. The fourteenth generation, Ever was thirty four years old when he had a son, Pelag. Ever lived four hundred and thirty years. After he had Pelag and he had sons and daughters, the fifteenth generation Pelag was thirty years old when he had a son. Ru Pelag lived two hundred and nine years after he had Ru and he had sons and daughters. The sixteenth generation Ru was thirty-two years old when he had a son. Sirig Ru lived two hundred and seven years after he had Sirig and he had sons and daughters. The seventeenth generation Sirig was thirty years old when he had a son. Nakar Sirig lived two hundred years after he had Nakar and he had sons and daughters. The eighteenth generation Nakar was twenty-nine years old when he had a son. Terak Nakar lived one hundred and nineteen years after he had Terak and he had sons and daughters. Abram Terak was seventy years old when he fathered Abram Nakar and Haran. These are the chronicles of Terak. Terak fathered Abram Nakar and Haran. Haran had a son. Lot Haran died during the lifetime of his father Terak in the land of his birth. Cast him Abram and Nakar married the name of Abram's wife was Sarai the name of Nakar's wife. Was Milka the daughter of Haran, who was the father of Milka and Yiscot. Sarai was sterile, she had no children. Terak took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son,
Through your efforts my life will be spared. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptian saw that his wife was very beautiful. Pharaoh's official saw her and spoke highly of her to Pharaoh. The woman was taken to Pharaoh's palace. He treated Abram well because of her, and Abram thus acquired sheep, cattle, donkeys, male and female slaves, sheep, donkeys, and camels. God struck Pharaoh and his palace with severe plagues because of Abram's wife. Sarai Pharaoh summoned Abram and said, How could you do this to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she was your sister so that I should take her to myself as a wife? Now here is your wife. Take her and go. Pharaoh put men in charge of Abram and they sent him on his way along with his wife and all that was his troubles. Abram headed northward to the Negev along with his wife and all that was his including Lot. Abram was very rich with livestock, silver and gold. He continued on his travels from the Negev toward Bethel until he came to the place where he originally had his tent between Bethel and Ai, the side of the altar that he had built there. At first Abram called in God's name Lot who accompanied Abram also had sheep, cattle and tents. The land could not support them living together. Their wealth was so great that they could not stay together. Friction developed between the herdsmen of Abram's flocks and those of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were then living in the land. Abram said to Lot, Let's not have friction between me and you and between my herdsmen and yours. After all, we're brothers. All the land is before you. Why not separate from me? If you go to the left, I will go to the right. If to the right, I will take the left. Lot looked up and saw that the entire Jordan plain, all the way to Sur, had plenty of water. This was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like God's own garden, like the land of Egypt. Lot chose for himself the entire Jordan plain. He headed eastward, and the two separated. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, having migrated as far as Sodom. But the people of Sodom were very wicked, and they sinned against God. After Lot left him, God said to Abram, Raise your eyes, and from the place where you are now standing, look to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. If a man will be able to count all the grains of dust in the world, then your offspring also will be countable. Rise, walk the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it all to you. Abram moved on. He came and settled in the plains of Mamre in Hebron, and there he built an altar to God. The war it was around this time that Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ario, king of Elisar, Shedder, Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, waged war against Bera, king of Sodom, Birshah, king of Gemara, Shinab, king of Admishem, Eber, king of Seboim, and the king of Bela, Nutsur. All of these had come together in Sidim Valley. Now the Dead Sea, they had served Chedorlaomer for twelve years, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlaomer and his allied kings came. They defeated the Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzim, and Ham, the Emim, and Shaved, Akiriyat, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as Elparin, which borders the desert. They then turned back and came to Enmishpat, Nukadesh, and they conquered the entire field of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who lived in Chatzitz and Tamar, the kings of Sodom, Gamar, Admit, Seboim, and Bela, Sur, marched forth. They set up battle lines in Sidim Valley against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Boim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arya, king of Elisar. There were four kings against the five. Sidim Valley was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gamar tried to flee, they fell into them. The others fled to the mountains. The victors seized all the goods of Sodom and Gamar and all the Food and they departed when they left. They also took Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he had been living in Sodom. Those who escaped came and brought the news to Abram, the Hebrew who was living undisturbed in the plains of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshkel and Anna. They were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he called out all his 318 fighting men who had been born in his house. He hurried after the invaders, catching up with them in Dan. He divided his forces against them and attacked that night. He and his servants he attacked and pursued the invaders as far as Kobah, which is to the left of Damascus. Abram brought back all the property. He also brought back his kinsmen Lot and all his goods along with the women and the other people. After he returned from his victory over Chedorlaomer and his allied kings, the king of Sodom came out to greet him in Level Valley, now King's Valley, Machitadek, king of Salem. Brought forth bread and wine, he was a priest to God the Most High. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram to God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Abram then gave him a tenth of everything the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people you can keep the goods. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand in an oath to God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Not a thread nor a shoelace. I will not take anything that is yours. You should not be able to say it was I who made Abram rich. The only exception is what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me on Eshkel and Mamre. Let them take their share of the pact between halves. After these events, God's word came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward is very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me if I remain childless? The heir to my household will be Damascus. Eliza Abram continued, You have given me no children. A member of my household will inherit what is mine. Suddenly God's word came to him, That one will not be your heir. One born from your own body will inherit what is yours. He then took Abram outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars. See if you can count them. God then said to him, That is how numerous your descendants will be. Abram believed in God and he counted it as righteousness. God said to him, I am God who took you out of or cast him to give you this land as a possession. O Lord God replied, Abram, How can I really know that it will be mine? God said to him, Bring for me a prime heifer, a prime goat, a prime ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these for him. He split them in half and placed one half opposite the other. The birds, however, he did not split vultures descended on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. When the sun was setting, Abram fell into a trance and he was stricken by a deep dark dread. God said to Abram, Know for sure that your descendants will be foreigners in a land that is not theirs for. Four hundred years they will be enslaved and oppressed, but I will finally bring judgment against the nation who enslaves them, and they will then leave with great wealth. You shall join your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. The fourth generation will return here since the Amorite sin will not have run its course until then the sun set, and it became very dark. A smoking furnace and a flaming torch passed between the halves of the animals on that day. God made a covenant. With Abram saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the Egyptian river as far as the great river, the Euphrates, the lands of the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Yebusites. Birth of Ishmael, Abram's wife Sarai had not borne him any children. She had an Egyptian slave girl by the name of Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, God has kept me from having children. Come to my slave and hopefully I will have sons through her. Abram heeded Sarai after Abram had lived in Canaan for ten years. His wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave, and gave her to her husband Abram. As a wife, Abram came to her and she conceived. When she realized that she was pregnant, she looked at her mistress with contempt. Sarai said to Abram, It's all your fault. I myself placed my slave in your arms. Now that she sees herself pregnant, she looks at me with disrespect. Let God judge between me and you. Abram replied to Sarai, Your slave is in your hands, do with her as you see fit. Sarai abused her, and Hagar ran away from her. An angel of God encountered her by a spring in the desert in the oasis on the road to Shur. The angel said, Hagar made of Sarai. From where are you coming and where are you going? I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. She replied, The angel of God said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her. Another angel said, In God's name, I will grant you many descendants. They will be so many that they will be uncountable. Still, another angel of God said to her, You are pregnant and will give birth to a son. You must name him Ishmael, for God has heard your prayer. He will be a rebel. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. Still, he will dwell undisturbed near all his brothers. Hagar gave a name to God who had spoken to her, saying, You are a vision, God, for she
You shall be circumcised through the flesh of your foreskin. This shall be the mark of the covenant between me and you throughout all generations. Every male shall be circumcised when he is eight days old. This shall include those born in your house as well as slaves bought with cash from an outsider who is not your descendant. All slaves, both houseborn and purchased with your money, must be circumcised. This shall be my covenant in your flesh and eternal covenant. The uncircumcised male whose foreskin has not been circumcised shall have his soul cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Fulfillment. God said to Abraham, Sarai, your wife, do not call her by the name Sarai, for Sarah is her name. I will bless her and make her bear you a son. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of entire nations. Kings will be her descendants. Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. He said to himself, Can a hundred year old man have children? Can Sarah, who is ninety, give birth? To God, Abraham said, May it be granted that Ishmael lie before you. God said, Still your wife Sarah will give birth to a son, you must name him Isaac. I will keep my covenant with him as an eternal treaty for his descendants after him. I have also heard you with regard to Ishmael. I will bless him and make him fruitful, increasing his numbers very greatly. He will father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will keep my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you this time next year. When he finished speaking to him, God went up. Leaving Abraham, Abraham took his son Ishmael, everyone born in his house, and every slave bought for money, every male in his household, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins. It was on the very day that God had spoken to him. Abraham was ninety nine years old when he was circumcised on the flesh of his foreskin. His son Ishmael was thirteen years old when the flesh of his foreskin was circumcised on the very day that Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, all the men of it. Household both homeborn and bought for cash from a stranger were circumcised with him. The visitor Sodom destroyed God appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent in the hottest part of the day. Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw three strangers standing a short distance from him. When he saw them from the entrance of his tent, he ran to greet them, bowing down to the ground. He said, Sir, if you would do not go on without stopping by me, let some water be brought and wash your feet. Rest under the tree. I will get a morsel of bread for you to refresh yourselves. Then you can continue on your way. After all, you are passing by my house. Abraham rushed to Sarah's tent and said, Hurry. Three measures of the finest flour. Knead it and make rolls. Abraham ran to the cattle and chose a tender choice calf. He gave it to a young man who rushed to prepare it. Abraham fetched some cottage cheese and milk and the calf that he prepared and he placed it before his guests. He stood over them as they ate under the tree. They asked him, Where is your wife Sarah? Here in the tent he replied, I will return to you this time next year, said one of the men and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening behind the entrance of the tent and he was on the other side. Abraham and Sarah were already old well on in years and Sarah no longer had female periods. She laughed to herself saying now that I am worn out shall I have my heart's desire? My husband is old. God said to Abraham why did Sarah laugh and say can I really have a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for God? At the designated time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid and she denied it. I did not laugh. She said Abraham said you did laugh. The strangers got up from their places and gazed at Sodom. Abraham went with them to send them on their way. God said shall I hide from Abraham what I am going to do? Abraham is about to become a great and mighty nation and through him all the nations of the world will be blessed. I have given him special attention so that he will command his children and his household after him and they will keep God's way doing charity and justice. God will then bring about for Abraham everything he promised God then said the outcry against Sodom is so great and their sin is so very grave I will descend and see have they done everything implied by the outcry that is coming before me. If not I will know the men turned from where they were and headed towards Sodom. Abraham was still standing before God he came forward and said will you actually wipe out the innocent together with the guilty? Suppose there are fifty innocent people in the city would you still destroy it and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty good people inside it? It would be sacrilege even to ascribe such an act to you, to kill the innocent with the guilty letting the righteous and the wicked fare alike it would be sacrilege to ascribe this to you. Shall the whole world judge not act justly? God said if I find fifty innocent people in Sodom I will spare the entire area for their sake. Abraham spoke up and said I have already said too much before my lord. I am mere dust and ashes. But suppose that there are five missing from the fifty innocent? Will you destroy the entire city because of the five? I will not destroy it if I find forty five there replied God. Abraham persisted and said suppose there are forty there. I will not act for the sake of the forty let not my lord be angry but I must speak up what if there are thirty there. I will not act if I find thirty there I have already spoken too much now before my lord. But what if twenty are found there? I will not destroy for the sake of the twenty let my lord not become angry but I will speak just once more suppose ten are found there. I will not destroy for the sake of the ten when he finished speaking with Abraham God left him Abraham then returned home the visitor Sodom destroyed the two angels came to Sodom in the evening while Lot was sitting at the city gate Lot saw them and got up to greet them bowing with his face to the ground he said please my lords turn aside to my house spend the night bathe your feet and then continue on your way early in the morning no they replied we will spend the night in. The square Lot kept urging them until they finally turned aside to him and came to his house he made a feast for them and baked matzah and they ate they had not yet gone to bed when the townspeople the men of Sodom surrounded the house young and old alike all the people from every quarter they called out to Lot and said where are the strangers who came to you tonight bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went out to them in front of the entrance shutting the door behind him he said my brothers don't do such an evil thing. I have two daughters who have never known a man I will bring them out to you do as you please with them but don't do anything to these men after all they have come under my roof. Get out of the way, they shouted they were saying this one man came here as an immigrant and now all of a sudden he has set himself up as a judge. We'll give it to you worse than to them. They pushed against Lot very much and tried to break down the door the strangers inside reached out and pulled Lot to them into the house closing the door they struck the men who were standing at the entrance with blindness, young and old alike, and the Sodomites tried in vain to find the door the strangers said to Lot who else do you have here? A son-in-law. Your own sons. Your daughters. If you have anyone in the city get them out of the area we are about to destroy this place for the people's outcry is great before God God has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were betrothed to his daughters he said get moving. Get out of this area. God is about to destroy the city. To his sons-in-law it was all a big joke as Don was breaking the two angels hurried Lot get moving. They said take your wife and two daughters who are here. You don't want to be swept away because of the city's sin. He hesitated the strangers grabbed him his wife and his two daughters by the hand leading them out and left them on the outskirts of the city God had shown pity on Lot when the angel had led them out he said run for your life. Do not look back. Do not stop anywhere in the valley. Flee to the hill so that you will not be swept away. Lot said to them oh God no. I have found favor in your eyes and you have been very kind in saving my life. But I cannot reach the hills to escape the evil will overtake me and I will die. Please there is a city here close enough for refuge it is insignificant. I will flee there, isn't it insignificant? And I will survive the angel replied to him I will also give you special consideration in this matter I will not overturn the city you mentioned but hurry. Run there. I can do nothing until you get there the city was henceforth known as Sur, insignificant. The sun had risen by the time that Lot arrived in Sur God made sulfur and fire rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. It came from God out of the sky he overturned these cities along with the entire plain destroying everyone who lived in the cities and all that was growing from the ground Lot's wife looked behind him and she was turned into a pillar of salt Abraham woke up early in the Morning hurrying back to the place where he had stood before God he stared at Sodom and Gomorrah and the whole area of the plain and all he saw was heavy smoke rising from the earth like the smoke of a long hill when God had
to the younger last night it was I who slept with my father tonight let's get him drunk with wine again you go sleep with him and we will survive through children from our father that night they again made their father drunk with wine the younger girl got up and she slept with him he was not aware that she had lain down or gotten up lots two daughters became pregnant from their father the older girl had a son and she named him Moab he is the ancestor of the nation Moab that exists Today the younger girl also had a son and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the ancestor of the people of Ammon who exist today. Sarah and Abimelech Abraham migrated from there to the land of Benegif and he settled between Kadesh and Shur. He would often visit Gerar there. He announced that his wife Sarah was his sister and Abimelech king of Gerar sent messengers and took Sarah. God came to Abimelech in a dream that night. You will die because of the woman you took. He said she is already married. Abimelech had not come near her. He said, O Lord, will you even kill an innocent nation? Didn't her husband tell me that she was his sister? She also claimed that he was her brother. If I did something, it was with an innocent heart and clean hands. God said to him in the dream, I also realized that you have done this with an innocent heart. That is why I prevented you from sinning against me, not giving you an opportunity to touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet. He will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, you can be sure that you will die. You and all that is yours, Abimelech got up. Early in the morning, and he summoned all his servants. He discreetly repeated all these words to them, and the men were very frightened. Abimelech summoned Abraham and said to him, How could you do this to us? What terrible thing did I do to you that you brought such great guilt upon me and my people? The thing you did to me is simply not done. Abimelech then asked Abraham, What did you see to make you do such a thing? Abraham replied, I realized that the one thing missing here is the fear of God. I could be killed because of my wife. In any case, she really is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. She later became my wife when God made me wander from my father's house. I asked her to do me a favor wherever we came. She was to say that I was her brother. Abimelech took sheep, cattle, and male and female slaves, and he gave them to Abraham. He also returned Abraham's. Wife Sarah to him, Abimelech said, My whole land is before you settle wherever you see fit to Sarah. He said, I am giving your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Let it be compensation for you and all who are with you for all that has been done. You can stand up tall. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech as well as his wife and slave girl so that they were able to have children. God had previously sealed up every woman in Abimelech's house because of Abraham's wife Sarah Isaac. And Ishmael God granted special providence to Sarah as he said he would and God did what he promised for Sarah. Sarah became pregnant and she gave birth to Abraham's son in his old age. It was at the exact time that God had promised it to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son he had to whom Sarah had just given birth when his son Isaac was eight days old. Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was one hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has given me. Laughter all who hear about it will laugh for me, she said, who would have even suggested to Abraham that Sarah would be nursing children? But here I have given birth to a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned. Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned, but Sarah saw the son that Hagar had born to Abraham playing. She said to Abraham, Drive away the slave together with her son. The son of the slave will not share the inheritance with my son Isaac. This troubled Abraham very much because it involved his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be troubled because of the boy and your slave. Do everything that Sarah tells you. It is through Isaac that you will gain posterity, but still I will also make the slave son into a nation, for he is your child. Abraham got up early in the morning. He took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, placing it on her shoulder. He sent her away with the boy she left and roamed aimlessly in the beard. She the desert when the water in the skin was used up. She set the boy under one of the bushes. She walked away and sat down facing him about a bow shot away. She said, Let me not see the boy die. She sat there facing him and she wept in a loud voice. God heard the boy weeping. God's angel called Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy's voice there where he is. Go and lift up the boy. Keep your hands strong on him, for I will make of him a great nation. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water, giving the boy some to drink. God was with the boy. The boy grew up and lived in the desert where he became an expert archer. He settled in the parent desert and his mother got him a wife from Egypt. The treaty at Beersheba around that time. Abimelech and his general Pichal made a declaration to Abraham saying God is with you and all that you do now swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me with my children or with my grandchildren show to me and the land where you were an immigrant the same kindness that I have shown to you I will swear replied Abraham Abraham and complained to Abimelech about the well that Abimelech's servants had taken by force Abimelech said I don't know who could have done such a thing you never told me I heard nothing about it until today Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech and the two of them made a treaty Abraham and put seven female sheep aside by themselves Abimelech asked Abraham what is the meaning of these seven ewes that you have set aside Take these seven ewes from my hand, replied Abraham, it will be my proof that I dug this well. That area was therefore called Beersheba since the two had made an oath there. They thus made a treaty in Beersheba. Abimelech and his general Pichal then left and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and there he called in the name of God, Lord of the universe. Abraham lived there in the land of the Philistines for many days the test. After these events God tested Abraham, Abraham. He said, Yes, take your son, the only one you love, Isaac, and go away to the Moriah area. Bring him as an all burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will designate to you. Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took his two men with him along with his son Isaac. He cut wood for the offering and set out heading for the place that God had designated on the third day. Abraham looked up and saw the place from afar. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here. With the donkey, the boy, and I will go to that place. We will worship and then return to you. Abraham took the offering wood and placed it on the shoulders of his son Isaac. He himself took the fire and the slaughter knife, and the two of them went together. Isaac spoke up to Abraham, Father, yes, my son, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the offering? God will see to a lamb for an offering, my son, replied Abraham. The two of them continued together when they finally came to the place designated by God. Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He then bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham reached out and took the slaughter knife to slit his son's throat. God's angel called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, yes, do not harm the boy, do not do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. You have not withheld your only son from him. Abraham then looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. He went and got the ram, sacrificing it as an all burnt offering in his son's place. Abraham named the place God will see, and on where Today it is therefore said on God's mountain he will be seen. God's angel called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, God declares, I have sworn by my own essence that because you performed this act and did not hold back your only son, I will bless you greatly and increase your offspring like the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your offspring shall inherit their enemies' gate. All the nations of the world shall be blessed through your descendants. All because you obeyed my voice, Abraham returned to his young men, and together they set out and went to Beersheba. Abraham remained in Beersheba, Rebekah. After this, Abraham received a message. Milka has also had children from your brother Nahor, who's his firstborn, but his brother Kemuel, father of Aram, Keschazo, Bildash, Yidl, and Bethul. Bethul has had a daughter, Rebekah. Milka bore the above eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor. Nahor's concubine was named Rima. She also had children. Tabak, Gosh, to Kash, and Maka, Sarah died. Sarah had lived to be 127 years old. These were the years of Sarah's life. Sarah died. In Kiryat Arba, also known as Hebron in the land of Canaan, Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham rose from beside his dead and he spoke to the children of Hate. I am an immigrant and a resident among you. He said, Sell me property for a burial place with you so that I can bury my dead and not have her here right in front of me. The children of Hate replied to Abraham, saying to
Barrier dead Abraham understood what Ephraim meant he weighed out for Ephraim the silver that had been mentioned in the presence of the children of eight four hundred shekels in negotiable currency Ephraim's field in Machpelah adjoining Mamre thus became Abraham's uncontested property this included the field its cave and every tree within its circumference it was Abraham's purchase with all the children of eight who came to the city gate as eyewitnesses Abraham and buried his wife Sarah in the cave of Machpelah field which adjoins Mamre also known as Hebron in the land of Canaan this is how the field and its cave became the uncontested property of Abraham as a burial site purchased from the children of eight a wife for Isaac Abraham was old well advanced in years and God had blessed Abraham with everything he said to the senior servant of his household who was in charge of all that he owned place your hand under my thigh I will bind you by an oath to God Lord of heaven and earth that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. Instead, you must go to my native land to my birthplace and obtain a wife for my son Isaac. But what if the girl does not want to come back with me to this land? Ask the servant, Shall I bring your son back to the land that you left? Be most careful in this respect, replied Abraham. Do not bring my son back there. God the Lord of heaven took me away from my father's house and the land of my birth. He spoke to me and made an oath to your offspring. I will give this land. He will send his angel before you and you will indeed find a wife there for my son. If the girl does not want to come back with you, then you shall be absolved of my oath. But no matter what, do not bring my son back there. The servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and he took an oath regarding this. The servant then took ten of his master's camels bringing along the best things his master owned. He set off and went to Aram Nahrim to the city of Nahrim. When he arrived he let the camels rest on their knees outside the city beside the well. It was in the evening when women go out to draw water. He prayed, O God, Lord of my master Abraham, be with me today and grant a favor to my master. Abraham, I am standing here by the well and the daughters of the townsmen are coming out to draw water. If I say to a girl, tip over your jug and let me have a drink and she replies, drink and I will also water your camels. She will be the one whom you have designated for your servant Isaac. If there is such a girl I will know that you have granted a favor for my master. He had not yet finished speaking when Rebecca appeared. She had been born to Bethel, the son of Milka, the wife of Abraham's brother knocked her jug was on her shoulder the girl was extremely good looking and she was a virgin untouched by any man the girl went down filled her jug and then came up again the servant ran toward her if you would let me sip a little water from your jug he said drink sir she replied she quickly lowered her jug to her hand and gave him a drink when he had finished drinking she said let me draw water for your camel so they can also drink their fill she quickly emptied her jug into the trough and ran to the well again to draw water she drew water for all his camels the man stood there gaping at her but he remained silent waiting to determine for certain whether or not God had made his journey successful when the camels had finished drinking he took a gold ring weighing half a shekel and two gold bracelets weighing ten gold shekels for her arms whose daughter are you he asked if you would tell me if there is a place in your father's house for us to spend a night, she replied, I am the daughter of Bethel, son of Milka, whom she bore to Nacher. She then said, We have plenty of straw and fodder as well as a place for people to spend a night. The man bowed low and prostrated himself to God. He said, Blessed be God, Lord of my master Abraham, who has not withdrawn the kindness and truth that he grants to my master. Here I am still on the road, and God has led me to the house of my master's close relatives. The girl ran to her mother's quarters and told her what had happened. Rebecca had a brother named Laban. He ran outside to the stranger to the well. He had seen the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and had heard his sister Rebecca relating what the man had said to her. He came to the stranger who was still standing beside the camels near the well and said, Come. You're a man blessed by God. Why are you still standing there outside? I have cleaned the house and prepared a place for the camels. The stranger came into the house and unmuzzled the camels. Laban gave the camels straw and fodder and provided water for the stranger and the men with him to wash their feet. Food was served, but the stranger said, I will not eat until I have spoken my peace. Speak, replied the host. The stranger said, I am Abraham's servant. God granted my master a very great blessing and he prospered. God granted him sheep cattle. Silver gold slave slave girls camels and donkeys. Finally, my master's wife Sarah gave birth to a son for my master after she had grown very old and my master gave him all that he owned. My master bound me by an oath. Do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. Instead, you must go to my father's house to my family and there you shall get a wife for my son. I said to my master, but what if the girl will not come back with me? He said to me, God before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and make your mission successful, but you must find a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. There is only one way that you can be free of my dread oath. If you go to my family and they do not give you a girl, you will be released from my dread oath. Now today I came to the well and I prayed, O God, Lord of my master Abraham, if you will grant success to this mission that I am undertaking, I am now. Standing by the town well, when a girl comes out to draw water, I will say to her, Let me drink some water from your jug. If she answers, not only may you drink, but I will also draw water for your camels, and she is the wife designated by God for my master's son. I had not yet finished speaking to myself when Rebecca suddenly came out carrying her jug on her shoulder. When she went down to the well and drew water, I said to her, Please give me a drink. She immediately lowered her jug and said, Drink. I will also water your camels. I took a drink and she also gave the camels water. I questioned her and asked, Whose daughter are you? She replied, I am a daughter of Bethel, son of Nacher, whom Milka bore to him. I then placed a ring on her nose and bracelets on her arms. I bowed low and prostrate myself to God. I blessed God, Lord of my master Abraham, who led me on a true path to get a niece of my master for his son. Now, if you want to do what is kind and right to my master, tell me. If not, say so, and I will go to the right or to the left. Laban and Bethel both spoke up. It is something from God. They said, We cannot say anything to you, bad or good. Rebecca is right here in front of you. Take her and go. Let her be a wife for your master's son, as God has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard these words, he prostrated himself on the ground to God. The servant brought out gold and silver jewelry as well as articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave precious gifts to her brother and mother. He and his men then ate and drank, and they spent the night. When they got up in the morning, the servant said let me go back to my master the girl's brother and mother replied at least let the girl remain with us for another year or ten months and she can go do not delay me said the servant god has already shown my mission to be successful let me leave so that i can go to my master let's call the girl and ask her personally they replied they summoned rebecca and said to her do you want to go with this man i will go she replied they let their relative rebecca go along with her attendant abraham servant and his men they blessed rebecca and said to her our sister grow into thousands of myriads may your descendants inherit the gate of their foes rebecca set off with her girls and they rode on the camels following the stranger the servant thus took rebecca and left isaac was on his way coming from beer lash iroi he was then living in the Negev area isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening he raised his eyes and saw camels approaching when rebecca looked up and saw isaac she fell from the camel she asked the servant who is this man coming toward us in the field that is my master, replied the servant. Rebecca took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all that had happened. Isaac brought the girl into his mother Sarah's tent and he married Rebecca. She became his wife and he loved her. Isaac was then consoled for the loss of his mother Abraham's last days. Abraham married another woman whose name was Kitara. She bore him Zimran, Yachin, Medan, Midian, Yishbach, and Jachin, Father Chiba, and Adon, the sons of Dadon were. The Ashirim, Letushim, and Liam, and the sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Enoch, Abadah, and Elgah. All these were Kitara's descendants. Abraham gave all that he owned to Isaac to the sons of the concubines that he had taken. Abraham also gave gifts. Then while he was still alive, he sent them to the country of the east away from his son Isaac. This then is the account of Abraham's years. He lived a total of 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good age old and satisfied and he was gathered to his people, his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in Machpelah cave in the field of Ephron son of Tzahar the Hittite, which borders Mamre
She went to seek a message from God. God's word to her was, Two nations are in your womb, two governments will separate from inside you. The upper hand will go from one government to the other, the greater one will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb. The first one came out reddish as hairy as a fur coat. They named him Esau. His brother then emerged and his hand was grasping Esau's he Isaac named him Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old. When Rebecca gave birth to them, the boys grew up. Esau became a skilled trapper, a man of the field. Jacob was a scholarly man who remained with the tents. Isaac enjoyed eating Esau's game and favored him, but Rebecca favored Jacob. Jacob was once simmering a stew when Esau came home exhausted from the field. Esau said to Jacob, Give me a swallow of that red stuff. I'm famished. He was therefore given the name Edom. First, sell me your birthright, replied Jacob. Here I'm about to die, exclaimed Esau. What good is a birthright to me? Make an oath to me right now, said Jacob. He made the oath and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then gave Esau bread and lentil stew. Esau ate it, drank, got up, and left. He thus rejected the birthright. Isaac and the Philistines. There was a famine in the land. Aside from the first famine in the time of Abraham, Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and Gerogot appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Remain undisturbed in the land that I shall designate to you. Remain an immigrant in this land. I will be with you and bless you, since it will be to you and your offspring that I will give all these lands. I will thus keep the oath that I made to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and grant them all these lands. All the nations on earth shall be blessed through your descendants. All this is because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my decrees, and my laws. Isaac thus settled in. Error when the local men asked about his wife, he told them that she was his sister. He was afraid to say that she was his wife. Rebecca was so good looking that the local men could have killed him because of her once after Isaac had been there for some time. Abimelech, king of the Philistines, was looking out the window and he saw Isaac enjoying himself with his wife. Rebecca, Abimelech summoned Isaac, but she is your wife. He said, How could you have said that she is your sister? I was afraid that I would die because of her, replied Isaac. What have you done to us? demanded Abimelech. One of the people could easily have slept with your wife. You would have made us commit a terrible crime. Abimelech issued an order to all the people, whoever touches this man or his wife shall die. Isaac farmed in the area that year he reaped a hundred times as much as he sowed for God had blessed him. This was the beginning of his prosperity. He then continued to prosper until he became extremely wealthy. He had flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and a large retinue of slaves. The Philistines became jealous of him. They plugged up all the wells that his father's servants had dug while Abraham was still alive and they filled them with dirt. Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, you have become much more powerful than we are. Isaac left the area and camped in the Gerar Valley, intending to settle there. He redug the wells that had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, which had been plugged up by the Philistines. After Abraham's death, he gave them the same names that his father had given them. Isaac's servants then dug in the valley and found a new well. Brimming over with fresh water, the shepherds of Gerar disputed with Isaac's shepherds, claiming that the water was theirs. Isaac named the well challenge, Isaac, because they had challenged him, they dug another well, and it was also disputed. Isaac named it accusation, Sidna. He then moved away from there and dug another well. This time it was not disputed, so he named it wide spaces, Rekobeth. Now God will grant us wide open spaces, he said, we can be fruitful in the land from. There Isaac went up to Beersheba. God appeared to him that night and said, I am God of your father Abraham, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and grant you very many descendants because of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called in God's name. He set up his tents there and his servants dug a well in the area of Imelech came to Isaac from Gerar along with a group of friends and his general Pichal. Why have you come to me? Asked Isaac, you hate me, you drove me away from you. We have indeed seen that God is with you, they replied. We propose that there now be a dread oath between you and us. Let us make a treaty with you that just as we did not touch you, you will do no harm to us. We did only good to you and let you leave in peace. Now you are the one who is blessed by God. Isaac prepared a feast for them and they ate and drank. They got up early in the morning and made a mutual oath. Isaac then bid them farewell and they left in peace on that very day. Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had been digging. We have found water. They announced Isaac named the well Shiva. The city is therefore called Beersheba to this very day. Esau marries when Esau was forty years old. He married Judith, daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite. His wives became a source of spiritual bitterness to Isaac and Rebekah. Jacob takes the blessing. Isaac had grown old and his eyesight was fading. He Summoned his elder son Esau, my son, yes, I am old and I have no idea when I will die. Now take your equipment, your dangler, and bow and go out in the field to trap me some game, make it into a tasty dish the way I like it, and bring it to me to eat my soul. Will then bless you before I die. Rebecca had been listening while Isaac was speaking to Esau. His son Esau went out to the field to trap some game and bring it home. Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I just heard your father. Speaking to your brother Esau, he said, Bring me some game and prepare it into something tasty. I will eat it and bless you in God's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me, eat my instructions carefully. Go to the sheep and take two choice young kids. I will prepare them with a tasty recipe just the way your father likes them. You must then bring it to your father so that he will eat it and bless you before he dies. But my brother Esau is hairy, replied Jacob, I am smooth. Skin, suppose my father touches me, he will realize that I am an imposter. I will gain a curse rather than a blessing. Let any curse be on me, my son, said the mother, but listen to me, go bring me what I asked. Jacob went and fetched what his mother had requested. She took the kids and prepared them using the tasty recipe that Jacob's father liked best. Rebecca then took her older son Esau's best clothing which she had in her keeping and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also placed the young goat skins on his arms and on the hairless parts of his neck. Rebecca handed to her son Jacob the delicacy and the bread she had baked. He came to his father, father, yes, who are you, my son? It is I, Esau, your firstborn, said Jacob. I have done as you asked. Sit up and eat the game I trapped so that your soul will bless me. How did you find it so quickly, my son? Asked Isaac, God, your Lord was with me. Come closer to me, said Isaac to Jacob. Let me touch you, my son. Are you really Esau or not? Jacob came closer to his father Isaac and Isaac touched him. He said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not realize who it was because there was hair on Jacob's arms just like those of his brother Esau. Isaac was about to bless him, but are you really my son Esau? I am, and serve me the food. I will eat the game that my son trapped so that my soul may bless you. Jacob served it, and Isaac ate. He then brought Isaac some wine and he drank it. His father Isaac said to him, Come closer and kiss me, my son. Jacob approached and kissed him. Isaac smelled the fragrance of his garments and blessed him. He said, See, my son's fragrance is like the perfume of a field blessed by God. May God grant you the dew of heaven and the fat of the earth. Much grain and wine nations will serve you, governments will bow down to you, you shall be like a lord over your brother, your mother's children will prostrate themselves to you, those who curse you are cursed, and those who bless you are blessed. Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had just left his father Isaac when his brother Esau came back from his hunt. He had also prepared a delicacy and brought it to his father. Let my father get up and eat his son's venison. He said so that your soul may bless me. Who are you? asked his father Isaac. I am your firstborn Esau. He replied, Isaac was seized with a violent fit of trembling. How raised the one who trapped game and just served it to me? I ate it all before you came, and I blessed him. The blessing will remain his when Esau heard his father's words. He let out a most loud and bitter scream. Bless me too, father. He pleaded, Your brother came with deceit, and he already took your blessing. Isn't he truly named Jacob? Yakov. He went behind my back. Akov. Twice first he took my birthright, and now he took my blessing. He saw pleaded, couldn't you have saved me a blessing too? Isaac tried to answer, but I made him like a lord over you. He said, I have given him all his brothers as slaves. I have
Jacob takes the blessing. Isaac summoned Jacob and gave him a blessing and a charge. Do not marry a Canaanite girl. He said, set out and go to Paden Aram to the house of your maternal grandfather, but will marry a daughter of your uncle Laban. God Almighty will then bless you, make you fruitful, and increase your numbers. You will become an assembly of nations. He will grant Abraham's blessing to you and your descendants so that you will take over the land which God gave to Abraham where you previously lived only as a foreigner. Isaac then sent Jacob on his way. Jacob headed toward Paden Aram to Laban's son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah. Jacob and Esau's mother Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Paden Aram to find a wife, including in his blessing the charge. Do not marry a Canaanite girl. He also knew that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Paden Aram. Esau understood that the Canaanite girls were displeasing to his father Isaac. Esau therefore went to Ishmael and married Machlath, daughter of Abraham's son Ishmael, a sister of Nebaioth. In addition to his other wives, Jacob's journey, marriage, and children, Jacob left Beersheba and headed toward Charon. He came to a familiar place and spent the night there because the sun had already set. Taking some stones, he placed them at his head and lay down to sleep there. He had a vision in a dream. A ladder was standing on the ground and its top reached up. Toward heaven God's angels were going up and down on it. Suddenly he saw God standing over him. God said, I am God, Lord of Abraham, your father, and Lord of Isaac. I will give to you and your descendants the land upon which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. All the families on earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and bring you back to the soil. I will not turn aside from you until I have fully kept this promise to you. Jacob awoke from his sleep. God is truly in this place, he said, but I did not know it. He was frightened. How inspiring this place is. He exclaimed, It must be God's temple. It is the gate to heaven. Jacob got up early in the morning and took the stone that he had placed under his head. He stood it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He named the place God's temple, Bethel. The town's original name, however, had been loose. Jacob made a vow. God will be with me. He said, if he will protect me on the journey that I am taking, if he gives me bread to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return in peace to my father's house, then I will dedicate myself totally to God. Let this stone that I have set up as a pillar become a temple to God of all that you give me. I will set aside a tent to you. Jacob's journey, marriage, and children. Jacob set off briskly and headed toward the land of the people of the east. He came to a place where he saw a well in a field. Three flocks of sheep were lying beside it. Since it was from this well that the flocks were watered, the top of the well was covered with a large stone. When all the flocks would come together, there the shepherds would roll the stone from the top of the well and water the sheep. Then they would replace the stone on the well. Some shepherds were there. From where do you come, brothers? Asked Jacob. We are from Charon. Do you know Nachus' grandson Laban? We know him. Is he doing well? Well enough. Here's his daughter Rachel coming with the sheep, but it's still the middle of the day. It's not yet time to bring the livestock together. Why not water the sheep and go on grazing? We can't until all the flocks have come together, all of us then roll the stone from the top of the well, only then can we water the sheep. While he was still conversing with them, Rachel appeared with her father's sheep. She was the shepherdess. Jacob looked at his cousin Rachel, who was with his uncle Laban's sheep. He stepped forward and rolled the stone from the top of the well, watering his uncle Laban's sheep. Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. He told her that he was Rebecca's son. And thus related to her father, she ran to tell her father when Laban heard the news that Jacob had arrived. He ran to greet him. He embraced and kissed him and brought him home. Jacob told Laban all that had happened. Yes, indeed, you are my own flesh and blood, said Laban. Jacob remained with him for a month. Laban then said to Jacob, Just because you are my close relative, does it mean that you must work for me for nothing? Tell me what you want to be paid. Laban had two daughters. The older one's name was Leah and the younger one's name was Rachel. Leah had lovely eyes while Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel. I will work for you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. He said, Better I should give her to you than to another man. Replied Laban, You can stay with me. Jacob worked for seven years for Rachel, but he loved her so much it seemed like no more than a few days. Finally, Jacob said to Laban, The time is up. Give me my bride and let me marry her. Laban invited all the local people and made a wedding feast in the evening. He took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, who consummated the marriage with her. Laban had also given his servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her handmaid. In the morning, Jacob discovered that it was Leah. He said to Laban, How could you do this to me? Didn't I work with you for Rachel? Why did you cheat me? In our country it is something that is simply not done, replied Laban. We never give a younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn, but wait until this week of wedding celebrations for Leah is over, then we will give you the other girl. In return for the work that you will do for me for another seven years, Jacob complied and completed the week of celebration for Leah Laban and gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife to his daughter Rachel Laban gave his servant. Bilhah as a handmaid Jacob thus also married Rachel and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He worked for Laban another seven years. God saw that Leah was unloved and he opened her womb. Rachel remained barren. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. God has seen my trouble. She said, Now my husband will love me. She became pregnant again and had a son. God has heard, Shama, that I was unloved, she said, and he also gave me the son she named the child. Simeon, Shimon, she became pregnant again and had a son. Now my husband will become attached, Leva, to me, she said, because I have given him three sons. Jacob therefore named the child Levi. She became pregnant again and had a son. She said, This time let me praise, Bode, God, and named the child Judah, yet Judah. She then stopped having children. Jacob's journey marriage and children. Rachel realized that she was not bearing any children to Jacob. She was jealous of her sister and said, To Jacob, give me children. If not, let me die. Jacob became furious with Rachel. Shall I take God's place? He said, It is he who is holding back the fruit of your womb. Rachel said, Here is my handmaid Bilhah. Come to her and let her give birth on my lap through her. I will then also have a son. She gave him her handmaid Bilhah as a wife, and Jacob came to her. Bilhah became pregnant and gave birth to Jacob's son. Rachel said, God has judged, Dan, me, and has also heard my prayer. He has finally given me a son. She therefore named the child Dan Rachel's handmaid Bilhah became pregnant again and had a second son by Jacob Rachel said I have been twisted around with my sister through all of God's roundabout ways, Naphtali, but I have finally won. She therefore named the child Naphtali Leah realized that she was no longer having children. She took her handmaid Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife Leah's handmaid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Good fortune, Gad, has come, exclaimed Leah she. Named the child Gad Leah's handmaid Zilpah bore a second son to Jacob. It's my happiness, Asher, said Leah. Young girls will consider me happy. She named the child Asher Reuben took a walk during the wheat harvest and he found mandrakes in the field. He brought them to his mother Leah Rachel said to Leah please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Isn't it enough that you have taken away my husband? Retorted Leah now you even want to take my son's mandrakes. All right, replied Rachel. Jacob will sleep with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came home from the field that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You will come to me, she said. I have paid for your services with my son's mandrakes. He slept with her that night. God heard Leah's prayer, and she became pregnant, giving birth to a fifth son. To Jacob, Leah said, God has given me my reward, Sakar, because I have given my handmaid to my husband. She named it. Child Issachar Leah became pregnant again, and she bore Jacob a sixth son. God has given me a wonderful gift, Zeb, said Leah. Now let my husband make his permanent home, Zebul, with me. She named the child Zebulun, Zebulun. Leah then had a daughter, and she named her Dinah. God gave special consideration to Rachel. He heard her prayer and opened her womb. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. God has gathered away, Azap, my humiliation, she said. She named the child. Joseph, Yosef, saying, May
That day Laban removed the ringed and streaked he goats and all the spotted and streaked she goats. Everyone with a trace of white he also removed every sheep with dark markings these he gave to his sons he then separated himself from Jacob by the distance of a three day journey Jacob was left tending Laban's remaining sheep Jacob took ones of fresh thorax almond and plain he peeled white stripes in them by uncovering the white layer under the ones bark he set up the ones. That he peeled near the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink facing the animals it was when they came to drink that they usually made it the animals made it in the presence of the ones and the young they bore were ringed spotted and streaked Jacob segregated the young animals still he made the animals in Laban's flocks look at the ringed ones and all those with dark markings but he bred his own flocks separately and did not let them breed with Laban's flocks whenever they Stronger animals made it. Jacob placed the ones before their eyes at the trough so that they would make facing the ones. But when the sheep were feeble, he did not place the ones. The feeble ones thus went to Laban. While Jacob got the stronger ones in this manner, the men became tremendously wealthy. He had many sheep and goats as well as slaves, slave girls, camels, and donkeys. Jacob's journey, marriage, and children. Jacob began to hear that Laban's sons were saying, Jacob has taken everything belonging to our father. He has become rich by taking our father's property. When Jacob saw Laban in person, Laban also did not behave to him as he did before. God said to Jacob, Go back to your birthplace in the land of your fathers. I will be with you. Jacob sent word and summoned Rachel and Leah to the field where his flock was. I saw your father's face. He said, He is not acting the same with me as he used to. But the God of my father has been with me. You know full well that I served your father with all my strength. Your father swindled me and changed. His mind about my pay at least ten times, but God would not let him harm me if he said, Your pay will be the spotted ones. Then all the animals gave birth to spotted young. If he said, Ringed ones will be your wage. Then all the animals dropped ringed ones. God thus eroded your father's livestock and gave it to me. During the breeding season, I suddenly had a vision. I saw that the bucks mounting the sheep were ringed spotted and flecked. An angel called to me in God's name, Jacob. And I replied, Yes, he said, Raise your eyes and you will see that the bucks mounting the sheep are ringed spotted and flecked. Let this be a sign that I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made an oath to me. Now set out and leave this land. Return to the land where you were born. Rachel and Leah both spoke up. Do we then still have a portion and an inheritance in our father's estate? They exclaimed, Why he treats us like strangers? He has sold us and spent the money. All the wealth that God has taken from our father actually belongs to us and our children. Now whatever God has said to you, do it. Jacob began the journey placing his children and wives on the camels. He led away all his livestock and took all the goods he had acquired, including everything that he had bought and paid in Aram. He was heading to see his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Meanwhile, Laban was away shearing his sheep. Rachel stole the fetishes that belonged to her father. Jacob decided to go behind the back of Laban the Aramean and did not tell him that he was leaving. He thus fled with all he owned. He set out and crossed the Euphrates heading in the direction of the Gilead Mountains. On the third day, Laban was informed that Jacob had fled. He took along his kinsmen and pursued Jacob for seven days, intercepting him in the Gilead Mountains. God appeared to Laban the Aramean that night in a dream and said, Be very careful not to say anything good or bad to Jacob. Laban then overtook Jacob. Jacob had set up his tents on a hill while Laban had stationed his kinsmen on Mount Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, How could you do this? You went behind my back and led my daughters away like prisoners of war. Why did you have to leave so secretly? You went behind my back and told me nothing. Why I would have sent you off with celebration and song with drum and lyre. You didn't even let me kiss my grandsons and daughters goodbye. What you did was very foolish. I have it in my power to do you great harm. But your father's God spoke to me last night and said, Be very careful not to say anything good or bad to Jacob. I realized that you left because you missed your parents' home. But why did you have to steal my gods? Jacob spoke up. I left this way because I was afraid. He said, I thought that you might take your daughters away from me by force. If you find your gods with anyone here, let him not live. Let all our close relatives here be witnesses. See if there is anything belonging to you and take it back. Jacob did not realize that Rachel had stolen them. Laban went into the tents of Jacob, Leah, and the two handmaids, but he found nothing when he left Leah's tent. He went into Rachel's. Rachel had taken the fetishes and placed them inside a camel cushion sitting down on them. Laban inspected the entire tent and found nothing. Rachel said to her father, Do not be angry, my lord, but I cannot get up for you. I have my female period. Laban searched, but he did not find the fetishes. Jacob was angry and he argued with Laban, asserting himself, What is my crime? He exclaimed, What terrible thing did I do that you came chasing me like this? You inspected all my things. What did you find from your house? Place it right here, in front of my relatives and yours. Let them determine which of us is right. Twenty years I worked for you. All the time your sheep and goats never lost their young not once did I ever take a ram from your flocks as food I never brought you an animal that had been attacked, I took the blame myself you made me make it good whether it was carried off by day or by night by day I was consumed by the scorching heat and at night by the frost when sleep was snatched from my eyes twenty years now I have worked for you in your estate, fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for some of your flocks you changed my wages ten times. If the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham and the dread of Isaac, had not been with me you would have sent me away empty handed. But God saw my plight and the work of my hands last night you rendered judgment. Laban interrupted Jacob the daughters are my daughters. The sons are my sons. The flocks are my flocks. All that you see is mine. But my daughters what can I do to them today? Or to the children they have born. Now come. Let's make a treaty, you and I let there be a tangible evidence of it between you and me. Jacob took a boulder and raised it as a pillar gathered stones. He said to his relatives they took stones and made a large mound they ate there on top of the mound Laban called it Witness Mound, Yegar Sahadatha, but Jacob named it Gal. This mound shall be a witness between you and me today said Laban that's why it is called Gal. Let the pillar be called Watchpost, Mitzvah, let it. He said that God will keep watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. If you degrade my daughters or marry other women in addition to them, there may be no one with us. But you must always realize that God is a witness between you and me. Laban and said, Here is a mount and here is a pillar that I have set up between us. The mount shall be a witness and the pillar shall be a witness. I am not to go beyond a mount with bad intentions and you are not to go beyond. The mount and pillar may the God of Abraham, the God of Nachar, and the God of their fathers be our judge. Jacob swore by the dread of his father Isaac. He then butchered an animal on the hill and invited his relatives to break bread. They had a meal and spent the night on the hill. Jacob's journey, marriage, and children. Laban got up early the next morning and kissed his grandsons and daughters goodbye. He then blessed them and left to return home. Jacob also continued on his way. He encountered angels of God when Jacob saw them. He said, This is God's camp. He named the place twin camps, Machanaim. Jacob meets Esau. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau to Edom's field in the Syria area. He instructed them to deliver the following message to my lord Esau, your humble servant. Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have delayed my return until now. I have acquired cattle, donkeys, sheep, slaves, and slave girls, and am now sending word to tell. My lord, to gain favor in your eyes, the messengers returned to Jacob with the report. We came to your brother Esau, and he is also heading toward you. He has four hundred men with him. Jacob was very frightened and distressed. He divided the people, accompanying him into two camps, along with the sheep, cattle, and camels. He said, If Esau comes and attacks one camp, at least the other camp will survive. Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, you yourself told me. Return to the land where you were born, and I will make things go well with you. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faith that you have shown me when I left home. I crossed the Jordan with only my staff, and now I have enough for two camps. Rescue me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. From the hand of Esau, I am afraid of him, for he can come and kill us
You must reply it belongs to your servant Jacob it is a tribute to my master Esau Jacob himself is right behind us he gave similar instructions to the second group to the third and to all who went after the herd you must all say the same thing to Esau when you meet him he said you must also say your servant Jacob is right behind us Jacob said to himself I will win him over with the gifts that are being sent ahead and then I will face him hopefully he will forgive me. He sent the gifts ahead of him and spent the night in the camp in the middle of the night he got up and took his two wives his two handmaids and his eleven sons and sent them across the Jabbok river shallows after he had taken them and sent them across he also sent across all his possessions Jacob remained alone a stranger appeared and wrestled with him until just before daybreak when the stranger saw that he could not defeat him he touched the upper joint of Jacob's thigh. Jacob's hip joint became dislocated as he wrestled with the stranger let me leave, said the stranger dawn is breaking I will not let you leave unless you bless me what is your name? Jacob your name will no longer be said to be Jacob but Israel, Mirael, you have become great, sir, before God and man you have won Jacob returned the question if you would he said tell me what your name is why do you ask my name, replied the stranger he then blessed Jacob Jacob named the place divine face, Peniel, he said I have seen the divine face to face and my soul has withstood it the sun rose and was shining on him as he left Penuel he was limping because of his thigh the Israelites therefore do not eat the displaced nerve on the hip joint to this very day this is because the stranger touched Jacob's thigh on the displaced nerve Jacob meets Esau Jacob looked up and saw Esau approaching with four hundred men he divided the children among Lee Rachel and the two handmaids he placed the handmaids and their children in front Leah and their sons behind them and Rachel and Joseph to the rear Jacob then went ahead of them and he prostrated himself seven times as he approached his brother Esau and to meet them he hugged Jacob and throwing himself on his shoulders kissed him they both wept Esau looked up and saw the women and children who are these to you he asked they are the children whom God has been kind enough to grant me reply Jacob the handmaids approached along with their children and the women bowed down Leah and her children also approached and bowed down finally Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed down what did you have to do with that whole camp that came to greet me asked Esau it was to gain favor in your eyes reply Jacob I have plenty my brother said Esau let what is yours remain yours please no said Jacob if I have gained favor with you please accept this gift from me after all seeing your face is like seeing the face of the divine you have received me so favorably please accept my welcoming gift as it has been brought to you God has been kind to me and I have all I need Jacob thus urged him and Esau finally took it let's get going and move on said Esau I will travel alongside you my lord reply Jacob you know that the children are weak and I have responsibility for the nursing sheep and cattle if they are driven hard for even one day all the sheep will die please go ahead of me my lord I will lead my group slowly following the pace of the work that I have ahead of me and the pace of the children I will eventually come to you my lord in Seir let me put some of my people at your disposal said Esau what for reply Jacob just let me remain on friendly terms with you on that day Esau returned along the way to Seir Jacob went to Sukkis there he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock he therefore named the place Sukkis, shelters, arrival in Shechem when Jacob came from Paden Aram and entered the boundaries of Canaan he arrived safely in the vicinity of Shechem he set up camp in view of the city he bought a piece of open land upon which he set up his tent for 100 kezit has from the sons of Chamar chief of Shechem he erected an altar there and named it God is Israel's Lord. El Elohe Israel, the affair of Dinah daughter Dinah whom she had born to Jacob went out to visit some of the local girls she was seen by Shechem son of the chief of the region Chamar the Hivite he seduced her slept with her and then raped her becoming deeply attached to Jacob's daughter Dinah he fell in love with the girl and tried to make up with her Shechem said to his father Chamar get me this young girl as a wife Jacob learned that his daughter Dinah had been. Defiled his sons were in the field with the livestock and Jacob remained silent until they came home meanwhile Shechem's father Chamar came to Jacob to speak with him Jacob's sons returned from the field when they heard what had happened the men were shocked and they seated with anger Shechem had committed an outrage against Israel sleeping with the daughter of Jacob. Such an act could not be tolerated. Chamar tried to reason with them my son Shechem is deeply in love with your daughter he said if you would let him marry her intermarry with us you can give us your daughters and we will give you ours you will be able to live with us and the land will be open before you settle down do business here and the land will become your property Shechem also spoke to Dinah's father and brothers I will do anything to regain your favor I will give you whatever you ask said the bridal. Payment and gifts as high as you like, I will give whatever you demand of me, just let me have the girl as my wife. When Jacob's sons replied to Shechem and his father Chamar, it was with an ulterior motive. After all, they were speaking to the one who had defiled their sister Dinah. We can't do that, they said, giving our sister to an uncircumcised man would be a disgrace to us. The only way we can possibly agree is if you will be like us and circumcise every male only, then will we give you our daughters and take your daughters for ourselves. We will be able to live together with you, and both of us will become a single nation. But if you do not accept our terms and agree to be circumcised, we will take our daughter and go. Their terms seemed fair to Chamar and his son Shechem since he desired Jacob's daughter. The young man lost no time in doing it. He was the most respected person in his father's house. Chamar and his son Shechem came to the city gate and they Spoke to the citizens of their city. These men are friendly toward us. They said they live on the land and support themselves profitably from it. The land has more than ample room for them. We will marry their daughters and give them ours. But it is only if their terms are met that these men will consent to live with us and become one nation. Every male among us must first be circumcised just as they are circumcised. Won't their livestock, their possessions, and all their animals eventually be ours? Just let us agree to their condition and live with them. All the people who came out to the city gate agreed with Chamar and his son Shechem. The males who passed through the city gate all allowed themselves to be circumcised on the third day when the people were in agony. Two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took up their swords. They came to the city without arousing suspicion and killed every male. They also killed Chamar and his son Shechem by the sword and took Dinah. From Shechem's house then they left Jacob's sons came upon the dead and plundered the city that had defiled their sister they took the sheep cattle donkeys and whatever else was in the city and the field they also took the women and all the children as captives they took everything from the houses plundering all the cities while Jacob said to Simeon and Levi you have gotten me in trouble giving me a bad reputation among the Canaanites and Perizzites who live in the land I have. Only a small number of men they can band together and attack me and my family and I will be wiped out should he have been allowed to treat our sister like a prostitute. They replied preparations for Bethel God said to Jacob set out and go up to Bethel remain there and make an altar to me the God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau Jacob said to his family and everyone with him get rid of the idolatrous artifacts that you have purify yourselves. And change your clothes we are setting out and going up to Bethel there I will make an altar to God who answered me in my time of trouble and who has been with me on the journey that I have taken they gave Jacob all the idolatrous artifacts that they had even the rings in their ears Jacob buried them under the terebinth tree near Shechem they began their journey the terror of God was felt in all the cities around them and they did not pursue Jacob's sons Jacob and all the people. With him came to loose in the land of Canaan, that is to Bethel he built an altar there and he named the place Bethel's God, El Bethel, since this was the place where God was revealed to him when he was fleeing from his brother Rebekah's nurse Deborah died and she was buried in the valley of Bethel under the oak it was named Weeping Oak, Alan Bacchot, Bethel now that Jacob had returned from Paden Aram God appeared to him again and blessed him God said to him your name is Jacob but your name will not be only Jacob you will also have Israel as a name God thus named him Israel God said to him I am God Almighty be fruitful and increase a nation and a community of nations will come into existence from you kings will be born from your loins I will grant you the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will also give the land to your descendants who will follow you God went up and left Jacob in the place where he had spoken to him Jacob had set up a pillar in the place that God had spoken to him he now offered a libation
Jacob had twelve sons, the sons of Leo were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, were Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's handmaid, Bilhah, were Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's handmaid, Zilpah, were Gad, and Asher, these are the sons born to Jacob and Paden Aram, Jacob thus came to his father Isaac in Mamre at Kiriath Arba, better known as Hebron, this is where Abraham and Isaac had resided, Isaac lived to be one hundred and eighty years old, he breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people old, and in the fullness of his years his sons Esau and Jacob buried him, Esau's line, these are the chronicles of Esau, also known as Edom, Esau took wives from the daughters of Canaan, these were a, the daughter of Elam the Hittite, and Ohalabama, daughter of Anna, daughter of Sivan the Hivite, he also married Basemath, daughter of Ishmael, and sister of Nebeah, Adab, or Esau, son of Basemath, or Rul Ohalabama. For Yashielam and Korish the above are Esau's sons who were born in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, all the members of his household, his livestock, animals, and all the possessions that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and he moved to another area away from his brother Jacob. This was because they had too much property to be able to live together because of all their livestock. The land where they were staying could not support them. Esau therefore settled in the hill country of Seir. There Esau became the nation of Edom. These are the chronicles of Esau, the ancestor of Edom in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Philip, the son of Esau's wife, Adarul, son of Esau's wife, Basemath, the sons of Elipha's were Taman, Omar, Tifo, Gatham, and Kenaz, Timna became the concubine of Esau's son, Elipha's, and she bore Elipha's son, Amalek. All these are the descendants of Esau's wife, Ada, these are the sons of Rule. Nakhav, Zirak, Shama, and Mizah, these are the descendants of Esau's wife, Basemath, these are the sons of Esau's wife, Ohalabama, daughter of Anna, daughter of Sivan. By Esau, she had Yashielam and Korach, these are the original tribal chiefs among the children of Esau, the sons of Esau's firstborn, Eliphaz, Chief Taman, Chief Omar, Chief Tifo, Chief Kenaz, Chief Korach, Chief Adam, Chief Amalek, these were the tribal chiefs from Eliphaz in the land of Edom, the above were descendants of Ada, these are the tribal chiefs among the children of Esau's son, Rule, Chief Nakhav, Chief Zirak, Chief Shama, Chief Mizah, these are the tribal chiefs from Rule in the land of Edom, the above were descendants of Esau's wife, Basemath, these are the sons of Esau's wife, Ohalabama, Chief Yash, Chief Yalam, Chief Korach, these are the tribal chiefs from Esau's wife, Ohalabama, daughter of Anna, these are the sons of Esau, and these are their tribal chiefs, this is what constitutes Edom. Seir's line, these are the children of Seir the Horite, the original inhabitants of the land. Lot and Chabalt, Sivan, Anadis, Hanitzer, Dishan, these were the tribal chiefs of the Horites among the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lot and Workori and Himam, Lot and sister was Timba, these are the sons of Chabal. Alban, Manachate, Ebel, Shabo, and Onam, these are the children of Sivan. Aya and Anna, Anna was the one who discovered how to breed mules in the desert when he was tending the donkeys for his father, Sivan, these are the children of Anna. Dishan, and Ohalabama, daughter of Anna, these are the sons of Dishan. Kemden, Eshban, Yithran, and Karen, these are the sons of Itzer. Bilhan, Zavan, and Akan, these are the sons of Dishan. Uts and Aaron, these are the tribal chiefs of the Horites. Chief Lot and Chief Shabal, Chief Sivan, Chief Anna, Chief Dishan, Chief Itzer, Chief Dishan, these are tribes of the Horites according to their chiefs in the land of Seer kings of Edom, these are the kings who ruled in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Bela son of Beer became king of Edom, and the name of his capital was Dinhab died, and he was succeeded as king by Yobav son of Zerach from Batsra. Yobav died, and he was succeeded as king by Chesham from the land of the Temanites. Chesham died, and he was succeeded as king by Hadad son of Badad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab. The name of his capital was Abad Hadad died, and he was succeeded as king by Samla of Masrach. Samla died, and he was succeeded as king by Saul from Rekobeth on the river. Rekobeth Hanover. Saul died, and he was succeeded as king by Baalgen and son of Akr. Baalgen and son of Akr died, and he was succeeded as king by Hadur. The name of his capital was Pau. His wife's name was Mahatabal, daughter of Matri, daughter of Mazahab. These are the names of the tribes of Esau according to their families in there. Respective areas named after individuals, the tribe of Timba, the tribe of Alba, the tribe of Yetid, the tribe of Ohalabama, the tribe of Ila, the tribe of Pinyon, the tribe of Kenez, the tribe of Taman, the tribe of Mutzer, the tribe of Magdil, the tribe of Aram, these are the tribes of Esau, each with its own settlements in its hereditary lands. This is how Esau was the ancestor of the Edomites. Joseph is sold. Meanwhile, Jacob settled in the area where his father had lived in the land of Canaan. These are the chronicles of Jacob. Joseph was seventeen years old as a lad. He would tend a sheep with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought his father a bad report about them. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons since he was the child of his old age. He made Joseph a long, colorful coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than all the rest, they began to hate him. They could not say a peaceful word to him and Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Listen to the dream I had. He said to them, We were binding sheep in the field when my sheep suddenly stood up erect. Your sheep formed a circle around my sheep and bowed down to it. Do you want to be our king? Retorted the brothers, Do you intend to rule over us? Because of his dreams and words, they hated him even more. He had another dream and told it to his brothers. I just had another dream. He said, The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me when he told it to his father and brothers. His father scolded him and said, What kind of dream did you have? Do you want me, your mother, and your brothers to come and prostrate ourselves on the ground to you? His brothers became very jealous of him, but his father suspended judgment. Joseph's brothers left to tend their father's sheep in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, I believe your brothers are keeping the sheep in Shechem. I would like you to go to them. I'm ready, replied Joseph. Then see how your brothers and the sheep are doing, said Israel. Bring me a report. Israel thus sent him from the Hebron Valley, and Joseph arrived in Shechem. A stranger found him blundering about in the fields. What are you looking for? Asked the stranger. I'm looking for my brothers, replied Joseph. Perhaps you can tell me where they are tending the sheep. They already left this area, said the man. I heard them planning to go to Dothan. Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. They saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they were plotting to kill him. Here comes the dreamer. They said to one another, Now we have the chance. Let's kill him and throw him into one of the wells. We can say that a wild beast ate him, and let's see what will become of his dreams. Reuben heard these words and tried to rescue Joseph. Let's not kill him. He said Reuben tried to reason with his brothers. Don't commit bloodshed. You can throw him into this well in the desert, and you won't have to lay a hand on him. His plan was to rescue Joseph from his brothers and bring him back to his father. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of the long colorful coat that he was wearing. They took him and threw him into the well. The well was empty. There was no water in it. The brothers sat down and ate a meal. When they looked up, they saw an Arab caravan coming from Gilead. The camels were carrying gum balsam and resin, transporting them to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover his blood? Let's sell him to the Arabs and not harm him with our own hands. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. The strangers who turned out to be Midianite traders approached, and the brothers pulled Joseph out of the well. They sold him to the Arabs for twenty pieces of silver. These Midianite Arabs were to bring Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the well, Joseph was no longer there. Reuben tore his clothes in grief. He returned to his brothers. The boy is gone. He exclaimed, and I, where can I go? The brothers took Joseph's coat. They slaughtered a goat and dipped the coat in the blood. They sent a long, colorful coat, and it was brought to their father. We found this. Explained the brothers when they returned.
Veil thus disguised she sat at the entrance of Twin Wells, he named, on the road to Timna she had seen that Jela had grown and she had not been given to him as a wife to the daughter and because she had covered her face he assumed that she was a prostitute he turned aside to her on the road not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law hello there he said let me come to you what will you give me if you come to me? I will send you a kid from the flock but you must give me something for security until you send it what do you want for security? Your seal your wrap and the staff in your hand she replied he gave them to her and came to her making her pregnant she got up and left taking off her veil and putting her widow's guard back on Judah sent the young kid with his friend the Adolamite in order to get the security back from the woman but his friend could not find her the friend asked the local people where is the religious prostitute? She was near Twin Wells, he named, alongside the road there was no religious prostitute here they replied he returned to Judah and said I could not find a woman the local men said that there was no sacred prostitute there let her keep the security replied Judah we don't want to become a laughing stock I tried to send her the kid but you couldn't find her some three months passed and Judah was told your daughter-in-law has been behaving loosely she has become pregnant. From her looseness take her out and have her burned said Judah when she was being taken out she sent the security to her father-in-law with the message I am pregnant by the man who is the owner of these articles when Judah came to her she said if you would identify these objects who is the owner of the seal this wrap and the staff. Judah immediately recognized them. She is more innocent than I am. He said she did it because I did not give her to my son Jelly. He was not intimate with her anymore. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twins in her womb as she was in labor. One of them put out an arm. The midwife grasped it and tied a crimson thread on it. This one came out first. She announced he pulled his hand back and then his brother came out. You have asserted yourself with such pushiness. Parrots, she said. Judah named the child Parrots. His brother with the crimson thread on his hand was then born. Judah named him Zerach. Joseph's temptation. Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's Egyptian officers, the captain of the guard, had purchased him from the Arabs who had brought him there. God was with Joseph and he made him very successful. Soon he was working in his master's own house. His master realized that God was with Joseph and that God. Granted success to everything he did Joseph gained favor with his master and before long he was appointed as his master's personal servant his master placed him in charge of his household giving him responsibility for everything he owned and as soon as his master had placed him in charge of his household and possessions God blessed the Egyptian because of Joseph God's blessing was in all the Egyptian had both in the house and the field his master left all his affairs in Joseph's hands except for the food he himself ate he did not concern himself with anything Joseph did meanwhile Joseph grew to be well built and handsome in the course of time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph sleep with me she said he adamantly refused he reasoned with his master's wife my master does not even know what I do in the house he has entrusted me with everything he owns no one in this house has more power than I have he has not kept back anything at all from me except for you his wife how could I do such a great wrong it would be a sin before God she spoke to Joseph every day but he would not pay attention to her he would not even lie next to her or spend time with her one such day Joseph came to the house to do his work none of the household staff was inside the woman grabbed him by his cloak sleep with me she pleaded he ran away from her leaving his cloak in her hand and fled outside when she realized that he had left his cloak in her hand and fled outside she called her household servant see she said he brought us a Hebrew man to play games with us he came to rape me but I screamed as loud as I could when he heard me scream and call for help he ran outside and left his cloak with me she kept Joseph's cloak with her until his master came home and she told him the same story the Hebrew slave that you brought us came to play games with me when I screamed and called for help he fled outside leaving his cloak with me when her husband heard his wife's story and her description of the incident he became furious Joseph's master had him arrested and placed him in the dungeon where the king's prisoners were kept he was to remain in that dungeon God was with Joseph and he showed him kindness making him find favor with the warden of the dungeon soon the warden had placed all the prisoners in the dungeon under Joseph's charge Joseph took care of everything that had to be done the warden did not have to look after anything that was under Joseph's care God was with Joseph and God granted him success in everything he did the prisoners dreamed soon after this the Egyptian king's wine steward and baker offended their master who was the king of Egypt Pharaoh was incensed at his two courtiers the chief steward and chief baker and he had them arrested they were placed in the house of the captain of the guard in the same dungeon where Joseph was imprisoned they were under arrest for a long period of time and the captain assigned Joseph to look after them one night the two of them dreamed the Egyptian king steward and baker who were imprisoned in the dungeon each had a dream that seemed to have a special meaning when Joseph came to them in the morning he saw that they were upset he tried to find out what was wrong with Pharaoh's courtiers who were his fellow prisoners in his master's house why do you look so worried today he asked we each had a Dream they replied and there is no one here to interpret it interpretations are God's business replied Joseph if you want to tell me about your dreams the chief steward related his dream to Joseph in my dream he said there was a grapevine right there in front of me the vine had three branches as soon as its buds formed its blossoms bloomed and its clusters ripened into grapes Pharaoh's cup was in my hand I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand Joseph said to him this is the interpretation the three branches are three days in three days Pharaoh will lift your head and give you back your position you will place Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you did before when you were his steward but when things go well for you just remember that I was with you do me a favor and say something about me to Pharaoh perhaps you will be able to get me out of this place I was originally kidnapped from it land of the Hebrews and when I came here I did not do anything to deserve being thrown in the dungeon the chief baker saw that Joseph was able to give a good interpretation he said to Joseph I also saw myself in my dream there were three baskets of fine white bread on my head in the top basket there were all kinds of baked goods that Pharaoh eats but birds were eating it from the basket on my head Joseph replied this is its interpretation the three baskets are three days and three days Pharaoh will lift your head right off your body he will hang you on the gallows and the birds will eat your flesh the third day was Pharaoh's birthday and he made a feast for all his servants among his servants he gave special attention to the chief wine steward and the chief baker he restored the chief steward to his position and allowed him to place the cup in Pharaoh's hand the chief baker however was hanged just as Joseph had predicted the chief steward did not remember Joseph he forgot all about him Joseph's vindication Two full years passed and Pharaoh had a dream he was standing near the Nile when suddenly seven handsome healthy looking cows emerged from the Nile and grazed in the marsh grass and another seven ugly lean cows emerged from the Nile and stood next to the cows already on the river bank the ugly lean cows ate up the seven handsome fat cows Pharaoh then woke up he fell asleep again and had a second dream he saw seven fat good ears of grain growing on a single stalk and suddenly another seven ears of grain grew behind them thin and scorched by the hot east wind the seven thin ears swallowed up the seven fat full ears Pharaoh woke up and realized that it had been a dream in the morning he was very upset he sent word summoning all the simplest and wise men of Egypt Pharaoh told them his dreams but there was no one who could provide a satisfactory interpretation the chief wine steward spoke to Pharaoh I must recall my crimes today he said Pharaoh was angry at us and he placed me under arrest in the house of the captain of the guard along with the chief baker we dreamed one night he and I each had a dream that seemed to have its own special meaning there was a young Hebrew man with us a slave of the captain of the guard we told him our dreams and he interpreted them he provided each of us with an interpretation and things worked out just as he said they would I was given back my position while the baker was hanged Pharaoh sent messengers and had Joseph summoned they rushed him from the dungeon he got a haircut and changed clothes and then came to Pharaoh Pharaoh said to Joseph I had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it I heard that when you hear a dream you can explain it Joseph answered Pharaoh it is not by my own power but God may provide an answer concerning Pharaoh's fortune Pharaoh related it to Joseph in my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile suddenly seven fat Handsome cows emerged from the Nile and grazed in the marsh grass and just
will be so terrible that there will be no way of telling that there was once a surplus in the land. The reason that Pharaoh had the same dream twice is because the process has already been set in motion by God and God is rushing to do it. Now Pharaoh must seek out a man with insight and wisdom and place him in charge of Egypt. Pharaoh must then take further action and appoint officials over the land. A rationing system will have to be set up over Egypt during the seven years of surplus. Let the officials collect all the food during these coming good years and let them store the grain under Pharaoh's control. The food will be kept in the cities under guard. The food can then be held in reserve for the land. When the seven famine years come to Egypt, the land will then not be depopulated by the famine. Pharaoh and all his advisors considered it an excellent plan. Pharaoh said to his advisors, Can there be another person who has God's spirit in him as this man does? Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you about all this, there can be no one with as much insight and wisdom as you. You shall be in charge of my government and food will be distributed to my people by your orders only by the throne will I attract you. Pharaoh then formally declared to Joseph, I am placing you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his ring off his own hand and placed it on the hand of Joseph. He had him dressed in the finest linen garments and placed a gold chain around his neck. He had Joseph ride in his second royal chariot and those going ahead of him announced the viceroy. Joseph was thus given authority over all Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh without your say, no man will lift a hand or foot in all Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphnath Pontiac. He gave him a Senath daughter of Podi for the priest of On as a wife. Joseph thus went out to oversee Egypt when he stood before Pharaoh. Joseph was thirty years old. Joseph left Pharaoh's court and he made an inspection tour of the entire land of Egypt during the seven years of surplus. The land produced loads of grain. Joseph collected the food during the seven years that Egypt was now enjoying and he placed the food in the cities. The food growing in the fields around each city was placed inside the city. Joseph accumulated so much grain it was like the sand of the sea. They had to give up counting it since there was too much to count. Joseph had two sons before the famine years came born to him by a Senath daughter of Podi for a priest of On. Joseph named the first. Born Manasseh, me Nasha, because God has made me forget, Nasha, all my troubles, and even my father's house he named his second son Ephraim, because God has made me fruitful, P.R.I., in the land of my suffering the seven years of surplus that Egypt was enjoying finally came to an end the seven years of famine and began just as Joseph had predicted there was famine in all the other lands but in Egypt there was bread eventually however all of Egypt also began to feel the famine and the people cried out to Pharaoh for bread Pharaoh announced to all Egypt go to Joseph do whatever he tells you the famine spread over the entire area Joseph opened all the storehouses and he rationed supplies to Egypt but the famine was growing worse in Egypt the famine was also growing more severe in the entire area and people from all over the area came to Egypt to obtain rations from Joseph Joseph's vindication Jacob learned that there were provisions in Egypt and he said to his sons why are you fantasizing? I have heard that there are supplies in Egypt. He explained, You can go there and buy food, let us live and not die. Joseph's ten brothers went to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin along with the others. Something might happen to him. He said, Israel's sons came to buy rations along with the others who came because of the famine in Canaan. Joseph was like a dictator over the land since he was the only one who rationed out food for all the people. When Joseph's brothers arrived, they prostrated themselves to him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers as soon as he saw them, but he behaved like a stranger and spoke harshly to them, Where are you from? He asked, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. They replied, Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. He remembered what he had dreamed about them. You are spies. He said to them, You have come to see where the land is exposed to attack. No, my lord, they replied, We are your servants who have come only to buy food. We are all the sons of the same man. We are honorable men. We would never think of being spies. No, retorted Joseph, you have come to see where the land is exposed. We are twelve brothers. They pleaded, We are the sons of one man who is in Canaan right now. The youngest brother is with our father, and one brother is God. I still say that you are spies, replied Joseph. There is only one way that you can convince me by Pharaoh's life. All of you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Let one of you go back and bring your brother. The rest will remain here under arrest. This will test your claim and determine if you are telling the truth. If not by Pharaoh's life, you will be considered spies. Joseph had them placed under arrest for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, If you do as I say, you will live. I fear the God. We will see if you are really being candid. One of you will be held hostage in the same building where you were kept under arrest. The rest can go and bring supplies to your hungry families. Bring your Youngest brother here and your claim will be substantiated and you will not die. They agreed to this but they said to one another we deserve to be punished because of what we did to our brother. We saw him suffering when he pleaded with us but we would not listen. That's why this great misfortune has come upon us. Now Reuben interrupted them. Didn't I tell you not to commit a crime against the boy? He said you wouldn't listen. Now a divine accounting is being demanded for his blood. Meanwhile they did not realize that Joseph was listening since they had spoken to him through a translator. Joseph left them and wept. When he returned he spoke to them sternly again. He had Simeon taken from them and placed in chains before their eyes. Joseph gave orders that when their bags were filled with grain each one's money should also be placed in his sack. They were also to be given provisions for the journey. This was done. The brothers then loaded the food they bought on there. Donkeys and they departed when they came to the place where they spent the night. One of them opened his sack to feed his donkey. He saw his money right there at the top of his pack. My money has been returned. He exclaimed to his brothers, It's in my pack. Their hearts sank. What is this that God has done to us? They asked each other with trembling voices when they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him about all that had happened to them. The man who was the Lord of the land spoke to us harshly. They said, And he charged us with spying on the land. We said to him, We are honorable men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, all of the same father. One of us has been lost, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. The man who was the Lord of the land said to us, I have a way of knowing if you are honorable. Leave one of your brothers with me. Take what you need for your hungry families and go bring your youngest brother back to me, and then I will know that you are honorable men and not spies. I will give your brother back to you, and you will be able to do business in our land. They began emptying their sacks, and each one's money was found to be in his sack. The brothers and their father saw the money bags, and they were afraid. Their father Jacob said to them, You are making me lose my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is happening to me. Reuben tried to reason with his father. If I do not bring Benjamin back to you, he said, You can put my two sons to death. Let him be my responsibility, and I will bring him back to you. My son will not go with you. Replied Jacob, His brother is dead, and he is all I have left. Something may happen to him along the way, and you will bring my white head down to the grave in misery. Joseph's vindication the famine became worse in the area when they had used up all the supplies that they had brought from Egypt. Their father said to them, Go back and get us a little food. Judah tried to reason with him. He said, The man warned us, Do not appear before me unless your brother is with you. If you consent to send our brother with us, we will go and get you food. But if you will not send him, we cannot go. The man told us, Do not appear before me unless your brother is with you. Israel said, Why did you do such a terrible thing to me, telling the man that you had another brother? The brothers replied, The man kept asking about us and our family. He asked, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How were we to know that he would demand that we bring our brother there? Send a boy with me, said Judah to his father Israel. Let us set out and get going. Let's live and not die. We, you and also our children, I myself will be responsible for him. You can demand him from my own hand. If I do not bring him back and have him stand before you, I will have sinned for all time. But if we had not waited so long, we could have been there and back twice by now. Their father Israel said to them, If that's the way it must be, this is what you must do. Take some of the land's famous products in your baggage, a little balsam, a little honey, and some gum resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take along twice as much money so that you will be able to return the
Everything is fine as far as you are concerned, replied the overseer. Don't be afraid, the God you and your father worship must have placed a hidden gift in your packs. I received the money you paid with that he brought Simeon out to them. The men brought the brothers into Joseph's palace. He gave them water so they could wash their feet and had fodder given to their donkeys. They got their gifts ready for when Joseph would come at noon since they heard that they would be eating with him. When Joseph arrived home, they presented him with the gifts they had brought. They prostrate themselves on the ground to him. He inquired as to their welfare. Is your old father at peace? He asked, Remember, you told me about him. Is he still alive? Your servant, our father, is at peace. They replied, He is still alive. They bowed their heads and prostrate themselves. Joseph looked up and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. He said, This must be your youngest brother about whom you told me to Benjamin. He said, God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph rushed out. His emotions had been aroused by his brother and he had to weep. He went to a room and there he wept. He washed his face and came out holding in his emotions. He said, Serve the meal. Joseph was served by himself and the brothers by themselves. The Egyptians who were eating with them were also segregated. The Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews since this was taboo to the Egyptians. When the brothers were seated before Joseph, they were placed in order of age from the oldest to the youngest. The brothers looked at each other in amazement. Joseph sent them portions from his table, giving Benjamin five times as much as the rest they drank. With him and became intoxicated. Joseph's vindication. Joseph gave his overseer special instructions. Fill the men's packs with as much food as they can carry. He said, Place each man's money at the top of his pack in my chalice, the silver chalice. Place it on top of the youngest one's pack, along with the money for his food. The overseer did exactly as Joseph instructed him. With the first morning light, the brothers took their donkeys and were sent on their way. They had just left the city and had not gone far when Joseph said to his overseer, Set out and pursue those men. Catch up with them and say to them, Why did you repay good with evil? It's the cup from which my master drinks and he uses it for divination. You did a terrible thing. The overseer caught up with them and repeated exactly those words to them. They said to him, Why do you say such things? Heaven forbid that we should do such a thing. After all, we brought you back the money we found at the top of our packs, all the way from Canaan. How could we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of us has it in his possession, he shall die. You can take the rest of us for slaves. It should be as you declare, he replied. But only the one with whom it is found will be my slave. The rest will be able to go free. Each one quickly lowered his pack to the ground, and they all opened their packs. The overseer inspected each one, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. The chalice was found in Benjamin's pack. The brothers tore their clothes in grief. Each one reloaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's palace, he was still there. They threw themselves on the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What did you think you were doing? Don't you realize that a person like me can determine the truth by divination? What can we say to my lord? Replied Judah, How can we speak? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered our old guild, let us be your slaves. We and the one in whose possession the chalice was found, heaven forbid that I do that, said Joseph. The one in whose possession the chalice was found shall be my slave, the rest of you can go in peace to your father. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Judah walked up to Joseph and said, Please, your highness, let me say something to you personally. Do not be angry with me, even though you are just like Pharaoh, you asked. If we still had a father or another brother, we told you, We have a father who is very old, and the youngest brother is a child of his old age. He had a brother who died, and thus he is the only one of his mother's children still alive. His father loves him. You said to us, Bring him to me so that I may set my eyes on him. We told you, The lad cannot leave his father. If he left him, his father would die. You replied, If your youngest brother does not come with you, you shall not see my face again we went to your servant our father and told him what you said when our father told us to go back and get some food we replied we cannot go we can go only if our youngest brother is with us if he is not with us we cannot even see the man in charge your servant our father said you know that my wife Rachel bore me two sons one has already left me and I assume that he was torn to pieces by wild animals I have seen nothing of him until now now you want to take this one from me too if something were to happen to him you will have brought my white head down to the grave in evil misery and now when I come to your servant our father the lad will not be with us his soul is bound up with the lad's soul when he sees that the lad is not there he will die I will have brought your servant our father's white head down to the grave in misery besides I offered myself to my father as a guarantee for the lad and I said if I do not bring him back to you I will have sent to my father for all time so now let me remain as your slave in place of the lad let the lad go back with his brothers for how can I go back to my father if the lad is not with me I cannot bear to see the evil misery that my father would suffer Joseph reveals himself to his brothers Joseph could not hold in his emotions since all his attendants were present he cried out have everyone leave my presence thus no one else was with him when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers he began to weep with such loud sobs that the Egyptians could hear if the news of these strange happenings reached Pharaoh's palace Joseph said to his brothers I am Joseph is my father still alive his brothers were so startled they could not respond please come close to me said Joseph to his brothers when they came closer he said I am Joseph your brother you sold me to Egypt now don't worry or feel guilty because you sold me look God has sent me ahead of you to save lives there has been a famine in the area for two years and for another five years there will be no plowing or harvest God has sent me ahead of you to ensure that you survive in the land and to keep you alive through such extraordinary means now it is not you who sent me here but God he has made me Pharaoh's vizier director of his entire government and dictator of all Egypt hurry go back to my father and give him the message your son Joseph says God has made me master of all Egypt come to me without delay you will be able to settle in the Goshen district and be close to me you your children your grandchildren your sheep your cattle and all that you own I will fully provide for you there since there will still be another five years of famine I do not want you to become destitute along with your family and all that is yours you and my brother Benjamin can see with your own eyes that I myself am speaking to you tell father all about my high position in Egypt and about all that you saw you must hurry and bring father here with that Joseph fell on the shoulders of his brother Benjamin and he wept Benjamin also wept on Joseph's shoulders Joseph and kissed all his brothers and wept on their shoulders after that his brothers conversed with him news spread to Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had shown up Pharaoh and his advisors were pleased Pharaoh told Joseph to instruct his brothers this is what you must do load your beast and go directly to Canaan bring your father and your families and come to me I will give you the best land in Egypt you will eat the fat of the land now you are instructed to do the following take wagons from Egypt for your small children and wives and also use them for your father come and do not be concerned with your belongings for the best of Egypt will be yours Israel's sons agreed to do this Joseph gave them wagons according to Pharaoh's instructions and he also Provided them with food for the journey, he gave each of his brothers an outfit of clothes to Benjamin. However, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five outfits. Joseph sent the following to his father 10 male donkeys loaded with Egypt's finest products, as well as 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father's journey. He sent his brothers on their way as they were leaving. He said to them, Have a pleasant journey. The brothers headed north from Egypt and they came to their father Jacob in Canaan. They broke the news to him. Joseph is still alive. He is the ruler of all Egypt. Jacob's heart became numb for he could not believe them. It's too much, said Israel. My son Joseph is alive. I must go and see him before I die. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Israel began the journey, taking all his possessions, and he arrived in Beersheba. He offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in a night vision and said, Jacob, Jacob. Yes, replied Jacob, God said, I am the omnipotent God of your father. Do not be afraid to go to Egypt, for it is there that I will make you into a great nation. I will go to Egypt with you, and I will also bring you back again. Joseph will place his hands on your eyes. Jacob set out from Beersheba. Israel's sons transported their father along with their children and wives on the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their livestock and all the possessions that they had acquired in
Asher's sons, Yimna Yishva Yishvi and Beria, there was also their sister Sarich, the sons of Beria, were Shepher and Machiel Bibar from the sons of Zilpah Laban gave her to his daughter Leah, and she bore these sons to Jacob. Here there are sixteen, and all the sons of Jacob's wife Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin in Egypt. Joseph had sons born to him by Senat, daughter of Podi for a priest of On, Manasseh and Ephraim, Benjamin's sons, Bela Becker, Ashbel, Garanam, and Eshirash Mutham. Shutham and Arthi Bibar from the sons that Rachel bore to Jacob. There are fourteen, and all Dan's sons, Shushim, Naphtali's sons, Yatza El Gadi and Shalom Bibar from the sons of Bilhal Laban gave her to his daughter Rachel, and she bore these sons to Jacob. Here there are seven, and all thus the number of people who came to Egypt with Jacob who were his blood descendants was sixty-six, not counting the wives of Jacob's sons. Joseph's sons born to him in Egypt added another. Two individuals adding it all up the number of individuals in Jacob's family who came to Egypt was seventy. Jacob arrives in Egypt. Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to make preparations in Goshen. They then arrived in the Goshen district. Joseph personally harnessed his chariot and he went to greet his father Israel in Goshen. He presented himself to his father and threw himself on his shoulders, weeping on his shoulders for a long time. Now I can die, said Israel to Joseph. I have seen your face and you are still alive. To his brothers and his father's family, Joseph said, I will go and tell Pharaoh. I will say the following to him: My brothers and my father's family have come to me from Canaan. These men deal in livestock and are tenders of sheep. They have brought along their sheep, their cattle, and all their possessions. When Pharaoh summons you and inquires as to your occupation, you must say, We and our fathers have dealt in livestock all our lives. You will then. Be able to settle in the Goshen district since all shepherds are taboo in Egypt. Jacob arrives in Egypt. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, he said, My father and brothers have come from Canaan along with their sheep, their cattle, and all their belongings. They are now in the Goshen district. From among his brothers, he selected five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked Joseph's brothers, What is your occupation? We are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh. We and our fathers before us, we have come to stay a while in your land. They explained to Pharaoh, Because there is no grazing for our flocks, so severe is the famine in Canaan. If you allow us, we will settle in the Goshen district. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and brothers have now come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and brothers in the best area. Let them settle in the Goshen district if you have. Capable men among them, you can appoint them as livestock officers over my cattle. Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. How old are you? Asked Pharaoh of Jacob. My journey through life has lasted 130 years. Replied Jacob. The days of my life have been few and hard. I did not live as long as my fathers did during their pilgrimage through life. With that, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and left his presence. Joseph found a place for his father and brothers to live. He gave them an estate in the Rameses region in the best area as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided all the needs of his father, his brothers, and all his father's family down to the very youngest. There was no bread in the entire area since the famine was very severe. The people of Egypt and Canaan became weak with hunger. Joseph collected all the money in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the food the people were buying. Joseph brought all the money to Pharaoh's treasury. When the money in Egypt and Canaan was used up, Egyptians from all over came to Joseph. Give us bread. They cried, Why should we die before you just because there is no money? Bring your livestock, replied Joseph. If there is no more money, I will give you what you need in exchange for your animals. They brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and donkeys. He saw them through that year with bread in exchange for all their livestock. The year came to an end. They came to him the next year and said, We are not holding anything back from you, your highness, but since the money and animal stocks are used up, there is nothing left for you besides our dried up bodies and our land. Why should we die before your very eyes, us and our land? By our bodies and our land in exchange for bread, let us become Pharaoh's serfs and let our land also be as give us seed grain. Let us live and not die. Let the land not become desolate. Joseph thus bought up all the farmland in Egypt for Pharaoh. Every man in Egypt had sold his field for the famine was too much for them and the land became Pharaoh's property. Joseph moved the people to the cities in all Egypt's borders from one end to the other. The only land he did not buy up was that of the priests since the priests had a food allotment from Pharaoh. They ate the food allotment that Pharaoh gave them and did not have to sell. Their lands Joseph announced to the people today I have purchased your bodies and your lands for Pharaoh here is seed grain for you plant your fields when it produces grain you will have to give a fifth to Pharaoh the other four parts will be yours as seed grain for your fields and as food for you your wives and your children you have saved our lives they responded just let us find favor in your eyes and we will be Pharaoh's serfs Joseph set down a decree that is in force until today that one fifth of whatever grows on the farmland of Egypt belonged to Pharaoh only the priestly lands did not belong to Pharaoh meanwhile the fledgling nation of Israel lived in Egypt in the Goshen district they acquired property there and were fertile with their population increasing very rapidly Jacob's last days Jacob made Egypt his home for 17 years he lived to be 147 years old when Israel realized that he would soon die he called for his son Joseph if you Really want to do me a kindness, he said. Place your hand under my thigh, act toward me with truth and kindness, and do not bury me in Egypt. Let me lie with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their grave. I will do as you say, replied Joseph. Swear to me, said Jacob. Joseph made an oath to him, and from where he was on the bed, Israel bowed Jacob's last days. A short time after this, Joseph was told that his father was sick. Joseph went to his father, taking his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told that Joseph was coming to him, Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty once appeared to me and loose in the land of Canaan. He blessed me and said to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous, and have you give rise to an assembly of nations. I will give this land to you and your descendants as their property forever. Now the two sons who were born to you in Egypt before I came here. Shall be considered as mine Ephraim and Manasseh shall be just like Reuben and Simeon to me. Any children that you have after them, however, shall be considered yours. They shall inherit only through their older brothers. When I was coming from Paden, your mother Rachel died on me and was in Canaan a short distance before we came to Ephraim. I buried her there along the road to Ephraim. Bethlehem, Israel saw Joseph's sons who are these. He asked, They are the sons that God gave me. He replied, Joseph to his father, If you would bring them to me, said Jacob, I will give them a blessing. Israel's eyes were heavy with age, and he could not see when Joseph brought his sons near him. Israel kissed them and hugged them. I never even hoped to see your face, said Israel to Joseph. But now God has even let me see your children. Joseph took the boys from near his father's lap and he bowed down to the ground. Joseph then took the two boys he placed Ephraim to his right, to Israel's left, and Manasseh to his left, to Israel's right. He then came close to his father. Israel reached out with his right hand and placed it on Ephraim's head. Even though he was the younger son, he placed his left hand on Manasseh's head. He deliberately crossed his hands. Even though Manasseh was the firstborn, Jacob gave Joseph a blessing. He said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked is the God who has been my shepherd from as far back as I can. Remember until this day, sending an angel to deliver me from all evil. May he bless the lads and let them carry my name along with the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. May they increase in the land like fish. When Joseph saw that his father had placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. He tried to lift his father's hand from Ephraim's head and place it on Manasseh's. That's not the way it should be done, father said Joseph. The other one is the firstborn place. Your right hand on his head. His father refused and said, I know my son, I know the older one will also become a nation. He too will attain greatness, but his younger brother will become even greater and his descendants will become full fleshed nations. On that day, Jacob blessed them. He said, In time to come, Israel will use you as a blessing. They will say, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. He deliberately put Ephraim before Manasseh. Israel said to Joseph, I am dying.
Issachar is a strong-boned donkey stretching out between the saddlebags but he sees that the resting place is good and that the land is pleasant so he will bend his back to the load working like a slave Dan Dan shall fight for, Dan, his people like any one of the tribes of Israel let Dan be a snake on the road a viper on the path biting the horse's heel so the rider falls backward I pray that God will help you Dan raiders, Gad, shall raid Gad but he will raid it there. He'll Asher from Asher shall come the richest foods he shall provide the king's delights Naphtali Naphtali is a deer running free he delivers words of beauty Joseph Joseph is a fruitful son like a fruitful vine by the fountain with branches running over the wall people made his life bitter and attacked him masters of strife made him their target but his resolution remained firm and his arms were eventually bedecked with gold this was from Jacob's champion and from then on he became the shepherd the builder of Israel this was from your father's God who will still help you and from the Almighty who will bless you yours will be the blessings of heaven above the blessing of the water lying beneath the blessing of breast and womb may your father's blessing add to the blessing of my parents lasting as long as the eternal hills may they be for Joseph's head for the brow of the elect of his brothers Benjamin conclusion Benjamin is a vicious wolf he eats a portion in the morning and divides his prey in the evening all these are the tribes of Israel twelve in all and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them he gave each one his own special blessing Jacob and gave his sons his final instructions I am going to join my people in death he said bring me to my fathers to be buried in the cave in the field of Ephraim the Hittite this is the cave in Machpelah field bordering Mamre in the land of Hain and Abraham bought it along with the field from Ephraim the Hittite as burial property. This is where Abraham and his wife Sarah are buried. This is where Isaac and his wife Rebekah are buried. And this is where I buried Leah the purchase of the field and its cave from the children of Hades. Still recognized Jacob thus concluded his instructions to his sons. He drew his feet back onto the bed, breathed his last, and was brought back to his people. Benjamin conclusion Joseph fell on his father's face. He went there and kissed his father Joseph and ordered his servants the physicians to embalm his father. The physicians thus embalmed Israel. It took forty days since that was the time required for embalming Egypt. Mourned Jacob for seventy days when the period of mourning of Jacob was over. Joseph addressed Pharaoh's court and said, If you would do me a favor, give the following personal message to Pharaoh. My father bound me by an oath and he declared, I am. Dying, you must bury me in the grave that I prepared for myself in the land of Canaan. Now, if you allow me, I will head north and bury my father. I will return. Go bury your father, said Pharaoh, just as he had you swear. Joseph headed north to bury his father, and with him went all of Pharaoh's courtiers, who were his palace elders, as well as all the other elders of Egypt, all of Joseph's household, his brothers, and his father's family. Also went all they left behind in Goshen were their small children, their sheep, and their cattle. A chariot brigade and horsemen also went with them. It was a very imposing retinue. They came to Bramble Barn, Thorin Hyatt, on the bank of the Jordan, and there they conducted a great imposing funeral. Joseph observed a seven-day mourning period for his father. When the Canaanites living in the area saw the morning in Bramble Barn, they said, "Egypt is indeed mourning here. The place on the bank of the Jordan was therefore called Egypt." Morning, Abel Mitzrayim, Jacob's sons did as he had instructed them. His sons carried him to Canaan and they buried him in the cave of Machpelah field bordering Mamre. This is the field that Abraham bought for burial property from Ephraim the Hittite. After he buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt along with his brothers and all those who went with him to his father's burial. Joseph's brothers began to realize the implications of their father's death. What if Joseph is still holding a grudge against us? They said he is likely to pay us back for all the evil we did him. They instructed messengers to tell Joseph, Before he died, your father gave us final instructions. He said, This is what you must say to Joseph. Forgive the spiteful deed and the sin your brothers committed when they did evil to you. Now forgive the spiteful deed that we, the servants of your father's God, have done as the messengers spoke to him. Joseph left his brothers and came and threw themselves at his feet here. They said, We are your slaves. Don't be afraid, said Joseph to them. Shall I then take God's place? You might have meant to do me harm, but God made it come out good. He made it come out as it actually did where the life of a great nation has been preserved. Now don't worry, I will fully provide for you and your children. He thus comforted them and tried to make up. Joseph remained in Egypt along with his father's family. He lived to be 110 years old. Joseph saw Ephraim's grandchildren and the children of Manasseh's son Machir were also born on Joseph's lap. Joseph said to his close family, I am dying. God is sure to grant you special providence and bring you out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph then bound the Israelites by an oath. When God grants you this special providence, you must bring my remains out of this place. Joseph died at the age of 110 years. He was embalmed and placed in a sarcophagus in Egypt. Israel's growth. These are the names of Israel's sons who came to Egypt with Jacob each with his family, Reuben. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, the original number of Jacob's direct descendants, including Joseph, who was in Egypt, was seventy. Joseph, his brothers, and everyone else in that generation died. The Israelites were fertile and prolific, and their population increased. They became so numerous that the land was filled with them. The new order, a new king who did not know of Joseph, came into power over Egypt. He announced to his people that Israelites are becoming too numerous and strong for us. We must deal wisely with them, otherwise, they may increase so much that if there is war, they will join our enemies and fight against us, driving us from the land. The Egyptians appointed conscription officers over the Israelites to crush their spirits with hard labor. The Israelites were to build up the cities of Pithom and Aramses as supply centers for Pharaoh, but the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites proliferated and spread the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites the Egyptians started to make the Israelites do labor designated to break their bodies they made the lives of the Israelites miserable with harsh labor involving mortar and bricks as well as all kinds of work in the field all the work they made them do was intended to break them the king of Egypt spoke to the chief Hebrew midwives whose names were Shifra and Puah he said when you deliver Hebrew women you must look carefully at the birth stool if the infant is a boy kill it but if it is a girl let it lie the midwives feared God and did not do as the Egyptian king had ordered them they allowed the infant boys to live the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and demanded why did you do this you let the infant boys live the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptians, replied the midwives to Pharaoh. They know how to deliver, they can give birth before a midwife even gets to them. God was good to the midwives, and the people increased and became very numerous because the midwives feared God. He gave them great families of their own. Pharaoh then gave orders to all his people Every boy who is born must be cast into the Nile, but every girl shall be allowed to live. Moses, a man of the house of Levi, went and married Levi's daughter. The woman became pregnant and had a son. She realized how extraordinary the child was, and she kept him hidden for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took a papyrus box coating it with asphalt and pitch, and she placed the child in it. She placed it in the rushes near the bank of the Nile. The child's sister stood herself at a distance to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe in the Nile while her maids walked along it. Niles as she saw the box in the rushes and sent her slave girl to fetch it opening the box she saw the boy the infant began to cry and she had pity on it it is one of the Hebrew boys she said the infant's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter shall I go and call a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you go replied Pharaoh's daughter the young girl went and got the child's own mother take this child and nurse it said Pharaoh's daughter to the mother I will pay you a fee the woman took the child and nursed it when the child matured his mother brought him to Pharaoh's daughter she adopted him as her own son and named him Moses Moshe Ibor Mashi him from the water she said when Moses was grown he began to go out to his own people and he saw their hard labor one day he saw an Egyptian killed one of his fellow Hebrews. Moses looked all around, and when he saw that no one was watching, he killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Moses went out the next day, and he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating your brother? He demanded of the one who was in the wrong, who made you our prince and judge. Retorted the other, Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian?
Covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God saw the Israelites, and he was about to show concern the burning bush. Moses tended the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro, sheep of Midian. He led the flock to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain in the Horeberry. God's angel appeared to Moses in the heart of a fire in the middle of the burnt bush. As he looked, Moses realized that the bush was on fire but was not being consumed. Moses said to himself, I must go over there and investigate this wonderful phenomenon. Why doesn't the bush burn? When God saw that Moses was going to investigate, he called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. He said, Yes, replied Moses, do not come any closer, said God, take your shoes off your feet, the place upon which you are standing is holy ground. God then said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Moses hid his face since he was afraid to look at the divine God, said, I have indeed seen the suffering of my people in Egypt. I have heard how they cry out because of what their slave drivers do, and I am aware of their pain. I have come down to rescue them from Egypt's power. I will bring them out of that land to a good spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Yebusites. Right now the cry of the Israelites is coming to me. I also see the pressure to which Egypt is subjecting them. Now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Said Moses to God, and how can I possibly get the Israelites out of Egypt? Because I will be with you, replied God, proof that I have sent you will come when you get the people out of Egypt, all of you will then become God's servants on this mountain. Moses said to God, So I will go to the Israelites and say, Your fathers God sent me to you, they will immediately ask me what his name is, what shall I say to them? I will be who I will be, replied God to Moses. God then explained, This is what you must say to the Israelites. I will be sent me to you. God then said to Moses, You must then say to the Israelites, Why HVH the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent me to you. This is my eternal name, and this is how I am to be recalled for all generations. Go gather the elders of Israel and say to them, Why HVH the God of your fathers appeared to me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said, I have granted you special providence regarding what is happening to you in Egypt. I declare that I will bring you out of the wretchedness of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Zitzivites, and Yebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will take what you say seriously. You and the elders of Israel will then go to the king of Egypt. You must tell him why HVH God of the Hebrews revealed himself to us. Now we request that you allow us to take a three-day journey into the desert to sacrifice to YHVH our God. I know in advance that the Egyptian king will not allow you to leave unless he is forced to do so. I will then display my power and demolish Egypt through all the miraculous deeds that I will perform in their land. And Pharaoh will let you leave. I will give the people status among the Egyptians. And when you all finally leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman shall borrow articles of silver and gold as well as clothing from her neighbor or from the woman living with her. You shall load this on your sons and daughters, and you will thus drain Egypt of its wealth. The burning bush. When Moses was able to reply, he said, "But they will not believe me. They will not listen to me. They will say, God did not appear to you. What is that in your hand? Ask God a staff. Throw it on the ground. When Moses threw it on the ground, it turned into a snake, and Moses ran away from it. God said to Moses, reach out and grasp its tail. When Moses reached out and grasped the snake, it turned back into a staff in his hand. This is so that they will believe that God appeared to you. He said, The God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God then said to Moses, Place your hand on your chest inside your robe. When Moses placed his hand in his robe and removed it from his chest, it was leprous as white as snow. Place your hand in your robe again, said God. Moses placed his hand back into his robe, and when he removed it from his chest, his skin had returned to normal. If they do not believe you, said God, and they do not pay attention to the first miraculous sign, and they will believe the evidence of the second sign. And if they also do not believe these two signs and still do not take you seriously, then you shall take some water from the Nile and spill it on the ground. The water that you will take from the Nile will turn into blood on it. Ground Moses pleaded with God, I beg you, O God, I am not a man of words, not yesterday, not the day before, not from the very first time you spoke to me, I find it difficult to speak and find the right language who gave man a mouth, replied God who makes a person dumb or deaf, who gives a person sight or makes him blind. Is it not I, God? Now go. I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say, I beg you, O Lord, exclaimed Moses, please. Send someone more appropriate. God displayed anger toward Moses, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? He said, I know that he knows how to speak. He is setting out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad you will be able to speak to him and place the words in his mouth. I will then be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you. He will be your spokesman, and you will be his guide. Take the staff in your hand with it. You will perform the miracles. Moses leads Midian. Moses left and returned to his father in law, Jethro. He said, I would like to leave and return to my people in Egypt to see if they are still alive. Go in peace, said Jethro to Moses. While Moses was still in Midian, God said to him, Go return to Egypt. All the men who seek your life have died. Moses took his wife and sons and putting them on the donkey, set out to return to Egypt. He also took the divine staff in his hand. God said to Moses, On your way back to Egypt, keep in mind all the wondrous powers that I have placed in your hand. You will use them before Pharaoh, but I will make him. Obstinate and he will not allow the people to leave you must say to Pharaoh this is what God says, Israel is my son my firstborn I have told you to let my son go and serve me if you refuse to let him leave I will ultimately kill your own firstborn son when they were in the place where they spent the night along the way God confronted Moses and wanted to kill him Tiparah took a stone knife and cut off her son's foreskin throwing it down at Moses' feet as far as I am concerned. You are married to blood she said to the child God then spared Moses you were married to blood because of circumcision she said first confrontation with Pharaoh God said to Aaron go meet Moses in the desert Aaron went and when he met Moses near God's mountain he kissed him Moses described to Aaron everything that God had told him about his mission as well as the miraculous proofs that he had instructed him to display Moses and Aaron went to Egypt and they gathered all. The elders of Israel Aaron related all the words that God had told Moses and he demonstrated the miraculous proofs before the people. The people believed they accepted the message that God had granted special providence to the Israelites and that he had seen their misery. They bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. First confrontation with Pharaoh Moses and Aaron then went to Pharaoh and said, This is what YHVH God of the Hebrews declares, let my people leave so they can sacrifice to me in the desert. Pharaoh replied, Who is YHVH that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not recognize YHVH nor will I let Israel leave. The God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us, said Moses and Aaron. Please allow us to take a three-day journey into the desert and let us sacrifice to YHVH our God, otherwise he may strike us down with the plague or the sword. The Egyptian king said to the Moses and Aaron, Why are you distracting the people from their work? Get back to your own business. The peasants are becoming more numerous, said Pharaoh, and you want them to take a vacation from their work. That day Pharaoh gave new orders to the people's administrators and foremen. He said, Do not give the people straw for bricks as before. Let them go and gather their own straw. Meanwhile, you must require them to make the same quota of bricks as before. Do not reduce it. They are lazy and are protesting that they want to go sacrifice to their God. Make the work heavier for the men and make sure they do it. Then they will stop paying attention to false ideas. The administrators and foremen went out and told the people. Pharaoh has said that he will no longer give you straw. You must go and get your own straw wherever you can find it. Meanwhile, you may not reduce the amount of work you must complete. The people spread out all over Egypt to gather grain stocks for straw. The administrators pressured them and said, You must complete your daily work quota just as before when there was straw. The Israelite foremen whom Pharaoh's administrators had appointed were flogged. They were told. Yesterday and today you did not complete your quotas. Why didn't you make as many bricks as before? The Israelite foreman came and protested to Pharao
them to know me by my name YHVH I also made my covenant with them promising to give them the land of Canaan and the land of their pilgrimage where they lived as foreigners I have also heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are holding as slaves and I have remembered my covenant therefore say to the Israelites in my name I am God I will take you away from your forced labor in Egypt and free you from their slavery I will liberate you with a demonstration of my power and with great acts of judgment I will take you to myself as a nation and I will be to you as a God you will know that I am God your Lord the one who is bringing you out from under the Egyptian subjugation I will bring you to the land regarding which I raised my hand swearing that I would give it to Abraham Isaac and Jacob I will give it to you as an inheritance I am God Moses related this to the Israelites but because of their disappointment and hard work they would no longer listen to him Moses demurs God spoke to Moses saying go speak to Pharaoh king of Egypt and he will let the Israelites leave his land Moses spoke interrupting the revelation even the Israelites will not listen to me he said how can I expect Pharaoh to listen to me I have no self-confidence when I speak Aaron is included God then spoke to both Moses and Aaron he gave them instructions regarding the Israelites and Pharaoh king of Egypt so they would be able to get the Israelites out of Egypt genealogy these are the heads of their extended families the sons of Israel's firstborn Reuben Enoch Hanok Halachetzrin and Carmi these are the families of Reuben the sons of Simeon Yemuel Yemen Ahadiakin and Zokar as well as Saul son of it Canaanite women these are the families of Simeon according to their family records these are the names of Levi's sons Gershon Kahat and Merari Levi lived to be 137 years old the families descending from Gershon Libni and Shimei the sons of Kahat Amram Yitzar Hebron Shevron and Uziel Kahat lived to be 133 years old the sons of Merari Makli and Mushi according to their family records the above are the families of Levi Amram married his aunt Yikaved and she bore him Aaron and Moses Amram lived to be 137 years old the sons of Yitzar Korach Nefeh and Zikri the sons of Uziel Misal El Tzavan and Sidri Aaron married Nachon sister Elishi the daughter of Ammonadab she bore him Nadab Abu Eliezer and Itamar the sons of Korach Asir Elkanah and Abiasaf these are the families of the Korach Yitzar and son Eliezer married one of the daughters of Kutail and she bore him Pinches the above are the heads of the Levite clans according to their families. This then is the lineage of Moses and Aaron to whom God said, Bring the Israelites out of Egypt and Massa. They are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh king of Egypt in order to get the Israelites out of Egypt. It involved both Moses and Aaron still on that day in Egypt. God spoke only to Moses. Second Demerol God spoke to Moses and said, I am God related to Pharaoh king of Egypt. All that I am saying to you, interrupting the revelation, Moses said, I do not have the self-confidence to speak. How will Pharaoh ever pay attention to me? Moses told what to expect. God said to Moses, Observe. I will be making you like a god to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You must announce all that I order you to, and your brother Aaron will relate it to Pharaoh. He will then let the Israelites leave his land. I will make Pharaoh obstinate and will thus have the opportunity to display many miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt. This is why Pharaoh will not pay attention to you, but then I will display my power against Egypt, and with great acts of judgment I will bring forth. From Egypt, my armies, my people, the Israelites, when I display my power and bring the Israelites out from among them, Egypt will know that I am God. Moses and Aaron did this, they did exactly as God had instructed them when they spoke to Pharaoh. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old. The staff becomes a serpent. God said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh speaks to you, he will tell you to prove yourself with a miraculous sign. You, Moses, must then tell Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, let it become a viper. Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, they did exactly as God had said. Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh, and it became a viper. Pharaoh summoned his scholars and magicians, the master symbolists, who were able to do the same thing with their magic tricks. When each one threw down his staff, the staffs all turned into vipers. Aaron's staff then swallowed up their staffs, but Pharaoh remained obstinate and did not pay attention to them, just as God had predicted warnings for the first plague. God said to Moses, Pharaoh is obstinate and he refuses to let the people leave. Pay a call on Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water stand where you will meet him on the bank of the Nile. Take in your hand the staff that was transformed into a snake. Say to him, God, Lord of the Hebrews, has sent me to you with the message. Let my people leave and let them worship me in the desert. So far you have not paid attention. God now says through this you will know that I am God. I will strike the water of the Nile with the staff in my hand and the water will turn into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will become future. The Egyptians will have to stop drinking water from the Nile blood. The first plague God said to Moses, tell Aaron to take his staff and extend his hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, their reservoirs and every place where water is kept. And the water shall turn into blood. There will be blood. Throughout all Egypt, even in wooden barrels and stone jars, Moses and Aaron did exactly as God had instructed. Aaron held the staff up and then struck the Nile's water in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials. The Nile's water was transformed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river became so polluted that the Egyptians were no longer able to drink the Nile's water. There was blood everywhere in Egypt. However, when the master symbolists of Egypt were able to produce the same effect with their hidden arts, Pharaoh became obstinate. He would not pay attention to Moses and Aaron, just as God had predicted. Pharaoh turned his back to them and went to his palace. Even to this miracle, he would not pay attention. The Egyptians dug around the Nile for drinking water, since they could not drink any water from the river after God struck the Nile. It remained that way for seven full days. Frogs. The second plague, God said to Moses, "Go to Pharaoh and say to him in." My name, let my people leave so they can serve me. If you refuse to let them leave, I will strike all your territories with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs, and when they emerge, they will be in your palace, in your bedroom, and even in your bed. They will also be in the homes of your officials and people, even in your ovens and kneading bowls. When the frogs emerge, they will be all over you, your people, and your officials' frogs. The second plague, God said to Moses, Tell Aaron to point the staff in his hand at the rivers, canals, and reservoirs, and he will make frogs emerge upon Egypt. Aaron held his hand out over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs emerged, covering Egypt. The master symbolists were able to produce the same effect with their hidden arts, making frogs emerge on Egyptian land. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to God. Let him get the frogs away from me and my people. I will let the people leave and sacrifice to God. Try and test me, replied Moses. Exactly when shall I pray for you, your officials and your people? The frogs will immediately depart from you and your homes remaining only in the Nile tomorrow. Said Pharaoh, as you say, replied Moses, you will then know that there is none like God our Lord. The frogs will depart from you as well as from your houses, your officials and your people. They will remain only in the Nile. Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh and Moses cried out to God concerning the frogs that he had brought upon Pharaoh. God did just as Moses said, and the frogs in the houses. Courtyards and fields died. The Egyptians gathered them into great heaps and the land stank. When Pharaoh saw that there had been a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them just as God had predicted lice. The third plague, God said to Moses, Tell Aaron to hold out his staff and strike the dust of the earth and will turn into lice all over Egypt. They did this. Aaron held out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. The lice appeared attacking men and Beasts throughout all Egypt the dust had turned into lice the master symbolists tried to produce lice with their hidden arts but they could not meanwhile the lice were attacking men and beasts alike it is the finger of God said the master symbolists to Pharaoh but Pharaoh remained obstinate and would not listen just as God had predicted harmful creatures the fourth plague God said to Moses get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh when he goes out to the water say to him in my name let my people leave and serve me if you do not let my people leave I will send swarms of harmful creatures to attack you your officials your people and your homes the houses of Egypt and even the ground upon which they stand will be filled with these creatures on that day I will miraculously set apart the Goshen area where my people
What we must do is make a three-day journey into the desert there we will be able to sacrifice to God our Lord just as he told us I will let you leave said Pharaoh as long as you do not go too far away you can sacrifice to God your Lord in the desert but pray for me. Moses answered when I leave your presence I will pray to God tomorrow the creatures will go away from Pharaoh his servants and his people but let Pharaoh never again deceive us refusing to let the people sacrifice to God Moses left Pharaoh's presence and prayed to God doing as Moses requested God caused the creatures to leave Pharaoh his servants and his people not a single one remained but this time again Pharaoh made himself obstinate and he would not let the people leave epidemic. The fifth plague God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and in the name of God Lord of the Hebrews say to him let my people leave and serve me for if you refuse to let them leave and continue holding them God's power will be directed against your livestock in the field the horses donkeys camels cattle and sheep will die from a very serious epidemic God will again make a miraculous distinction this time between Israel's livestock and that of Egypt not a single animal belonging to it. Israelites will die God has set a fixed time and has announced that he will strike the land with this tomorrow on the next day God did this and all the livestock in Egypt died of the Israelites livestock however not a single one was affected Pharaoh sent word and discovered that among the Israelites livestock not a single animal had died but Pharaoh remained obstinate and would not let the people leave oils the sixth plague God said to Moses and Aaron take a handful of furnace Soot and throw it up in the air before Pharaoh's eyes it will settle as dust on all Egypt and when it falls on man or beast anywhere in Egypt it will cause a rash breaking out into boils they took the furnace soot and stood before Pharaoh Moses threw it up in the air and it caused a rash which broke into boils in man and beast the master symbolists could not stand before Moses as a result of the rash since the rash had attacked the symbolists along with the rest of Egypt now it was God who made Pharaoh obstinate he did not listen to Moses and Aaron just as God had predicted warning God told Moses to get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh saying to him in the name of God Lord of the Hebrews let my people leave and serve me this time I am prepared to send all my catastrophes against your very heart they will strike your officials and your people so that you will know that there is none like me in all the world I could have unleashed my power killing you and your people with the epidemic sent against the animals and you would have been obliterated from the world the only reason I let you survive was to show you my strength so that my name will be discussed all over the world but now you are still lording it over my people refusing to let them leave at this time tomorrow I will bring a very heavy hail never before in Egypt since the day it was founded has there been anything like it now send word and make arrangements to shelter your livestock and everything else you have in the field any man or beast who remains in the field and does not come indoors will be pelted by the hail and will die some of Pharaoh's subjects feared God's word and they made their slaves and livestock flee indoors but those who did not fear God's word left their slaves and livestock in the field hail the seventh plague God said to Moses stretch out your head toward the sky and there will be hail throughout all Egypt it will fall on Man and beast and on all outdoor plants all over Egypt Moses pointed his staff at the sky and God caused it to thunder and hail with lightning striking the ground God then made it hail on the land of Egypt there was hail with lightning flashing among the hailstones it was extremely heavy unlike anything Egypt had experienced since it became a nation throughout all Egypt the hail killed every man and animal who was outdoors the hail destroyed all the outdoor plants and smashed every tree. In the fields only in Goshen where the Israelites lived there was no hail Pharaoh sent word and summoned Moses and Aaron he said to them this time I am guilty. God is just. It is I and my people who are in the wrong. Pray to God there has been enough of the supernatural thunder and hail I will let you leave you will not be delayed again Moses said to him when I go out of the city I will spread my hands in prayer to God the thunder will then stop and there will not be any more hail you will then know that the whole world belongs to God I realize that you and your subjects still do not fear God the flax and barley have been destroyed since the barley was ripe and the flax had formed stalks but the wheat and spelt have not been destroyed since they are late in sprouting Moses left Pharaoh's presence and went out of the city as soon as he spread his hands out to God the thunder ceased and the hail and rain stopped falling to the ground but when Pharaoh saw that there was no longer any rain hail or thunder he continued his simple ways he and his officials continued to make themselves obstinate Pharaoh hardened his heart and did not let the Israelites leave just as God had Predicted through Moses' warning, God said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, I have made him and his advisors stubborn so that I will be able to demonstrate these miraculous signs among them. You will then be able to confide to your children and grandchildren how I made fools of the Egyptians and how I performed miraculous signs among them. You will then fully realize that I am God. Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh in the name of God, Lord of the Hebrews. They said to him, How long will you refuse to submit to me? Let my people leave and serve me. If you refuse to let my people leave, I will bring locusts to your territories tomorrow. They will cover every visible speck of land so that you will not be able to see the ground and they will eat all that was spared for you by the hail devouring every tree growing in the field. They will fill your palaces as well as the houses of your officials and of all Egypt. It will be something that your fathers and your fathers' fathers have never seen since the day. They were in the land with that Moses turned his back and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials said to him, How long will this man continue to be a menace to us? Let the men go and let them serve God their Lord. Don't you yet realize that Egypt is being destroyed? Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. Go serve God your Lord, he said, but exactly who will be going? Young and old alike will go, replied Moses. We will go with our sons and our daughters with our sheep and cattle. It is a festival to God for all of us. May God only be with you just as I will let you leave with your children, replied Pharaoh. You must realize that you will be confronted by evil, but that's not the way it will be. Let the males go and worship God if that's really what you want. With that he had them expelled from his presence locusts. The eighth plague God said to Moses, Extend your hand over Egypt to bring the locusts and they will emerge on Egypt. They will eat all the foliage in the land that was feared by the hail. Moses raised his hand over Egypt and all that day and night God made an east wind blow over the land. When morning came the east wind was carrying the locusts. The locusts invaded Egypt settling on all Egyptian territory. It was a very severe plague. Never before had there been such a locust plague and never again would the light be seen. The locusts covered the entire surface of the land making the ground black. They ate all the plants on the ground and all the fruit on the trees. Whatever had been spared by the hail nothing green remained on the trees and plants throughout all Egypt. Pharaoh hastily summoned Moses and Aaron. I have committed a crime. He said both to God your Lord and to you now forgive my offense just this. One more time pray to God your Lord. Just take this death away from me. Moses left Pharaoh's presence and prayed to God. God turned the wind around, transforming it into a very strong west wind. It carried away the locusts and plunged them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained within all Egypt's borders. But once again, God made Pharaoh obstinate, and he would not let the Israelites leave darkness. The ninth plague, God said to Moses, "Reach out toward the sky with your hand, and there will be darkness in Egypt. The darkness will be palpable." Moses lifted his hand toward the sky, and there was an opaque darkness in all Egypt, lasting for three days. People could not see each other, and no one left his place for three days. The Israelites, however, had light in the areas where they lived. Pharaoh summoned Moses, "Go." He said, "Worship God. Even your children can go with you. Just leave your sheep and cattle behind. Will you then provide us with sacrifices and burnt offerings so that we will be able to offer them to God, our Lord?" Replied Moses, "Our livestock must also go along with us. Not a single who can be left behind. We must take them to serve God, our Lord, since we do not know what we will need to worship." God until we get there God made Pharaoh obstinate and he was no longer willing to let the Israelites leave leave my presence said Pharaoh to Moses don't dare see my face again the day you appear before me you will die as you say replied Moses I will not see your face again preparations for the final plague God said to Moses there is one more plague that I will send against Pharaoh and Egypt after that he will let you leave this place when he lets you leave he will actually drive you out of here now speak to the people discreetly and let each man request from his friend gold and silver articles let every woman make the same request of her friends God gave the people status among
Speak to the entire community of Israel saying, On the tenth of this month every man must take a lamb for each extended family a lamb for each household if the household is too small for a lamb and he and a close neighbor can obtain a lamb together as long as it is for specifically designated individuals individuals shall be designated for a lamb according to how much each one will eat you must have a flawless young animal a one year old male you can take it from the sheep or from the goats hold it in safekeeping until the fourteenth day of this month the entire community of Israel shall then slaughter their sacrifices in the afternoon they must take the blood and place it on the two doorposts and on the beam above the door of the houses in which they will eat the sacrifice eat the sacrificial meat during the night roasted over fire eat it with matzah and bitter herbs do not eat it raw or cooked in water but only roasted over fire including its head its legs and its internal organs do not leave any of it over until morning anything that is left over until morning must be burned in fire you must eat it with your waist belted your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and you must eat it in haste it is the Passover, the sash, offering to God I will pass through Egypt on that night and I will kill every firstborn in Egypt man and beast I will perform acts of judgment against all the gods of Egypt I alone am God the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are staying I will see the blood and pass you by, the sack, there will not be any deadly plague among you when I strike Egypt this day must be one that you will remember you must keep it as a festival to God for all generations it is a law for all time that you must celebrate it eat matzahs for seven days by the first day you must have your homes cleared of all leaven whoever eats leaven from the first day until the seventh day will have his soul cut off. From Israel the first day shall be a sacred holiday and the seventh day shall also be a sacred holiday no work may be done on these days the only work that you may do is that which is needed so that everyone will be able to eat be careful regarding the matzahs for on this very day I will have brought your masses out of Egypt you must carefully keep this day for all generations it is a law for all times from the fourteenth day of the first month in the evening until the night of the twenty-first day of the month you must eat only matzahs during these seven days no leaven may be found in your homes if someone eats anything leavened his soul shall be cut off from the community of Israel this is true whether he is a proselyte or a person born into the nation you must not eat anything leavened in all the areas where you live eat matzahs Passover preparations Moses summoned the elders of Israel and said to them gather the people and get yourself sheep for your family so that you will be able to slaughter the Passover sacrifice you will then have to take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood that will be placed in the basin touch the beam over the door and the two doorposts with some of the blood in the basin not a single one of you may go out the door of his house until morning God will then pass through to strike Egypt when he sees the blood over the door and on the two doorposts God will pass over that door and not let the force of destruction enter your houses to strike you must keep this ritual as a law for you and your children forever when you come to the land that God will give you as he promised you must also keep the service your children may then ask you what is the service to you you must answer it is the Passover service to God he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians sparing our homes the people bent their heads and prostrate themselves the Israelites went and did as God had instructed Moses and Aaron they did it exactly the final plague it was midnight God killed every firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon as well as every firstborn animal Pharaoh stayed up that night along with all his officials and all the rest of Egypt there was a great outcry since there was no house where there were no dead Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night get moving he said get out from among my people you and the Israelites go worship God just as you demanded take your sheep and cattle just as you said go bless me too the Egyptians were also urging the people to hurry and leave the land we are all dead men, they were saying the people took their dough before it could rise their leftover dough was wrapped in their robes and placed on their shoulders the Israelites also did as Moses had said they requested silver and gold articles and clothing from the Egyptians God made the Egyptians respect the people and they granted their request the Israelites thus drained Egypt of its wealth the Exodus. The Israelites traveled from Ramses toward Sukkot there were about 600,000 adult males on foot besides the children a great mixture of nationalities left with them there were also sheep and cattle a huge amount of livestock the Israelites baked the dough that they had brought out of Egypt into unleavened matzah, cakes since it had not risen they had been driven out of Egypt and could not delay and they had not prepared any other provisions the lifestyle that the Israelites endured. In Egypt had thus lasted 430 years at the end of the 430 years all of God's armies left Egypt in broad daylight there was a night of vigil for God preparing to bring them out of Egypt this night remains for the Israelites a vigil to God for all generations Passover laws God said to Moses and Aaron this is the law of the Passover sacrifice no outsider may eat it if a man buys a slave for cash and circumcises him and the slave can eat it but if a Gentile is a temporary resident or a hired hand he may not eat the Passover sacrifice it must be eaten by a single group do not bring any of its meat out of the group do not break any of its bones the entire community of Israel must keep this ritual when a proselyte joins you and wants to offer the Passover sacrifice to God every male in his household must be circumcised he may then join in the observance and be like a native-born Israelite but no uncircumcised man may eat the sacrifice the same Law shall apply both for the native-born Israelite and for the proselyte who joins you. All the Israelites did as God had instructed Moses and Aaron. They did it exactly leaving Egypt on that very day. God took the Israelites out of Egypt in organized groups commemorating the Exodus. God spoke to Moses saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn that initiates the womb among the Israelites among both man and beast. It is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day as the time you left Egypt the place of slavery when God brought you out of here with a show of force. No leaven may be eaten. You left this day in the month of standing grain. There will come a time when God will bring you to the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Yebusites. Eat matzahs for seven days and make the seventh day a festival to God since matzahs must be eaten for these seven days. No leaven may be seen in your possession. No leaven may be seen in all your territories on. That day you must tell your child it is because of this that God acted for me when I left Egypt. These words must also be a sign on your arm and a reminder in the center of your head. God's Torah will then be on your tongue. It was with a show of strength that God brought you out of Egypt. This law must therefore be kept at its designated time from year to year. Consecration of the firstborn. There will come a time when God will have brought you to the land of the Canaanites, which he promised you and your ancestors, and he will have given it to you. You will then bring to God every firstborn that initiates the womb. Whenever you have a young firstling animal, the males belong to God. Every firstling donkey must be redeemed with a sheep. If it is not redeemed, you must decapitate it. You must also redeem every firstborn among your sons. Your child may later ask you, What is this? You must answer him with a show of power. God brought us out of Egypt, the place of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us leave, God killed all the firstborn in Egypt, man and beast alike. I therefore sacrificed to God all male firstling animals and redeem all the firstborn of my sons. These words shall also be a sign on your arm and an insignia in the center of your head. All this is because God brought us out of Egypt with a show of strength, the root from Egypt. When Pharaoh let the people leave, God did not leave them along the Philistine highway. Although it was the shorter route, God's consideration was that if the people encountered armed resistance, they would lose heart and return to Egypt. God therefore made the people take a roundabout path by way of the desert to the Red Sea. The Israelites were well prepared when they left Egypt. Moses took Joseph's remains with him. Joseph had bound the Israelites by an oath. God will grant you special providence and. You must then bring my remains out of here with you. The Israelites moved on from Sukkot and they camped in Edom at the edge of the desert. God went before them by day with a pillar of cloud to guide them along the way. By night it appeared as a pillar of fire, providing them with light. They could thus travel day and night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire at night never left their position in front of the people. Egypt pursues God spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the Israelites and tell them to turn back and camp before Freedom Valley between Tower and the Sea, facing Lord of the North Camp opposite it near the Sea." Pharaoh will then say that the Israelites are lost in the area and trapped in the desert. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will come after them. I will trium
Didn't we tell you in Egypt to leave us alone and let us work for the Egyptians? It would have been better to be slaves in Egypt than to die here in the desert. Don't be afraid, replied Moses to the people. Stand firm and you will see what God will do to rescue you today. You might be seeing the Egyptians today, but you will never see them again. God will fight for you, but you must remain silent. Crossing the sea, God said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Speak to the Israelites and let them start moving. Raise your staff and extend your hand over the sea. You will split the sea and the Israelites will be able to cross over on dry land. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will follow you. Thus I will triumph over Pharaoh and his entire army, his chariot corps and his cavalry. When I have this triumph over Pharaoh, his chariot corps and cavalry, Egypt will know that I am God. God's angel had been traveling in front of it. Israelite camp, but now it moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud thus moved from in front of them and stood at their rear. It came between the Egyptian and the Israelite camps. There was cloud and darkness that night, blocking out all visibility. Moses extended his hand over the sea during the entire night. God drove back the sea with a powerful east wind, transforming the seabed into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites entered the seabed on dry land. The water was on there. Right and left, like two walls, the Egyptians gave chase and came after the Israelites. All of Pharaoh's horses, chariot corps, and cavalry went into the middle of the sea. Toward the end of the night, God struck at the Egyptian army with the pillar of fire and cloud. He panicked the Egyptian army. The chariot wheels became bogged down and they could move only with great difficulty. The Egyptians cried out, Let us flee from Israel. God is fighting for them against Egypt. The Egyptians downfall. God said to Moses, Extend your hand over the sea. The waters will come back over the Egyptians, covering their chariot corps and cavalry. Just before morning, Moses extended his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal condition. The Egyptians were fleeing the water, but God swamped the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. The waters came back and covered the cavalry and chariots of all Pharaoh's army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not a single one remained. Meanwhile, the Israelites were walking in the midst of the sea on dry land. The water was on their right and on their left like two walls. Thus, on that day, God rescued the Israelites from Egypt. The Israelites saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. The Israelites saw the great power that God had unleashed against Egypt, and the people were in awe of God. They believed in God and in his servant Moses. The song of the Red Sea Moses and the Israelites then sang the song too. God it went, I will sing to God for his great victory horse and rider he threw in the sea my strength and song is God and this is my deliverance this is my God I will enshrine him my father's God I will exalt him God is the master of war God is his name Pharaoh's chariots and army he cast in the sea his very best officers were drowned in the Red Sea the depths covered them they sank to the bottom like a stone your right hand O God is awesome in power your right hand O God crushes the foe in your great majesty you broke your opponents you sent forth your wrath it devoured them like straw at the blast of your nostrils the waters towered flowing water stood like a wall the depths congealed in the heart of the sea the enemy said I will give chase I will overtake divide the spoils I will satisfy myself I will draw my sword my hand will demolish them you made your wind blow the sea covered them they sank like lead in the mighty waters who is like you among powers God who is like you majestic in holiness awesome in praise doing wonders. You put forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them with love. You led the people you redeemed with mud. You led them to your holy shrine. Nations heard and shuddered terror gripped those who dwell in Philistia. Edom's chiefs then panicked. Moab's heroes were seized with trembling. Canaan's residents melted away. Fear and dread fell upon them at the greatness of your arm. They are still as stone until your people crossed, O God, until the people you gained crossed over, O bring them and plant them on the mount. You possess the place you dwell in is your accomplishment. God, the shrine of God, your hands have founded. God will reign forever and ever. The song was sung when Pharaoh's horse came into the sea along with his chariot corps and cavalry, and God made the sea come back on them. The Israelites had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. Miriam, song Miriam, the prophetess Aaron's sister, took the drum in her hand, and all the women followed her with. Drums and dancing Miriam led them in the response, sing to God for his great victory horse and rider he cast in the sea the bitter waters Moses led the Israelites away from the Red Sea and they went out into the sure desert they traveled for three days in the desert without finding any water finally they came to Merah but they could not drink any water there the water was bitter, Merah, and that was why the place was called Merah the people complained to Moses what shall we drink? They demanded when Moses cried out to God he showed him a certain tree Moses threw it into the water and the water became drinkable it was there that God taught them survival techniques and methods and there he tested them he said if you obey God your Lord and do what is upright in his eyes carefully heeding all his commandments and keeping all his decrees then I will not strike you with any of the sicknesses that I brought on Egypt I am God who heals you Elim and Sin and Came to Elim here there were twelve springs of water and seventy day palms they then camped by the water Elim and Sin they moved on from Elim and the entire community of Israel came to the Sin desert between Elim and Sinai it was the fifteenth of the second month after they had left Egypt there in the desert the entire Israelite community began to complain against Moses and Aaron the Israelites said to them if only we had died by God's hand in Egypt there at least we could sit by pots of meat and eat our fill of bread but you had to bring us out to this desert to kill the entire community by starvation promise of food God said to Moses I will make bread rain down to you from the sky the people will go out and gather enough for each day I will test them to see whether or not they will keep my law on Friday they will have to prepare what they bring home it will be twice as much as they gather every other day Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites when evening comes you will know that it was God who took you out of Egypt and in the morning you will see God's glory he has heard your Complaints which are against God after all what are we that you should complain against us? Moses said in the evening God will give you meat to eat and in the morning there will be enough bread to fill you up God has heard your complaints which you are actually addressing against him what are we? Your complaints are not against us but against God. Moses said to Aaron tell the entire Israelite community to gather before God for he has heard your complaints when Aaron spoke to the entire Israelite community they turned toward the desert God's glory was visible in the clouds of man God spoke to Moses saying I have heard the complaints of the Israelites speak to them and say in the afternoon you will eat meat and in the morning you will have your fill of bread you will then know that I am God your Lord that evening a flock. A quail came and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp when the layer of dew evaporated there were little grains all over the surface of the desert it looked like fine frost on the ground the Israelites looked at it and had no idea what it was what is it they asked one another God's instructions are that each man shall take as much as he needs there shall be an omer for each person according to the number of people each man has in his tent when the Israelites went to do this some gathered more and some less but when they measured it with an omer the one who had taken more did not have any extra and the one who had taken less did not have too little they had gathered exactly enough for each one to eat Moses announced to them let no man leave any over until morning some men did not listen to Moses and left the portion over for the morning it became putrid and maggoty with worms Moses was angry with these people did. People gathered it each morning according to what each person would eat and when the sun became hot it melted when Friday came what they gathered turned out to be a double portion of food two omers for each person all the leaders of the community came and reported it to Moses Moses said to them this is what God has said tomorrow is a day of rest God's holy Sabbath bake what you want to bake and cook what you want to cook today whatever you have left over put aside carefully until morning they put it away until Saturday morning as Moses had instructed it was not putrid and there were no maggots in it Moses announced eat it today for today is God's Sabbath you will not find anything in the field today you are to gather this food during the six weekdays but the seventh day is the Sabbath and on that day there will not be any still some people went out to gather food on Saturday but they found nothing the Sabbath God told Moses to say to the Israelites how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my law you must realize that God has given you the Sabbath and that is why I gave you food for two days on Friday on the Sabbath every person must remain in his designated place one may not leave his home to gather food on Saturday the people rested on Saturday the family of Israel called the food man it looked like coriander seed
God said to Moses, March in front of the people along with the elders of Israel, take in your hand a staff with which you struck the Nile and go, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, you must strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. Moses did this in the presence of the elders of Israel. Moses named the place testing and argument because the people had argued and had tested God, they had asked, Is God with us or not? Amalek Amalek arrived and attacked Israel there in Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and prepare for battle against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him, engaging Amalek in battle. Moses, Aaron, and she went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, Israel would be winning. But as soon as he let his hands down, the battle would go in Amalek's favor when Moses' hands became weary. They took a stone and placed it under him so that he would be able to sit on it. Aaron and Shu then held his hands one on each side and his hands remained steady until sunset. Joshua was thus able to break the ranks of Amalek and his allies with the sword. Divine vengeance. God said to Moses, Write this as a reminder in the book and repeat it carefully to Joshua. I will totally obliterate the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. Moses built an altar and he named it God is my banner. He said, The hand is on God's throne. God shall be at war with Amalek for all generations. Jethro's advice. Moses' father in law, Jethro Sheik of Midian, heard about all that God had done for Moses and his people Israel when he brought Israel out of Egypt. Jethro brought along Moses' wife Zipporah, who had been sent home earlier, and her two sons. The name of the first one was Gershom because Moses had declared, I was a foreigner. G E R. In a strange land, the name of the other one was. Eliza, because my father's God, El, was my helper, Ezer, rescuing me from Pharaoh's sword, Jethro came together with Moses' wife and sons to the desert where Moses was staying near God's mountain. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am on my way to you along with your wife. Her two sons are with her. Moses went out to greet his father-in-law, bowing down low and kissing him. They asked about each other's welfare and went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about all that God had done to Pharaoh and Egypt for the sake of Israel as well as all the frustrations they had encountered on the way and how God had rescued them. Jethro expressed joy because of all the good that God had done for Israel, rescuing them from Egypt's power. He said, Praise be God who rescued you from the power of Egypt and Pharaoh, who liberated the people from Egypt's power. Now I know that God is the greatest of all deities through their very plots he rose above them. Jethro brought burnt offerings and other sacrifices to God. Aaron and all the elders of Israel came to share the meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day Moses sat to judge the people. They stood around Moses from morning to evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What are you doing to the people? Why are you sitting by yourself and letting all the people stand around you from morning until evening? The people come to me to seek God, replied Moses to his father-in-law. Whenever they have a problem, they come to me. I judge between man and his neighbor, and I teach God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You are going to wear yourself out along with this nation that is with you. Your responsibility is too great. You cannot do it all alone. Now listen to me. I will give you advice, and God will be with you. You must be God's representative. For the people and bring their concerns to God, clarify the decrees and laws for the people, show them the path they must take and the things they must do. But you must also seek out from among all the people capable God fearing men, men of truth who hate injustice. You must then appoint them over the people as leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. Let them administer justice for the people on a regular basis. Of course, they will have to bring every major case to you, but they can judge the minor cases by themselves. They will then share the burden, making things easier for you. If you agree to this and God concurs, you will be able to survive. This entire nation will then also be able to attain its goal of peace. Moses took his father in law's advice and did all that he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and he appointed them as administrators over the people, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. They administer justice on a regular basis, bringing the difficult cases to Moses and judging the simple cases by themselves. Moses let his father in law depart. And he went away to his homeland. The Ten Commandments in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt on the first of the month, they came to the desert of Sinai. They had departed from Rephidim and had arrived in the Sinai desert camping in the wilderness. Israel camp opposite the mountain. Moses went up to God. God called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you must say to the family of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You saw what I did in Egypt, carrying you on eagles' wings and bringing you to me. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be my special treasure among all nations. Even though all the world is mine, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to me. These are the words that you must relate to the Israelites. Moses came back and summoned the elders of the people, conveying to them all that God had said. All the people answered as one and said, All that God has spoken, we will do. Moses brought the people's reply back to God. God said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that all the people will hear when I speak to you. They will then believe in you forever. Moses told God the people's response to that. God said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them even immerse their clothing. They will then be ready for the third day, for on the third day God will descend on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, set a boundary for the people around the mountain, and tell them to be careful not to climb the mountain or even to touch its edge. Anyone touching the mountain will be put to death. You will not have to lay a hand on him, for he will be stoned or cast down. Neither man nor beast will be allowed to live. But when the trumpet is sounded with a long blast, they will then be allowed to climb the mountain. Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He sanctified them and they immersed themselves and their clothing. Moses said to the people, Keep yourselves in readiness for three days. Do not come near a woman. The third day arrived. There was thunder and lightning in the morning with a heavy cloud on the mountain and an extremely loud blast of a ram's horn. The people in the camp trembled. Moses led the people out of the camp toward the divine presence. They stood transfixed at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was all in smoke because of the presence that had come down on it. God was in the fire and its smoke went up like the smoke of a long kill. The entire mountain trembled violently. There was the sound of a ram's horn increasing in volume to a great degree. Moses spoke and God replied with a voice. God came down on Mount Sinai to the peak of the mountain. He summoned Moses to the mountain peak and Moses climbed up. God said to Moses, Go back down and warn the people that they must not cross the boundary in order to see the divine because this will cause many to die. The priests who usually come near the divine must also sanctify themselves or else God will send destruction among them. Moses replied to God, The people cannot climb Mount Sinai. You already warned them to set a boundary around the mountain and to declare it sacred. God said to him, Go down, you can then come back up along with Aaron, but the priests and the other people must not violate the boundary to go up to the divine. If they do, he will send destruction among them. Moses went down to the people and conveyed this to them. The first two commandments God spoke all these words, saying, I am God your Lord who brought you out of Egypt from the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods before me. Do not represent such gods by any carved statue or picture of anything in the heaven above on the earth below or in the water below the land. Do not bow down to such gods or worship them. I am God your Lord, a God who demands exclusive worship where my enemies are concerned. I keep in mind the sin of the fathers for their descendants to the third and fourth generation. But for those who love me and keep my commandments, I shall love for thousands of generations. The third commandment, do not take the name of God your Lord in vain. God will not allow the one who takes his name in vain to go unpunished the fourth. Commandment Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You can work during the six weekdays and do all your tasks, but Saturday is the Sabbath to God your Lord. Do not do anything that constitutes work. This includes you, your son, your daughter, your slave, your maid, your animal, and the foreigner in your gates. It was during the six weekdays that God made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but you rested on Saturday. God therefore blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The fifth commandment Honor your father and mother. You will then live long on the land that God your Lord is giving you. The sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth commandments Do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify as a
Married man his wife shall leave with him if his master gives him a wife and she bears sons or daughters the woman and her children shall remain her master's property the slave shall leave by himself if the slave declares I am fond of my master my wife and my children I do not want to go free his master must bring him to the court standing the slave next to the door or doorpost his master shall pierce his ear within all the slave shall then serve his master forever the Hebrew. Maid servant if a man sells his daughter as a maid servant she shall not be freed as male servants are released her master should provisionally designate her as his bride and if she is not pleasing to him he must let her be redeemed he is considered to have broken faith with her and he therefore does not have the right to sell her to anyone else if the master designates her as a bride for his son she must be treated exactly the same as any other girl similarly if the master marries. Another wife he may not diminish this one's allowance clothing or conjugal rights if none of the above three are done to the girl then she shall be released without liability or payment manslaughter if one person strikes another and the victim dies the murderer must be put to death if he did not plan to kill his victim but God caused it to happen then I will provide a place where the killer can find refuge murder if a person plots against his neighbor to kill him. Intentionally then you must even take him from my altar to put him to death injuring a parent whoever intentionally injures his father or mother shall be put to death kidnapping if one person kidnaps and sells another and the victim is seen in his hand and the kidnapper shall be put to death cursing a parent whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death personal injury this is a law when two men fight and one hits the other with a stone or with his fist if the victim does not die but becomes bedridden and then gets up and can walk under his own power the one who struck him shall be acquitted still he must pay for the victim's loss of work and must provide for his complete cure killing of slaves if a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies under his hand a death must be avenged however if the slave survives for a day or two then since he is his master's property his death shall not be avenged Personal damages this is a law when two men fight and accidentally harm a pregnant woman causing her to miscarry if there is no fatal injury to the woman then the guilty party must pay a monetary penalty the woman's husband must sue for it and the amount is then determined by the courts however if there is a fatal injury to the woman then he must pay full compensation for her life full compensation must be paid for the loss of an eye a tooth a hand or a footfall. Compensation must also be paid for a burn a wound or a bruise injury to slaves if a person strikes his male or female slave in the eye and blinds it he shall set the slave free in compensation for his eye similarly if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female slave he must set the slave free in compensation for his tooth the killer ox if an ox gores a man or woman and the victim dies the ox must be stoned to death and its flesh may not be eaten the owner of the ox however shall not be punished but if the ox was in the habit of goring on previous occasions and the owner was warned but did not take precautions then if it kills a man or woman the ox must be stoned and its owner shall also deserve to die nevertheless an atonement fine must be imposed on him and he must pay whatever is imposed on him as a redemption for his life this law also applies if the ox scores a minor boy or a minor girl if the ox scores a male or female slave its owner must give 30 silver shekels to the slave's master and the bull must be stoned a hole in the ground this is the law if a person digs a hole in the ground or uncovers a hole and does not cover it over if an ox or donkey falls into it the one responsible for the hole must make restitution restoring the full value of the animal to its owner the dead animal remains the property of its owner damaged by goring if one person's ox injures the ox of another person and it dies they shall sell it Live ox and divide the money received for it they shall also divide the dead animal however if the ox was known to be in the habit of going on previous occasions and its owner did not take precautions then he must pay the full value of the dead ox the dead animal remains the property of its owner penalties for stealing if a person steals an ox or sheep and then slaughters or sells it he must repay five oxen for each ox and four sheep for each sheep penalties for stealing if a burglar is caught in the act of breaking in and is struck and killed it is not considered an act of murder however if he robs in broad daylight then it is an act of murder to kill him a thief must make full restitution if he does not have the means he must be sold as a slave to make restitution for his theft if the stolen article is found in his possession and it is a living ox donkey or sheep he must make double restitution damage by grazing if a person grazes a field or a vineyard and lets his livestock lose so that it grazes in another person's field he must make restitution with the best of his field and the best of his vineyard damage by fire if fire gets out of control and spreads through weeds and then consumes bound or standing grain or a field the one who started the fire must make restitution the unpaid custodian if one person gives another money or articles to watch and they are stolen from the house of the person keeping them and if it thief is found the thief must make the usual double restitution if the thief is not found the owner of the house shall be brought to the courts where he must swear that he did not lay a hand on his neighbor's property in every case of dishonesty whether it involves an ox a donkey a sheep a garment or anything else that was allegedly lost and witnesses testify that it was seen both parties claims must be brought to the courts the person whom the courts declare guilty must then make double restitution to the other the paid custodian if one person gives another a donkey an ox a sheep or any other animal to watch and it dies is maimed or is carried off in a raid without eyewitnesses then the case between the two must be decided on the basis of an oath to god if the person keeping the animal did not make use of the other's property the owner must accept it and the person keeping the animal need not pay however if it was stolen from a keeper then he must Make restitution to the animal's owner if the animal was killed by wild beast and the keeper can provide evidence he need not make restitution for the attacked animal the borrowed article if a person borrows something from another and it becomes broken or dies and the owner is not involved with the borrower then the borrower must make full restitution however if the owner was involved with him and the borrower need not make restitution if the article was hired the loss is covered by the rental price deduction if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed he must pay a dowry and must marry her if her father refuses to allow him to marry her then he must pay the father the usual dowry money for virgins occult practices bestiality do not allow a sorceress to live whoever lies with an animal must be put to death idolatry and oppression whoever sacrifices to any deity other than God alone must be condemned to death do not hurt the feelings of a foreigner or oppress him for you were foreigners in Egypt do not mistreat a widow or an orphan if you mistreat them and they cry out to me I will hear their cry I will then display my anger and kill you by the sword so that your wives will be widows and your children orphans lending money when you lend money to my people to the poor man among you do not press him for repayment also do not take interest from him if you take your neighbor's garment as security for a loan you must return it to him before sunset this alone is his covering the garment for his skin with what shall he sleep therefore if he cries out to me I will listen for I am compassionate accepting authority do not curse the judges do not curse a leader of your people do not delay your offerings of newly ripened produce and your agricultural offerings give me the firstborn of your sons you must also do likewise with your ox and sheep it must remain with its mother for seven days but on the eighth day you must give it to me be holy people to me do not eat flesh torn off in the field by a predator cast it to the dogs justice do not accept a false report do not join forces with a wicked person to be a corrupt witness do not follow the majority to do evil do not speak up in a trial to pervert justice a case must be decided on the basis of the majority do not favor even the poorest man in his lawsuit straight animals if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey going astray bring it back to him the fallen animal if you see the donkey of someone you hate lying under its load you might want to refrain from helping him but instead you must make every effort to help him unload it justice and festivals do not pervert justice for your degraded countrymen in his lawsuit keep away from anything false do not kill a person who has not been proven guilty or one who has been acquitted ultimately i will not let a guilty person escape punishment do not accept bribery bribery blinds the clear-sighted and twists the words of the just do not oppress a foreigner you Know how it feels to be a foreigner for you were foreigners in Egypt you may plant your land for six years and gather its crops but during the seventh year you must leave it alone and withdraw from it the needy among you will then be able to eat from your fields just as you do and whatever is left over can be eaten by wild animals this also applies to your vineyard and your olive grove you may do whatever you must during the six weekdays but you must stop on Saturday your donkey and ox must then be able to rest and your maid son and the fo
Temple of God, your Lord, do not cook meat and milk even that of its mother promises and instructions. I will send an angel before you to safeguard you on the way and bring you to the place that I have prepared. Be careful in his presence and heed his voice. Do not rebel against him since my name is with him. He will not pardon your disobedience. But if you obey him and do all that I say, then I will hate your enemies and attack your foes. My angel will go before you and bring you among it. Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Yebusites, and I will then annihilate them. Do not bow down to their gods and do not serve them. Do not follow the ways of these nations. You must tear down their idols and break their sacred pillars. You will then serve God, your Lord, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will banish sickness from among you. The land in your land, no woman will suffer miscarriage or remain childless. I will make you live out full lives. I will cause the people who are in your path to be terrified of me, and I will throw all the people among whom you are coming into a panic. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and flee from you. I will send deadly wasps ahead of you, and they will drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites before you. I will not drive them out in a single year, however, lest the land become depopulated and the wild animals become too many for you to contend with. I will drive the inhabitants out. Little by little, giving you a chance to increase and fully occupy the land, I will set your borders from the Red Sea to the Philistine Sea, from the desert to the river. I will give the land's inhabitants into your hand, and you will drive them before you do not make a treaty with these nations or with their gods. Do not allow them to reside in your land, since they may then make you sin to me. You may even end up worshiping their gods, and it will be a fatal trap to you, sealing the covenant. God said to Moses, Go up to God along with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. All of you must bow down at a distance. Only Moses shall then approach God. The others may not come close, and the people may not go up with him. Moses came and told the people all of God's words and all the laws. The people all responded with a single voice. We will keep every word that God has spoken. Moses wrote down all of God's words. He got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain along with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel he sent a consecrated young men among the Israelites and they offered oxen as burnt offerings and peace offerings to God Moses took half the blood of these offerings and put it into large bowls the other half he sprinkled on the altar he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people they replied we will do and obey all that God has declared Moses then took the rest of the blood and sprinkled it on the people he said this is the blood of the covenant that God is making with you regarding all these words Moses then went up along with Aaron Nadab and Abihu and seventy of Israel's elders they saw a vision of the God of Israel and under his feet was something like a sapphire brick like the essence of a clear blue sky God did not unleash his power against the leaders of the Israelites they had a vision of the divine and they ate and drank Moses ascends God said to Moses, Come up to me to the mountain and remain there. I will give you the stone tablets, the Torah, and the commandment that I have written for the people's instruction. Moses and his aide Joshua set out. Moses went up on God's mountain. He said to the elders, Wait for us here until we return to you. Aaron and Shua will remain with you. Whoever has a problem can go to them. As soon as Moses reached the mountain top, the cloud covered the mountain. God's glory rested on Mount Sinai. And it was covered by the cloud for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud to the Israelites. The appearance of God's glory on the mountain top was like a devouring flame. Moses went into the cloud and climbed to the mountain top. Moses was to remain on the mountain for forty days and forty nights. The offering described God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites and have them bring me an offering. Take my offering from everyone whose heart impels him. To give the offering that you take from them shall consist of the following gold, silver, copper, sky blue, wool, dark red, wool, wool dyed with crimson, worm linen, goats, wool, red, and ram skins, blue processed skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil, and the sweet smelling incense, and sardonyxes, and other precious stones for the ephod and breastplate. They shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell among them. You must make the tabernacle and all its furnishings following the plan that I am showing you. The ark, make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. Cover it with a layer of pure gold on the inside and outside, and make a gold rim all around its top. Cast four gold rings for the ark and place them on its four corners. Two rings on one side and two on the other side. Make two carrying poles of acacia wood and cover them with a layer of gold. Place the poles in the rings. On the sides of the ark so that the ark can be carried with them the poles must remain in the ark's rings and not be removed it is in this ark that you will place the testimony that I will give you make a golden cover for the ark two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide make two golden cherubs hammering them out from the two ends of the cover one cherub shall be on the end and one on the other make the cherubs from the same piece of gold as the cover itself on its two and so the cherubs shall spread their wings upward so that their wings shield the cover the cherubs shall face one another but their faces shall also be inclined downward toward the cover place the cover on top of the ark after you place into the ark the testimony that I will give you I will commune with you there speaking to you from above the ark cover from between the two cherubs that are on the ark of testimony in this manner I will give you instructions for the Israelites the Table make a table of acacia wood two cubits long one cubit wide and one and a half cubits high cover it with a layer of pure gold and make a gold rim all around it make a frame a hand breadth wide all around the table and on the frame all around the golden rim shall be placed make four gold rings for the table and place the rings on the four corners of its four legs the rings shall be adjacent to the frame and they shall be receptacles for the poles with which the table is carried. The poles shall be made of acacia wood and covered with a layer of gold they will be used to carry the table for the table make bread forms incense bowls and side frames as well as the half tubes that will serve as dividers between the loaves of bread all these shall be made of pure gold it is on this table that your bread shall be placed before me at all times the menorah lamp make a menorah out of pure gold the menorah shall be formed by hammering at its base stem and decorative. Cups, spheres, and flowers must be hammered out of a single piece of gold. Six branches shall extend from its sides. Three branches on one side of the menorah and three branches on the other side. There shall be three embossed cups as well as a sphere and a flower on each and every one of the branches. All six branches extending from the menorah's stem must be the same in this respect. The shaft of the menorah shall have four embossed cups along with its spheres and flowers. A sphere shall serve as a base for each pair of branches extending from the shaft. This shall be true for all six branches extending from the stem of the menorah. The spheres and branches shall be an integral part of the menorah. They shall all be hammered out of a single piece of pure gold. Make seven lamps on the menorah. Its lamps shall be lit so that they shine primarily toward its center. The menorah's with tongs and ash scoops shall also be made out of pure gold. The menorah including. All its parts shall be made of the talent of pure gold. Carefully observe the pattern that you will be shown on the mountain and make the menorah in that manner. The tabernacle make the tabernacle out of ten large tapestries consisting of twine linen and sky blue dark red and crimson wool with a pattern of cherubs woven into them. Each tapestry shall be twenty-eight cubits long and four cubits wide with each tapestry the same size. The first five tapestries shall be sewn together and the second five shall also be sewn together. Make loops of sky blue wool at the edge of the innermost tapestry of the first group. Do the same on the edge of the innermost tapestry of the second group. Place fifty loops on the one tapestry and fifty on the edge of the tapestry in the second group. The two sets of loops shall be made so that the loops are exactly opposite one another. Make fifty golden fasteners. The two groups of tapestries will then be able to be joined together so that the tabernacle will. Be one piece make sheets of goat's wool to serve as a tent over the tabernacle there shall be eleven such sheets and each sheet shall be thirty cubits long and four cubits wide all eleven sheets must be the same size so together the first five sheets by themselves and the other six sheets by themselves half of the sixth sheet shall hang over the front of the tent make fifty loops on the edge of the innermost sheet of the first group and fifty loops on the edge of the innermost sheet of the second group make fifty copper fasteners place the fasteners in the loops bringing the tent together and making it one there will then remain an extra portion from what is left over in the breadth of the sheets of the tent the extra half sheet shall trail behind the back of the tabernacle the extra cubit on both sides in the length of the tent sheets
there will be a total of eight beams and sixteen silver bases, two bases under each and every beam, eight crossbars out of acacia wood. There shall be five for the beams of the first side of the tabernacle to the south. There shall also be five for the beams of the second side to the north, and five for the beams of the tabernacle on the western wall of these. The center crossbar shall go through the middle of the beams from one end of the tabernacle to the other. Cover the beams with a layer of gold. Also make gold rings on the beams to hold the crossbars. The crossbars shall also be covered with a layer of gold. You will then be ready to set up the tabernacle in the proper manner as you were shown on the mountain. The cloth partition make a cloth partition out of sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool woven together with twine linen cherubs shall be woven into it so that they can be seen on both sides. Place it on four gold covered acacia pillars having gold hooks. The pillars shall be set in four silver sockets. Place the cloth partition directly under the fastenings holding the tapestries together into the space behind this curtain. You will bring the ark of testimony. This curtain will thus divide between the sanctuary and the holy of holies. You will then place the cover on the ark of testimony and the holy of holies. Place the table outside the curtain toward the northern wall of the tabernacle. The menorah shall be opposite the table toward the southern wall of the tabernacle. Make a drape for the entrance of the tent out of sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool and twine linen. It shall be embroidered work. Make five acacia pillars to hold the drape. Cover them with a layer of gold and place golden hooks on them. Cast five copper bases for the pillars. The altar make the altar out of acacia wood. The altar shall be square five cubits by five cubits and three cubits. I make protrusions on all four sides as an integral part of the altar. Then cover it with a layer of copper. Make pots to remove its greasy ashes as well as scoop sacrificial basins, flesh pokers, and fire pans for the altar. All these instruments shall be made of copper. Make a screen out of copper net to go around the altar. Place four copper rings on the four corners of the screen. The screen shall be placed below the decorative border of the altar, extending downward until the middle of the altar. Make carrying poles for the altar out of acacia wood. Covered with a layer of copper, place the poles in the ring so that the poles will be on the two sides of the altar. When it is carried, the altar shall be a hollow structure made out of boards. You must make it as you were shown on the mountain. The enclosure make the enclosure for the tabernacle in this manner. On the south side, there shall be hangings made of twine linen. Like all the other sides, it shall be one hundred cubits long. It shall have twenty pillars and twenty copper bases. The hooks and Bands for the pillars shall be made of silver. The same shall be done on the north side. The hangings shall be 100 cubits long with 20 pillars and 20 copper bases with silver hooks and bands for the pillars. The width of the hangings at the western end of the enclosure shall be 50 cubits and it shall have 10 pillars and 10 bases. The width of the enclosure at its eastern end shall also be 50 cubits of this. The hangings on one side of the entrance shall be 15 cubits long with three pillars and three bases. On the other side, the hangings shall also be 15 cubits long with three pillars and three bases. The entrance of the enclosure shall be covered with a 20 cubit embroidered drape made of sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool together with twisted linen. It shall have four pillars and four bases. All the pillars of the outer enclosure shall have silver hoops, silver hooks, and copper bases. The length of the enclosure shall be 100 cubits and its width shall be 50 cubits. The pillars holding it. Hangings of twine linen shall be five cubits high and their bases shall be made of copper. All the equipment used to make the tabernacle shall be made out of copper. The stakes for the tabernacle itself and all the stakes for the enclosure shall also be made of copper oil for the lamp. You Moses must command the Israelites to bring you clear illuminating oil made from hand crushed olives to keep the lamp constantly burning. Aaron and his sons shall arrange for the lamps to burn from evening until morning in God's presence in the communion tent outside the cloth partition that conceals the ark of testimony. It is a rule for all time that this oil shall come from the Israelites. The priestly vestments separate your brother Aaron and his sons from among the Israelites and bring them close to you so that Aaron and his sons Nadab, Eliezer, and Ithamar can become priests to me. Make sacred vestments that are both dignified and beautiful for your brother Aaron. Speak to everyone who is naturally talented to whom I have granted a spirit of wisdom and let them make Aaron's vestments. These vestments will then be used to consecrate him and make him a priest to me. These are the vestments that they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, and a tunic, a turban, and a sash. Make them as sacred vestments for Aaron and his sons so that they will be able to be priests to me. The skilled workers shall take the gold, the sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool, and the linen, the ephod. These workers shall make the ephod out of gold thread, sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool together with twine linen in a pattern brocade. It shall have two attached shoulder pieces at its two corners, and these shall be sewn to it. The ephod's belt, which is made in the same manner as the ephod itself, shall be woven together with it out of gold thread, sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool, and twine linen. Take two sardonic stones and engrave on. Then the names of Israel's sons there shall be six names on one stone and the remaining six names on the second stone inscribed in the order of their birth the names of Israel's sons shall be engraved by a skilled jeweler and it shall appear like the engraving on a signet ring these stones shall then be placed in gold settings place the two stones on the two shoulder pieces of the ephod as remembrance stones for Israel's sons the settings make gold settings also make matched cables of pure gold braided like cords the braided cables shall then be attached to the settings the breastplate make a decision breastplate it shall be a pattern brocade like the ephod make it out of gold thread sky blue dark red and crimson wool and twine linen when folded over it shall be a span long and a span wide set it with four rows of mounted stones the first of these rows shall contain a carnelian and emerald and a topaz the second row carbuncle sapphire barrel Third row, jacinth, agate, amethyst, the fourth row, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, these stones shall be placed in gold settings. The stones shall contain the names of the twelve sons of Israel, one for each of the twelve stones. Each one's name shall be engraved as on a signet ring to represent the twelve tribes. Make match cables out of pure gold braided like cords for the breastplate. Make two gold rings for the breastplate and attach them to the two upper corners of the breastplate. Attach the two gold braids to the two rings on the two corners of the breastplate. Attach the two braids on the two corners to the two settings and they shall thus be attached to the two shoulder pieces of the ephod toward the front. Make two gold rings and attach them to the two lower corners of the breastplate on the edge that is toward the inside of the ephod. Make another two gold rings and attach them to the bottoms of the two shoulder pieces toward the front where they are sewn on. Above the ephod's belt, place the lower rings of the breastplate to the lower rings of the ephod with a twist of sky blue wool so that the breastplate shall remain directly above the ephod's belt. Aaron will thus carry the names of Israel's sons on the decision breastplate over his heart when he comes into the sanctuary. It shall be a constant remembrance before God. Place the Urim and Thummim in the decision breastplate and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he comes before God. Aaron will then carry the decision making device for the Israelites before God at all times. The robe make the robe that is worn under the ephod completely out of sky blue wool. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle and this opening shall have a woven border all around it like there is around the head opening of a coat of mail. The neck shall thus not be left open on the bottom of the robe. Place pomegranates made of sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool all along its lower border. In between these pomegranates all around there shall be gold bells, thus there shall be a gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate all around the lower edge of the robe. Aaron shall wear this robe when he performs the divine service. The sound of the bell shall be heard when he enters the sanctuary before God and when he goes out so that he not die. The other vestments make a forehead plate of pure gold and engrave on it in the same manner as a signet ring. The words, Holy to God, attach a twist of sky blue wool to it so that it can be worn next to the turban. It must be worn right near the front of the turban. This plate shall be worn on Aaron's forehead. Aaron shall thus carry the device that expiates errors in the sacred offerings that the Israelites consecrate as holy gifts. It shall be on his forehead at all times to make these offerings acceptable for the Israelites before God. Knit the tunic out of linen, also make the turban out of Linen and an embroidered sash for Aaron's sons make tunics and sashes also make them hats that are both dignified and beautiful place these vestments on Aaron and his sons then
On the altar's foundation take all the fat that covers the inner organs as well as the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with the fat around them and burn them on the altar you must burn the bull's flesh along with its skin and the food in its intestines outside the camp it is a sin offering take the first ram and have Aaron and his sons place their hands on its head when you then slaughter the ram take its blood and sprinkle it on all sides of the altar cut the ram into pieces. Then wash off its intestines and legs and place them together with the cut up pieces of the ram and its head burn the entire ram on the altar it is a burnt offering to God it shall thus be an appeasing fragrance of fire offering to God take the second ram and have Aaron and his sons place their hands on its head when you then slaughter the ram take its blood and place some of it on the right ear lobe of Aaron and his sons as well as on their right thumbs and right big toes sprinkle it. Remaining blood on all sides of the altar collect the blood that is on the altar and together with the anointing oil sprinkle it on Aaron and his vestments as well as on his sons and their vestments this will consecrate Aaron and his vestments as well as his sons and their vestments take the intestinal fat of the second ram along with its broad tail the fatty layer covering the stomach the lobe of the liver the two kidneys together with their fat and the right hind leg since this ram is an installation offering also take one cake of unleavened bread one loaf of oil bread and one flat cake from the basket of unleavened bread that is before God place all these items onto the open hands of Aaron and his sons and have them wave these items in the prescribed motions of a wave offering before God then take these items from their hands and burn them on the altar after the first ram which is a burnt offering let it be an appeasing fragrance before God since it is a fire offering to God take the breast of Aaron's installation ram and wave it in the motions prescribed for a wave offering this shall be your portion Moses sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the hind leg of the uplifted offering for all time these are the parts of the installation ram of Aaron and his sons that were waved with the prescribed horizontal and vertical motions it shall be a law for all times that this be an offering for Aaron and his sons from it. Israelites taken from their peace offerings as a priestly offering to God Aaron's sacred vestments shall also be passed down to his descendants after him to give them special status and to install them the descendant who takes Aaron's place to enter the communion tent and perform the divine service in the inner sanctuary must first put on these vestments for seven consecutive days take the rest of the installation ram and cook its flesh in a sanctified area Aaron and his sons shall eat the ram's meat along with the bread in the basket near the entrance of the communion tent they will gain atonement by eating these offerings and they will thus be installed to their consecrated rank these offerings are sacred and therefore may not be eaten by any outsider if any meat of the installation offering or any of the bread is left over until morning you must burn the leftovers in the fire since it is consecrated it may not be eaten do exactly as I have instructed you for Aaron and his sons their installation shall take seven days sacrifice a young bull as a sin offering each day for atonement by sprinkling the blood of this offering on the altar you will atone for any misdeed associated with making it and by anointing it you will sanctify it for all seven days you shall make such atonement for the altar and sanctify it thus making the altar holy of holies anything that touches the altar will therefore become sanctified consecrating the altar this is what you must do for the altar offer two yearling sheep each day consecutively the first sheep shall be offered in the morning and the second sheep in the afternoon offer one tenth of fine flour mixed with one fourth in pressed olive oil and a libation of one fourth in wine with the first sheep offer the second sheep in the afternoon along with a meal offering and libation just like that of the sheep offered in the morning it shall then be an appeasing fragrance to God this shall also be the continual burnt offering for all generations it shall be offered before God at the entrance of the communion tent the place where I commune with all the people by speaking with you there it is there that I will commune with the Israelites and the tabernacle will thus be sanctified with my glory I will sanctify the communion tent and the altar and I will also sanctify Aaron and his sons to be priests to me I will make my presence felt among the Israelites and I will be a God for them they will realize that I God their Lord brought them out of Egypt to make my presence felt among them I am God their Lord the incense altar make an altar to burn incense out of acacia wood it shall be square a cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high including its horns cover it with a layer of pure gold on its top its walls all around and its horns make a gold rim all around it place two gold rings under the altar's rim on its two opposite sides as receptacles to hold the poles with which it is carried make the carrying poles out of acacia wood and cover them with a layer of gold place this altar in front of the cloth partition concealing the testimony ark before the cloth partition concealing the testimony area where I commune with you Aaron shall burn incense on this altar each morning when he cleans out the lamps he shall also burn incense before evening when he lights the lamps thus for all generations there will be Incense before God at all times do not burn any unauthorized incense on it furthermore do not offer any animal sacrifice meal offering or libation on it furthermore once each year Aaron shall make atonement on the horns of this altar for all generations he shall make atonement with the blood of the atonement sacrifice once each year this altar shall be a holy of holies to God instructions for a census God spoke to Moses saying when you take a census of the Israelites to determine their numbers each one shall be counted by giving an atonement offering for his life in this matter they will not be stricken by the plague when they are counted everyone included in the census must give a half shekel this shall be by the sanctuary standard where a shekel is twenty years it is half of such a shekel that must be given as an offering to God every man over twenty years old shall be included in the census and give this offering to God the rich may not give more and it or may not give less than this half shekel it is an offering to God to atone for your lives you will take this atonement money from the Israelites and use it for making the communion tent it will thus be a remembrance for the Israelites before God to atone for your lives the wash stand God spoke to Moses saying make a copper wash stand along with the copper base for it place it between the altar and the communion tent and fill it with water for washing Aaron and his sons must was there hands and feet from this wash stand if they are not to die they must wash with the water of this wash stand before entering the communion tent or approaching the altar to perform the divine service presenting a fire offering to God if they are not to deserve death they must first wash their hands and feet this shall be for Aaron and his descendants a law for all time for all generations the anointing oil God spoke to Moses saying you must take the finest fragrances 500 shekels of distilled myrrh two half portions each consisting of 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon and 250 shekels of fragrant cane and 500 shekels of cassia all measured by the sanctuary standard along with a gallon of olive oil make it into sacred anointing oil it shall be a blended compound as made by a skilled perfumer made especially for the sacred anointing oil then use it to anoint the communion tent the ark of testimony the table and all its utensils the menorah and its utensils the incense altar the sacrificial altar and all its utensils the wash stand and its base you will thus sanctify them making them holy of holy so that anything touching them become sanctified you must also anoint Aaron and his son sanctifying them as priests to me speak to the Israelites and tell them this shall be the sacred anointing oil to me for all generations do not pour it on the skin of any unauthorized person and do not duplicate it with a similar formula it is holy and it must remain sacred to you if a person blends a similar formula or places it on an unauthorized person he shall be cut off spiritually from his people the incense God said to Moses take fragrances such as balsam onica galvanum and pure frankincense all of the same weight as well as other specified fragrances make the mixture into incense as compounded by a master perfumer well blended pure and holy grind it very finely and place it before the ark of testimony in the communion tent where I commune with you it shall be holy of holies to you do not duplicate the formula of the incense that you are making for personal use since it must remain sacred to God if a person makes it to enjoy its fragrance he shall be cut off spiritually from his people the architects God spoke to Moses saying I have selected Bet son of Uri son of Shev the tribe of Judah by name I have filled him with a divine spirit with wisdom understanding and knowledge and with the talent for all types of craftsmanship he will be able to devise plans as well as work in gold, silver and copper cut stones to be set hard wood and do other work. I have also given him a holly of son of Kisimak of the tribe of Dan as an assistant. Besides this I have placed wisdom in the heart of every naturally talented person. They will thus make all that I have ordered the communion tent the ark for the testimony the ark covered to go on it all the utensils
Generations as an eternal covenant it is a sign between me and the Israelites that during the six weekdays God made heaven and earth but on Saturday he ceased working and withdrew to the spiritual the golden calf when God finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai he gave them two tablets of the testimony they were stone tablets written with God's finger the golden calf meanwhile the people began to realize that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain they gathered around Aaron and said to him make us an oracle to lead us we have no idea what happened to Moses the man who brought us out of Egypt take the rings off the ears of your wives and children replied Aaron bring them to me all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron he took the rings from the people and had someone form the gold in a mold casting it into a calf some of the people began to say this Israel is your God who brought you out of Egypt when Aaron Saw this he built an altar before the calf Aaron made an announcement and said tomorrow there will be a festival to God getting up early the next morning the people sacrificed burnt offerings and brought peace offerings the people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to enjoy themselves Moses response God declared to Moses go down for the people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt they have been quick to leave the way that I ordered them to follow and they have made themselves a cast metal calf they have bowed down and offered sacrifice to it exclaiming this Israel is your God who brought you out of Egypt God then said to Moses I have observed the people and they are an unbending group now do not try to stop me when I unleash my wrath against them to destroy them I will then make you into a great nation Moses began to plead before God his Lord he said oh God why unleash your wrath against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a show of force why should Egypt be able to say that you took them out with evil intentions to kill them in the hill country and wipe them out from the face of the earth withdraw your display of anger and refrain from doing evil to your people remember your servants Abraham Isaac and Jacob you swore to them by your very essence and declared that you would make their descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky giving their descendants the land you promised so that they would be able to occupy it forever. God refrained from doing the evil that he planned for his people Moses descends Moses turned around and began going down the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand they were tablets written on both sides with the writing visible from either side the tablets were made by God and written with God's script engraved on the tablets Joshua heard the sound of the people rejoicing and he said to Moses it sounds as though there is a battle going on in the camp. It is not the song of victory replied Moses nor the dirge of the defeated what I hear is just plain singing as he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing Moses displayed anger and threw down the tablets that were in his hand shattering them at the foot of the mountain he took the calf that the people had made and burned it in fire grinding it into fine powder he then scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it Moses said to Aaron what did the people do to you that you allowed them to commit such a great sin do not be angry my lord replied Aaron but you must realize that the people have bad tendencies they said to me make an oracle to lead us since we do not know what happened to Moses the man who took us out of Egypt when I responded to them who has gold they took it off and gave it to me I threw the gold into the fire and the result was this calf Moses realized that the people had actually been restrained Aaron had restrained them doing only a small part of what the outspoken ones had demanded Moses stood up at the camp's entrance and announced whoever is for God join me all the levites gathered around him he said to them this is what God Lord of Israel says let each man put on his sword and go from one gate to the other in the camp let each one kill all those involved in the idolatry even his own brother close friend or relative the levites did as Moses had ordered and approximately 3,000 people were killed that day Moses said today you can be ordained as a tribe dedicated to God with a special blessing men have been willing to kill even their own sons and brothers at God's command the next day Moses said to the people you have committed a terrible sin now I will go back up to God and try to gain atonement for your crime Moses went back up to God and he said the people have committed a terrible sin by making a golden idol now if you would please forgive their sin if not you can blot me out from the book that you have written God replied to Moses I will blot out from my book those who have sinned against me now go you still have to lead the people to the place that I described to you I will send my angel before you still when I grant special providence to the people I will take the sin of theirs into account God then struck the people with the plague because of the calf that Aaron had made Moses and the decree God declared to Moses you and the people you took out of Egypt will have to leave this place and go to the land regarding which I swore to Abraham Isaac and Jacob that I would give it to their descendants I will send an angel ahead of you and drive out the Canaanites Amorites Hittites Perizzites Hivites and Yebusites you will thus go to a land flowing with milk and honey however I will not go with you since you are an unbending people and I may destroy you along the way when they heard this bad news the people began to mourn they stopped wearing jewelry God told Moses to say to the Israelites you are an unbending people in just one second I can go among you and Utterly destroy you now take off your jewelry and I will know what to do with you from that time at Mount Horeb on the people no longer wore their jewelry Moses took his tent and set it up outside the camp at a distance he called it the meeting tent later whoever sought God would go to the meeting tent outside the camp whenever Moses went out to the tent all the people would rise and each person would stand near his own tent gazing at Moses until he would come to his tent when Moses went into the tent the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the tent's entrance and God would speak to Moses when the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tent's entrance the people would rise and each one would bow down at the entrance of his tent God would speak to Moses face to face just as a person speaks to a close friend Moses would then return to the camp but his aide the young man Joshua son of Nun did not leave the tent Moses plea Moses said to God you told me to bring these people to the promised land but you did not tell me whom you would send with me you also said that you know me by name and that you are pleased with me now if you are indeed pleased with me allow me to know your way so that I will know how to remain pleasing to you also you must confirm that this nation is your people my presence will go and leave you replied God Moses said if your presence does not accompany us do not make us leave this place unless you accompany us how can it be known that I and your people are pleasing to you but if you do I and your people will be distinguished from every nation on the face of the earth the divine glory God said to Moses since you have been pleasing to me and I know you by name I will also fulfill this request of yours please let me have a vision of your glory begged Moses God replied I will make all my good pass before you and reveal the divine name in your presence but still I will have mercy and show kindness to whomever I desire God then explained you cannot have a vision of my presence a man cannot have a vision of me and still exist God then said I have a special place where you can stand on the rocky mountain when my glory passes by I will place you in the crevice in the mountain protecting you with my power until I pass by I will then remove my protective power and you will have a vision of what follows from my existence my essence itself however will not be seen the second tablets God said to Moses carve out two tablets for yourself just like the first ones I will write on those tablets the same words that were on the first tablets that you broke be ready in the morning so that you will be able to climb Mount Sinai in the morning and stand waiting for me on the mountain peak no man may climb up with you and no one else may appear on the entire mountain even the cattle and sheep may not graze near the mountain Moses carved out two stone tablets like the first he then got up early in the morning and climbed Mount Sinai as God had commanded him taking the two stone tablets in his hand God revealed himself in a cloud and it stood there with Moses Moses called out in God's name God passed by before Moses and proclaimed God God omnipotent merciful and kind slow to anger with tremendous resources of love and truth he remembers deeds of love for thousands of generations forgiving sin rebellion and error he does not clear those who do not repent but keeps in mind the sins of it fathers to their children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation Moses quickly bowed his head and prostrated himself he said if you are indeed pleased with me O God let my Lord go among us this nation may be unbending but forgive our sins and errors and make us your own God said I will make a covenant before all your people and will do miracles that have never been brought into existence in all the world among any nation all the people among whom you dwell will see how Fearsome are the deeds that I got am doing with you. Be very careful with regard to what I am instructing you today. I will drive the Amorites, Canaanites, Hivites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Yebusites out before you. Be most careful not to make a treaty with the people who live in the land where you are coming since they can be a fatal trap to you. You must shatter their
During the six weekdays but on Saturday you must stop working ceasing from all plowing and reaping keep the festival of Shavuot through the first fruits of your wheat harvest also keep the harvest festival soon after the year changes three times each year all your males shall thus present themselves before God the Master Lord of Israel when I expel the other nations before you and extend your boundaries no one will be envious of your land when you go to be seen in God's presence three times each year do not slaughter the Passover sacrifice with leaven in your possession do not allow the Passover sacrifice to remain overnight until morning bring the first fruits of your land to the temple of God your Lord do not eat meat cooked in milk even that of its own mother Moses returns with the tablets God said to Moses write these words down for yourself since it is through these words that I have made a covenant with you and Israel Moses remained there with God on the mountain for forty days and forty nights without eating bread nor drinking water God wrote the words of the covenant consisting of the Ten Commandments on the tablets Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as Moses descended from the mountain he did not realize that the skin of his face had become luminous when God had spoken to him when Aaron and all the Israelites saw that the skin of Moses' face was shining with the brilliant light they were afraid to come close to him Moses summoned them and when Aaron and all the community leaders returned to him Moses spoke to them after that all the Israelites approached and Moses gave them instructions regarding all that God had told him on Mount Sinai when Moses finished speaking with them he placed the hood over his face whenever Moses came before God to speak with him he would remove the hood until he was ready to leave he would then go out and speak to the Israelites telling them what he had been commanded the Israelites would see that the skin of Moses' face was glowing brilliantly Moses would then replace the hood over his face until he would once again speak with God the Sabbath Moses assembled the entire Israelite community and said to them these are the words that God has commanded for you to do you may do work during the six weekdays but Saturday must be kept holy as a Sabbath of Sabbaths to God whoever does any work on that day shall be put to death do not ignite any fire on the Sabbath no matter where you may live materials for the tabernacle Moses said to the entire Israelite community this is the word that God has commanded collect among yourselves an elevated offering to God if a person feels like giving an offering to God he can bring any of the following gold silver copper sky blue wool dark red wool wool dyed with the crimson worm fine linen goats wool red and ram skins blue processed hides acacia wood oil for the lamp fragrances for the anointing oil and perfume incense as well as sardonyx and other precious stones for the ephod and the breastplate every naturally talented individual among you shall come forth and make all that God has ordered the tabernacle along with its over tent roof fasteners beams crossbars and pillars the ark and its carrying poles the ark cover the cloth partition the table along with its carrying poles all its utensils and the showbread bit menorah lamp along with its utensils lights and illuminating oil the incense altar and its carrying poles the anointing oil the perfumed incense the drape for the tabernacles entrance the sacrificial altar along with its carrying poles and all its utensils the washstand and its base the hangings for the enclosure its pillars and bases the drape for the enclosures entrance the stakes for the tent the stakes for the enclosure the tying ropes the packing cloths for sacred use the sacred vestments for Aaron the priest and the vestments that his sons will wear to serve the entire Israelite community left Moses presence each person who was ready to volunteer then came forward also each one who wanted to give brought a donation to God for the making of the communion tent all its necessities and the sacred vestments the men accompanied the women and those who wanted to make a donation brought bracelets earrings finger rings and body ornaments all made of gold there were also all the ones who donated a wave offering of gold to God every person who had sky blue wool dark red wool crimson wool fine linen goats wool red and ram skins or blue processed hides brought these items whoever donated silver or copper brought it as a divine offering and anyone who had acacia wood that could be used for the dedicated work also brought it every skilled woman put her hand to spinning and they all brought the spun yarn of sky blue wool dark red wool crimson wool and fine linen highly skilled women volunteers also spun the goats wool the tribal leaders brought the sardonyxes and other precious stones for the ephod and breastplate as well as the fragrances and olive oil for the lamp the anointing oil and the perfumed incense every man and woman among the Israelites who felt an urge to give something for all the work that God had ordered through Moses brought a donation for God appointing the architects Moses said to the Israelites God has selected Bet son of Uri, son of Shub, the tribe of Judah, and has filled him with a divine spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and a talent for all types of craftsmanship. He will thus be able to devise plans working gold, silver, and copper cut stones to be set and do carpentry and other skilled work. God also gave to him an Ohali of son of Isamak of the tribe of Dan the ability to teach others. He has granted them a natural talent for all craftsmanship to form materials to brocade or embroider patterns with sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool and fine linen and to weave. They will thus be able to do all the necessary work in planning, appointing the architects. Bet Salel shall thus do all that God commanded along with Ohali and every other skilled individual to whom God has granted the wisdom and understanding to know how to do all the work necessary for the sacred task. Moses summoned Bet Salel and all the other skilled individuals upon. Whom God had bestowed a natural talent, all who volunteered to dedicate themselves to completing the task in Moses' presence, they took the entire donation that the Israelites had brought to complete the work on the sacred task. Meanwhile, the Israelites were bringing more gifts each morning. All the craftsmen engaged in the sacred work left the work they were doing and came to Moses. They said to Moses, The people are bringing much more than is needed for the work that God commanded to do. Moses gave orders to make an announcement in the camp. Let no man or woman bring any more material for the sacred offering. The people stopped bringing, but the materials were more than enough for all the work that had to be done. Making the tabernacle, all the most talented craftsmen worked on the tabernacle itself, which consisted of ten tapestries made of twine linen together with sky blue, dark red, and crimson wool brocade with cherubs. All the tapestries were the same size, twenty-eight. Cubits long and four cubits wide. The first five tapestries were sewn together, as were the other five loops of sky blue wool were made on the innermost tapestry of the second group of five. There were fifty loops on the first tapestry and fifty on his counterpart on the second group, with all the loops on one side parallel to those on the other side. Fifty gold fasteners were made to attach the sets of tapestries together to make the tabernacle into a single unit, making the over tent. They made sheets of goat's wool for the over tent covering the tabernacle. There were eleven such sheets, and all eleven were the same size. Thirty cubits long and four cubits wide. Five sheets were sewn together to form one group, and six to form the second group. Fifty loops were made on the innermost sheet of the first group, and another fifty on the innermost sheet of the second group. They made fifty copper fasteners to join the over tent together and make it a single unit. They made a roof for the tabernacle out of red and skins and another roof above it out of blue processed hides making the beams they made the upright beams for the tabernacle out of acacia wood each beam was 10 cubits long and one and a half cubits wide with two matching square pits on the bottom all the tabernacles beams were made in this manner they made 20 beams for the southern wall of the tabernacle along with 40 silver bases to go under the 20 beams there were two bases under each beam one base going under each of the two square pits on the bottom of each beam on the second wall of the tabernacle to the north they also made 20 beams along with 40 silver bases two bases under each of the beams two picks for the western wall of the tabernacle they made six beams along with two finishing beams for the corners of the tabernacle at the bottom all the beams were joined next to one another exactly and on top every pair was joined with a square ring this was also true of the two beams on the two corners thus on the west side there was a total of eight beams along with sixteen bases two bases for each beam they made five crossbars of acacia wood for the first wall of the tabernacle to the south the second set of five crossbars for the second wall of the tabernacle to the north and five similar crossbars for the western wall of the tabernacle the middle crossbar was made to go through the center of the beams from one end to the other they covered the beams with a layer of gold they also made the rings that would hold the crossbars out of gold and they covered the crossbars themselves with a layer of gold they made the cloth partition out of sky blue dark red and crimson wool and twine linen brocade with cherubs they made four acacia poles to hold it covering the poles with a layer of gold with gold hooks attached they also cast
Poles of acacia wood and covered them with a layer of gold. He then placed the carrying poles in the rings on the ark side so that the ark could be carried with them. He made a pure gold cover two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. He made two golden cherubs hammering them out from the two ends of the cover. The cherubs were made on both ends from the same piece of metal as the cover itself. One cherub on one end and one on the other. The cherubs had their wings outstretched upward so as to shield the ark cover with their wings. They faced one another with their faces somewhat inclined downward toward the cover, making the table. He made the table out of acacia wood two cubits long, one cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. He covered it with a layer of pure gold and made it a gold room all around. He made a frame for it one hand breadth wide and placed the gold room on the frame. He cast four gold rings for the table, placing the rings on it. Corners of its four legs, the rings were adjacent to the frame and were meant to hold the poles used to carry the table. He made acacia poles to carry the table and covered them with a layer of gold. He made the utensils to go on the table, bread forms and incense bowls, as well as half tubes and side frames to serve as dividers for the bread, all out of pure gold. Making the lamp, he made the menorah out of pure gold, hammering the menorah along with its base stem and decorative cups, spheres, and flowers out of a single piece of metal. Six branches extended from the menorah's sides, three on one and three on the other. There were three embossed cups, a sphere and a flower on each branch. This was true of all six branches extending from the menorah. The menorah's shaft had four embossed cups along with its own spheres and flowers. There was a sphere at the base of each of the three pairs of branches extending from the stem. This was true of all six of the menorah's branches. The spheres and branches were all made from the same ingot as the menorah itself. It was all hammered from a single piece of pure gold. He thus made the menorah with seven lamps. He also made its wick tongs and ash scoops out of pure gold. The menorah and all its parts were made from a talent of gold. Making the incense altar, he made the incense altar of acacia wood one cubit square and including its horns two cubits high. He covered its top, its walls all around, and its horns with a layer of pure gold and made it a gold room all around. He made two rings for the altar below its rim on its two opposite sides so as to hold the poles with which the altar was carried. He made the carrying poles out of acacia wood and covered them with a layer of gold using the techniques of the perfumer. He made the sacred anointing oil and the pure perfume incense. Making the sacrificial altar, he made the sacrificial altar out of acacia wood five cubit square and three cubits high. He made the protrusions on all four corners as an integral part of the altar structure and then covered the entire structure with a layer of copper. He made all the altar's utensils, pots, scoops, sacrificial basins, flesh pokers, and fire pans. They were all made out of copper. He made a screen out of copper mesh and placed it below the altar's decorative border extending downward until the middle of the altar. He cast four rings on the copper screen to hold the carrying poles he made. Acacia carrying poles and covered them with a layer of copper. He placed the carrying poles in the rings on the altar's corner so that it could be carried. He constructed the altar as a hollow structure made out of boards, making a washstand. He made the copper washstand and its copper base out of the mirrors of the dedicated women who congregated at the entrance of the communion tent, making the enclosure. He made the enclosure for the tabernacle on the south side, the twine linen. Hangings were 100 cubits long held by 20 poles with 20 copper bases and silver pole hooks and bands on the north side. It was also 100 cubits long held by 20 poles with 20 copper bases and silver pole hooks and bands on the west side. The curtains were 50 cubits held by 10 poles with 10 bases and silver pole hooks and bands. The east side was also 50 cubits wide. The hangings on one side of the enclosure were 15 cubits long held by 3 poles with 3 bases. The same was true of the other side of the enclosure's entrance so that the hangings there were also 15 cubits wide held by 3 poles with 3 bases. All the enclosure's hangings were made of twine linen. The bases for the poles were made of copper while the pole hooks and bands were made of silver. All the enclosure's poles also had silver caps and the poles themselves were ringed with silver. The drape for the enclosure's entrance was embroidered out of sky blue, dark red and crimson wool together. With twine linen it was 20 cubits long and 5 cubits wide, or high, just like the other hangings of the enclosure it was held with 4 poles having 4 copper bases and silver hooks caps and bands all the stakes used for the tabernacle itself and the surrounding enclosure were made of copper the accounting these are the accounts of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which were calculated by Moses ordered by the Levites under it the Mar son of Aaron the priest Betzalel son of Uri son of Chav the tribe of Judah used these materials to make all that God had commanded Moses with him was Ohali of son of Isamach of the tribe of Dan who was a skilled carpenter and was also expert in brocading and embroidering with sky blue dark red and crimson wool and fine linen the materials all the gold was used in the work to complete the sacred task the amount of gold donated as a wave offering was 29 talents and 730 shekels by the sanctuary standard the silver census money collected from the community came out to 100 talents and 1775 shekels by the sanctuary standard this consisted of a becca which was a half shekel by sanctuary standards for each of the 600 and 3550 men over 20 years old included in the census the 100 talents were used to cast the bases for the sanctuary and the clock partition there were a total of 100 bases made out of the 100 talents one talent for each base out of the remaining 1775 shekels the hooks caps and inlaid hoops for the pillars were made the copper donated as a wave offering came out to 70 talents and 2400 shekels it was used to make the bases for the communion tents and trance the copper altar along with its copper screen and all the altars utensils the bases for the surrounding enclosure the bases for the enclosures and trance the stakes for the tabernacle and the stakes for the surrounding enclosure the materials from the sky blue dark red and crimson wool they made the packing cloths for sacred use they also made the sacred vestments for Aaron as God had commanded Moses making the ephod he made the ephod out of gold thread sky blue dark red and crimson wool and twine linen they beat out thin sheets of gold and cut them into threads which were then included in the sky blue dark red and crimson wool and the fine linen the ephod was made as a pattern brocade they made shoulder pieces for its own to its two corners the ephod's attached belt woven together with it was made in the same manner also out of gold thread sky blue dark red and crimson wool and twine linen it was thus made as God had commanded Moses setting the sardonyx as they prepared the sardonyx stones to be placed in the settings the stones were engraved as on a signet ring with the names of Israel's sons he placed them on the ephod's shoulder pieces as remembrance stones for Israel's sons it was done as God had commanded Moses making the breastplate he made the breastplate out of rocket work just like the ephod it was also made from gold thread sky blue dark red and crimson wool and twine linen the breastplate was made to be a square when folded over it was a span long and when folded over a span wide the breastplate was set with four rows of precious stones the first row carnelian emerald topaz the second row carbuncle sapphire beryl the third row jacinth agate amethyst the fourth row chersolite onyx jasper the stones contained the names of israel's sons there were twelve names engraved as on a signet ring one for each of the twelve tribes matched pure gold cables braided like cords were attached to the breastplate they made two gold settings and two gold rings and they placed the two rings on the breastplate's two upper corners the two gold braids were then attached to the two rings on the breastplate's corners the two braids on the two corners were attached to the two settings and they were thus attached to the ephod's shoulder pieces toward the front they made two gold rings and placed them on the breastplate's two lower corners on the edge toward the inside of the ephod they made two gold rings and placed them on the bottoms of the ephod's two shoulder pieces toward the front near where they were attached above the ephod's belt they laced the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a twist of sky blue wool so that the breastplate would remain above the ephod's belt it breastplate would thus not be displaced from the ephod all this was done as God had commanded Moses making the robe he made the robe for the ephod weaving it completely out of sky blue wool the robe's opening was in the middle like the opening of a coat of mail with a border all around so that it not be left open on the skirt of the robe they made pomegranates out of twine sky blue dark red and crimson wool they made pure gold bells and placed the bells between the pomegranates the bells were thus all around on the bottom of the robe between the pomegranates there was a bell and a pomegranate a bell and
its utensils and the illuminating well the golden altar the anointing well the perfumed incense the communion tent straight the copper altar along with its carrying poles and all its equipment the washstand and its base the hangings for the enclosure its poles and bases the drape for the enclosures and trance its tying ropes and stakes all the equipment used in the communion tent tabernacle service the packing cloths for sacred use the sacred vestments for Aaron the priest and the vestments that his sons would wear to serve the Israelites had done all the work exactly in the manner that God had commanded Moses when Moses saw that all the work had been done exactly as God had ordered he blessed all the workers orders for erecting the tabernacle God spoke to Moses saying on the first day of the first month you shall erect the communion tent tabernacle place the ark of testimony there and shield the ark with the cloth partition bring in the table and set it up and bring in the menorah and light its lamps place the gold incense altar directly in front of the ark of testimony and then set up the drape at the tabernacle's entrance place the sacrificial altar in front of the entrance of the communion tent tabernacle and place the washstand between the communion tent and the altar and fill it with water set up the enclosure all around and place the drape over the enclosure's entrance take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and Everything in it you will thus sanctify it and all its equipment making it holy anoint the sacrificial altar and all its equipment you will thus sanctify the altar and it will be holy of holies anoint the washstand and its basin and make them holy bring Aaron and his sons to the communion tent's entrance and have them immerse in a mikvah then have Aaron put on the sacred vestments and anoint him thus sanctifying him as a priest to me bring forth Aaron's sons and place the tunics on them then anoint them just as you anointed their father so that they will be priests to me it will be done so that their anointing will make them an eternal hereditary priesthood for all generations Moses proceeded to do exactly as God had commanded him the tabernacle is erected in the first month of the second year of the exodus on the first of the month the tabernacle was erected Moses erected the tabernacle he did this by setting up the bases placing the beams in the men. Fastening them together with the crossbars, he then set up the pillars. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and placed the tent's roof over it. It was all done as God had commanded Moses. Placing the ark, he took the tablets of testimony and placed them in the ark. He then placed the carrying poles in the ark and set the cover on top of the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the cloth partition so that it would shield the ark of testimony. It was all done as God had commanded Moses. Placing the table, he placed the table in the communion tent outside the cloth partition on the north side of the tabernacle. Then he placed the prescribed arrangement of bread on it before God. It was all done as God had commanded Moses. Placing the lamp, he placed the menorah in the communion tent directly across from the table on the southern side of the tabernacle. He then lit the lamps before God. It was all done as God had commanded Moses. Placing the incense. Altar he placed the golden altar in the communion tent in front of the cloth partition and he burned perfume incense on it. It was all done as God had commanded Moses the drape and the altar he placed the drape over the tabernacle's entrance. He then placed the sacrificial altar in front of the entrance of the communion tent tabernacle and he sacrificed the burnt offering and meal offering on it. It was all done as God had commanded Moses placing the washstand he set it. Wash stand between the communion tent and the altar and he filled it with water for washing Moses Aaron and Aaron's sons washed their hands and feet from it they would wash in this manner whenever they came to the communion tent or offered sacrifice on the altar it was all done as God had commanded Moses setting up the enclosure he set up the enclosure surrounding the tabernacle and altar and he placed the drape over the enclosure's entrance with this Moses completed all the work the cloud on the tabernacle the cloud covered the communion tent and God's glory filled the tabernacle Moses could not come into the communion tent since the cloud had rested on it and God's glory filled the tabernacle later when the cloud would rise up from the tabernacle it would be a signal for the Israelites to move on and this was true in all their travels whenever the cloud did not rise they would not move on waiting until the day it did God's cloud would then remain on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night this was visible to the entire family of Israel in all their travels burnt offerings of cattle God called to Moses speaking to him from the communion tent he said speak to the Israelites and tell them the following when one of you brings a mammal as an offering to God the sacrifice must be taken from the cattle sheep or goats if the sacrifice is a burnt offering taken from the cattle it must be an unblemished male one must bring it of his own free will to the entrance of the communion tent before God he shall press his hands on the head of the burnt offering and it shall then be accepted as an atonement for him he shall have the young bull slaughtered before God Aaron's sons the priests shall then bring forth the blood dashing it on all sides of the altar that is in front of the communion tent's entrance he shall have the burnt offering skinned and cut into pieces Aaron's sons shall place fire on the altar and Arrange wood on the fire Aaron's sons shall then arrange the cut pieces the head and the fatty intestinal membrane on top of the wood that is on the altar fire the inner organs and legs however must first be scrubbed with water the priest shall thus burn the entire animal on the altar as a completely burnt fire offering to God and appeasing fragrance burnt offerings of smaller animals if one's burnt offering is a smaller animal it shall be taken from the sheep or goats and one must likewise present an unblemished male he shall have it slaughtered on the north side of the altar before God and the priest who are Aaron's descendants shall dash its blood on all sides of the altar the animal shall be cut into pieces and the priest shall arrange them along with the head and intestinal membrane on top of the wood on the altar fire the internal organs and feet shall first be washed with water and the priest shall then offer everything burning it on the altar it is a Completely burnt fire offering and appeasing fragrance to God. Burnt offerings of birds. If one's burnt offering is a bird, he must bring a turtle dove or a young common dove. The priest shall bring it to the altar and nip off its head after draining the bird's blood on the altar's wall. He shall burn the head on the altar. He shall remove the bird's crop along with its adjacent feathers and cast them into the place of the fatty ashes directly to the east of the altar. He shall split the bird apart by its wings without tearing it completely in half. The priest shall then burn it on the altar on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, a fire offering that is an appeasing fragrance to God. The meal offering of an individual presents a meal offering to God. His offering must consist of the best grade of wheat meal on it. He shall pour olive oil and place frankincense. He shall bring it to the priest who are Aaron's descendants and the priest shall scoop out three. Fingers full of its meal and oil, and then take all the frankincense. The priest shall then burn this memorial portion on the altar as a fire offering and appeasing fragrance to God. The rest of the meal offering shall belong to Aaron and his descendants. It is holy of holies among the fire offerings to God. The baked offering, if he brings a meal offering that was baked in an oven, it shall consist either of unleavened loaves made of wheat meal mixed with olive oil or flat matzah saturated with olive oil. The pan offering, if the sacrifice is a pan fried offering, it shall be made of wheat meal mixed with olive oil, and it shall remain unleavened. Break it into little pieces and pour olive oil on it. In this respect, it is like every other meal offering. The deep fried offering, if your sacrifice is a meal offering prepared in a deep pot, it shall be made of wheat meal and olive oil. You may thus bring a meal offering in any of these ways as an offering to God. It shall be. Presented to the priest and brought to the altar, the priest shall then lift out the memorial portion from the meal offering and burn it on the altar. It is a fire offering and appeasing fragrance to God. The remainder of the meal offering then belongs to Aaron and his descendants. It is holy of holies, one of God's fire offerings. Do not make any meal offering that is sacrificed to God out of leavened dough. This is because you may not burn anything fermented or sweet as a fire offering to God. Although these may be brought as a first fruit offering to God, they may not be offered on the altar as an appeasing fragrance. Moreover, you must salt every meal offering. Do not leave out the salt of your God's covenant from your meal offerings. Furthermore, you must also offer salt with your animal sacrifices. The first grain offering, when you bring an offering of the first grain, it should be brought as soon as it ripens on the stock. Your first grain offering shall consist of fresh kernels of barley roasted in a perforated pan and then ground into coarse meal. Place olive oil and frankincense on it, just like for any other meal offering as a fire offering to God. The priest shall then burn the memorial portion taken from its coarse meal and oil, as well as all its frankincense peace offerings of cattle. If one sacrifices a peace offering and it is from the cattle,
As a fire offering to God, peace offerings of goats, if his sacrifice is a goat, he shall present it before God, he shall press his hands on its head and have it slaughtered before the communion. Ten parents' descendants shall then dash its blood on all sides of the altar as his fire offering sacrifice to God, he shall present the layer of fat that covers the stomachs and all the other fat attached to the stomachs, the two kidneys along with the fat on them, along the flanks and the lobe over. The liver near the kidneys shall also be removed, the priests shall burn them on the altar to be consumed as a fire offering and appeasing fragrance. All the prescribed internal fat thus belongs to God, it shall be an eternal law for all your generations that you are not to eat any internal fat that is normally sacrificed, nor any blood, no matter where you may live sin offerings for the high priest. God spoke to Moses with instructions to speak to the Israelites and tell them the following. This is the law of an individual commits an inadvertent sin by violating certain specified prohibitory commandments of God. If the anointed priest commits an inadvertent violation bringing guilt to his people, the sacrifice for his violation shall be an unblemished young bull as a sin offering to God. He shall bring the bull before God to the entrance of the communion tent and press his hands on the bull's head. He shall then slaughter the bull before God. The anointed priest shall take the bull's blood and bring it into the communion tent. The priest shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it seven times before God toward the cloth partition in the sanctuary. The priest shall then place some of the blood on the incense altar which is before God in the communion tent. He shall then spill out all the rest of the bull's blood at the base of the sacrificial altar which is in front of the communion tent and trance. He shall separate out all the fat of the sin offering. Bull taking the layer of fat covering the stomachs and all the fat attached to the stomachs, the two kidneys, the fat on them along the flanks and the lobe on the liver near the kidneys shall also be removed. All these are the same as the parts removed from the peace offering. The priest shall then burn them on the sacrificial altar. He shall take the bull's skin and all its flesh from head to toe as well as the food in its intestines. The entire bull shall thus be removed to the ritually pure place outside the camp where the altar's ashes are deposited. It shall be burned in fire on the wood in the place where the ashes are deposited. Sin offerings for the community if the entire community of Israel commits an inadvertent violation as a result of the truth being hidden from the congregation's eyes and they violate one of the specified prohibitory commandments of God, they shall incur guilt when the violation that they have committed becomes known. It Congregation must bring a young bull as a sin offering, presenting it before the communion tent. The community elders shall press their hands on the bull's head before God, and it shall be slaughtered before God. The anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood into the communion tent, and dipping his finger into the blood, he shall sprinkle it seven times before God toward the cloth partition. He shall then place some of the blood on the horns of the incense altar that is before God. In the communion tent, he shall spill out all the rest of the blood at the base of the sacrificial altar, which is in front of the communion tent's entrance. He shall then separate out all of its fat and burn it on the altar, doing with this bull exactly as he did with the bull sacrifice as a sin offering for the anointed priest. The priest shall thus make atonement for the community so that they will be forgiven. He shall remove the bull to a place outside the camp and burn it. Just as he burned the first bull, this is the sin offering for the entire congregation. Sin offerings for the king. If the leader commits a sin by inadvertently violating certain of God's prohibitory commandments, he incurs guilt when he is made aware of the sin that he has committed. He must bring an unblemished male goat as his sacrifice. He shall press his hands on the goat's head and have it slaughtered as a sin offering in the same place that the burnt offering was slaughtered before. God the priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger and place it on the protrusions of the sacrificial altar. The rest of the blood shall be poured out at the base of the sacrificial altar. All the animals fat shall be burned on the altar, just like the fat of the peace offerings. The priest shall thus make atonement for the leader, and he will be forgiven sin offerings for commoners. If a commoner commits an inadvertent violation by violating any one of certain Specified prohibitory commandments of God, he incurs guilt when he is made aware of the violation he has committed. He must bring an unblemished female goat for the sin he committed. He shall press his hands on the head of the sin offering and have the sin offering slaughtered in the same place as the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the goat's blood with his finger and place it on the protrusions of the sacrificial altar, spilling out all the rest of the blood at the altars. Base he shall remove all the fat as he did with the fat of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn it on the altar as an appeasing fragrance to God. The priest shall thus make atonement for the individual, and he will be forgiven sheep as a sin offering. If he brings a sheep as a sin offering, it shall be an unblemished female. He shall press his hands on the head of the sin offering and have it slaughtered in the same place that the burnt offering was slaughtered. The priest shall take. Some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and place it on the protrusions of the sacrificial altar, spilling out all the rest of the blood at the altar's base. He shall remove all its choice parts just as he removed all the choice parts of the sheep brought as a peace offering and burn them on the altar along with the fire offerings dedicated to God. The priest will thus make atonement for the sin the person committed and he will be forgiven the adjustable guilt offering. This is the law of the person sins in any of the following ways. If he is bound by an oath to give evidence in court where he was a witness who saw or knew something and he does not testify, he must bear his guilt. The same is true if a person touches anything ritually unclean, whether it is any dead non kosher animal, wild or domestic, or any dead unclean creeping animal, and then commits a violation while forgetting that he was unclean. Similarly, if he comes in contact with any ritual. Uncleanliness stemming from a human being which renders him unclean and then forgets about it, he may later discover that he has committed a violation. This is also true if a person makes a verbal oath to do good or bad, no matter what is expressed in the oath, and then forgets about it. In any of these cases, the person is considered guilty as soon as he realizes what he has done. When he is guilty in any of these cases, he must confess the sin that he has committed. He must also bring his guilt offering to God for the sin he has committed. It must be a female sheep or goat brought as a sin offering. The priest will then make atonement for the person's sin. If he cannot afford a sheep, the guilt offering that he presents to God for his sin shall be two turtle doves or two young common doves. One shall be a sin offering and the other shall be a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest who shall first sacrifice the one for the sin offering. He shall gouge through its neck. From the back without separating the head from the body he shall then drain some of the blood on the side of the altar and the rest of the blood at the altar's base this one is the sin offering then he shall sacrifice the second bird as the law requires the priest shall thus make atonement for the sin that the person committed and he will be forgiven the meal offering for guilt if he cannot afford the two turtle doves or two common doves the sacrifice that he must bring for his sin shall consist of one tenth of wheat meal as a sin offering since it is a sin offering he shall not place any oil nor any frankincense on it he shall bring it to the priest and the priest shall scoop up three fingers full as a memorial portion he shall burn this portion as a sin offering on the altar along with God's other fire offerings the priest shall thus make atonement for the person's sin with one of the above mentioned offerings and he will be forgiven just as in the case of the meal offering the unburnt portions of these sacrifices shall belong to the priest. The misappropriation sacrifice God spoke to Moses saying, If a person sins inadvertently by expropriating for personal use something that is sacred to God, he shall bring as his guilt offering to God an unblemished ram with a prescribed value of at least two shekels according to the sanctuary standard. It shall be prepared as a guilt offering for misappropriating something that was sacred. He must make full restitution adding one-fifth to it and give it to the priest. The priest shall then atone for him with the guilt offering ram and he will be forgiven the offering for questionable guilt. If a person sins by violating certain of God's prohibited commandments without knowing for sure he still bears responsibility, he must bring an unblemished ram with the prescribed value to the priest as a guilt offering. The priest shall then make atonement for the inadvertent sin that the person committed without definite knowledge and he shall be forgiven it is a guilt offering that one must bring for his guilt toward God offerings for dishonesty God spoke to Moses saying this is the law if a person sins and commits a misappropriation offense against God by lying to his neighbor it can involve an article left for safekeeping a business deal robbery withholding funds or finding a lost object and denying it if the person swears falsely in any of these cases involving human relations he is considered to have sinned when he becomes guilty of
Parts of the peace offerings, thus there shall be a constant fire kept burning on the altar without being extinguished. Laws of the meal offering, this is the law of meal offering. One of Aaron's descendants shall offer it before God near the place where one ascends to the altar with his three middle fingers. He shall lift up some of the wheat meal and oil of the offering and then remove all the frankincense on the offering. He shall burn this on the altar as an appeasing fragrance. It is a memorial portion to God. Aaron and his descendants shall then eat the rest of the offering. It must be eaten as unleavened bread in a holy place. They must therefore eat it in the enclosure of the communion tent. It shall not be baked as leavened bread. I have given this to them as their portion of my fire offerings, and it is holy of holies like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among Aaron's descendants may eat it. It is an eternal law for all generations that it be taken from God's fire offerings. Any food coming in contact with it shall become holy. The high priest's offering God spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering that Aaron and his descendants must bring from the day that any one of them is anointed as high priest. It shall consist of one tenth of wheat meal, and it shall be a daily meal offering with one half offered in the morning and one half in the evening. It shall be prepared with olive oil on a flat pan after being. Oiled and baked it is then to be presented as an offering of many wafers of bread and appeasing fragrance to God. It is a law for all time that the anointed priest among Aaron's descendants shall prepare it. It must be completely burned. Similarly, every meal offering brought by a priest must be completely burned and not eaten. Laws of sin offerings. God spoke to Moses, telling him to relate the following message to Aaron and his descendants. This is the law of the sin offering. The sin offering must be slaughtered before God in the same place that the burnt offering is slaughtered. It is holy of holies. Any priest fit to offer it may eat it. It must be eaten in a holy place in the enclosure around the communion tent. Any food touching the sin offering shall become sanctified. If its blood splashes on any garment, it must be washed off in a sanctified area. Any clay pot in which it is cooked must be broken. However, if it is cooked in a copper pot, the pot may be purged and rinsed with water. Although it is holy of holies, any male priest may eat it. However, any sin offering whose blood is brought into the communion tent to make atonement in the sanctuary may not be eaten. It must be burned in fire. Laws of guilt offerings. This is the law of the guilt offering, which is holy of holies. The guilt offering must be slaughtered in the same place that the burnt offering is slaughtered, and its blood must be dashed on all sides of the altar. All the Choice parts such as the broad tail and the fat covering the stomachs must be presented. The two kidneys and the fat on them along the flanks and the lobe over the liver near the kidneys must also be removed. The priest must burn all these as a guilt offering on the altar of fire offering to God. All the male priests may eat the rest. It shall be eaten in a sanctified area since it is holy of holies. The sin offering and the guilt offering have exactly the same laws insofar as they can be given to any priest fit to offer them. Similarly, any priest fit to sacrifice a person's burnt offering can share in the skin of the burnt offering after it is sacrificed. The unburnt portion of any meal offering which is baked in an oven pan fried or deep fried shall also be given to any priest fit to offer it. Similarly, any meal offering whether mixed with oil or dry shall belong equally to all of Aaron's descendants. Laws of peace offerings. This is the law of it. Peace offering that is sacrificed to God if it is offered as a thanksgiving offering that it must be presented along with unleavened loaves mixed with oil flat matzah saturated with oil and loaves made of oil flour mixed with oil the sacrifice shall also be presented along with loaves of leavened bread all these shall be presented with one thanksgiving peace offering he shall present some of each of the above four bread offerings as an elevated gift to God this shall belong to the priest who sprinkles the blood of the peace offering the flesh of the thanksgiving peace offering must be eaten on the day it is offered none of it may be left over until morning however if one sacrifice offering is meant merely to fulfill a general vow or a specific pledge he shall eat it on the same day that he offers his sacrifice but what is left over may also be eaten on the next day nevertheless what is left over from the sacrifice's flesh on the third day must be burned in fire, if the person bringing the offering even plans to eat it on the third day, the sacrifice will not be accepted. It is considered putrid and it will not be counted in his favor. Any person who eats it will bear his guilt. Any sacrificial flesh that comes in contact with something unclean may not be eaten. It must be burned in fire. Otherwise, any ritually clean person may eat the flesh. But if any person eats the flesh of a peace sacrifice to God while still in a state of ritual, uncleanliness, his soul will be cut off from his people. Any person who comes in contact with human uncleanness or with an unclean mammal or other unclean creature and then eats the flesh of a peace offering to God shall have his soul cut off from his people. God spoke to Moses, telling him to relate the following to the Israelites Do not eat any of the hard fat in an ox, sheep, or goat. Even if an animal is improperly slaughtered or fatally wounded, you may use its hard fat for any purpose. You desire as long as you do not eat it, but anyone who eats the hard fat offered to God in any animal shall have his soul cut off from his people. Do not eat any blood, whether from a mammal or a bird, no matter where you may live. Any person who eats blood shall have his soul cut off from his people. The priest's portion God spoke to Moses, telling him to convey the following to the Israelites. When anyone brings a peace sacrifice to God, he must bring a special offering to God from it. With his own hands, he must bring the choice parts presented as a fire offering to God on top of the animal's chest. He shall wave the chest in the prescribed motions as a wave offering before God. The priest shall then burn the choice parts on the altar. The chest on the other hand shall belong to Aaron and his descendants. The right hind leg of your peace offering shall also be given as an elevated gift to the priest. Any descendant of Aaron fit to offer the blood and fat of it. Peace offerings shall have the right leg as a portion. This is because I have taken the chest as a wave offering and the hind leg as an elevated gift from the Israelites from their peace sacrifices, and I have given these parts to Aaron the priest and his descendants. It is a law for all times that this be taken from the Israelites. This is the portion of God's fire offerings that was given when Aaron and his sons were anointed on the day that he brought them forth to be priests to God. On the day that he anointed them, God commanded that this be given to them by the Israelites. It is an eternal law for all generations. This then is the law of the burnt offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, the inauguration offering, and the peace offering which God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. It was given on the day that he commanded the Israelites to offer their sacrifices to God in the Sinai desert installation of the priests. God spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron along with his sons the vestments, the anointing oil, the sin offering, bowl, the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread gathered the entire community at the entrance of the communion tent. Moses did as God commanded, and the community was assembled at the communion tent's entrance. Moses said to the community, This is what God has commanded to be done. Moses brought forth Aaron and his sons and immersed them in a mikvah. He then dressed Aaron with the tunic, belted him with the sash, put the robe on him, and placed the ephod over it. He girded him with the ephod's belt and tightened it on him. He then placed the breastplate on the ephod and placed the urim and thummim in the breastplate. He placed the turban on Aaron's head and toward his face just below the turban. He placed the gold forehead plate as a sacred coronet. It was all done as God commanded. Moses, Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, thus sanctifying them. He sprinkled some of the oil on the altar seven times he then anointed the altar and all its utensils as well as the washstand and its base thus sanctifying them he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and he anointed him to sanctify him Moses then brought forth Aaron's sons and he dressed them in tunics skirted them with sashes and fitted them with hats it was all done as God had commanded Moses he brought forth the bowl for the sin offering and Aaron and his sons pressed their hands on its head Moses slaughtered it and collected the blood with his finger he placed the blood all around the altar's protrusions thus purifying the altar he poured the rest of the blood at the altar's base thus sanctifying it so that atonement could be offered on it he took the fat on the stomachs the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys along with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar all the rest of the bull its skin flesh and insides he burned in fire outside the camp it was all done as God had commanded Moses, he brought forth the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons pressed their hands on its head. He slaughtered it, and Moses dashed its blood on all sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head, the cut
Aaron and his vestments as well as on Aaron's sons and their vestments Eva sanctified Aaron and his vestments as well as Aaron's sons and their vestments Moses said to Aaron and his sons cook the flesh at the communion tents and trance there you shall eat it along with the bread and the installation basket do it because I have given instructions that Aaron and his sons eat these things whatever is left over of the flesh and bread you must burn in fire do not leave the entrance of the communion tent for seven days until your period of inauguration is complete this is because your installation ceremony shall last for seven days God has commanded that whatever was done on this day must be done all seven days to atone for you remain at the communion tents entrance day and night for seven days you will thus keep God's charge and not die since this is what was commanded Aaron and his sons did all these things just as God had commanded through Moses the eighth day. Nadab and Abu died on the eighth day Moses summoned Aaron his sons and the elders of Israel he said to Aaron take yourself a calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering both unblemished and sacrifice them before God speak to the Israelites and tell them to take unblemished animals a goat for a sin offering a yearling calf and a lamb for a burnt offering and a bull and a ram for peace offerings they shall sacrifice these before God along with a meal offering mixed with oil because God will reveal himself to you today they brought what Moses ordered to the front of the communion tent and the entire community came forth and stood before God Moses said this is what God has commanded do it and God's glory will be revealed to you Moses then said to Aaron approach the altar and prepare your sin offering and burnt offering thus atoning for you and the people then prepare the people's offering to atone for them as God has commanded Aaron went up to the altar and he slaughtered the calf that he had for a sin offering Aaron's sons brought forth the blood and dipping his finger in the blood Aaron placed some on the altar's protrusions he then spilled out the rest of the blood at the altar's base he burned the fat the kidneys and the liver lobe of the sin offering it was all done as God had commanded Moses he then burned the flesh and skin of the sin offering in fire outside the camp he slaughtered the burnt offering Aaron's sons passed the blood to him and he dashed the blood on all sides of the altar they passed him the cut up parts of the burnt offering piece by piece along with the head and he burned them on the altar he washed the entrails and the feet and burned them on the altar along with the rest of the burnt offering he brought forth the people's offering he took the goat that was the people's sin offering and slaughtered it preparing it as a sin offering just like the first one he brought forth it burnt offering preparing it according to the law he brought forth the grain offering he took a handful and burned it on the altar this was in addition to the morning grain offering he slaughtered the bull and the ram that were the people's peace sacrifice Aaron's sons passed the blood to him and he dashed it on all sides of the altar they also passed him the choice parts of the bull and ram the broad tail the fatty membrane the kidneys and the liver lobe they placed the choice Parts on the chest of the animals and Aaron then burned the choice parts on the altar Aaron had first waved the chest and right hind legs in the prescribed motions as a wave offering before God it was all done as God had commanded Moses Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them he then descended from the altar where he had prepared the sin offering the burnt offering and the peace offerings Moses and Aaron went into the communion tent and when they came out they blessed the people God's glory was then revealed to all the people fire came forth from before God and consumed the burnt offering and the choice parts on the altar when the people saw this they raised their voices in praise and threw themselves on their faces the eighth day Nadab and Abu die Aaron's sons Nadab and Abu each took his fire pan placed fire on it and then incense on it they offered it before God but it was unauthorized fire which God had not instructed them to Offer fire came forth from before God and it consumed them so that they died before God. Moses said to Aaron, This is exactly what God meant when he said, I will be sanctified among those close to me and I will thus be glorified. Moses summoned Missal and El Safe and the sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel and he said to them, Come forth and remove your close relatives from inside the sanctuary, bring them outside the camp. They came forth and carried Nadab and Abu outside the camp in their tunics. As Moses had said, Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eliezer and Ithamar, Do not go without a haircut and do not tear your vestments, otherwise you will die bringing divine wrath upon the entire community. As far as your brothers are concerned, let the entire family of Israel mourn for the ones whom God burned. Do not leave the entrance of the communion tent lest you die because God's anointing oil is still upon you. They did as Moses had said, drunkenness God spoke to Aaron. Saying, when you enter the communion tent, neither you nor your descendants may drink wine or any other intoxicant, otherwise you will die. This is an eternal law for all your generations. You will thus be able to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the ritually unclean and the clean. You will also be able to render decisions for the Israelites in all the laws that God has taught you through Moses, completing the service Moses announced to Aaron and his surviving sons. Eliezer and Ithamar take the remainder of the meal offering that is before God and eat it as unleavened bread near the altar. Since it is holy of holies, you must eat it in a holy place. It is the portion for you and your descendants from God's fire offering. Since I have thus been commanded, however, the chest taken as a wave offering and the hind leg taken as an elevated gift, you may eat together with your sons and daughters. It is the portion designated for you and your descendants from it. He sacrifices of the Israelites the hind leg for the elevated gift and the chest for the wave offering shall be brought on top of the choice parts designated as a fire offering it is all to be waved in the prescribed motions of the wave offering the leg and chest are meant to be a portion for you and your descendants for all time as God commanded Moses then inquired about the goat slaughtered as a sin offering and when he discovered that it had already been burned he was angry. With Aaron's surviving sons Eliezer and Edomar he said to them why did you not eat the sin offering in a holy area? It is holy of holies and has been given to you to remove the community's guilt and atone for them before God since its blood was not brought into the inner sanctuary you should have eaten it in a holy place as I commanded you Aaron responded to Moses today when they sacrificed their sin offering and burnt offering before God such a terrible tragedy occurred to me if I had eaten the sin offering today would it have been right in God's eyes? When Moses heard this he approved the dietary laws God spoke to Moses and Aaron telling them to speak to the Israelites and convey the following to them, of all the animals in the world these are the ones that you may eat, among mammals you may eat anyone that has true hooves that are cloven and that brings up its cut however among the cut chewing hoofed animals these are the ones that you may not eat, the camel shall be unclean to you although it brings up its cut since it does. Not have a true hoop, the hyrax shall be unclean to you, although it brings up its cut since it does not have a true hoop, the hair shall be unclean to you, although it brings up its cut since it does not have a true hoop, the pig shall be unclean to you, although it has a true hoop which is cloven since it does not chew its cut, do not eat the flesh of any of these animals at this time, do not touch their carcasses since they are unclean to you, this is what you may eat of all that is in the water, you may eat any creature that lives in the water whether in seas or rivers as long as it has fins and scales, on the other hand all creatures in seas and rivers that do not have fins and scales whether they are small aquatic animals or other aquatic creatures must be avoided by you, they will always be something to be shunned, you must avoid them by not eating their flesh, every aquatic creature without fins and scales must be shunned by you, these are the flying animals that you must avoid since they are to be avoided. Do not eat any of the following: the eagle, the ospreys, the osprey, the kite, the vulture family, the entire raven family, the ostrich, the owl, the gull, the hawk family, the falcon, the cormorant, the ibis, the swan, the pelican, the magpie, the stork, the heron family, the hoopoe, and the bat. Every flying insect that uses four legs for walking shall be avoided by you. The only flying insects with four walking legs that you may eat are those which have knees extending above their feet, using these longer legs to hop on the ground. Among these, you may only eat members of the red locust family, the yellow locust family, the spotted gray locust family, and the white locust family. All other flying insects with four feet for walking must be avoided by you. There are also animals that will defile you, so that anyone touching their carcasses will be unclean until evening. Furthermore, anyone lifting their carcasses will have to immerse. Even his clothing and then remain unclean until evening. Thus, every animal that has true hooves but is not cloven hooved and does not bring up its cut is unclean to you, and anyone touching its flesh shall become unclean. Similarly, every animal that walks on its paws among four footed animals shall be unclean to you, and anyone touching its
dead body of any of these animals falls on them the seed shall be unclean to you other laws involving animals if any animal that you may eat dies anyone touching its carcass shall be unclean until evening anyone eating something from such a carcass must immerse even his clothing and then remain unclean until evening similarly one who lifts such a carcass shall immerse even his clothing and then remain unclean until evening every small animal that breeds on land shall be avoided by you and shall not be eaten thus you may not eat any creature that crawls on its belly or any small animal with four or more feet that breeds on land they are all things that must be avoided do not make yourselves disgusting by eating any small creature that breeds do not defile yourselves with them because it will make you spiritually insensitive for i am god your lord and since i am holy you must also make yourselves holy and remain sanctified therefore do not defile your souls by eating any small animal that lives on the land I am God and I brought you out of Egypt to be your God therefore since I am holy you must also remain holy this then is the law concerning mammals birds aquatic creatures and lower forms of terrestrial animals with this law you will be able to distinguish between the unclean and the clean between edible animals and animals which may not be eaten childbirth God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites relating it following when a woman conceives and gives birth to a boy she shall be ritually unclean for 7 days just as she is unclean during the time of separation when she has her period on the 8th day the child's foreskin shall be circumcised and for 33 additional days she shall have a waiting period during which her blood is ritually clean until this purification period is complete she shall not touch anything holy and shall not enter the sanctuary if she gives birth to a girl she shall have for two weeks the same ritually unclean status as during her menstrual period and for 66 days after that she shall have a waiting period during which her blood is ritually clean when her purification period for a son or a daughter is complete she shall bring to the priest to the communion tent entrance a yearling sheep for a burnt offering and a young common dove or a turtle dove for a sin offering the priest shall offer the sacrifice before God and atone for the woman thus cleansing her of the blood coming from her womb this law applies whether a woman gives birth to a boy or to a girl if the woman cannot afford a sheep she shall bring two turtle doves or two young common doves one for a burnt offering and one for a sin offering the priest shall then make atonement for her and she shall be clean the leprous curse God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying if a person has a white blotch discoloration or spot on the skin of his body and it is suspected of being a mark of the leprous curse on his skin he shall be brought to Aaron or to one of his descendants who are the priests the priest shall examine the mark on the person's skin and if the hair on the mark has turned white and the mark appears to have penetrated the skin then it is a leprous curse as soon as the priest sees it he shall declare it unclean however if there is a white spot on the skin but it does not appear to have penetrated the skin and its hair has not turned White then the priest shall quarantine the affected person for seven days the priest shall examine the person on the seventh day and if the mark has not increased in size the priest shall quarantine the victim for an additional seven days the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day and if the mark has faded or if it has not spread the priest shall declare the person clean since it is merely a white discoloration the person must immerse his body and clothing and he is then clean however if the white discoloration increases in size on the skin after it was shown to the priest who purified it the person must show it to the priest again if the priest sees that the rash has increased in size on the skin he shall declare the person unclean since it is a leprous curse healthy skin in a spot when the person is suspected of having the leprous curse he shall be brought to the priest if the priest sees that there is a white blotch on the skin and it has turned a hair white or that there is an area of healthy skin inside the blotch then it is a chronic leprosy in his skin and the priest must declare it unclean he shall not quarantine it since it is obviously unclean this is a law if the leprous area spreads over the skin so that it covers all the skin of the afflicted person from head to foot wherever the priest can see it when the priest sees that the leprous discoloration has covered all the person's skin he shall declare the afflicted person clean as long as he has turned completely white he is clean however on the day that healthy skin appears on the person he is unclean when the priest sees the healthy skin he shall declare the person unclean the healthy skin is a sign of uncleanness since it is a leprous curse if the healthy skin turns white again the person shall come back to the priest when the priest sees that the afflicted person has turned completely white the priest shall declare him clean and he is then ritually pure leprosy on an infection this is a law when there is an infection on the body and it heals if a white blotch or bright pink spot and develops where the infection was it must be shown to the priest the priest shall examine it and if it appears to have penetrated the skin and its hair has turned white it is a leprous curse that has erupted over the infection however if the priest examines it and it does not have white hair nor does it appear to have penetrated the skin since it is a dull white the priest shall quarantine the person for seven days if the spot then increases in size on the skin the priest shall declare it unclean since it is a curse however if the spot remains stable and does not expand it is scar tissue from the infection and the priest shall declare it clean leprosy on the burn this is a law when there is a burn on the body and a bright pink or white spot appears where the burn has healed the priest shall examine it and if the hair on the spot has turned white and the spot appears to have penetrated the skin it is a leprous curse breaking out on the burn since it is a leprous curse the priest shall declare it unclean however if the priest examines it and the spot does not have white hair and it is a dull white which does not appear to have penetrated the skin then the priest shall quarantine it for seven days on the seventh day the priest shall examine it and if it has increased in size on the skin the priest shall declare it unclean since it is a leprous curse however if the spot remains stable and does not increase in size or if it has faded then it is a discoloration due to the burn since it is merely scar tissue from the burn the priest shall declare it clean bald patches this is a law if a man or woman has an affliction on the head or beard the priest shall examine the affliction and if it appears to have penetrated the skin and has fine blonde hairs in it the priest shall declare it unclean such a bald mark is a sign of the leprous curse on the head or beard however if when the priest examines the bald patch the affliction does not appear to have penetrated the skin but it does not have black hair in it the priest shall quarantine the person afflicted by the bald patch for seven days on the seventh day the priest shall examine the mark if the bald mark has not increased in size and if there is no blonde hair in it so that the mark does not appear to have penetrated the skin the person shall shave himself without shaving off the bald patch the priest shall then quarantine the person having the bald patch for a second seven day period the priest shall examine the bald patch on the seventh day and if the area of fallen hair has not increased in size or if the affliction does not appear to have penetrated the skin the priest shall declare it clean the person must then immerse his body and clothing and he is clean however if the bald patch increases in size after he has cleansed himself the priest must examine it again if the bald patch has increased in size the priest need not look for blonde hair since it is automatically unclean but if the bald patch remains the same or if the black hair grows on it then the bald patch has healed and it is clean the priest shall declare the person clean dull white spots if the skin of a man's or woman's body becomes covered with white spots it priest shall examine it if the skin is merely covered with dull white spots it is a simple rash breaking out on the skin and it is clean baldness if a man loses the hair on his head it is simple baldness and he is clean similarly if he loses hair near his face it is merely a receding hairline and he is clean however if he has a bright pink mark on his bald spot or where his hairline has receded it may be a sign of the leprous curse on his bald spot or hairless forehead the priest shall examine it and if the blotch on his bald spot or hairless forehead is bright pink then it is like leprosy on the skin of his body the person is considered afflicted by the leprous curse and he is unclean since he is unclean and the mark is on his head the priest must declare him unclean when a person has the mark of the leprous curse his clothing must have a tear in it he must go without a haircut and he must cover his head down to his lips unclean unclean he must call out as long as he has the mark he shall remain unclean since he is unclean he must remain alone and his place shall be outside the camp discoloration of garments this is a law when a garment has the mark of the leprous curse it can be woolen cloth linen cloth linen or wool threads meant for the warp or wool leather or anything made of leather if a bright green or bright red area appears in the cloth leather warp or wool thread or in any leather article it may be the mark of the leprous curse and it must be shown to the priest the priest shall examine the mark and quarantine the affected article for seven days on the seventh day he shall examine the affected
is removed when the cloth warp or wool thread or leather article is scrubbed. The article shall be immersed the second time and it is clean. This is the entire law concerning the mark of the leprous curse in wool or linen cloth in warp or wool thread or in any leather item through which it is rendered clean or unclean. Purification of a leper. God spoke to Moses saying, This is the law concerning the leper when he is purified and placed under the jurisdiction of the priesthood. Priest shall go outside the camp where he shall examine the leper to determine that the leper's mark has healed. The priest shall then order that for the person undergoing purification there be taken two live kosher birds, a piece of cedar, some crimson wool, and a hyssop branch. The priest shall give orders that one bird be slaughtered over fresh spring water in a clay bowl. He shall then take the live bird together with the piece of cedar, the crimson wool, and the hyssop along with the live. Bird he shall dip the other articles into the spring water mixed with the blood of the slaughtered bird. He shall then sprinkle this mixture seven times on the person undergoing purification from the leper's curse, thus rendering him clean. He shall send a living bird away toward the fields. The person undergoing purification shall then immerse his clothing, and the priest shall shave off all the person's hair. He shall then immerse in a mikvah and thus complete the first part of it. Purification process he may return to the camp, but he must remain outside his tent for seven days. On the seventh day, the priest shall shave off all the person's hair, his head, beard, eyebrows, and other body hair must all be shaved off. He shall then immerse his clothing and body in a mikvah, and he is clean on the eighth day. He shall take two unblemished male sheep, one unblemished yearling female sheep, three tenths of an ephah of the best grade wheat flour mixed with oil as a meal. Offering and one log of olive oil, the priest tending to the purification process shall stand all these items and the person undergoing purification before God at the communion tent entrance. The priest shall take one male sheep and present it as a guilt offering along with the log of oil. He shall wave them in the manner prescribed for a wave offering before God. He shall then slaughter the sheep in the same place where burnt offerings and sin offerings are slaughtered in a holy place. This guilt offering is holy of holies and it is just like a sin offering to the priest. The priest shall take some of the guilt offering's blood and place it on the right ear lobe, right thumb, and right big toe of the person undergoing purification. The priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of another priest's hand. The second priest shall then dip his right forefinger into the oil in his left hand and with his finger sprinkle some oil before God seven times. The priest shall place some of the oil in his hand on the right ear, right thumb, and right big toe of the person undergoing purification over the guilt offerings blood. The priest shall then place the rest of the oil in his hand on the head of the person undergoing purification. In this manner, the priest shall make atonement for him before God. The priest shall then sacrifice the sin offering to remove the defilement for the person undergoing purification. After that, he shall slaughter the burnt offering, and the priest shall present the burnt offering and the meal offering on the altar. The priest shall thus make atonement for him, and the person is then ritually clean. The poor leper's offering, if the leper is poor and cannot afford the above sacrifices, he shall take one male sheep as a guilt offering. This shall be the wave offering to atone for him. He shall also take one tenth of the best grade wheat meal mixed with oil as a meal offering and a log of olive. Oil in addition, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young common doves as he can afford one for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering on the eighth day of his purification. He shall bring them to the priest to the communion tent entrance before God. The priest shall take the guilt offering sheet and the log of oil and wave them in the motions prescribed for a wave offering before God. He shall slaughter the guilt offering sheet. The priest shall take the blood of the guilt offering and place it on the right ear lobe, the right thumb, and the right big toe of the person undergoing purification. The priest shall then pour some of the oil onto the left hand of another priest with his right finger. The second priest shall sprinkle some of the oil on his left hand seven times before God. The priest shall place some of the oil from his hand on the right ear lobe, right thumb, and right big toe of the person undergoing purification right over the place where the blood of the guilt offering was put. The priest shall then place the rest of the oil that is in his hand on the head of the person undergoing purification. With all this, he shall make atonement for the person before God. He shall then prepare one of the turtle doves or young common doves that the person was able to afford taking this offering that the person could afford. The priest shall sacrifice one bird as a sin offering and one as a meal offering and then present the meal. Offering the priest shall thus make atonement before God for the person undergoing purification. The above is the entire law concerning the person who has the mark of the leprous curse on him and who cannot afford more for his purification. Discoloration in houses. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you come to the land of Canaan, which I am giving to you as an inheritance, I will place the mark of the leprous curse in houses in the land you inherit. The owner of the house shall come and tell the priest, It looks to me as if there is something like a leprous mark in the house. The priest shall give orders that the house be emptied out before any priest comes to see the mark, so that everything in the house will not become unclean. Only then shall a priest come to see the house. He shall examine the mark to determine if the mark on the wall of the house consists of penetrating streaks that are bright green or bright red, which appear to be below the surface of. The wall if they are the priest shall leave the house and stand just outside the entrance of the house. The priest shall then quarantine the house for seven days. On the seventh day he shall return and examine it to determine whether or not the mark has expanded on the wall of the house. If it has the priest shall give orders that people remove the stones having the mark and that they throw the stones outside the city in an unclean place he shall then have the inside of it. House scrape off all around the mark and the people doing it shall discard the removed dust outside the city in an unclean place. The people shall take other stones to replace the removed stones. The owner shall then plaster the entire house with new clay if after the stones have been removed and the house has been scraped and replaced after the mark comes back. The priest shall return and examine it if the mark has spread in the house again it is a malignant leprous mark which is unclean the priest must order that the house be demolished and its stones wood and all the clay from the house shall be brought outside the city to an unclean place as long as the house is in quarantine anyone entering it shall be unclean until evening if one remains in the house long enough to relax he must immerse both his body and his clothing however he must immerse his clothing only if he has remained in the house long enough to eat a small meal however if it priest returns at the end of the seven days after the house has been replaced after and he sees that the mark has not reappeared in the house then the mark has gone away and the priest shall declare the house clean to purify the house he shall order two birds a piece of cedar some crimson wool and a hyssop branch he shall slaughter one bird over fresh spring water in a clay bowl he shall then take the piece of cedar the hyssop the crimson wool and the live bird dip them in the blood of it Slaughtered bird and fresh spring water and sprinkle it on the house seven times thus with the bird's blood and spring water along with the live bird cedar wood hyssop and crimson wool he shall purify the house he shall then send a live bird outside the city toward the fields in this manner he shall make atonement for the house and it is then clean the above is the entire law for every leprous mark bald patch leprous mark in the garment or house and white blotch discoloration or spot on the skin so that decisions can be rendered as to the day one is rendered clean and the day one is rendered unclean this is the entire law concerning the leprous curse male discharges God spoke to Moses and Aaron telling them to speak to the Israelites and tell them as follows when a man has a discharge from his organ this discharge can render him unclean he becomes unclean through a discharge if his organ dribbles with the discharge or if he has some of it stuck to his organ this makes him unclean so that any bed upon which the man with the discharge lies is unclean and any object upon which he sits is also unclean any person who touches the man's bed must immerse his clothing and his body in a mikvah and then remain unclean until evening similarly anyone who sits on an object upon which the man with the discharge has been sitting must also immerse his clothing and his body in a mikvah and then remain unclean until evening if anyone touches the body of the person with the discharge he must similarly immerse his clothing and his body and then remain unclean until evening if the saliva of the man with the discharge comes in contact with a ritually clean person the latter must immerse his clothing and his body and then remain unclean until evening every saddle upon which the person with the discharge rides shall be unclean thus anyone who touches something that has been under the man with the discharge shall be Unclean until evening one who lifts such an object must immerse both his clothing and his body and then remain unclean until evening if anyone touches a man with a discharge who has not immersed even his hands in a mikvah
emerges from her body for seven days she is then ritually unclean because of her menstruation and anyone touching her shall be unclean until evening as long as she is in her menstrual state anything upon which she lies shall be unclean and anyone sitting on it is likewise unclean whoever touches her bed must immerse his clothing and his body in a mikvah and then remain unclean until evening similarly anyone who sits on any article upon which she has sat must immerse his clothing and his body in a mikvah and then remain unclean until evening thus if he is on the bed or any other article upon which she sat whether he touches it or not he is unclean until evening if a man has intercourse with such a woman her menstrual impurity is transferred to him and he shall be unclean for seven days any bed upon which he lies shall be unclean female discharges if a woman has a discharge of blood for a number of days when it is not time for her menstrual period or if she has such a discharge right after her period then as long as she has this discharge she is unclean just as she is when she has her period thus as long as she has a discharge any bed upon which she lies shall have the same status as it has while she is menstruating similarly any article upon which she sits shall be unclean just as it is unclean when she is menstruating anyone touching these articles must similarly immerse his clothing and his body in a mikvah and then remain unclean until evening when the woman is rid of her discharge she must count seven days for herself and only then can she undergo purification on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young common doves and bring them to the priest to the communion tent entrance the priest shall prepare one as a sin offering and one as a burnt offering and the priest shall thus make atonement for her before God purifying her from her unclean discharge you Moses and Aaron must Warn the Israelites about their impurity so that their impurity not cause them to die if they defile the tabernacle that I have placed among them this then is the entire law concerning the man who is unclean because of a discharge or seminal omission as well as the woman who has her monthly period the man or woman who has a genital discharge and the man who lies with a ritually unclean woman the Yom Kippur service God spoke to Moses right after the death of Aaron's two sons who brought an unauthorized offering before God and died God said to Moses speak to your brother Aaron and let him not enter the inner sanctuary that is beyond the partition concealing the ark so that he may not die since I appear over the ark cover in the cloud when Aaron enters this inner sanctuary it must be with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering he must put on a sanctified white linen tunic and have linen pants on his body he must also gird himself with a linen sash and bind his head with a linen turban these are sacred vestments and therefore before putting them on he must immerse in a mikvah from the Israelite community he shall also take two goats for sin offerings and one ram for a burnt offering he shall begin by presenting his own sin offering bowl and atoning for himself and his family he shall then take the two goats and stand them before God at the communion tent entrance Aaron shall place two lots on the two goats one lot marked for God and one marked for Azazel Aaron shall present the goat that has a lot for God so that it will later be prepared as a sin offering the goat that has a lot for Azazel shall remain alive before God so that Aaron will later be able to make atonement on it and send it to Azazel in the desert Aaron shall present his sin offering bowl and make atonement for himself and his fellow priests he shall then slaughter his bull as a sin offering he shall take a fire pan full of burning coals from the side of the altar that is toward God along with a double handful of finely pulverized perfume incense and bring them both into the inner sanctuary beyond the cloth partition there before God he shall place the incense on the fire so that the smoke from the incense covers the ark cover over the tablets of testimony then he will not die he shall take some of the bull's blood and with his forefinger sprinkle it once above the east side of the ark cover he shall then sprinkle with his forefinger seven times directly toward the ark cover he shall then slaughter the people's sin offering goat and bring its blood into the inner sanctuary beyond the cloth partition he shall do the same with this blood as he did with the bull's blood sprinkling it both above the ark cover and directly toward the ark cover with this he will make atonement for the Israelites defilement as well as for their rebellious acts and all their inadvertent misdeeds he shall then perform exactly the same ritual in the communion tent which remains with the Israelites even when they are unclean no one else shall be in the communion tent from the time that Aaron enters the sanctuary to make atonement until he leaves in this manner he shall make atonement for himself for his family and for the entire Israelite community he shall then go out to the altar that is before God and make atonement on it he shall do this by taking some of the bulls and goats blood and placing the mixture on the altar's horns all around he shall sprinkle the blood on it seven times with his forefinger through this he shall purify and sanctify it from any defilement on the part of the Israelites when he thus finishes making atonement in the inner sanctuary in the communion tent and on the altar he shall present the live goat Aaron shall press both his hands on the live goat's head and he shall confess on it all the Israelite sins rebellious acts and inadvertent misdeeds when he has thus placed them on the goat's head he shall send it to the desert with a specially prepared man the goat will thus carry all the sins away to a desolate area when it is sent to the desert Aaron shall then go into the communion tent and take off the white linen vestments that he wore when he entered the inner sanctuary he shall leave these vestments there he shall immerse his body in a mikvah in the sanctified area and put on his regular vestments he shall then go out and complete his own burnt offering and the people's burnt offering thus atoning for himself and the people he shall also burn the choice parts of the sin offering on the altar the one who sends the goat to Azazel shall immerse his clothing and body in a mikvah only then can he enter the camp the bull and goat presented as sin offerings whose blood was brought into the inner sanctuary to make atonement shall be brought outside the camp there their skin flesh and entrails shall be burned in fire the one who burns them shall immerse his clothing and body in a mikvah and he may then come back into the camp all this shall be an eternal law for you each year on the tenth day of the seventh month you must fast and not do any work this is true of both the native born and the proselyte who joins you this is because on this day you shall have all your sins atoned so that you will be cleansed before God you will be cleansed of all your sins it is a sabbath of sabbaths to you and the day upon which you must fast this is a law for all time the priest who is anointed and installed to be high priest in his ancestors place shall make this atonement wearing the sacred vestments of white linen he shall be the one to make atonement in the holy inner sanctuary in the communion tent and on the altar the atonement that he makes shall be for the priests and for the people of the community all this shall be for you as a law for all time so that the Israelites will be able to gain atonement for their sins once each year Aaron later did exactly as God had commanded Moses slaughtering animals God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to Aaron his sons and the other Israelites telling them that the following is literally what God commanded if any member of the family of Israel sacrifices an ox sheep or goat whether in the camp or outside the camp and does not bring it to the Communion tent to be offered as a sacrifice to God before his sanctuary that person is considered a murderer that person has committed an act of murder and he shall be cut off spiritually from among his people the Israelites shall thus take the sacrifices that they are offering in the fields and bring them to God to the communion tent entrance where they are given to the priest they can then be offered as peace offerings to God the priest will then dash the blood on God's altar at the communion tent's entrance and burn the choice parts as an appeasing fragrance to God the Israelites will then stop sacrificing to the demons who continue to tempt them this shall be an eternal law for them for all generations also tell them that if any person whether from the family of Israel or a proselyte who joins them prepares a burnt offering or other sacrifice and does not bring it to the communion tent to present it to God that person shall be cut off spiritually from his People, if any person, whether of the family of Israel or a proselyte who joins them, eats any blood, I will direct my anger against the person who eats blood and cut him off spiritually from among his people. This is because the life force of the flesh is in the blood, and I therefore gave it to you to be placed on the altar to atone for your lives. It is the blood that atones for a life, and I therefore told the Israelites, Let none of you eat blood of proselyte who joins you shall. Likewise, not eat blood if any man, whether of the family of Israel or a proselyte who joins them, traps an animal or bird that may be eaten and spills its blood, he must cover the blood with earth. All this is because every living creature has its blood associated with its life force. Tell the Israelites not to eat any blood, since the life force of all flesh is in its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off spiritually if any person, whether native born or a proselyte, eats a creature. Which has died on its own and which is forbidden only because it has a fatal lesion, he must immerse
Offense against your father a sister do not commit incest with your sister even if she is the daughter of only your father or mother whether she is legitimate or illegitimate you must not commit incest with her grandchildren do not commit incest with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter since this is a sexual crime against yourself a half sister do not commit incest with the daughter that your father's wife has born to your father she is your sister and you must not commit incest with her a paternal aunt do not commit incest with your father's sister since she is your father's blood relative a maternal aunt do not commit incest with your mother's sister since she is your mother's blood relative an uncle's wife do not commit a sexual offense against your father's brother by having sexual contact with his wife she is your aunt a daughter-in-law do not commit incest with your daughter-in-law she is your son's wife you must not commit incest with her a Sister-in-law do not commit incest with your brother's wife since this is a sexual offense against your brother other forbidden relations do not commit incest by marrying a woman and her daughter do not even take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter since this constitutes incest since they are blood relatives it is a perversion do not marry a woman and then take her sister as a rival to her as long as the first one is alive do not come close to a woman who is ritually unclean because of her menstruation since this is a sexual offense do not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife since this will defile her do not give any of your children to be initiated to molek so that you not profane your god's name i am god do not lie with a male as you would with a woman since this is a disgusting perversion do not perform any sexual act with an animal since it will defile you a woman shall likewise not give herself to an animal and allow it to mate with her this is an utterly detestable perversion do not let yourselves be defiled by any of these acts it was as a result of them that the nations that I am driving away before you became defiled the land became defiled and when I directed my providence at the sin committed there the land vomited out its inhabitants you however must keep my decrees and laws and not become involved in any of these disgusting perversions neither the native born nor any foreigner who settles among you did. People who lived in the land before you did all these disgusting perversions and defiled the land but you shall not cause the land to vomit you out when you defile it as it vomited out the nation that was there before you thus whenever anyone does any of these disgusting perversions all the people involved shall be cut off spiritually from the midst of their people keep my charge and do not follow any of the perverted customs that were kept before you arrived so that you not be defiled by them I am God your Lord holiness laws God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the entire Israelite community and say to them you must be holy since I am God your Lord and I am holy every person must respect his mother and father and keep my Sabbaths I am God your Lord do not turn aside to false gods and do not make yourselves gods out of cast metal I am God your Lord when you offer a peace sacrifice to God you shall do so of your own free will you can eat it on the day you sacrifice it and on the next day but anything left over until the third day must be burned in fire if one even plans to eat it on the third day it is considered putrid and it is not acceptable if one then eats it he has desecrated that which is holy to God and he shall bear his guilt such a person shall be cut off spiritually from his people when you reap your land's harvest do not completely harvest the ends of your fields also do not pick up individual stocks that have fallen furthermore do not pick the incompletely formed great clusters in your vineyards also do not pick up individual fallen grapes in your vineyards all the above must be left for the poor and the stranger I am God your Lord do not steal do not deny rightful claim do not lie to one another do not swear falsely by my name if you do so you will be desecrating your God's name I am God do not unjustly withhold that which is to your neighbor do not let the workers wages remain with you overnight until morning do not curse even the deaf do not place a stumbling block before the morally blind you must fear your God I am God do not pervert justice do not give special consideration to the poor nor show respect to the great judge your people fairly do not go around as a gossiper among your people do not stand still when your neighbor's life is in danger I am God do not hate your brother in your heart you must admonish your neighbor and not bear Sin because of him do not take revenge nor bear a grudge against the children of your people you must love your neighbor as you love yourself I am God keep my decrees do not crossbreed your livestock with other species do not plant your field with different species of seeds do not wear a garment that contains a forbidden mixture of fabrics if a man lies carnally with a slave woman who is half married to another man and she has not been redeemed or given her freedom she must be physically punished however since she has not been free the two shall not be put to death the man must bring his guilt offering to God to the communion tent and transit shall be a ram for a guilt offering the priest shall make atonement for him before God with the guilt offering ram for the sin that he committed he will thus gain forgiveness for his sin forbidden practices when you come to the promised land and plant any tree bearing edible fruit you must avoid its fruit as a Forbidden growth for three years the fruit shall be a forbidden growth and it may not be eaten and in the fourth year all the trees fruit shall be holy and it shall be something for which God is praised in the fifth year you may eat its fruit and thus increase your crops I am God your Lord do not eat on blood do not act on the basis of omens do not act on the basis of auspicious times do not cut off the hair on the sides of your head do not shave off the edges of your beard do not make gashes in your skin for the dead do not make any tattoo marks on your skin I am God do not defile your daughter with premarital sex you will then not make the land sexually immoral and the land will not be filled with perversion keep my sabbaths and revere my sanctuary I am God do not turn to mediums nor seek out oracles so as to defile yourselves through them I am God your Lord stand up before a white head and give respect to the old you shall thus fear your God I am God when a proselyte comes to live in your land do not hurt his feelings the foreigner who becomes a proselyte must be exactly like one who is native born among you you shall love him as you love yourself for you were foreigners in Egypt I am God your Lord do not falsify measurements whether in length weight or volume you must have an honest balance honest weights an honest dry measure and an honest liquid measure I am God your Lord who took you out of Egypt safeguard my decrees and all my laws and keep them I am God penalties God spoke to Moses telling him to say the following to the Israelites if any person whether a born Israelite or a proselyte who joins Israel gives any of his children to Molech he must be put to death the local people must pelt him to death with stones I will direct my anger against that person and will cut him off spiritually from among his people since he has given his children to Molech thus defiling that which is holy to me and profaning my holy name therefore if the people ignore the fact that this person has given his children to Molech and they do not kill him I will direct my anger against that person and his family I will cut him off spiritually from among his people along with all those who are misled by him to prostitute themselves to Molech if a person turns to the mediums and oracle so as to prostitute himself to their ways I will direct my anger against him and cut him off spiritually from his people. You must sanctify yourselves and be holy for I am God your Lord safeguard my decrees and keep them since I am God and I am making you holy any person who curses his father or mother shall therefore be put to death since he has cursed his father or mother he shall be stoned to death if a man commits adultery with a married woman and she is the wife of a fellow Israelite both the adulterer and adulteress shall be put to death if a man has intercourse with his father's wife he has committed a sexual offense against his father therefore both of them shall be put to death by stoning if a man has intercourse with his daughter-in-law both of them shall be put to death since they have committed an utterly detestable perversion they shall be stoned to death if a man has intercourse with another man in the same manner as with a woman both of them have committed a disgusting perversion they shall be put to death by stoning if a man marries a woman and her mother it is a perversion and both he and the second one taken shall be burned with fire if a man performs a sexual act with an animal he must be put to death and the animal shall also be killed if a woman presents herself to an animal and allows it to mate with her you shall kill both the woman and the animal they shall be put to death by stoning if a man takes his sister even a half sister who is only the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother and they both agree to a sexual act it is an extremely shameful perversion and they shall be cut off spiritually before their people since he has committed incest with his sister he shall bear his guilt if a man has intercourse with a woman who is ritually impure from her menstruation he has committed a sexual offense with her he has violated her womb and she has revealed the source of her blood therefore both of them shall be cut off spiritually from among their people do not commit incest with your mother's sister or with your father's sister if one thus violates his blood relative he shall bear his guilt if a man has intercourse with his aunt thus committing a sexual offense against his uncle
Priest defile himself by contact with the dead among his people except for such close blood relatives as his mother, father, son, daughter, or brother. He may also allow himself to become ritually unclean for his deceased virgin sister who is also close to him as long as she is not married. However, a husband may not defile himself for his dead wife if she is legally unfit for him. Let no priest shave off patches of hair from his head. Let them not shave the edges of their beards and not make gouges in their skin. They must be holy to their God and not profane their God's name since they present God's fire offerings. The food offering for their God they must remain holy. They shall not marry an immoral or profane woman. They also must not marry a woman who has been divorced from her husband. The priest must thus be holy to his God. You must strive to keep him holy since he presents the food offering to God. He must be holy since I am God. I am holy and I am making. You holy if a priest's daughter defiles herself by committing adultery, she has defiled her father's position and she must be burned with fire. The high priest, these are the rules for the high priest among his brothers upon whose head the anointing oil has been poured and who has been inaugurated to wear the special priestly vestments. He shall not go without a haircut and shall not allow his vestments to be torn. He shall not come in contact with any dead body. He shall thus not defile himself even for his father or mother. In such a case, he may not even leave the sanctuary. He will then not profane his God's sanctuary since his God's anointing oil is upon him. I am God. He must marry a virgin. He must not marry a widow, a divorcee, or a profane or immoral woman. He may only marry a virgin from his own people. He will then not profane his children because of his wife. He must do all this because I am God and I make him holy. Blemish priest God spoke to. Moses telling him to speak to Aaron as follows, Anyone among your descendants who has a blemish may not approach to present his God's food offering. Thus any blemished priest may not offer sacrifice. This includes anyone who is blind or lame or who has a deformed nose or a misshapen limb. Also included is anyone who has a crippled leg, a crippled hand, who is a hunchback or a dwarf, who has a blemish in the eye, who has severe eczema or ringworm, or who has a hernia. Any descendant of Aaron the priest who has a blemish may not approach to present God's fire offering. As long as he has a blemish, he may not approach to present his God's food offering. Still he may eat the food offerings of his God both from the Holy of Holies and from the Holy, but he may not come to the cloth partition in the sanctuary, and he may not approach the altar if he has a blemish. He shall thus not defile that which is holy to me since I am God and I sanctify it. Moses told this to Aaron his Sons and all the Israelites' priestly purity God spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and tell them to be careful regarding the sacred offerings that the Israelites consecrate to me so that they not desecrate my holy name. I am God. Tell them that if any man among their descendants is in an unclean state when he presents the sacred offerings that the Israelites consecrate to God, he shall be cut off spiritually from before me. I am God. Any descendant of Aaron who has a leopard's mark or a male discharge may not eat any sacred offerings until he has purified himself. The same is true of one who touches anyone defiled by the dead who has had a seminal omission or who has touched any unclean small animal or any person who can defile him. A person who touches any of the above shall be unclean until evening and he shall not eat any sacred offering unless he has immersed in a mikvah. He then becomes ritually clean at sunset and he can eat the sacred offerings. Which are his portion, the priest shall not eat any creature that has died on its own and which is forbidden only because it has a fatal lesion, since this will defile him. I am God, the priest shall thus keep my charge and not profane the sacred offering, which is a sin that can cause them to die. I am God, and I am making them holy. No non priest may eat the sacred offering, even if a person resides with a priest or is hired by him, that person may not eat the sacred offering. However, if a priest buys a slave for money as his own property, then the slave may eat the sacred offering. Similarly, a slave born in his house may eat his food. When a priest's daughter marries a non priest, she may no longer eat the sacred elevated gift, but if the priest's daughter has no children and is widowed or divorced, she may return to her father's house with the same status as when she was a girl and she may eat her father's food. No non priest may eat the elevated gift if a person inadvertently eats such a sacred offering, he must add one-fifth to it and give it to the priest along with an appropriate substitute for the sacred offering. Non-priests thus shall not profane the sacred offerings which the Israelites give as elevated gifts in God's name. If they eat the sacred offerings, they will bear the guilt of sin since I am God and it is I who make these offerings holy blemished animals. God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to Aaron to his sons. And to all the Israelites saying to them, This is the law of any person whether of the family of Israel or of the proselytes who join them offers any animal that can be presented to God as a burnt offering to fulfill a general or a specific pledge to gain acceptance. It must be an unblemished male taken from the cattle, sheep, or goats. Do not present any blemished animal since it will not be accepted for you. Similarly, when a person presents a peace offering of cattle or sheep to fulfill a general or specific pledge, it must be unblemished in order to be acceptable. It shall not have any blemish on it. Thus, you may not offer to God any animal that is blind, broken, limbed, or gashed, or that has warts, mange, or ringworm. You may not place such an animal on the altar as a fire offering to God. However, if an ox or sheep has an extra or missing limb, it can be offered as a gift to the sanctuary, but none of the above shall be acceptable as a pledge for the altar. Similarly, you may not offer to God any animal that has its testicles crushed, whether by hand or with an instrument pulled loose or severed. This is something that you must never do, no matter where you live. You may not offer any such animal, even if it is presented by Gentile animals that are maimed and blemished, shall not be acceptable for you. Acceptable animals, God spoke to Moses, saying, When a bull sheep or goat is born, it must remain with its mother for seven days. Then after the eighth day, it shall be acceptable as sacrifice for a fire offering to God. Whether it is a bull, a sheep, or a goat, do not slaughter a female animal and its child on the same day. When you sacrifice a thanksgiving offering to God, you must do so in an acceptable manner. It must be eaten on the same day with nothing left over until the next morning. I am God. Be careful regarding my commandments and keep them. I am God. Do not desecrate my holy name. I must be sanctified among the Israelites, I am God, and I am making you holy and bringing you out to Egypt to be your God. I am God. Special days. The Sabbath God spoke to Moses, telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, There are special times that you must celebrate as sacred holidays to God. The following are my special times. You may do work during the six weekdays, but Saturday is a Sabbath of Sabbaths. It is a sacred holiday to God when you shall do no work wherever you may live. It is God's Sabbath. Passover, these are God's festivals that you must celebrate as sacred holidays at their appropriate times. The afternoon of the fourteenth day of the first month is the time that you must sacrifice God's Passover offering. Then on the fifteenth of that month, it is God's festival of matzahs. When you eat matzahs for seven days, the first day shall be a sacred holiday to you. When you may not do any service work, you shall then bring sacrifices to God for seven days. The seventh day is a sacred holiday. When you may not do any service work, the Omer God spoke to Moses, telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you come to the land that I am going to give you and you reap its harvest, you must bring an Omer of your first reaping to the priest. He shall wave it in the motions prescribed for a wave offering to God so that it will be acceptable for you. The priest shall make this wave offering on the day after the first day of the Passover holiday. On the day you make the wave offering of the Omer, you shall prepare an unblemished yearling sheep as a burnt offering to God. Its meal offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of wheat meal mixed with oil. A fire offering to God. Its libation offering shall be one fourth in of wine until the day that you bring the sacrifice to your God. You may not eat bread, roasted grain, or fresh grain. This shall be an eternal law for all generations, no matter where you live. Counting the Omer Shavuot, you shall then count. Seven complete weeks after the day following the Passover holiday when you brought the Omer as a wave offering until the day after the seventh week when there will be a total of fifty days on that fiftieth day you may present new grain as a meal offering to God from the land upon which you live you shall bring two loaves of bread as a wave offering they shall be made of two tenths of an ephah of wheat meal and shall be baked as leavened bread they are the first harvest offering to God. Together with this bread you shall sacrifice seven unblemished yearling sheep one young bull and two rams these along with their meal offerings
Before God your Lord if anyone does not fast on this day he shall be cut off spiritually from his people similarly if one does any work on this day I will destroy him spiritually from among his people do not do any work on this day this is an eternal law for all generations no matter where you may live it is a Sabbath of Sabbaths to you and a day when you must fast you must keep this holiday from the ninth of the month until the next night Sukkot God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites as follows the 15th of the seventh month shall be the festival of Sukkot to God lasting seven days the first day shall be a sacred holiday when you may not do any service work for seven days then you shall present a fire offering to God the eighth day is a sacred holiday to you when you shall bring a fire offering to God it is a time of retreat when you may do no service work the above are God's special times which you must keep as sacred holidays there are times when you must present to God a burnt offering a meal offering a sacrifice and libations each depending on the particular day this is in addition to God's Sabbath offerings and the gifts and the specific and general pledges that you offer to God on the 15th of the seventh month when you harvest the land's grain you shall celebrate a festival to God for seven days the first day shall be a day of rest and the eighth day shall be a day of rest on the first day you must take for yourself the fruit of the citron tree and unopened palm frond myrtle branches and willows that grow near the brook you shall rejoice before God for seven days during these seven days each year you shall celebrate to God it is an eternal law for all generations that you celebrate this festival in the seventh month during these seven days you must live in thatched huts everyone included in Israel must live in such thatched huts this is so that future generations will Know that I had the Israelites live in huts when I brought them out of Egypt. I am God your Lord Moses related the rules of God's special times to the Israelites. The lamp God spoke to Moses telling him to instruct the Israelites to bring him clear illuminating oil from hand crushed olives to keep the lamp burning constantly. Aaron shall light the lamp consistently with this oil. It shall burn before God from evening to morning outside the clock partition in the communion tent. This shall be an eternal law for all your generations. He shall consistently kindle the lamps on the pure gold menorah before God. The showbread you shall take the finest grade of wheat flour and bake it into twelve loaves. Each loaf shall contain two tenths of an ephah. Arrange these loaves in two stacks. Six loaves to each stack. This shall be on the undefiled table which is before God. Place pure frankincense alongside these stacks. This will be the memorial portion presented as a fire. Offering to God these loaves shall consistently be arranged before God each Sabbath. It is an eternal covenant that this must come from the Israelites. The bread shall be given to Aaron and his descendants, but since it is holy of holies among God's fire offerings, they must eat it in a sanctified area. This is an eternal law. The blasphemer, the son of an Israelite woman and an Egyptian man, went out among the Israelites, and the Israelite woman's son had a quarrel with an Israelite man in the camp. The Israelite woman's son and blasphemed God's name with a curse. The people brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shalami, daughter of the Bri of the tribe of Dan. They kept him under custody until the penalty could be specified by God. Penalties for blasphemy. God spoke to Moses, saying, Take the blasphemer out of the camp and let all who heard him place their hands on his head. The entire community shall then stone him to death. Speak to the Israelites as follows. Anyone. Who curses God shall bear his sin, but if one actually blasphemes the name YHVH, he shall be put to death. The entire community shall stone him, whether he is a proselyte or a native born Israelite, he shall be put to death. One who takes a human life must be put to death. If one kills an animal, he must pay for it the value of a life for a life. If one maims his neighbor, he must be penalized accordingly, thus full compensation must be paid for a fracture or the loss of an eye or a tooth. If one inflicts injury on another person, he must pay as if the same injury were inflicted on him. Thus, if one kills an animal, he must pay for it, but if one kills a human being, he must be put to death. There shall be one law for you for both the proselyte and the native born, for I am God, Lord of you. All Moses related all this to the Israelites, and they took the blasphemer out of the camp, pelting him to death with stones. The Israelites thus did as God had commanded Moses the sabbatical. Here God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you come to the land that I am giving you the land must be given a rest period a Sabbath to God for six years you may plant your fields, prune your vineyards and harvest your crops but the seventh year is a Sabbath of Sabbaths for the land it is God's Sabbath during which you may not plant your fields nor prune your vineyards do not harvest crops that grow on their own and do not gather. The grapes on your unpruned vine since it is a year of rest for the land what grows while the land is resting may be eaten by you by your male and female slaves and by the employees and resident hands who live with you all the crops shall also be eaten by the domestic and wild animals that are in your land the jubilee you shall count seven sabbatical years that is seven times seven years the period of the seven sabbatical cycles shall thus be forty nine years then on the tenth day of it. Seventh month you shall make a proclamation with the ram's horn this proclamation with the ram's horn is thus to be made on Yom Kippur you shall sanctify the fiftieth year declaring emancipation of slaves all over the world this is your jubilee year when each man shall return to his hereditary property and to his family the fiftieth year shall also be a jubilee to you insofar as you may not sow harvest crops growing of their own accord nor gather grapes from unpruned vines during that. Here the jubilee shall thus be holy to you. You shall eat the crops from the field that year in the jubilee year. Every man shall return to his hereditary property. Thus, when you buy or sell land to your neighbor, do not cheat one another. You are buying only according to the number of years after the jubilee. Therefore, he is selling it to you for the number of years that the land will produce crops until the next jubilee, since he is selling it to you for the number of crops. You must increase the price if it will be for many years and decrease it. If there are few, you will then not be cheating one another. You shall fear your God, since it is I who am God. Your Lord, keep my decrees and safeguard my laws. If you keep them, you will live in the land securely. The land will produce its fruit, and you will eat your fill. Thus, living securely in the land in the seventh year, you might ask, what will we eat in the jubilee year? We have not planted nor have we harvested crops. I will direct my blessing to you in the sixth year, and the land will produce enough crops for three years. You will therefore be eating your old crops when you plant. After the eighth year, you will still be eating your old crops until the crops of the ninth year are ripe. Since the land is mine, no land shall be sold permanently. You are foreigners and resident aliens as far as I am concerned, and therefore there shall be time of redemption. For all your hereditary lands, redemption of land. If your brother becomes impoverished and sells some of his hereditary land, a close relative can come and redeem what his kinsman has sold. The same is true if a man does not have anyone to redeem it but gains enough wealth to be able to redeem it himself. He shall then calculate the number of years for which the land has been sold and return the balance to the buyer. He can then return to his hereditary land if he does not have it. Means to retrieve the land and that which he has sold shall remain with the buyer until the jubilee year it is then released by the jubilee so that the original owner can return to his hereditary land houses in walled cities. When a man sells a residential house in a walled city, he shall be able to redeem it until the end of one year after he has sold it. He has one full year to the day to redeem it. However, if it is not redeemed by the end of this year, then the house in the walled city shall become the permanent property of the buyer to be passed down to his descendants. It shall not be released by the jubilee. On the other hand, houses in villages that do not have walls around them shall be considered the same as open land. They shall thus be redeemable and shall be released by the jubilee. As far as the Levites cities are concerned, the Levites shall always have the power to redeem the houses in their hereditary cities. Thus, if one buys a house or city from the Levites, it must be released by the jubilee. This is because houses in the Levites cities are their hereditary property among the Israelites. Similarly, the open areas surrounding their cities shall not be sold permanently because it is their hereditary property forever helping others. When your brother becomes impoverished and loses the ability to support himself in the community, you must come to his aid, help him survive. Whether he is a proselyte or a native Israelite, do not take advance. Interest or accrued interest from him, fear your God and let your brother live alongside you. Do not make him pay advance interest for your money and do not give him food for which he will have to pay accrued interest. I am God your Lord who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be a God for you slaves. If your brother becomes impoverished and is sold to you, do not work him like a slave. He shall be with you just like an employee or a resident
reckoning with the one who bought him according to the number of years from the time he was sold until the jubilee his purchase price shall then be counted for that number of years as if he were hired for that amount thus if there are still many years until the jubilee the redemption money that he returns to his buyer shall be in proportion to the money for which he was sold if only a few years remain until the jubilee year he shall make a similar reckoning in either case he shall return a sum of redemption money according to the number of years that he has already worked such a slave shall thus be the same as an employee hired on a yearly basis if you are aware of it you may not let his master dominate him so as to break his spirit if the slave is not redeemed through any of the above means he and his children shall be freed in the jubilee year all this is because the israelites are actually my slaves they are my slaves because i brought them out of Egypt I am God your Lord slaves of Gentiles therefore do not make yourselves false gods do not raise up a stone idol or a sacred pillar for yourselves do not place a kneeling stone in your land so that you can prostrate yourselves on it I am God your Lord keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary I am God rewards for obedience if you follow my laws and are careful to keep my commandments I will provide you with rain at the right time so that the land will bear its crops and it trees of the field will provide fruit you will have so much that your threshing season will last until your grape harvest and your grape harvest will last until the time you plant you will have your fill of food and you will live securely in the land I will grant peace in the land so that you will sleep without fear I will rid the land of dangerous animals and the sword will not pass through your land you will chase away your enemies and they will fall before your sword five of you will be able to chase away a hundred and a hundred of you will defeat ten thousand as your enemies fall before your sword I will turn to you making you fertile and numerous thus keeping my covenant with you you will continue eating the previous year's crops long after their time and you will eventually have to clear out the old crops because of the new I will keep my sanctuary in your midst and not grow tired of you I will make my presence felt among you thus I will be a god to you and you will be a nation dedicated to me I am God your Lord I brought you out from Egypt where you were slaves I broke the bands of your yoke and led you forth with your heads held high punishments for disobedience but this is what will happen if you do not listen to me and do not keep all these commandments if you come to denigrate my decrees and grow tired of my laws then you will not keep all my commandments and you will have broken my covenant I will then do the same to you I will Bring upon you feelings of anxiety along with depression and excitement, destroying your outlook and making life hopeless. You will plant your crop in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will direct my anger against you so that you will be defeated by your foes and your enemies will dominate you. You will flee even when no one is chasing you. If you still do not listen to me, I will increase the punishment for your sins sevenfold. I will break your aggressive pride, making your skies like iron and your land like brass. You will exhaust your strength in vain since your land will not yield its crops and the trees of the land will not produce fruit. If you are indifferent to me and lose the desire to obey me, I will again increase the punishment for your sins sevenfold. I will send wild beasts among you, killing your children, destroying your livestock, and reducing your population so that the roads will become deserted. If this is not enough to discipline you and you are still indifferent to me then I will also be indifferent to you but I will again increase the punishment for your sins sevenfold I will bring a vengeful sword against you to avenge my covenant so that you will huddle in your cities I will send a plague against you and give you over to your enemies I will cut off your food supply so that ten women will be able to bake bread in one oven bringing back only a small amount of bread you will eat but you will not be satisfied destruction and repentance if you still do not obey me and remain indifferent to me then I will be indifferent to you with a vengeance bringing yet another sevenfold increase in the punishment for your sins you will eat the flesh of your sons and make a meal of the flesh of your daughters when I destroy your altars and smash your sun gods I will let your corpses rot on the remains of your idols I will thus have grown tired of you I will let your cities fall into ruins and make your sanctuaries Desolate no longer will I accept the appeasing fragrance of your sacrifices I will make the land so desolate that even your enemies who live there will be astonished I will scatter you among the nations and keep the sword drawn against you your land will remain desolate and your cities in ruins then as long as the land is desolate and you are in your enemy's land the land will enjoy its sabbaths the land will rest and enjoy its sabbatical years thus as long as it is desolate the land will enjoy the sabbatical rest that you would not give it when you live there I will bring such insecurity upon those of you who survive in your enemy's land that the sound of a rustling leaf will make them flee from the sword they will fall with no one chasing them they will fall over one another as if chased by the sword even when there is no one pursuing you will have no means of standing up before your foes you will thus be destroyed among the nations the land of your Enemies will consume you. The few of you who survive in your enemies' lands will realize that your survival is threatened as a result of your non observance. These few will also realize that their survival has been threatened because of the non observance of their fathers. They will then confess their sins and the sins of their fathers for being false and remaining indifferent to me. It was for this that I also remained indifferent to them and brought them into their enemies' land. But when the time finally comes that their stubborn spirit is humbled, I will forgive their sin. I will remember my covenant with Jacob as well as my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham. I will remember the land for the land will have been left behind by them and will have enjoyed its Sabbaths while it lay in desolation without them. The sin they had committed by denigrating my laws and growing tired of my decrees will also have been expiated thus even when they are in there. Enemies' land I will not grow so disgusted with them nor so tired of them that I would destroy them and break my covenant with them since I am God their Lord I will therefore remember the covenant with their original ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nation so as to be a God to them I am God these are the decrees laws and codes that God set between himself and the Israelites at Mount Sinai through the hand of Moses endowment valuations God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them this is the law when a person expresses a vow to donate to God the endowment valuation of a person the endowment valuation of a 20 to 60 year old male shall be 50 shekels according to the sanctuary standard for a woman this endowment valuation shall be 30 shekels for a person between 5 and 20 years old the endowment valuation shall be 20 shekels for a male and 10 shekels for a female for a person between 1 month and 5 years old the endowment valuation shall be five silver shekels for a male and three silver shekels for a female for a person over sixty years old. The endowment valuation shall be fifteen shekels for a man and ten shekels for a woman. If a person is too poor to pay the endowment, he shall present himself before the priest so that the priest can determine the endowment valuation. The priest shall then make this determination on the basis of how much the person making the vow can afford endowments of animals and real. He state if the endowment is an animal that can be offered as a sacrifice to God, then anything donated to God automatically becomes consecrated. One may neither exchange it nor offer a substitute for it, whether it be a better animal for a worse one or a worse animal for a better one. If he replaces one animal with another, both the original animal and its replacement shall be consecrated. If it involves any unfit animal that cannot be offered as a sacrifice to God, the owner shall. Present the animal to the priest. The priest shall set the endowment value according to the animal's good and bad qualities, and its endowment valuation shall be that which is determined by the priest. If the owner wishes to redeem it, he must add 20% to its endowment value. If a person consecrates his house as something sacred to God, the priest shall set its endowment value according to its good and bad points. The endowment value shall then remain that which is determined by the priest. If the one who consecrates it wishes to redeem his house, he must add an additional 20% to its endowment value, and it then reverts to him. If a man consecrates a field from his hereditary property to God, its endowment value shall be calculated according to the amount of seed required to sow it 50 silver shekels for each tumor of barley seed. This is the endowment valuation that must be paid if the field is consecrated immediately after the Jubilee year. However, if one consecrates his Field later after the jubilee year then the priest shall calculate the value on the basis of how many years remain until the next jubilee year and its endowment value shall be reduced accordingly if the person who has consecrated his field redeems it he must add 20% to its endowment valuation and it then reverts to him however if he does not redeem the field or if the sanctuary treasurer sells it to someone else it can no longer be redeemed when the field is then released by the jubilee it becomes consecrated to God like a field that has been declared taboo and it then becomes the hereditary property of the priest if
Trees belong to God and are thus consecrated to God. If a person wishes to redeem such tithes, he must add an additional 20%. All tithes of the herds and flocks shall be given when they are counted under the rod. With every tenth one being consecrated to God, no distinction may be made between better and worse animals, and no substitutions may be made. If a substitution is made, then both the original animal and its replacement shall be consecrated and not redeemable. These are the commandments that God gave Moses for the Israelites at Mount Sinai. The census God spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert in the communion tent on the first day of the second month in the second year of the Exodus, saying, Take a census of the entire Israelite community, do it by families following the paternal line according to the names of each male taken individually. You and Aaron shall take a tally of them by their divisions, counting every male over twenty years old who is fit for. Service alongside you, there shall be one man from each tribe, and he shall be the head of his paternal line. These are the names of the men who will assist you. For Reuben, the Litzer, son of Shedeor, for Simeon, Jalumiel, son of Surai, Shaddai, for Judah, Nachshon, son of Ammonad, for Isishar, Nethanel, son of Sur, for Zebulun, Eliab, son of Kelan, for Joseph's sons, for Ephraim, Elis, Hamas, son of Amihud, for Manasseh, Gumlil, son of Pedetzer, for Benjamin, Abadon, son of Gido, and I, for Dan. Ashiezer, son of Ami, Shaddai, for Asher, Pagil, son of Achran, for Gad, Eliab, son of Diul, for Naphtali, Akira, son of Enan. These are the communal representatives, the princes of their paternal tribes, and leaders of Israel's thousands. Moses and Aaron took aside these men whose names had been designated. They assembled the entire community on the first day of the second month, and all the people were registered by ancestry according to their paternal families, all those over twenty years. Old were counted individually by name. Moses thus took a tally of the Israelites in the Sinai desert as God had commanded him. Reuben, this was the result for the descendants of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of individual names for males over twenty years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Reuben was forty-six thousand five hundred. Simeon for the descendants of Simeon, according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of individual names in the tally for males over twenty years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Simeon was fifty-nine thousand three hundred. Gad for the descendants of Gad, according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over twenty years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Gad was forty-five thousand six hundred and fifty. Judah for the descendants of Judah, according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over twenty years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Judah. Was 74,600 Issachar for the descendants of Issachar according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Issachar was 54,400 Zebulun for the descendants of Zebulun according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Zebulun was 57,400 Ephraim among the sons of Joseph for the descendants of Ephraim according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Ephraim was 40,500 Manasseh for the descendants of Manasseh according to the records of their paternal families. This was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Manasseh was 32,200 Benjamin. For the descendants of Benjamin, according to the records of their paternal families, this was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Benjamin was 35,400. Dan for the descendants of Dan, according to the records of their paternal families, this was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Dan was 62,700. Asher for the descendants of Asher, according to the records of their paternal families, this was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Asher was 41,500. Naphtali, the descendants of Naphtali, according to the records of their paternal families, this was the number of names for males over 20 years old, all fit for service. The tally for the tribe of Naphtali was 53,400. The total, these are the tallies made by Moses Aaron and the 12 men who were princes of Israel, one from each paternal family. Tally of Israelites according to their paternal families included those over 20 years old, all fit for service. The entire tally was 603,550. However, the men who were Levites according to their father's tribe were not tallied together with the other Israelites. The Levites God spoke to Moses saying, Do not take a tally or census of the Levites together with the other Israelites. Put the Levites in charge of the tabernacle of testimony, all its furniture and everything pertaining to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furniture and they will serve in it. They shall therefore camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is moved, the Levites shall take it down and when it is to remain in one place, they shall set it up. Any non Levite who participates shall die when the Israelites camp. Each individual shall be in his own camp, each one designated by the banner for its division. The Levites, however, shall camp around the tabernacle of testimony so that there will not be any divine anger directed against the Israelites. It shall be the Levites who safeguard the trust of the tabernacle of testimony. The Israelites did all that God commanded Moses and they did it exactly the camp. Judah to the east God spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, The Israelites shall camp with each person near the banner having its paternal families insignia. They shall camp at a specified distance around the communion tent camping to the east. The direction of sunrise shall be the divisions under the banner of Judah. The leader of Judah's descendants was Nachshon son of Ammonadab. The tally of his division was 74,600 camping near him shall be the tribe of Issachar and the leader of Issachar's descendants was Nethanel son of Ksur. The tally of his division was 54,400 with them shall be the tribe of Zebulun and the leader of Zebulun's descendants was Eliab son of Kelan. The tally of his division was 57,400. The entire tally for the divisions in Judah's camp was thus 186,400 on the march they shall go first Reuben to the south the divisions under the banner of Reuben's camp shall be to the south the leader of Reuben's descendants was Elitzer son of Shedeur the tally of his division was 46,500 camping near him shall be the tribe of Simeon and the leader of Simeon's descendants was Shlemiel son of Tsurai Shaddai the tally of his division was 59,300 with them shall be the tribe of Gad and the leader of Gad's descendants was Elias of son of Ruel the count of his division was 45,650 the entire tally for the divisions in Reuben's camp was thus 151,450 on the march they shall go second the tabernacle on the march on the march the communion tent and the camp of the Levites shall then proceed they shall be in the middle of the other camps the people shall travel in the same manner as they camp each person shall be in his place according to each one's banner Ephraim to the west the divisions under the Banner of Ephraim's camp shall be to the west. The leader of Ephraim's descendants was Elis Hamas son of Amihud. The tally for his division was 40,500. Near him shall be the tribe of Manasseh, and the leader of Manasseh's descendants was Gumlil son of Pedetzer. The tally for his division was 32,200. With them shall be the tribe of Benjamin, and the leader of Benjamin's descendants was Abadon son of Gido. And I, the tally for his division was 35,400. The entire count for the divisions of Ephraim's camp was thus 108,100. On the march they shall go through Dan to the north. The divisions under the banner of Dan's camp shall be to the north. The leader of Dan's descendants was Ashiezer son of Amishadai. The tally of his division was 62,700. Camping near him shall be the tribe of Asher, and the leader of Asher's descendants was Pagil son of Akron. The tally for his division was 41,500. With them shall be the tribe of Naphtali, and the leader of Naphtali's descendants was Akira son of Enan. The tally for his division was 53,400. The entire tally for Dan's camp was thus 157,600. On the march they shall be the last of the banners. The camp as a whole, these then are the tallies of the Israelites according to their paternal families. The tally for all the camps in all divisions was 603,500. The Levites were not registered among the rest of the Israelites as God had commanded Moses. The Israelites did all that God had commanded Moses. They camped under their Banners in the prescribed manner, and each person traveled in a similar manner with his family according to his paternal line genealogy of Aaron. These are the chronicles of Aa
Everything else that the Israelites have entrusted for the tabernacle service gives special instructions to Aaron and his descendants. They are his gift from the Israelites. Give special instructions to Aaron and his descendants that they safeguard their priesthood. Any non priest who participates shall die in place of the firstborn. God spoke to Moses, saying, I have separated the Levites from the other Israelites so that they may take the place of all the firstborn who initiate the womb among the Israelites and the Levites shall be mine. This is because every firstborn became mine on the day I killed all the firstborn in Egypt. I then sanctified to myself every firstborn in Israel, man and beast alike, and they shall remain mine. I am God's census of the Levites. Gershon God spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert and said, Take a tally of the Levites family by family according to their paternal lines. Count every male over one month old. Moses numbered them at God's. Command as he had been instructed by name the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kahat, and Merari. The sons of Gershon heading families were Libni and Shimei. The sons of Kahat heading families were Amromi, Yitzar, Hebron, and Uziel. The sons of Merari heading families were Machli and Mushi. These are the Levi families according to their paternal lines. For Gershon there was the Libni family and the Shimei family. These were the Gershonite families numbering every male over one month old. Their tally was 7,500. The Gershonite family shall camp to the west toward the back of the tabernacle. The paternal leader of the Gershonites was Ilias of son of Lyle. The task of the descendants of Gershon involving the communion tent shall be the tabernacle tapestries, the overtent, its roof, the drapes at the communion tent entrance, the enclosures, hangings, the drape at the entrance of the enclosure surrounding the tabernacle and altar and the ropes as well as all the work involving these. Items Kahat and Merari for Kahat there was the Amramite family, the Yitzharite family, the Hebronite family, and the Utzilite family. All these were the Kahatite families. The count of every male over one month old was 8,600. They were in charge of the sacred articles. The family of Kahat's descendants shall camp to the south side of the tabernacle. The paternal leader of the Kahatite family is Elsafe and son of Utzil. Their charge shall be the ark, the table, the menorah, the two altars, the sacred utensils for all these, the partition drape, and all the work involving these items. The one in charge of the Levites' leaders shall be Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest. He shall be in charge of safeguarding the trust of the sacred articles for Merari. There was the Mokli family and the Mushi family. These were the families of Merari. Their tally numbering every male over one month old was 6,200. The paternal leader of the families of Merari was Thriel, son of Abigail. They shall camp. To the north side of the tabernacle, the appointed task of the descendants of Merari shall include the beams, crossbars, pillars, and bases of the tabernacle, all its utensils and the associated work, as well as the pillars, bases, stakes, and ropes of the surrounding enclosure. Camping to the east in front of the tabernacle shall be Moses and Aaron and his sons, those who keep charge of the sanctuary as a trust for the Israelites. Any unauthorized person who includes himself shall die the entire tally of the Levites was made by Moses and Aaron by families. There were 22,000 males over one month old. Census of the firstborn God said to Moses, Make a tally of the male firstborn among the Israelites who are over one month old and take a census of their names. Take the Levites to me, I am God. In place of all the Israelite male firstborn, also take the Levites animals. In place of the Israelites firstborn animals, Moses made a tally of all the firstborn male Israelites as God had. Commanded him according to the number of their names. The tally of all the firstborn over one month old was 22,273. Substituting the Levites, God spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites in place of all the male firstborn Israelites. Also take the Levites' livestock in place of the Israelites' firstborn animals. The Levites shall become mine. I am God. Also take a redemption for the 273 individuals by which the firstborn outnumber the Levites. This shall be five shekels for each individual according to the sanctuary standard where the shekel is 20 years. Give the silver to Aaron and his sons as a redemption for the firstborn who are in excess of the Levites. Moses took the redemption money for those who were left over after the majority of firstborn had been redeemed by the Levites. The silver that he took from the firstborn Israelites consisted of 1,365 sanctuary shekels. Moses gave the silver for those who were redeemed to Aaron and his sons at God's. Commanded was all done as God had commanded Moses' duties for Kahat. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Take a special census of the descendants of Kahat among the Levites. Take it by families following the paternal line. It shall include those from 30 to 50 years old. All who enter service to work in the communion tent. The following is the service of Kahat's descendants in the communion tent. It is the Holy of Holies when the camp is about to travel. Aaron and his sons shall come and take down the partition drape using it to cover the Ark of Testimony. They shall then place a cover of blue processed skins over it and on top of that a cloth of pure sky blue wool. They shall then put its carrying poles in place. They shall spread a sky blue cloth over the inner table. Then they shall set in place on it the bread forms, incense bowls, half tubes, and covering side frames so that the bread can remain on the table constantly over it. All they shall place a crimson wool. Cloth and cover it with a case of blue processed skins. They shall then put its carrying poles in place. They shall take a cloth of sky blue wool and cover the menorah lamp along with its oil cups with tongs, ash scoops, and the oil containers used for it. The menorah and all its utensils shall be placed in a case of blue processed skins and placed on the carrying frame. They shall spread a sky blue wool cloth on the golden altar and then cover it with a case of blue processed skins. They shall then set its carrying poles in place. They shall take all the sanctuary service utensils and place them on a sky blue wool cloth. They shall then be covered with a case of blue processed skins and placed on the carrying frame. They shall remove all the ashes from the sacrificial altar and place a dark red cloth over it. They shall place on it all the utensils that are used for its service, such as the fire pans, flesh poker scoops, and sacrificial basins. All the altar's utensils they shall. Then cover it all with a case of blue processed skins and set its carrying poles in place. Aaron and his sons shall thus finish covering the sacred furniture and all the sanctuary utensils so that the camp can begin its journey. Only after the priests are finished shall the Kahatites come to carry these items so that they not die when they touch the sacred objects. The above is what the Kahatites must carry for the communion tent. This shall be under the direction of Eliezer, son of Aaron the priest, along with the illuminating oil, the perfume, and sense the meal offerings for the daily sacrifice and the anointing oil. He shall also be in charge of the entire tabernacle and all its sacred furniture and utensils. Precautions for the Kahatites. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Do not cause the Kahatites to become extinct among the Levites. This is what you must do so that they survive and not die when they come into the Holy of Holies. Aaron and his sons shall first. Come and arrange each thing so that every Kahatite can perform his service carrying his load. The Kahatites will then not come and see the sacred furniture being packed and they will not die. Duties of Gershon God spoke to Moses saying, Also take a census of Gershon's descendants by families following the paternal line. Take a tally of those from 30 to 50 years old. All who are fit for duty in the communion tent service the Gershonite family shall serve by maintaining and carrying as follows. They shall carry the tabernacles, tapestries, the communion tent, the roof, the overroof of blue processed skins that is above it, the drape at the communion tent entrance, the enclosures, hangings, the drape at the entrance to the enclosure around the tabernacle and altar, the guy ropes, all their appropriate tools and everything necessary for their maintenance. All the carrying and maintenance service of the Gershonites shall be under the supervision of Aaron and his sons. The Gershonites shall have fixed appointments for everything they carry. The above is the Gershonite family service for the communion tent. Their duties shall be under the supervision of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. Duties of Merari, tally of Kahat, take a tally of Merari's descendants by family following the paternal line. Take the tally of those from 30 to 50 years old. All who are fit for duty in the communion tent service, they shall be entrusted to carry and maintain the following items in the communion tent. The beams, crossbars, pillars, and bases of the tabernacle, the pillars of the surrounding enclosure, their bases, stakes, and guy ropes, all their tools, and all their maintenance equipment. They shall be appointed by name to carry all the articles with which they are entrusted. The above is the work comprising the entire service of Merari's descendants in the communion tent. It shall be under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest, Moses, Aaron, and it.
Bid for duty in the communion tent service their tally by families was 3,200. This was the complete tally of the families of Merari's descendants. The tally was taken by Moses and Aaron as God had directed Moses. This is the entire tally that Moses, Aaron, and the communal leaders took of beloveds. It was by families following the paternal line, including everyone from 30 to 50 years old who was fit for duty in the communion tent service. Their tally was 8,580. They were thus counted by Moses at God's bidding each individual according to his service, what he would carry, and his appointed task as God had commanded Moses, purifying the camp. God spoke to Moses, saying, Instruct the Israelites to send out of the camp everyone who has a leprous mark or a male discharge, and all who are ritually defiled by the dead, whether male or female, they must be sent out of the camp so that they not defile their camp where I dwell among them. The Israelites did the sending all. Such people out of the camp the Israelites did exactly as God had told Moses offerings God spoke to Moses telling him to speak as follows to the Israelites, if a man or woman sins against his fellow man thus being untrue to God and becoming guilty of a crime he must confess the sin that he has committed he must then make restitution of the principal plus a 20% surcharge and give it to the victim of his crime if there is no relative to whom the dishonest gain can be returned it must be returned to God and given to the priest this is in addition to the atonement ram through which the wrongdoer sin is expiated all the sacred offerings that the Israelites present as elevated gifts to the priest shall become his property the sacred offerings of each individual remain his own property when they are given to the priest they become the priest's property the suspected adulteress God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them this is the law of any man's wife is suspected of committing adultery and being false to her husband a man may have iron with her carnally keeping it hidden from her husband and they may have acted secretly so that there could be no witness against the woman the woman was not raped this is a case where the man had previously expressed feelings of jealousy against his wife and she then may have been defiled however he may have expressed such feelings of jealousy against his wife and she may have not been defiled the law is that the man must bring his wife to the priest when he brings her he must also bring a sacrifice for her consisting of one tenth of barley meal he shall not pour oil on it nor place frank incense on it since it is a jealousy offering it is a reminder offering to recall sin the priest shall bring forth the woman and have her stand before god the priest shall take sanctified water in a clay bowl he shall also take some earth from it tabernacle floor and place it in the water the priest shall stand a woman before God and uncover her hair he shall place under hands the reminder offering the jealousy offering in the priest's hand shall be the curse bearing bitter water the priest shall administer a note to the woman saying to her if a man has not lain with you and you have not committed adultery so as to be defiled to your husband you shall be unharmed by this curse bearing bitter water but if you have committed adultery against your husband and have become defiled and if a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you at this point the priest shall administer to the woman the part of the oath containing the curse the priest shall say to the woman in such a case God will make you into a curse and an oath among your people causing your sexual organs to rupture and your belly to blow up this curse bearing water will enter your body and it will cause your belly to blow up and your Sexual organs to rupture the woman shall respond amen amen the priest shall then write these curses on a parchment and dissolve the writing in the bitter waters he shall then make the woman drink the bitter curse bearing waters and the curse bearing waters shall begin to take effect the priest shall take the jealousy offering from the woman and wave the offering in the prescribed motions before God bringing it near the altar thus after he makes the woman drink the water the priest shall scoop out the memorial portion of the meal offering and burn it on the altar when the woman drinks the water if she has been defiled and untrue to her husband the curse bearing water will enter her body to poison her causing her belly to blow up and her sexual organs to rupture the woman will be a curse among her people however if the woman is pure and has not been defiled to her husband she will remain unharmed and will become pregnant this is the entire law regarding jealousy for the case when a woman commits adultery and becomes unclean or when a man simply has a feeling of jealousy against his wife he shall stand a woman before God and the priest shall follow this entire procedure the man will then be free of sin but the woman will be punished if guilty the Nazi right God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them this is the law when a man or woman expresses a Nazi right vow to God he must separate himself completely from wine and wine brandy he may not even drink vinegar made from wine and wine brandy he shall not drink any grape beverage and he shall not eat any grapes or raisins as long as he is a Nazi right he may not eat anything coming from a grape from its seeds to its skin as long as he is under Nazi right oath no cutting instrument shall touch the hair on his head until he completes his term as a Nazi right to God the uncut hair that grows on his head is sacred as long as he is a Nazi right to God he may not have any contact with the dead he may not ritually defile himself even when his father mother brother or sister dies since his god's nazi right crown is on his head as long as he is a nazi right he is holy to god if a person dies in his presence suddenly and renders his crown head ritually unclean then when he purifies himself on the seventh day he must shave off the hair on his head on the eighth day he must bring two turtle doves or two young common doves to the priest to the communion tent entrance the priest shall prepare one as sin a sin offering and one as a burnt offering to atone for his inadvertent defilement by the dead on that day he shall resanctify his head he shall then begin counting his nazi right days anew to god and he shall bring a yearling sheep as a guilt offering the following is the law of what the nazi right must do when the term of his nazi right vow is complete and of what he must bring to the communion tent entrance the offering that he must present shall be one unblemished yearling male sheep for a burnt offering, one unblemished yearling female sheep for a sin offering, one unblemished ram for a peace offering, and a basket containing unleavened wheat loaves kneaded with oil and flat matzah saturated with oil along with the proper meal offerings and libations for the animal sacrifices. The priest shall come in before God and prepare the Nazarite sin offering and burnt offering. He shall then sacrifice the ram as a peace offering to God to go with the basket of unleavened bread. The priest shall also present the meal offering and libation after the service at the communion tent and trance. The Nazirite shall shave off the crown of hair on his head. He shall take the hair from the Nazirite crown on his head and place it on the fire that is under the peace sacrifice. After the Nazirite has shaved, the priest shall take the cooked foreleg of the ram along with one unleavened loaf and one flat matzah and Place them on the Nazarites open hands the priest shall wave them with the motions prescribed for a wave offering before God these are sanctified to belong to the priest along with the animals chest given as a wave offering and the hind leg given as an elevated gift after all this the Nazi right may drink wine this is the entire law concerning the Nazi right who has a vow obligation to bring his Nazi right sacrifice to God this is in addition to anything else that he may wish to present to fulfill his vow which must be brought above and beyond what the law requires for his Nazi right vow the priestly blessing God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to Aaron and his son saying this is how you must bless the Israelites say to them may God bless you and keep watch over you may God make his presence enlighten you and grant you grace may God direct his providence toward you and grant you peace the priest will thus link my name with the Israelites and I will Bless them the leader's offering on the day that Moses finished erecting the tabernacle he anointed it and sanctified it along with all its furniture he also anointed the altar and all its utensils and thus sanctified them the princes of Israel who were the heads of their paternal lines and came forward they were the leaders of the tribes and the ones who had directed the census the offering that they presented to God consisted of six covered wagons and twelve oxen there was one wagon for each two princes and one ox for each one they presented them in front of the tabernacle God said to Moses take the offering from them and let the wagons and oxen be used for the communion tent service give them to the levites as appropriate for each family's work Moses took the wagons and oxen and gave them to the levites he gave two wagons and four oxen to the descendants of Gershon as appropriate for their service to the descendants of Merari he gave four wagons and Eight oxen both were under the direction of Ithamar son of Aaron the priest he did not give any wagons to the descendants of Kahat however since they had responsibility for the most sacred articles which they had to carry on their shoulders on the day that it was anointed the princes presented their dedication offerings for the altar the leaders placed their offerings before the altar God said to Moses let them present their offerings for the altar
One gold incense bowl weighing ten shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering, one goat for a sin offering, and for the peace sacrifice, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five yearling sheep. This was the offering of Netanel son of Ksur the third day. Zebulun on the third day, it was the leader of Zebulun's descendants, Ilyab son of Kelan. His offering was one silver bowl weighing one hundred and thirty shekels, and one sacrificial basin weighing seventy shekels by the sanctuary standard, both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a meal offering, one gold incense bowl weighing ten shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering, one goat for a sin offering, and for the peace sacrifice, two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five yearling sheep. This was the offering of Ilyab son of Kelan the fourth day. Reuben on the fourth day, it was the leader of Reuben's descendants, Elitzer son of Jedeor his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a meal offering one gold incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bowl one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep this was the offering of Elitzer son of Jedeor the fifth day Simeon on the fifth day it was the leader of Simeon's descendants Shalomiel son of Tsurai Shaddai his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a meal offering one gold incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bowl one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for a he sacrificed two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five yearling sheep. This was the offering of Shalomiel son of Tsurai Shaddai the sixth day. Gad on the sixth day it was the leader of Gad's descendants Ilyas of son of Duel. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard boat filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a meal offering one gold incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one. Young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Elias of son of Duel the seventh day. Ephraim on the seventh day it was a leader of Ephraim's descendants Elis Hamas son of Amihad his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard boat filled with wheat. Meal kneaded with oil for a grain offering one gold incense bowl weighing ten shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Elis Hamas son of Amihad the eighth day. Manasseh on the eighth day it was a leader of Manasseh's descendants Gamliel son of Pedetzer his offering was one silver bowl. Weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a grain offering one gold incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep this was the offering of Gamliel son of Pedetzer the ninth day. Benjamin. On the ninth day it was the leader of Benjamin's descendants Avadon son of Gido and I his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat kneaded with oil for a grain offering one incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male. Goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Avadon son of Gido and I the tenth day. Gad on the tenth day it was the leader of Dan's descendants Achiezer son of Amishadai his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal for a grain offering one gold incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt. Offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Ashiezer son of Amishadai the eleventh day. Asher on the eleventh day it was the leader of Asher's descendants Pajil son of Akran his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a grain offering one. Incense bowl weighing ten shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Pajil son of Akran the twelfth day. Naphtali on the twelfth day it was the leader of Naphtali's descendants Akira son of Enan his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels and one silver sacrificial basin weighing. 70 shekels by the sanctuary standard both filled with wheat meal kneaded with oil for a grain offering one incense bowl weighing 10 shekels filled with incense one young bull one ram and one yearling sheep for a burnt offering one goat for a sin offering and for the peace sacrifice two oxen five rams five male goats and five yearling sheep that was the offering of Akira son of Enan the altar's dedication that was the dedication offering for the altar given by the princes of Israel on the day that it was anointed there were 12 silver bowls 12 silver sacrificial basins and 12 gold incense bowls since each bowl weighed 130 shekels and each sacrificial basin weighed 70 all the silver in the utensils amounted to 2400 sanctuary shekels there were 12 gold incense bowls full of incense each weighing 10 sanctuary shekels therefore all the gold in the incense bowls amounted to 120 shekels the total of all the animals for burnt offerings was 12 oxen 12 rams and 12 yearling sheep along with their meal offerings there were also 12 male goats for sin offerings the total of all the animals for peace sacrifices was 24 bowls 60 rams 60 male goats and 60 yearling male sheep that was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed when Moses came into the communion tent to speak with God he would hear the voice speaking to him from between the two cherubs on the ark cover over the ark of testimony God thus spoke to him Lighting the lamp God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to Aaron and say to him when you light the lamps the seven lamps shall illuminate the menorah Aaron did that lighting the lamps to illuminate the menorah as God commanded Moses the menorah was made of a single piece of beaten gold everything from its base to its blossom consisted of a single piece of beaten metal the menorah was thus made exactly according to the vision that God showed Moses inaugurating the love God spoke to Moses saying take the levites from among the Israelites and purify them in order to purify them you must sprinkle the water of the sin offering on them after they have shaved their entire bodies with a razor they shall then immerse their bodies and their clothing and they will be clean they shall then take a young bull along with its grain offering consisting of the best grade wheat meal mixed with olive oil you shall also present a second bull as a sin offering bring it Levites to the front of the communion tent and assemble the entire Israelite community present the Levites before God and have the Israelites lay their hands on the Levites Aaron shall then designate the Levites as a wave offering to God from the Israelites and the Levites shall become the ones to perform God's service the Levites shall then lay their hands on the heads of the bulls and you shall prepare one bull as a sin offering and one as a burnt offering to God to atone for the Levites you shall stand the Levites before Aaron and his sons and designate them as a wave offering to God in this manner you will separate the Levites from the other Israelites and the Levites shall become mine after you have purified them and designated them as a wave offering the Levites shall come to perform the service in the communion tent they are given to me from among the Israelites in place of the firstborn that initiate the womb of all the Israelites I have taken them for Myself, this is because all firstborn of the Israelites are my men and beasts alike. I sanctified them for myself on the day that I killed all the firstborn in Egypt. I have now taken the
Priests in the communion tent they shall not however participate in the divine service this is what shall be done for the Levites as far as their appointed tasks are concerned Passover in the desert God spoke to Moses in the Sinai desert in the second year of the exodus of Egypt in the first month saying the Israelites shall prepare the Passover offering at its proper time the proper time for its preparation shall be the fourteenth day of this month in the afternoon they must prepare it in accordance with all its decrees and laws Moses spoke to the Israelites telling them to prepare the Passover offering they prepared the Passover offering in the Sinai desert on the fourteenth of the first month in the afternoon the Israelites did exactly as God had instructed Moses there were however some men who had come in contact with the dead and were therefore ritually unclean so that they could not prepare the Passover offering on that day during the course of that day they approached Moses and Aaron we are ritually unclean as a result of contact with the dead the men said to Moses but why should we lose out and not be able to present God's offering at the right time along with the other Israelites wait here replied Moses I will hear what orders God gives regarding your case making up the Passover offering God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites saying if any person is ritually unclean from contact with the dead or is on a distant journey whether among you now or in future generations he shall still have the opportunity to prepare God's Passover offering he shall prepare it on the afternoon of the 14th of the second month and shall eat it with matzahs and bitter herbs he shall not leave any of it over until morning and not break any bone in it he shall thus prepare it according to all the rules of the regular Passover offering however if a man is ritually clean and not on a distant journey and he neglects to prepare the Passover offering that person shall be cut off spiritually from his people he shall bear his guilt for not offering God's sacrifice at the prescribed time if a proselyte joins you he must also prepare God's Passover Offering presenting it according to the rules and laws governing the Passover offering there shall thus be a single law for all of you the proselyte and native born alike divine signs to move on on the day that the tabernacle was erected the cloud covered the tabernacle the tent of testimony then in the evening there was something that appeared to be like fire on the tabernacle remaining there until morning from then on it remained that way there was a cloud covering it by day and a fire like apparition by night whenever the cloud rose up from the tent the Israelites would set out on the march the Israelites would then camp in the place where the cloud rested the Israelites would thus move on at God's bidding and at God's bidding they would remain in one place for as long as the cloud remained on the tabernacle if the cloud remained over the tabernacle for a long time the Israelites would keep their trust in God and not travel on in some cases the cloud would remain on the tabernacle for just a few days and they would similarly remain camped at God's word and then move on at God's word there were even cases where the cloud remained only from evening to morning when the cloud then rose in the morning they would travel on at other times it might be for a day and night and they would then move on when the cloud rose thus whether it was for two days a month or a full year no matter how long the cloud remained at rest over the tabernacle the Israelites would remain in one place and not move on then when the cloud rose they would continue on their travels they thus camped at God's word and moved on at God's word keeping their trust in God it was all done according to God's word through Moses the trumpets God spoke to Moses saying make yourself two silver trumpets make them out of beaten metal they shall be used by you to assemble the community and to make the camps break camp for their journeys when both of it Trumpets are sounded with a long note the entire community shall assemble at the communion tent entrance if a long note is sounded on only one of them the princes who are leaders of thousands in Israel shall come together to you when you sound a series of short notes the camps to the east shall be in the march then when you sound a second series of short notes the camps to the south shall set out however when the community is to be assembled the trumpets shall be sounded with a long note and not with a series of short notes the priests who are Aaron's descendants shall be the ones to sound the trumpets that shall be an eternal law for future generations when you go to war against an enemy who attacks you in your land you shall sound a staccato on the trumpets you will then be remembered before God your Lord and will be delivered from your enemies when your days of rejoicing on your festivals and on your new moon celebrations you shall sound a note with the Trumpets for your burnt offerings and your peace offerings this shall be a remembrance before your God I am God your Lord the journey from Sinai in the second year of the Exodus on the twentieth of the second month the cloud rose from the tabernacle of testimony the Israelites thus began their travels moving on from the Sinai desert until the cloud came to rest in the Paran desert this was the first journey at God's word through Moses the divisions in the banner camp of Judas. Descendants set out first heading that division was Nachshon son of Ammonadab heading the tribal division of Issachar's descendants was Nethanel son of Sur and heading the tribal division of Zebulun's descendants was Eliab son of Kelan the tabernacle was then dismantled and the descendants of Gershon and Merari who carried the tabernacle began to march the divisions in the banner camp of Reuben and began to march heading that division was Elitzer son of Shedeur heading the Tribal division of Simeon's descendants was Shalomiel son of Surai Shaddai and heading the tribal division of Gad's descendants was Elias of son of Duel the Kahadites who carried the sacred furniture then began their march the tabernacle would be set before they arrived at the destination the divisions in the banner camp of Ephraim's descendants then began the march heading their division was Elis Hamas son of Amihud heading the tribal division of Manasseh's descendants was Gamliel son of Pitzer and heading the tribal division of Benjamin's descendants was Avadon son of Gido and I then the divisions in the banner camp of Dan's descendants the last of the camps began the march heading their division was Ahiezer son of Ami Shaddai heading the tribal division of Asher's descendants was Pajil son of Akran and heading the tribal divisions of Naphtali's descendants was Akira son of Enan when they set out this was the marching order of the Israelites according to their divisions Joseph Moses said to his father-in-law Joseph son of Ruel the Midianite we are now on our way to the place that God promised to give us come with us and we will let you share the benefit of all the good things that God has promised Israel I would rather not go reply Joseph I wish to return to my land and my birthplace do not abandon us said Moses after all you are familiar with the places where we are going to camp in the desert and you can be our guide if you go with us we will share with you whatever good God grants us the Israelites marched the distance of a three-day journey from God's mountain the ark of God's covenant traveled three days ahead of them in order to find them a place to settle when they began traveling from the camp by day God's cloud remained over them the ark goes forth when the ark went forth Moses said arise O God and scatter your enemies let your foes flee before you when it came to rest he said return O God to the myriads of Israel's thousands complaints the people began to complain and it was evil in God's ears when God heard it he displayed his anger and God's fire flared out consuming the edge of the camp the people cried out to Moses and when Moses prayed to God the fire died down he named the place burning Tabitira for God's fire had burned them the mixed multitude among the Israelites began to have strong cravings and the Israelites once again began to weep who's going to give us some meat to eat they demanded we fondly remember the fish that we could eat in Egypt at no cost along with the cucumbers melons leeks onions and garlic but now our spirits are dried up with nothing but the manna before our eyes the manna was like coriander seed with a pearl like luster the people could simply go for a stroll and gather it they would then grind it in a hand mill or crush it in a mortar cooking it in a pan and making it into cakes it tasted like an oil wafer at night when the dew would fall on the camp the manna would descend on it Moses heard the people weeping with their families near the entrances of their tents God became very angry and Moses also considered it wrong why are you treating me so badly said Moses to God don't you like me anymore why do you place such a burden upon me was I the woman who was pregnant with this nation in my belly did I give birth to them but you told me that I must carry them in my bosom as a nurse carries an infant until we come to the land that you swore to their ancestors where can I get enough meat to give all these people they are wanting to me to give them some meat to eat I cannot be responsible for this entire nation it's too hard for me if you are going to do this to me just do me a favor and kill me don't let me see myself get into such a terrible predicament the promise of meat God said to Moses assemble 70 of Israel's elders the ones you know to be the people's elders and leaders bring them to the communion tent and let them stand there with you when I lower my essence and speak to you there I will cause some of the spirit that you possess to emanate and I will grant it to them you will then not have to bear the responsibility all alone tell the people as
Moses went out and told the people what God had said. He gathered seventy of the people's elders and stood them around the tent. God descended in the cloud and spoke to Moses. He caused the spirit that had been imparted on Moses to emanate, and he bestowed it upon the seventy elders. When the spirit descended on them, they gained the gift of prophecy and did not lose it. Two men remained in the camp, and the spirit also rested on them. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the second was Medad. Although they were among those registered, they did not go out to the communion tent, but they spoke prophetically in the camp. A young man ran to tell Moses, Eldad and Medad are speaking prophecy in the camp. He announced Joshua, son of Nun. Moses' chosen attendant spoke up, My Lord Moses, he said, Stop them. Are you jealous for my sake? Replied Moses, I only wish that all of God's people would have the gift of prophecy. Let God grant his spirit to them all. Moses then returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. God caused the wind to start blowing sweeping quail up from the sea. They ran out of strength over the camp and were flying only two cubits above the ground for the distance of a day's journey in each direction. The people went about all that day, all night, and the entire next day and gathered quail. Even those who got the least had gathered ten chimers. The people spread them out around the camp. The meat was still between their teeth. When the people began to die, God's anger was displayed against the people and he struck them with an extremely severe plague. Moses named the place Graves of Craving, Hebrew Hathabah, since it was in that place where they buried the people who had these cravings from Graves of Craving. The people traveled to Chatzarit. They were to remain in Chatzarit longer than planned. Miriam and Aaron complained. Miriam and Aaron began speaking against Moses because of the dark skin. Woman he had married, the woman that Moses had married was indeed dark skinned, and went on to say, Is it to Moses exclusively that God speaks? Doesn't he also speak to us? God heard it, Moses, however, was very humble, more so than any man on the face of the earth. Miriam's punishment, God suddenly said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, All three of you go out to the communion tent. When the three of them went out, God descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the tent's entrance. He summoned Aaron and Miriam, and both of them went forth. God said, Listen carefully to my words. If someone among you experiences divine prophecy, then when I make myself known to him in a vision, I will speak to him in a dream. This is not true of my servant Moses, who is like a trusted servant throughout my house with him. I speak face to face in a vision, not containing allegory, so that he sees a true picture of God. How can you not be afraid to speak against my servant Moses? God displayed anger against them and departed when the cloud left its place over the tent. Miriam was leprous white like snow. When Aaron returned to Miriam and saw her leprous, Aaron said to Moses, Please, my lord, do not hold a grudge against us for acting foolishly and sinning. Let Miriam not be like a stillborn child who comes from the womb with half its flesh rotted away. Moses cried out to God, O oh God, please heal her. Miriam quarantined. God said to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not have been embarrassed for seven days? Let her remain quarantined for seven days outside the camp, and then she can return home. For seven days, Miriam remained quarantined outside the camp, and the people did not move on until Miriam was able to return home. The people then left Chatzarit and they camped in the barren desert, exploring the promised land. God spoke to Moses, saying, Send out men for yourself to explore the Canaanite territory that I am about to give the Israelites. Send out one man for each patriarchal tribe each. One shall be a person of high rank. Moses sent them from the Paran desert at God's bidding. All the men were leaders of the Israelites. Their names were as follows From the tribe of Reuben, Shane, who was son of Zakur, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, son of Cori, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Yephunah, from the tribe of Issachar, Yael, son of Joseph, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hashiah, son of Nun, from the tribe of Benjamin, Paul, the son of Rehob, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, son of Sodi, from the tribe of Manasseh, from Joseph, Kathi, son of Susa, from the tribe of Danamiel, son of Gemali, from the tribe of Asher, Stu, son of Michael, from the tribe of Naphtali, Naj, by son of Babsi, from the tribe of Gad, Joel, son of Machai. These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. However, Moses gave Hashiah, son of Nun, a new name, Joshua, Yahashua. When Moses sent the men to explore the Canaanite territory, he said to them, Head north to the Negev and then. Continue north to the hill country, see what kind of land it is. Are the people who live there strong or weak, few or many? Is the inhabited area good or bad? Are the cities where they live open or fortified? Is the soil rich or weak? Does the land have trees or not? Make a special effort to bring back some of the land's fruits. It was the season when the first grapes began to ripen. The men headed north and explored the land from the Ksin Desert all the way to Rikok on the road to Kamath on the way through the Negev. They came to Hebron where they saw Kim and Sheshai and Talmi, descendants of the giant Hebron, had been built seven years before. So in Egypt, when they came to Cluster Valley, Nakal Eshkel, they cut a branch and a cluster of grapes. Which two men carried on a frame because of the great cluster that the Israelites cut there. The place was named Cluster Valley. At the end of forty days, they came back from exploring the land. When they arrived, they went directly to Moses Aaron and the entire Israelite community who were in the Paran Desert near Kadesh. They brought their report to Moses Aaron and the entire community and showed them fruit from the land. They gave the following report: We came to the land where you sent us, and it is indeed flowing with milk and honey, as you can see from its fruit. However, the people living in the land are aggressive, and the cities are large and well fortified. We also saw the giants' descendants, their Amalek lives in the Negev area, the Hittites, the Abbasides, and the Morites live in the hills, and the Canaanites live near the sea and on the banks of the Jordan. Caleb tried to quiet the people for Moses. We must go forth and occupy the land. He said, We can do it. We cannot go forward against those people, replied the men who had gone with him. They are too strong for us. They began to speak badly about the land that they had explored. They told the Israelites the land that we crossed to explore is a land that consumes its inhabitants. All the men we saw there were huge. While we were there we saw the Titans. They were sons of the giant who descended from the original Titans. We felt like tiny grasshoppers. That's all that we were in their eyes exploring the promised land. The entire community raised a hubbub and began to shout that night. The people with all the Israelites complained to Moses and Aaron. The entire community was saying we wish we had died in Egypt. We should have died in this desert. Why is God bringing us to this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will be captives. It would be best to go back to Egypt. The people started saying to one another, Let's appoint a new leader and go back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the whole assembled Israelite community among the men who had explored the land. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephunah, tore their clothes in grief. They said to the whole Israelite community, The land through which we passed in our explorations is a very, very good land. If God is satisfied with us and brings us to this land, He can give it to us, a land flowing with milk and honey, but don't rebel against God. Don't be afraid of the people in the land. They have lost their protection and shall be our prey. God is with us, so don't be afraid. The whole community was threatening to stone them to death when God's glory suddenly appeared at the communion tent before all the Israelites' threat of destruction. God said to Moses, How long shall this nation continue to provoke me? How long will they not believe in me despite all the miracles that I have done among them? I will kill them with a plague and annihilate them, and I will make you into a greater, more powerful nation. And they Moses replied to God, And what will happen when the Egyptians hear about it? You have brought this nation out from among them with your great power. And what if they tell the people who live in this land? They have heard that you, God, have been with this nation Israel. You, God, have revealed yourself to them face to face, and your cloud stands over them. You go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. Now you want to kill this entire nation like a single man. The nations who hear this news about you will say that God was not able to bring this nation to the land that he swore to them, so he slaughtered them in the desert. Now, O oh God, is the time for you to exercise even more restraint. You once declared God is slow to anger, great in love, and forgiving of sin and rebellion. He does not clear those who do not repent, but keeps in mind the sins of the fathers for their children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren with your great love forgive. The s
Exceptions will be Caleb son of Yephuna and Joshua, son of Nun. You said that your children will be taken captive but they will be the ones I will bring there so that they will know the land that you rejected you however will fall as corpses in the desert your children will be herded from place to place in the desert for forty years paying for your indiscretion until the last of your corpses lie here in the desert the punishment shall parallel the number of days you spent. Exploring the land there were forty days and there shall be one year for each day a total of forty years until your sin is forgiven you will then know how I act I God have spoken and there is no way that I will not do this to the entire evil community that has banded against me they will end their lives in this desert and here is where they will die the men whom Moses sent to explore the land and who returned and complained about it to the entire community slandering the land were punished immediately the men who had given a bad report about the land thus died before God in the plague among the men who went to explore the land only Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Yephunneh remained alive Moses related God's words to all the Israelites and they were overcome with terrible grief when they got up early in the morning they began climbing toward the top of the mountain declaring we are now ready we shall go forward to the place that God described we admit that we were mistaken why are you going against God's word said Moses it won't work. Do not proceed God is not with you don't be killed by your enemies. Up ahead of you are the Amalekites and Canaanites and you will fall by the sword you have gone away from God and now God will not be with you the people defiantly climbed toward the top of the mountain but the ark of God's covenant and Moses did not move from the camp the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived on that mountain swooped down and defeated the Israelites pursuing them with crushing force all the way to Kerbameel offerings for sacrifices God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them when you come to your homeland that I am giving you you will be presenting fire offerings to God they may be burnt offerings or other sacrifices either for a general or specific pleasure or for your festivals taken from the cattle or smaller animals they shall be meant to provide an appeasing fragrance to God the one bringing the sacrifice to God must then present a grain offering consisting of one tenth of the best grade with meal mixed with one fourth in olive oil the wine for the libation shall also be one fourth in this shall be for each sheep offered as a burnt offering or peace sacrifice for a ram you shall prepare a grain offering of two tenths of wheat meal mixed with one third in oil the wine for the libation shall also be one third in presented as an appeasing fragrance to God if you prepare one of the cattle as a burnt offering or other sacrifice to fulfill a vow or as a peace offering to God then together with each animal one must present a grain offering of three tenths of wheat meal mixed with one half in oil the wine presented as a libation shall also be one half in as a fire offering an appeasing fragrance to God you must follow this prescription for each bull or ram or among the smaller animals for sheep and goats regardless of the number prepared you must present the prescribed meal offering for each one in order to present a fire offering that is an appeasing fragrance to God every native born Israelite must present it in this manner along with the prescribed grain offerings if a proselyte joins you or lives among you in future generations and he prepares a fire offering as an appeasing fragrance to God he must do it in exactly the same manner among the group that may marry one another the same rule shall apply both to you and to the proselyte who joins it is an eternal law for future generations that the proselyte shall be the same as you before God there shall thus be one for a end. One law for you and for the proselyte who joins you the dough offering God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them when you come to the land to which I am bringing you and you eat the land's produce you must separate an elevated gift for God you must separate the first portion of your kneading as a dough offering it must be separated very much like the elevated gift that is taken from the threshing floor in future generations you must thus give it first of your kneading as an elevated gift to God communal sin offerings for idolatry this is the law if you inadvertently commit an act of idolatry which is equivalent to violating all these commandments that God gave to Moses it is like a violation of all that God commanded you through Moses from the day that God gave his commandments as well as what he will command you later in future generations if such a sin is committed inadvertently by the community because of their Leadership the entire community must prepare one young bull for a burnt offering as an appeasing fragrance to God along with its prescribed grain offering and libation they must also present one goat for a sin offering the priest shall then make atonement for the entire Israelite community and they will be forgiven it was inadvertent and they brought their sacrifice as a fire offering to God along with their sin offering before God for their misdeeds since all the people acted without knowledge the entire Israelite community along with the proselytes who joined them shall thus be forgiven individual sin offerings for idolatry if a single individual commits such a sin inadvertently he must bring a yearling female goat for a sin offering the priest will then make atonement before God for the individual who sinned inadvertently to expiate his sin and he will be forgiven there shall be a single law for one who does such an inadvertent act whether he is a native born Israelite or a proselyte who joins them however if a person commits such an act of idolatry high-handedly whether he is native born or a proselyte he is blaspheming God and that person shall be cut off spiritually from among his people since he has denigrated God's word and violated his commandment that person shall be utterly cut off spiritually and his sin shall remain upon him the man gathering sticks on the Sabbath while the Israelites were in the desert they discovered a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath the ones who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses Aaron and the entire community since it was not specified what must be done to him they placed him under guard the penalty for Sabbath violation God said to Moses that man must die let the entire community pelt him with stones outside the camp the entire community took him outside the camp and they pelted him to death with stones it was done as God had commanded Moses since it tassels God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and have them make tassels on the corners of their garments for all generations they shall include a twist of sky blue wool in the corner tassels these shall be your tassels and when you see them you shall remember all of God's commandments so as to keep them you will then not stray after your heart and eyes which in the past have led you to immorality you will thus remember and keep all my commandments and be holy to your God I am God your Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God I am God your Lord Korach is rebellion Korach son of Yitzhar the grandson of Kahat and great grandson of Levi began rebellion along with David and Abiram sons of Eliuth and on son of Philip descendants of Reuben they had a confrontation with Moses along with 250 Israelites who were men of rank in the community representatives at the assembly and famously demonstrated against Moses and Aaron and declared to them you have gone too far all the people in the community are holy and God is with them why are you setting yourselves above God's congregation? When Moses heard this he threw himself on his face then he spoke to Korach and his whole party tomorrow morning he said God will show that he knows who is his and who is holy and he will bring them close to him he shall choose those who shall be allowed to present offerings to him this is what you must do let Korach and his entire party take fire pants tomorrow place fire on them and offer incense on them before God the man whom God chooses shall then be the holy one you sons of Levi have also gone too far. Moses tried to reason with Korach listen to what I have to say you sons of Levi isn't it enough that the God of Israel has separated you from the community of Israel? He has brought you close to him allowing you to serve in God's tabernacle and to minister as the community's leaders although he gave this privilege to you and all your fellow levites you are now also demanding the priesthood. It is actually against God that you and your party are demonstrating. After all who is Aaron that you should have grievances against him. Moses then sent word to summon David and Abiram the sons of Eli if we won't come, was their response isn't it enough that you brought us out Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey, just to kill us in the desert? What right do you have to set yourself above us? You didn't bring us to a land flowing with milk and honey or give us inheritance of fields and vineyards do you think that you can pull something over our eyes? We will definitely not come. Moses became very angry he prayed to God do not accept their offering I did not take a single donkey from them. I did not do any of them any harm. Moses then said to Korach you and all your party will have to present yourselves before God you and your party will be there tomorrow along with Aaron each man shall take his fire pan and place incense on it and each one shall then present it before God there shall thus be 250 fire pans besides the pans that you and Aaron will have each one took his fire pan placed fire on it and then offered incense they stood at the communion tent ent
8. Hiram went out and stood defiantly at the entrance of their tents along with their wives, sons, and infants. Moses announced, This shall demonstrate to you that God sent me to do all these deeds, and I did not make up anything myself. If these men die like all other men and share the common fate of man, then God did not send me. But if God creates something entirely new, making the earth open its mouth and swallow them, and all that is there so that they descend to the depths alive, then it is. These men who are provoking God, Moses had hardly finished speaking when the ground under David and Abiram split the earth, opened its mouth, and swallowed them and their houses, along with all the men who were with courage and their property. They fell into the depths along with all that was theirs. The earth then covered them over, and they were lost to the community. Hearing their cries, all the Israelites around them screamed that the earth would also swallow them up, and they began to run away. Fire then came down from God, and it consumed the two hundred and fifty men who were presenting the incense. The incense pans God spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, that the fire pans have been sanctified, and he must gather them up from the burned area. He shall then scatter the burning coals far and wide. The fire pans belonging to the men who committed a mortal sin have been presented before God and thus sanctified, so he shall make them into beaten plates to cover the Altar let this be a sign for the Israelites. Eliezer took the copper fire pans that the victims of the fire had presented and he beat them flat as a covering for the altar. It was to be a reminder for the Israelites so that no one other than a descendant of Aaron shall bring unauthorized fire and burn incense before God. They shall then not be like Korach and his party. Eliezer thus did as God had told him through Moses' fear and complained. The next day the entire Israelite community began to complain to Moses, You have killed God's people. They exclaimed the people were demonstrating against Moses and Aaron when they turned toward the communion tent. It was suddenly covered with the cloud and God's glory appeared. Moses and Aaron went to the front of the communion tent. Aaron saves the people. God spoke to Moses, saying, Stand clear of this community and I will destroy them in an instant. Moses and Aaron threw themselves on their faces. Moses then said to Aaron, Take the fire pan and place on it some fire from the altar offer incense and go quickly to the community to make atonement for them divine wrath is coming forth from God the plate has already begun. Aaron took the pans as Moses had told him and he ran to the middle of the assembled masses where the plate had already begun to kill people he offered the incense to atone for the people he stood between the dead and the living and the plate was checked the number of people who died in that plate was 14,700 these were in addition to the ones who died because of Korach's rebellion when the plate had been stopped Aaron returned to Moses at the communion tent entrance the test of Staffs God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Israelites and take a staff from each paternal tribe. Twelve staffs shall thus be taken from all the leaders, one for each of their paternal tribes. Let each man write his name on his staff, since there shall be only one staff for the head of each paternal tribe. Write Aaron's name on Levi's staff. Place the staffs in the communion tent before the Ark of Testimony, where I commune with you, the staff of the man who is my choice. Will then blossom, I will thus rid myself of the complaints that the Israelites are directing at you. Moses spoke to the Israelites, and each of the leaders gave him a staff for his paternal tribe. There were twelve staffs with Aaron's staff among them. Moses placed the staffs before God in the testimony tent. The next day, when Moses came to the testimony tent, Aaron's staff representing the house of Levi had blossomed, it had given forth leaves, and was now producing blossoms and almonds. Were ripening on it, Moses brought all the staffs out from before God and let all the Israelites see them. Each man took his own staff. Aaron's staff, God said to Moses, Put Aaron's staff back there before the Ark of Testimony as a keepsake. Let it be a sign for anyone who wants to rebel. This should put an end to their complaints to me, and then they will not die. Moses did exactly as God had instructed him. Fear of the sanctuary, the Israelites said to Moses, We're going to die. We will be destroyed. We are all lost. Whoever approaches God's tabernacle dies. Are we then doomed to die? Duties of priests and love, as God said to Aaron, You along with your sons and your paternal tribe shall expiate any sin associated with the sanctuary. You and your descendants will also expiate any sin associated with your priesthood. Also bring close to you your brothers, the members of your father's tribe. Levi, let them be your associates and minister to you and your descendants before the testimony tent. Beloved shall thus be entrusted with their responsibilities toward you and they. Tent, but they shall not approach the sacred furniture or the altar so that you and they not die. Beloved shall be your associates and they shall be entrusted with responsibility for the communion tent and all the tent service. Let no unauthorized person join them. Let them be entrusted with responsibility for the sanctuary and the altar so that there not be any more divine wrath directed at the Israelites. I have thus taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the other Israelites. As a gift to you, they are given over to God to perform the communion tent service. You and your sons shall be entrusted with your priesthood so that your service shall include everything that pertains to the altar and to anything inside the cloth partition. This is a gift of service that I have given you as your priesthood. Any unauthorized person who participates shall die. The priestly share God announced to Aaron, I have given you responsibility for my elevated gifts I am thus giving you. All the sacred gifts of the Israelites as part of your anointment, these shall be an eternal portion for your descendants among the fire offerings that are holy of holies. The following shall be yours. All the Israelites' sacrifices, all their grain offerings, all their sin offerings, all their guilt offerings, and everything that they return to me, these shall be holy of holies to you and your descendants. Every male priest may eat these offerings, but you must eat them in a most holy area since they must remain holy to you. This is what shall be bestowed as an elevated gift to you. All the Israelites' wave offerings are given to you along with your sons and daughters as an everlasting portion. Everyone in your household who is ritually clean may eat them. The dedicated portion of oil, wine, and grain that must initially be presented to God is now given to you. The first fruit of all that grows in your land which is presented to God shall be yours. Everyone in your Household who is ritually clean may eat everything that the Israelites declare taboo shall be yours. The first fruits of the womb that must be presented to God among man and beast shall be yours. However, you must redeem firstborn humans as well as the firstborn of unclean animals. The redemption of the firstborn human male from one month old shall be made with the usual endowment of five shekels by the sanctuary standard where the shekel is twenty years. You must not, however, redeem the firstborn of an ox, sheep, or goat. Since such firstborn are sacred, you must therefore dash their blood on the altar and burn their choice parts as an appeasing fragrance to God. Their flesh shall then belong to you like the chest presented as a wave offering and the right thigh of peace offerings I have thus given you together with your sons and daughters as an eternal portion. The elevated gifts from the sacred offerings that the Israelites present to God for you and your descendants. This is a covenant that shall be preserved forever before God. God then said to Aaron, You will not have any inheritance in the land of the Israelites, and you will not have a portion among them. I myself shall be a portion and inheritance among the Israelites. Beloved, I will share to the descendants of Levi. I am now giving all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance. This is in exchange for their work, the service that they perform in the communion tent. The other Israelites shall therefore no longer come forth to the communion tent, since they can then become guilty of sin and die. Instead, the necessary service in the communion tent will be performed by the Levites, and they will expiate the sins of the Israelites. It shall be an eternal law for future generations that the Levites not have any land inheritance. Instead, the inheritance that I am giving the Levites shall consist of the tithes of the Israelites, which they separate as an elevated gift. I have therefore told the Levites that they shall not have any land inheritance among the Israelites. The Levites priestly gifts God spoke to Moses telling him to speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the Israelites the tithe that I have given you as your inheritance from them, you must separate from it an elevated gift to God. A tithe of the tithe is tithe given to you by the Israelites is your own elevated gift and it is exactly like grain from the threshing floor or wine from the bat. You must therefore separate an elevated gift from all the tithes that you take from the Israelites and you must give it as God's elevated gift to Aaron the priest. Thus from all that is given to you, you must separate God's elevated gift taking a sanctified portion as its dedicated tithe for the priest. Say to the Levites, After you have separated out the dedicated tithe for the priest, the rest shall be for all the Levites exactly like ordinary produce from the threshing. Floor and wine that
Sprinkling water as a means of purification the one who gathers up the cow's ashes must immerse his body and his clothing and remain unclean until evening all this shall be an eternal law for the Israelites and for any proselyte who joins them. If one has contact with any dead human being he shall become ritually unclean for seven days in order to become clean he must have himself sprinkled with the purification water on the third day and the seventh day any person who touches. The corpse of a human being who has died and does not have himself sprinkled shall be cut off spiritually from Israel if he defiles God's tabernacle by entering it when a man dies in a tent this is the law. Everything that comes into the tent or was originally in the tent shall be unclean for seven days every open vessel that does not have an airtight seal shall be unclean similarly anyone who touches a victim of the sword any other corpse a human bone or a grave even in it. Open field shall be unclean for seven days. Some of the dust from the burnt purification offering shall be taken for such an unclean person. It shall be placed into a vessel that has been filled with water directly from a running spring. A ritually clean person shall then take some hyssop and dip it into the water. He shall sprinkle the water on the tent on all the vessels and persons who were in it and on anyone who touched the bone, a murder victim, or any other corpse or a grave. It. Ritually clean person shall sprinkle the water on the unclean person on the third day and on the seventh day. The purification process is completed on the seventh day when the person undergoing purification must immerse his clothing and body in a mikvah and then become ritually clean in the evening. If a person is unclean and does not purify himself and then defile God's sanctuary by entering it, that person shall be cut off spiritually from the community as long as the purification. Water has not been sprinkled on him, he shall remain unclean. This shall be to you a law for all times. One who sprinkles the purification water other than when it is done for the purification ritual must immerse both his body and his clothing. However, if he merely touches the purification water, he must only immerse his body and then be unclean until evening. Anything that a person unclean by contact with the dead touches shall become unclean. Moreover, any person touching him shall be unclean until evening. Miriam's death, lack of water in the first month, the entire Israelite community came to the Tsin desert, and the people stopped in Kadesh. It was there that Miriam died and was buried. The people did not have any water, so they began demonstrating against Moses and Aaron. The people disputed with Moses, We wish that we had died together with our brothers before God. They declared, Why did you bring God's congregation to this desert? So that we and our livestock should die. Why did you take us out of Egypt and bring us to this terrible place? It is an area where there are no plants, figs, grapes, or pomegranates. Now there is not even any water to drink. Moses and Aaron moved away from the demonstration to the communion tent entrance and fell on their faces. God's glory was revealed to them. Water from the rock God spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and you and Aaron assemble the community. Speak to the cliff in their presence and it will give forth its water. You will thus bring forth water from the cliff and allow the community and their livestock to drink. Moses took the staff from before God as he had been instructed Moses and Aaron. Then assembled the congregation before the cliff. Listen now you rebels. Shouted Moses, Shall we produce water for you from this cliff? With that Moses raised his hand and struck the cliff twice with his staff a huge amount of water gushed out and the community and their animals were able to drink punishment of Moses and Aaron. God said to Moses and Aaron, You did not have enough faith in me to sanctify me in the presence of the Israelites. Therefore you shall not bring this assembly to the land that I have given you. These are the waters of dispute, May Meribah, where the Israelites disputed with God and where he was nevertheless sanctified encounter with Edom. Moses sent envoys from Kadesh to the king of Edom with the following message. This is what your brother Israel declares. You know about all the troubles that we have encountered. Our fathers migrated to Egypt and we lived in Egypt for a long time. The Egyptians mistreated both our fathers and us when we cried out to God. He heard our voice and sent a representative to take us out of Egypt. We are now in Kadesh, a city at the edge of your territories. Please let us pass through your land. We will not go through any fields or vineyards and we will not drink any water from your wells until we pass through your territories. We will travel along the king's highway, not turning aside to the right or to the left. Edom's response was, Do not pass through my land or I will greet you with the sword. The Israelites said, We will keep on the beaten path. If we or our cattle drink any of your water, we will pay the full price. It is of no concern. We only want to pass through on foot. Do not come through, was Edom's response. Edom came forth to confront the Israelites with a large number of people and a show of force. Edom thus refused to allow Israel to pass through its territories, and Israel had to go around the area Aaron's death, moving on from Kadesh. The entire Israelite community came to Hor Mountain. At Hor Mountain, God said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron will now die and be gathered up to his people. He will not come to the land that I am giving the Israelites because he rebelled against my word at the waters of dispute. You, Moses, take Aaron and his son Eliezer and bring them up to Hor Mountain to vest Aaron of his vestments and place them on his son Eliezer. Aaron will then be gathered up to his ancestors and die there. Moses did as God commanded him. It Three of them climbed Hor Mountain in the presence of the entire community. Moses divested Aaron of his vestments and placed them on Aaron's son Eliezer. Aaron died there on the top of the mountain. When Moses and Eliezer descended from the mountain, the people realized that Aaron had died. The entire family of Israel mourned Aaron for thirty days' confrontation with Canaan. When the Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that the Israelites were traveling along the Atharim highway, he attacked them and took some captives. The Israelites made a vow to God and said, "If you give this nation into our hand, we will render their cities taboo." God heard Israel's voice and he allowed them to defeat the Canaanites. The Israelites declared them and their cities taboo. The place was therefore named Tabu, Shermith. The snakes further journeys. The Israelites moved on from Hor Mountain, going by way of the South Sea, so as to skirt the territory of Edom. The people began to become discouraged along the way. The people spoke out against God and Moses, "Why did you take us out of Egypt to die in the desert?" There is no bread and no water. We are getting disgusted with this insubstantial food. God sent poisonous snakes against the people, and when they began biting the people, a number of Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against God, and you pray to God and have him take the snakes away from us. When Moses prayed for the people, God said to Moses, Make yourself the image of a venomous snake and place it on a banner. Everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Moses made a copper snake and placed it on a hot pole. Whenever a snake bit a man, he would gaze at the copper snake and live. The Israelites then moved on and camped in Obeth from Obeth. They moved on and camped in the desolate passes along Moab's eastern border. They then continued and camped along the Zir Brook. They traveled further and camped in the desert, extending from the Amorite border on the opposite side of the Arnon River. The Arnon is the Moabite border separating Moab from the Amorites. It is therefore told in the book of God's wars as an outermost boundary I have given you the streams of Arnon as well as the valleys rapids that hug Moab's borders turning aside at the fortress settlement from there the Israelites traveled to the well this is the well regarding which God said to Moses gather the people and I will give them water song of the well it was then that Israel sang this song rise O well respond to the song a well was dug by princes sunk by the people's leaders carved out with their staffs from the desert the Israelites went to Matanah from Matanah to Nakaliel and from Nakaliel to Gomit from Gomit they went to the guy in the field of Moab it is on the top of the cliff that overlooks the wastelands confrontations with Sikhan and Israel sent emissaries to Sikhan king of the Amorites with the following message let us pass through your land we will not turn aside to the fields and vineyards and we will not drink any well water we will follow the king's highway until we have passed through your territory Sikhan however did not let Israel pass through his territories instead Sikhan mustered up all his people and went out to confront Israel in the desert when he came to Yahitz he attacked Israel Israel struck him down with the sword and occupied his land from the Arnon to the Jabbok as far as the borders of the Ammonites the borders of the Ammonites however remained firm Israel thus took all these cities they later settled in Cheshman and all its tributary towns all the Amorite cities Cheshman was the capital of Sikhan king of the Amorites he had fought against the first king of Moab and taken all his land as far as the Arnon the minstrels therefore say come to Cheshman let Sikhan city be built and established for a fire
Around us just as Abol licks up all the vegetation in the field, Balak son of Tipper was then king of Moab. He sent emissaries to Balaam son of Beor to his native land in Petar on the Euphrates River. They were to summon him with the following message. A nation that covers the land surface has left Egypt and is now staying right near us. This nation is too powerful for us alone. So if you would come and curse this nation for me, then we may be able to defeat them and drive them from. The area I know that whomever you bless is blessed and whomever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian first in the cult arts went to Balaam conveying to him Balak's message. Spend the night here. He replied to them and when God speaks to me I will be able to give you an answer. The Moabite dignitaries remained with Balaam. God appeared to Balaam and asked who are these men with you. Balaam replied to God, Balak son of Tipper, king of Moab, has sent me a message. A nation that covers the earth's surface has left Egypt. Come and curse them for me, so that hopefully I will be able to fight against them and drive them away. God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. Do not curse the nation in question, because it is a blessed nation. When Balaam got up in the morning, he said to Balak's dignitaries, Go home. God refuses to let me go with you. The Moabite dignitaries set out, and when they came to Balak, they said, Balaam refuses to go with us. Balak sent another delegation this time with a larger number of dignitaries higher in rank than the first. When they came to Balaam, they gave him the following message in the name of Balak son of Tipper. Do not refuse to come to me. I will give you great honor doing anything you say, but please come and curse this nation for me. Balaam interrupted. Balak's servants and said, Even if Balak gave me his whole palace full of gold and silver, I would not be able to do anything great or small that would violate the word of God, my lord. But now you two remain here overnight, then I will know what God shall declare to me. That night God appeared to Balaam and said to him, If the men have come to summon you, set out and go with them, but only do exactly as I instruct you. When Balaam got up in the morning, he saddled his female donkey and went. With the Moabite dignitaries, God displayed anger because Balaam was so anxious to go, and an angel of God planted himself in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, accompanied by his two boy servants. When the donkey saw God's angel standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, the donkey went aside from the road into the field. Balaam beat the donkey to get it back on the road. God's angel then stood in a narrow path through the vineyards where there was a fence on. Either side, when the donkey saw God's angel, it edged over to the side, crushing Balaam's foot against the wall. Balaam beat it even more. God's angel continued ahead of Balaam, and he stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn right or left. When the donkey saw God's angel, it lay down, refusing to budge. Or Balaam, Balaam lost his temper and beat the donkey with a stick. God then gave the donkey the power of speech, and it said to Balaam, "What have I done to you that you beat me these three times? You have been playing games with me." Shouted Balaam at the donkey, "If I had had a sword in my hand just now, I would have killed you." The donkey replied to Balaam, "Am I not your old donkey? You have been riding on me as far back as you remember. Have I ever been in the habit of doing this to you?" No reply. Balaam God then gave Balaam the ability to see, and he perceived the angel standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. Balaam kneeled and prostrated himself on his face. God's angel said to him, "Why did you beat your donkey these three times?" I have come out to oppose you because your errand is obnoxious to me. When the donkey saw me, it turned aside these three times. If it had not turned aside before me as it did now, I would have killed you and spared the donkey. Balaam said to God's angel, I have sinned. I did not know that you were standing on the road before me. If you consider it wrong for me to go, I will go back home. God's angel said to Balaam, Go with the men, but do not say anything other than the exact words that I declare to you. Balaam thus continued with Balak's dignitaries. When Balak heard that Balaam had arrived, he went out to meet him in the city of Moab, which was at the extreme end of his territory on the edge of the Arnon. Balak said to Balaam, I had to make so much effort to get you. Why did you not come to me right away? Did you think that I couldn't honor you? And now that I have come to you, replied Balaam to Balak, do you think that I can say anything? I can only declare the words that God places in my mouth. Balaam went with Balak and they came to the city suburbs. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep, sending some to Balaam and the dignitaries who were with him in the morning. Balak took Balaam and brought him to the high altars of Baal where he could see as far as the other edges of the Israelite people. Balak and Balaam built seven altars for me here, said Balaam to Balak and prepare for me seven bulls and seven rams when Balak did as Balaam had requested. Balak and Balaam sacrificed a bull and ram as a burnt offering on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, keep a vigil beside your burnt offerings and I will go. Hopefully God will appear to me and declare that he will show me something that I can relate to you with. That Balaam went off to meditate. God appeared to Balaam. I have set up seven altars, said Balaam to God and I have sacrificed a bull and ram as a burnt offering on each altar. God placed a Message in Balaam's mouth and said, Go back to Balak and declare exactly what I have told you. When Balaam returned, Balak was still standing in vigil over his burnt offering along with all the Moabite dignitaries. Balaam declared his oracle and said, Balak, king of Moab, has brought me from Aram from the hills of the east, telling me to come curse Jacob and conjure divine wrath against Israel. But what curse can I pronounce if God will not grant curse? What divine wrath can I conjure if God will not be angry? I see this nation from mountaintops and gaze on it from the heights. It is a nation dwelling alone at peace, not counting itself among other nations. Jacob is like the dust who can count his hordes. Who can number the seed of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, but let my end be like his. Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but you have made every effort to bless them. Balaam interrupted and said, Didn't I tell you that I must be very careful to say only what God tells me? If you would reply, Balak, come with me to another place there, you will be able to see only a small section of the Israelite camp, and you will not have to see them all from there. You may be able to curse them for me with that. He took Balaam to look out field at the top of the cliff there. He built seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Keep a vigil here with your burnt offering, said Balaam to Balak, and I will go yonder and seek a vision. God appeared to Balaam and placed a message in his mouth. He said, Return to Balak and declare exactly what I have told you. When Balaam returned, Balak was standing vigil over his burnt offering along with the Moabite dignitaries. What has God declared? Asked Balak. Balaam proclaimed his oracle and said, Rise, Balak, and listen. Pay close attention to my insight, son of Tipper. God is not human that he should be false nor mortal that he should change his mind. Shall he say something and not do it or speak? And not fulfill? It is a blessing that I have taken, and when there is such a blessing, I cannot reverse it. God does not look at wrongdoing in Jacob, and he sees no vice in Israel. God, their Lord, is with them, and they have the king's friendship. Since God brought them out of Egypt, they are like his highest expression of strength. No black magic can be effective against Jacob, and no occult powers against Israel. How is God acting? Is the only question pertinent to Jacob and Israel? This is a nation that rises like the king of beasts and lifts itself like a lion. It does not lie down until it eats its prey and drinks the blood of its kill. Balak said to Balaam, If you can't curse them, at least don't bless them. Balaam interrupted and said to Balak, My exact words to you were, I will do precisely what God declares, weren't they? If you would, let's go on, said Balak to Balaam, I will take you somewhere else. Hopefully, God will consider it proper to let you curse them for me there. Balak took Balaam to the top of the peak that overlooks the wasteland. Balaam said to Balak, Build me seven altars here and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Balak did as Balaam said, and he sacrificed the bull and ram as a burnt offering on each altar. Balak and Balaam, when Balaam realized that God desired to bless Israel, he did not seek out the occult forces as he had done before. Instead, he set his gaze toward the desert. When Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel dwelling at peace by tribes, God's spirit was on him. He proclaimed his oracle and said, This is the word of the son Balaam, the word of the man with the enlightened eye. It is the word of one who hears God's sayings, who sees a vision of the Almighty falling into a meditative trance with mystical insight. How good are your tents, Jacob, your Tabernacles Israel, they stretch out like streams like gardens by the
perceive it but not in the near future a star shall go forth from Jacob and a staff shall arise in Israel crushing all of Moab's princes and dominating all of Seth's descendants Edom shall be demolished and his enemies here destroyed but Israel shall be triumphant out of Jacob shall come an absolute ruler who will obliterate the city's last survivors when Balaam saw Amalek he proclaimed his oracle and said first among nations is Amalek but in the end he will be destroyed forever when he saw the Canites he proclaimed his oracle and said you live in a fortress and have placed your nest in a cliff but when the time comes to destroy the Canites how long will Assyria hold back from you he then declared his oracle and said alas who can survive God's devastation Warships shall come from the ports of the Kittim and they will lay waste Assyria and ever but in the end they too shall be destroyed forever with that Balaam set out and returned home Balak also went on his way Israel sins with Moab Israel was staying in Shittim when the people began to behave immorally with the Moabite girls the girls invited the people to their religious sacrifices and the people ate and worshipped the Moabite gods Israel thus became involved with Baal Pier and God displayed anger against Israel God said to Moses take the people's leaders and have them impale the idolaters publicly before God this will reverse God's display of anger against Israel Moses said to Israel's judges each of you must kill your constituents who were involved with Baal Pier the judges were still weeping in indecision at the communion tent entrance when an Israelite brought forth a Midianite woman to his brethren before the eyes of Moses and the Israelite community when pinches a son of Eliezer and a grandson of Aaron the priest saw this he rose up from the midst of the assemblage and took a spear in his hand he followed the Israelite man into the tent's inner chamber and ran them through driving the spear through the Israelite man and woman's growing with that the plague that had struck the Israelites was arrested and that plague 24,000 people had died pinches reward God spoke to Moses saying pinches a son of Eliezer and grandson of Aaron the priest was the one who zealously took up my cause among the Israelites and turned my anger away from them so that I did not destroy them in my demand for exclusive worship therefore tell him that I have given him my covenant of peace that shall imply a covenant of eternal priesthood to him and his descendants after him it is given to him because he zealously took up God's cause and made atonement for the Israelites the name of the man who was killed along with the Midianite woman was Zimri son of Saul, a prince of the Simeonite paternal line. The name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Kashbi, the daughter of Sir governor of the paternal line. In Midian orders to attack Midian, God spoke to Moses, saying, Attack the Midianites and kill them, since they attacked you through their plot with Pir, as well as through their sister Kashbi, daughter of a Midianite prince who was killed on the day of plague that resulted from Pir, the new census, Reuben. It was now after the plague God spoke to Moses and Eliezer, son of Aaron the priest, saying, Take a census of the entire Israelite community by paternal lines, counting every male over twenty years old who is fit for duty. Moses and Eliezer the priest spoke to the Israelites in the western plains of Moab near the Jordan opposite Jericho, saying, Count those over twenty years old, just as God commanded Moses and the Israelites who had left Egypt. Reuben was Israel's firstborn. They Descendants of Reuben were the Enochite family from Enoch, the Paliot family from Palu, the Chetronite family from Chetron, and the Carmite family from Carmi. These were the Rubenite families, and their tally was 43,730. The sons of Palu, Eliot, the sons of Eliot, Nemul, Dathan, and Abiram, Dathan, and Abiram were the communal leaders who led a revolution against Moses and Aaron as part of Korach's rebellion against God. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, and Korach when the rebellious group died, and fire annihilated 250 men. This involved a divine miracle. The sons of Korach, however, did not die. Simeon by families. The descendants of Simeon were the Nemulite family from Nemul, the Yamanite family from Yamani, the Yakanite family from Yakan, the Zarkite family from Zirak, and the Salite family from Saul. These are the families of Simeon, numbering 22,200. Gad by families. The descendants of Gad were the Zephonite family from Zephon, the Chagite family from. Chagai, the Shinite family from Shinai, the Aznite family from Aznite, the Arite family from Ari, the Arodite family from Arat, and the Erlite family from Arali. These are the families of Gad's descendants. Their tally being 40,500 Judah, the first sons of Judah were Er and Onan, but Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan by families. Then the descendants of Judah were the Shelanite family from Shelah, the Partsite family from Peretz, and the Zarkite family from Zirak. The descendants of Peretz were the Chetronite family from Chetron, and the Camelite family from Camel. These are the families of Judah. Their tally being 76,500 Issachar by families. The descendants of Issachar were the Tolate family from Tola, the Punite family from Puba, the Yashavit family from Yashav, and the Shimronite family from Shimron. These are the families of Issachar. Their tally being 64,300 Zebulun by their families. The descendants of Zebulun were the Sardite family from Seir, the Ilani. Family from Elon and the Yachlai family from Yachlai. These are the families of Zebulun. Their tally being 60,500 Manasseh by their families. The descendants of Joseph were Manasseh and Ephraim. The descendants of Manasseh consisted of the Machairite family from Machir. Machir's son was Gilead, and from Gilead came the family of the Galatites. These were the descendants of Gilead. The Yezerite family from Yezer. The Shilkai family from Shelet. The Asrielite family from Asriel. The Shechemite family from Shechem. The Shemite family from Shemite. And the Shephrite family from Shephrite. Shephrite's son Tzilkad did not have any sons, only daughters. The names of Tzilkad's daughters were Machlonoa, Shiklamoka, and Tertza. These are the families of Manasseh, and their tally was 52,700 Ephraim by their families. The descendants of Ephraim were the Shuttlekai family from Shuttlelash, the Bekrite family from Bekr, and the Tekanite family from Tekan. The descendants of Shuttlelash consisted of the Aranite family from Aran. These are the families of Ephraim's descendants. Their tally being 32,500. All these were the descendants of Joseph by their families. Benjamin by their families. The descendants of Benjamin were the Baalite family from Bela, the Ashbalite family from Ashbal, the Kiramite family from Kiram, the Shephuthamite family from Shephuthamite, and the Shuthamite family from Shuthamite. The sons of Bela were Art and Nominees gave rise to the Artite. Family and the Namite family from Naman, these are Benjamin's descendants by their families, and their tally was 45,600. Dan by their families, the descendants of Dan consisted of the Shishamite family from Shushim. This was the only family of Dan. The tally of all the families of the Shishamites was 64,400. Asher by their families, the descendants of Asher were the Yimna family from Yimna, the Ishvai family from Ishvi, and the Buriite family from Buria. The descendants of Buria consisted of the Shevrite family from Shevra and the Malthielite family from Machiel. The name of Asher's daughter was Rich. These are the families of Asher's descendants, their tally being 53,400. Naphtali total by their families, the descendants of Naphtali consisted of the Yatzili family from Yatzil, the Gunite family from Gunite, the Yitzrite family from Yitzir, and the Shalemite family from Shalem. These are the families of Naphtali, their tally being 45,400. The total tally of the Israelites was a 601730, dividing the land God spoke to Moses saying, Among these people you shall divide the land as an inheritance following a number of names recorded to a larger group you shall give a larger inheritance while to a smaller group you shall give a smaller inheritance each one shall thus be given his hereditary property according to its tally however hereditary property shall be granted to paternal families through a lottery system this is how the land shall be divided whether a group is large or small its hereditary property shall be divided by a lottery system tally of the Levites these are the tallies of the Levites by their families the Gershonite family from Gershon the Kahatai family from Kahat and the Merari family from Merari these are the subfamilies of Levi the Libnite family the Chevronite family the Machlite family the Mashite family and the Korshite family Kahat had a son Amram the name of Amram's wife was Yekebde Daughter of Levi, who had been born to Levi in Egypt, she bore Amram's children Aaron and Moses, as well as their sister Miriam, born to Aaron, were Nadab, Abu Eliezer, and Ithamar. Nadab and Abu, however, died when they offered unauthorized fire before God, counting every male over one month old. The tally of the Levites was 23,000. They were not tallied among the other Israelites because they were not to be given hereditary property
Give us a portion of land along with our fathers' brothers. Moses brought their case before God. Inheritance for daughters. God spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Tzilakat have just claimed. Give them a hereditary portion of land alongside their fathers' brothers. Let their fathers' hereditary property thus pass over to them. Speak to the Israelites and tell them that if a man dies and has no son, his hereditary property shall pass over to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then his hereditary property shall be given to his brothers. If he has no brothers, you shall give his property to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, then you shall give his property to the closest relative in his family who shall then be his heir. This was the decreed law for the Israelites as God had commanded Moses. Moses told to prepare for death. God said to Moses, Climb up to the Abarim mountain where you will be able to see the land that I am giving to the Israelites after. You see it, you will be gathered up to your people just as your brother Aaron was when the community disputed God in the Ksin desert. You disobeyed my commandment when you were to sanctify me before their eyes with the water. God was speaking of the waters of dispute. May Meripa, at Kadesh in the Ksin desert, Joshua chosen to replace Moses. Moses spoke to God, saying, Let the omnipotent God of all living souls appoint a man over the community. Let him come and go before them and let him bring them forth and lead them. Let God's community not be like sheep that have no shepherd. God said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man of spirit, and lay your hands on him. Have him stand before Eliezer the priest and before the entire community, and let them see you commission him, invest him with some of your splendor, so that the entire Israelite community will obey him. Let him stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall seek the decision of the Urim before God on his behalf. But this word Joshua along with all the Israelites and the entire community shall come and go. Moses did as God had ordered him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer the priest and before the entire community. He then laid his hands on him and commissioned him. It was all done as God had commanded Moses. The daily sacrifice God spoke to Moses telling him to give the Israelites instructions and tell them, Be careful to offer my fire offering food sacrifice to me in its proper time as my appeasing fragrance. Tell them that the fire offering that they must offer to God shall consist of two yearling sheep without blemish each day as a regular daily burnt offering. Prepare one sheep in the morning and the second sheep in the afternoon. There shall also be one tenth of wheat meal for the grain offering mixed with one fourth in hand pressed olive oil. This is a regular daily burnt offering the same as that presented at Mount Sinai as an appeasing fragrance of fire. Offering to God its libation shall be one fourth in one for each sheep poured in the sanctuary as a libation to drink offering to God. Present the second sheep in the afternoon you shall present it with the same meal offering and libation as the morning sacrifice. It is a fire offering and appeasing fragrance to God. The additional Sabbath offering on the Sabbath day you shall present two additional yearling sheep without blemish two tenths of wheat meal mixed with oil as a grain offering. And its libation this is the burnt offering presented each Sabbath in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its libation the new moon offering on your new moon festivals you shall present as a burnt offering to God two young bulls one ram and seven yearling sheep all without blemish there shall be a grain offering of three tenths of wheat meal mixed with oil for each bull a grain offering of two tenths of wheat meal mixed with oil for the ram and a grain offering of one tenth. If a mix with oil for each sheep this shall be burnt offering presented as an appeasing fragrance to God their one libation shall consist of one half in for each bull one third in for the ram and one fourth in for each sheep this is the new moon burnt offering for the year's lunar months there shall also be one goat presented as a sin offering to God all this shall be presented in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its libation the Passover offering the fourteenth day of the first month is God's Passover then on the fifteenth day a festival shall begin when matzah shall be eaten for seven days the first day shall be a sacred holiday when you shall do no mundane work as a burnt fire offering to God you shall offer two young bulls one ram and seven yearling sheep making sure that all are without blemish the grain offering that you must present shall consist of wheat meal mixed with oil three tenths for each bull two tenths for the ram and one tenth for each of the seven sheep. There shall also be a sin offering go to make atonement for you all these shall be presented in addition to the morning burnt offering that is offered as a regular daily sacrifice on each of the seven days you shall prepare a similar sacrifice as a consumed fire offering and appeasing fragrance to God this shall be in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its libation the seventh day shall be a sacred holiday to you when you shall not do any mundane work Shavuot offering the day of first fruits is when you bring a new grain offering to God as part of your Shavuot festival it shall be a sacred holiday to you when you may not do any mundane work as an appeasing fragrance to God you shall then present a burnt offering consisting of two young bulls one ram and seven yearling sheep their grain offering consisting of wheat meal mixed with oil shall be three tenths of for each bull two tenths for the ram and one tenth for each of the seven sheep there shall also be one male goat to atone for you you must present all this in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its meal offering these sacrifices and their libations must be without blemish for you to present them the new year offering the first day of the seventh month shall be a sacred holiday to you when you may not do any mundane work it shall be a day of sounding the ram's horn as an appeasing fragrance to God you must present a burnt offering consisting of one Young bull one ram and seven yearling sheep all without blemish their grain offering of wheat meal mixed with oil shall be three tenths for the bull two tenths for the ram and one tenth for each of the seven sheep there shall also be one goat as a sin offering to make atonement for you all this is in addition to the new moon offering the regular daily offering and their required meal offerings and libations which are an appeasing fragrance of fire offering to God the young keeper offering. The tenth of this month shall be a sacred holiday to you when you must fast and not do any work as a burnt offering for an appeasing fragrance to God you shall present one young bull one ram and seven yearling sheep making sure that all are without blemish their grain offering of wheat meal mixed with oil shall be three tenths for the bull two tenths for the ram and one tenth for each of the seven sheep there shall also be one goat as a sin offering in addition to the special atonement sin. Offering all these sacrifices and their libations are in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its meal offering the circus offering. First day of the fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be a sacred holiday to you when no mundane work may be done. You shall celebrate a festival to God for seven days as an appeasing fragrance to God. You shall present a burnt offering consisting of thirteen young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling sheep, all without blemish. Their grain offering of wheat meal mixed with oil shall be three tenths for each of the thirteen bulls, two tenths for each of the two rams, and one tenth for each of the fourteen sheep. There shall also be one goat as a sin offering. This is in addition to the regular daily burnt offering, its grain offering, and its libation. The second day of circus on the second day there shall be twelve young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling sheep, all without blemish, along with the grain offerings and libations appropriate for the number of bulls, rams, and sheep. There shall also be one goat as a sin offering. These offerings and their libations shall be in addition to the regular daily burnt offering and its grain offering. The third day of circus on the third day there shall be eleven young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling sheep, all without blemish, along with the grain offerings and libations appropriate for the number of bulls, rams, and sheep. There shall also be one goat as a sin offering. All this is in addition to the regular daily burnt offering. Its grain offering and its libation. The fourth day of circus on the fourth day there shall be ten young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling sheep, all without blemish, along with the grain offerings and libations appropriate for the number of bulls, rams, and sheep. There shall also be one goat as a sin offering. All this is in addition to the regular daily burnt offering. Its grain offering and its libation. The fifth day of circus on the fifth day there shall be nine young bulls, two rams, and fourteen. Yearling sheep all without blemish along with the grain offerings and libations appropriate for the number of bulls rams and sheep there shall also be one goat as a sin offering all this is in addition to the regular daily burnt offering its grain offering and its libation the sixth day of circus on the sixth day there shall be eight young bulls two rams and fourteen yearling sheep all without blemish along with the grain offerings and libations appropriate for the number of bulls rams and sheep there shall also be one goat as a sin offering all this is in addition to the regular daily burnt
must not break his word, he must do all that he expressed verbally. This is the law when a woman makes a vow to God or binds herself by an obligation while still a girl in her father's house. If her father remains silent when he hears her vow or self-imposed obligation, then all her vows and self-imposed obligations must be kept. However, if he obstructs her on the day he hears it, then any such vow or self-imposed obligation of hers shall not be fulfilled since her father has obstructed her. God will forgive her. This is the law if she is betrothed to a man and is bound by her vows and self-imposed verbal obligations. If the men in her life hear about it and remain silent on the day they hear, then her vows and self-imposed obligations must be kept. However, if the men in her life obstruct her on the day they hear about it, they can annul her vows and self-imposed verbal obligations, and God will forgive her. The vow of a widow or divorcee must be kept no matter what obligation. She takes upon herself. This is the law if a woman makes a vow or an oath for a self-imposed obligation in her husband's house. If her husband hears it and remains silent without obstructing her, then all her vows and self-imposed obligations must be kept. However, if her husband annuls them on the day he hears them, then all her verbally expressed vows and self-imposed obligations need not be kept since her husband has annulled them. God will forgive her. Thus, in the case of every vow or oath involving self-denial, a woman's husband can uphold them, and her husband can annul them. If her husband remains silent for the entire day, then he has automatically upheld any vow or obligation that she has assumed. He has upheld them simply by remaining silent on the day he heard them. However, if he annuls them after hearing them, he removes any guilt that she may have for violating them. These are the rules that God commanded Moses regarding the relationship between a man and his wife and between the father and his daughter as long as she is a girl in her father's house attacking the Midianites God spoke to Moses saying take revenge for the Israelites against the Midianites then you shall die and be gathered to your people Moses spoke to the people saying detach men for armed service against Midian so that God's revenge can be taken against the Midianites 1,000 from each of Israel's tribes shall be sent into armed service from the thousands of Israel 1,000 volunteered from each tribe a total of 12,000 special troops Moses sent forth the 1,000 men from each tribe as an army along with Pinchas son of Eliezer the priest who was in charge of the sacred articles and signal trumpets they mounted a surprise attack against Midian as God had commanded Moses and killed all the adult males along with the other victims they also killed the five kings of Midian every Rechem search and Reba the five Midianite kings they also killed Balaam. Son of Beba by the sword, the Israelites took captive all the women of Midian and their children. They took as booty all their animals, all their possessions, and all their wealth. The Israelites also set fire to all their residential cities and fortresses, taking all the booty and plunder, both man and beast. They brought the captives, the plunder, and the spoils to Moses Eliezer, the priest, and the entire Israelite community who were in the western plains of Moab on the Jericho Jordan. Moses Eliezer and all the community princes went out to greet them outside the camp. However, Moses was angry at the generals and captains who were the officers returning from the military campaign. Why have you kept all the women alive? demanded Moses. These are exactly the ones who were involved with the Israelites at Balaam's instigation, causing them to be unfaithful to God in the fear incident and bringing a plague on God's community. Now kill every male child as well as every woman. Who has been involved intimately with a man? However, all the young girls who have not been involved intimately with a man you may keep alive for yourselves. You must now remain outside the camp for seven days. Whoever killed a person or touched a corpse must purify himself on the third and seventh days. As far as you and your captives are concerned, every garment, every leather article, anything made of goat products, and every wooden article must undergo such purification. Purification after the war, Eliezer the priest said to the soldiers returning from the campaign, This is the rule that God commanded Moses. As far as the gold, silver, copper, iron, tin, and lead are concerned, whatever was used over fire must be brought over fire and purged and then purified with the sprinkling water. However, that which was not used over fire need only be immersed in a mikvah. You yourselves must also immerse your bodies and your garments on the seventh day, and you will then be clean so that. You can enter the camp dedicating a portion of the spoil God spoke to Moses saying together with Eliezer the priest and the community's paternal leaders you must take an accounting of the men and animals plundered as spoiled and divide the plunder equally giving half to the warriors who went out to battle and the other half to the community from the soldiers who participated in the campaign levy a tax to God consisting of one out of five hundred of the humans cattle donkeys and sheep take this from their half and give it to Eliezer the priest as an elevated gift to God from the half that is going to the other Israelites take one part out of fifty of the humans cattle donkeys sheep and other animals and give it to the Levites who are entrusted with God's tabernacle Moses and Eliezer the priest did as God had commanded Moses in addition to the goods that the troops had taken as booty the plunder consisted of six hundred and seventy five thousand sheep seventy two thousand head of cattle sixty one thousand donkeys and thirty two thousand humans, women who had never experienced intimacy with a man, the half portion for those who went out in the army was as follows, the number of sheep was 337,500 and the tax for God from the sheep consisted of 675 sheep there were 36,000 cattle out of which the tax for God was 72 there were 30,500 donkeys out of which the tax for God was 61 there were 16,000 humans out of which the tax for God consisted of 32 individuals Moses gave the tax to Eliezer the priest as an elevated gift to God. As God had commanded Moses the half that Moses took from the military men for the other Israelites as the community's portion consisted of 337,500 sheep, 36,000 cattle, 30,500 donkeys and 16,000 humans from the humans and beasts that were the Israelites half Moses took one out of fifty and gave them to the Levites who were entrusted with God's tabernacle it was all done as God had commanded Moses the generals and captains who were officers over the army's divisions approached Moses. They said to Moses we have taken a census of the warriors under our command and not a single man has been lost. We therefore want to bring an offering to God every man who found any gold article such as an anklet, a bracelet, a finger ring, an earring or a body ornament wishes to bring it to atone for our souls before God. Moses and Eliezer the priest took all the gold articles from them. The entire elevated gift of gold that was offered to God totaled 16,750 shekels. This was given by the generals and captains. The other soldiers however took their plunder for themselves. Moses and Eliezer did. Priest took the gold from the generals and captains and brought it to the communion tent as a remembrance for the Israelites before God. The petition of Reuben and Gad, the descendants of Reuben and Gad, had an extremely large number of animals, and they saw that the Eliezer and Gilead areas were good for livestock. The descendants of Gad and Reuben therefore came and presented the following petition to Moses, Eliezer the priest, and the community princes: Adaroth, Devon, Yazer, Nimr, Cheshvan, El Elis of Amnibo, and beyond in the land that God struck down before the Israelite community is livestock land, and what we have is livestock. Moses objects to the petition. They said, If you would grant us a favor, let this land be given to us as our permanent property, and do not bring us across the Jordan. Moses said to the descendants of Gad and Reuben, Why should your brothers go out and fight while you stay here? Why are you trying to discourage the Israelites from crossing over to the land that God has given them? This is the same thing your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. They went as far as Cluster Valley to see the land, but then they discouraged the Israelites from coming to the land that God gave them. God displayed his anger that day and swore none of the men over twenty years old who left Egypt will see the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob since they did not follow me wholeheartedly. The only exceptions shall be Caleb, son of Yephunneh, the Kenizzet, and Joshua, son of Nun, because they followed God wholeheartedly. God displayed anger against Israel and he made them wander forty years in the desert until the generation that had done evil in God's eyes had died out. Now you are trying to take your fathers' places as a band of sinners and bring yet more of God's wrath against Israel. A pledge of aid by Reuben and Gad, you will dissuade them from following him and he will once again leave us in the desert and you will have destroyed this nation completely. The Reubenites and Gadites approached Moses and said we will build enclosures for our sheep here and cities for our children but we will then arm ourselves and go as an advance guard before the other Israelites fighting until we have brought them to their homeland because of the
Before God and Israel this land will then be yours as your permanent property before God but if you do not do that you will have sinned to God and you must realize that your sin will be your undoing now build yourself cities for your children and folds for your sheep, but keep your promise. The descendants of Gad and Reuben said to Moses we will do as you have ordered our children wives property and livestock will remain here in the cities of Gilead meanwhile all our special forces shall cross over for battle before God as you have said Moses then gave instructions to Eleazar the priest Joshua son of Nun and the paternal heads of the Israelite tribes Moses said to them if the entire special force of the Gadites and Reubenites crosses the Jordan to fight with you then. When the land is conquered you shall give them the Gilead area as their permanent property but if they do not go as a special force before you then they shall have their property alongside you in the land of Canaan the descendants of Gad and Reuben responded we will do whatever God has told us we will cross over as a special force to the land of Canaan and we shall then have our permanent hereditary property on the side of the Jordan to the descendants of Gad and Reuben and to half the tribe of Manasseh son of Joseph Moses then gave the kingdom of Sikhon king of the Amorites and the kingdom of Og king of the Bashan he gave them the land along with the cities along its surrounding borders the descendants of Gad built up the Von Adaroth Arrow Atroth Shotham Yazer Yagdi Habet Nimr and Bet Haran these were built into fortress cities and enclosures for flocks the descendants of Reuben built up Cheshbon Elikir Yahim Nebo Baalmian these names had been changed, and Sibba they gave these cities the names that they had when they were built the sons of Machir, son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and captured it, expelling the Amorites who were there. Moses gave the Gilead to Machir, son of Manasseh, and he lived there. Yair, grandson of Manasseh, went and conquered the villages in this district, and he named them Yair's villages, Chavoth Yair, Nabok went and captured Kanat and its surrounding towns, and he gave the area his own. Name Nabok journeys, the exodus to Aaron's death, these are the journeys of the Israelites who had left Egypt in organized groups under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded their stops along the way at God's command, these were their stops along the way. The Israelites left Arameses on the 15th of the first month on the day after the Passover sacrifice, the Israelites left triumphantly before the eyes of the Egyptians. Egypt was still burying all their firstborn who had been killed by God and God had destroyed their idols. The Israelites left Arameses and camped in Sukkot. They left Sukkot and camped in Edom at the edge of the desert. They left Edom and returned to Freedom Valley facing north of the north, camping near Tower. They left Freedom Valley and crossed the Red Sea toward the desert. They then traveled for three days in the Edom desert and camped in Merah. They left Merah and came to Elim and Elim. There were twelve water springs and seventy palms and they camped there. They left Elim and camped near the Red Sea. They left the Red Sea and camped in the Sin Desert. They left the Sin Desert and camped in Dafka. They left Dafka and camped in Alish. They left Alish and camped in Revidim where there was no water for the people to drink. They left Revidim and camped in the Sinai Desert. They left the Sinai Desert and camped in Graves of Craving. They left Graves of Craving and camped in Chatzareth. They left Chatzareth and Camped in Ritma, they left Ritma and camped in Rimen Parrots, they left Rimen Parrots and camped in Libna, they left Libna and camped in Risa, they left Risa and camped in Kailata, they left Kailata and camped at Mount Chipper, they left Mount Chipper and camped in Charita, they left Charita and camped in Makhelet, they left Makhelet and camped in Takate, they left Takate and camped in Terak, they left Terak and camped in Mitka, they left Mitka and camped in Chashmana, they left Chashmana and camped in Mosroth, they left Mosroth and camped in Bainu Yaikin, they left Bainu Yaikin and camped in Chahajid, they left Chahajid and camped in Yabata, they left Yabata and camped in Abrona, they left Abrona and camped in Etzianabur, they left Etzianabur and camped in Kadesh in the Tsin Desert, they left Kadesh and camped at Hor Mountain at the edge of the land of Edom, Aaron the priest climbed Hor Mountain at God's command and he died there on the first day of the fifth month in the fortieth year of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt when he died on Hor Mountain, Aaron was one hundred and twenty-three years old. Final journeys, the Canaanite king of Arad who lived in the Negev in the land of Canaan heard that the Israelites had arrived, they left Hor Mountain and camped in Zalmanah, they left Zalmanah and camped in Punan, they left Punan and camped in Obat, they left Obat and camped in the desolate passes on Moab's borders. They left the passes and camped in Devon Gad. They left Devon Gad and camped in Almon Diblatim. They left Almon Diblatim and camped in the Avarim Mountains in front of Nebo. They left the Avarim Mountains and camped in the west plains of Moab on the Jericho Jordan. There they camped along the Jordan from Beth Hayashimo to Abel Shittim on the west plains of Moab, occupying the land. God spoke to Moses in the west plains of Moab on the Jericho Jordan, telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, you must drive out the land's inhabitants ahead of you. You must destroy all their carved stones and demolish all their cast metal idols and high altars. Clear out the land and live in it, since it is to you that I am giving the land to occupy. It is by a lottery system that you shall distribute the land to your families. To a large family, give a large portion to a smaller one. Give a smaller portion. Distribute it. Land to the paternal tribes and each one shall have what the lottery system dictates. If you do not drive out the land's inhabitants before you, those who remain shall be barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, causing you troubles in the land that you settle. I will then do to you what I originally planned to do to them. The land's boundaries. God spoke to Moses, telling him to give the Israelites instructions and say to them, When you come to the land of Canaan, this is the land within. The borders of the land of Canaan that shall be your hereditary territory. Your southern sector shall begin in the Tsin Desert alongside Edom. The southern border to the east shall be the edge of the Dead Sea. The border shall then turn to pass to the south of the Akrabim Steps. It shall then pass toward Tsin with its southernmost point at Kadesh Barnea and then extend to Chat Saradar and reach as far as its from its The border shall turn north and follow the Egyptian Wadi, which shall be its far boundary to the west. The western boundary shall be the Mediterranean Sea and its shores. This shall be your western border. This shall be your northern boundary from the Mediterranean Sea. Draw a line to Hor Mountain from Hor Mountain. Draw a line along the Kamath Highway so that the extreme edge of the boundary is towards Sedad. The border shall then extend through Zifran with its extreme end at Chat Saradar. This shall be your northern border for your eastern boundary. You shall draw a line from Chatsari to Shafam. The boundary shall then run southward from Shafam to Ribla to the east of Ayin. Continuing to the south, the boundary shall run along the eastern shore of the Kinnereth Sea. The boundary shall then continue south along the Jordan, continuing until the Dead Sea. All these shall be your boundaries on all sides. Moses gave the Israelites the following instructions. This is the land that God commanded you to give to nine tribes and a half tribe, and which you must distribute as hereditary property through a lottery system. However, the tribe of the Rubenite descendants, the Gadite descendants, and half the tribe of Manasseh have already taken their hereditary property. These two and a half tribes have already taken their hereditary property across the Jordan from Jericho to the east. New leadership. God spoke to Moses, saying, These are the names of the men who shall parcel out the land. First, there shall be Eleazar the priest and Joshua son of Nun, you shall also appoint one leader from each tribe to help parcel out the land. These are the names of the men. For the tribe of Judah, Caleb son of Yephunah, for the tribe of Simeon's descendants, Shemuel son of Amihud, for the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad son of Kislev, for the tribe of Dan's descendants, the leader is Bukai son of Yigli, among Joseph's sons, for the tribe of Manasseh's descendants, the leader is Chaniel son of Ephod, for the tribe of Ephraim's descendants, the leader is Kemuel son of Shiphtan, for the tribe of Zebulun's descendants, the leader is Elitzaphan son of Parnak, for the tribe of Issachar's descendants, the leader is Paltiel son of Azan, for the tribe of Asher's descendants, the leader is Akahad son of Shalomi, for the tribe of Naphtali's descendants, the leader is Pedel son of Amihud. These are the men whom God commanded to distribute to the Israelites their hereditary property in the land of Canaan, Levitical cities. God spoke to. Moses in the west plains of Moab on the Jericho Jordan
kills a person shall be able to escape there of course if one strikes his victim purposely with an iron weapon killing him and he is a murderer and he must be put to death for murder similarly if he strikes with a handheld stone that can be a deadly weapon and the victim dies he is a murderer and must be put to death for murder likewise if he strikes with a deadly wooden hand weapon and the victim dies he is a murderer and must be put to death for murder in such cases after the trial the blood avenger shall kill the murderer and he can kill him wherever he finds him the same law applies if the killer pushes down his victim or throws something down on him with hatred causing the victim to die this is also true if he maliciously strikes him with his hand causing the victim to die the person dealing the blow is a murderer and he must be put to death once he has been tried the blood avenger shall kill him wherever he finds him this is not true However, if the killer pushes down his victim accidentally and without malice or throws any object at him without planning to kill him, even if it is a stone that can kill if he did not see the victim and it killed him by falling on him, he is not a murderer since he was not an enemy and did not bear his victim any malice. In such cases, the court shall follow these laws and judge between the killer and the blood avenger. The court shall protect the accidental murderer from the blood avenger and return him to the refuge city to which he fled. The killer must live there until the death of the high priest anointed with the sacred oil. If the killer goes outside the boundaries of the refuge city to which he fled and the blood avenger finds him outside the borders of his refuge city, then if the blood avenger puts the killer to death, it is not an act of murder. The killer is thus obligated to live in his refuge city until the high priest dies after the high priest. Dies the killer may return to his hereditary land. These shall be the rules of law for you for all generations, no matter where you may live. If anyone kills a human being, the murderer shall be put to death on the basis of eyewitness testimony. However, a single eyewitness may not testify against the person where the death penalty is involved. Do not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is under the death penalty, since he must be put to death. Similarly, if one has fled to his refuge city, do not take ransom to allow him to return and live in the land before the high priest dies. Do not pollute the land in which you live. It is blood that pollutes the land. When blood is shed in the land, it cannot be atoned for except through the blood of the person who shed it. You must not defile the land upon which you live and in which I dwell, since I God dwell among the Israelites. Intermarriage between tribes of paternal leaders of the family of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh which was one of the families from Joseph's sons, came forth and spoke before Moses and the leaders who were the paternal heads of the Israelites. They said, God has commanded you to give the land to the Israelites as hereditary property through a lottery system. You have also been commanded by God to give the hereditary property of Tilakad, our brother, to his daughters. But if they marry a member of another Israelite tribe, then the hereditary property coming to us from our fathers will be diminished since it will be added to the tribe into which they marry our hereditary property from the lottery system will thus be diminished even if the Israelites have the jubilee their hereditary property will be added to the property of the tribe into which they marry and it will be subtracted from the property of our father's tribe Moses gave the Israelites instructions at God's command saying the tribe of Joseph's descendants have just claimed this is the word that God has commanded regarding Tilakad's daughters you may marry anyone you wish as long as you marry within your father's tribe the hereditary property of the Israelites will thus not be transferred from one tribe to another and each person among the Israelites will remain attached to the hereditary property of his father's tribe thus every girl who inherits property among the Israelite tribes shall marry a member of her father's tribe each Israelite will then inherit his father's hereditary Property and the hereditary property will not be transferred from one tribe to another. Each of the Israelite tribes will then remain attached to its hereditary property. Tzilakad's daughters did exactly as God had commanded Moses. Machla, Tertz, Shiklamilka, and Noah, the daughters of Tzilakad, married their cousins. They thus married into the families of Manasseh, son of Joseph, and their hereditary property remained with their father's family. These are the commandments and laws that God instructed the Israelites through Moses in the west plains of Moab on the Jericho Jordan. Introduction These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel on the east bank of the Jordan in the desert and in the Arabah near Suth in the vicinity of Paran Tophel, Levin, Chatzarat, and Dizahab. This is in the area which is an 11 day journey from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by way of the Seir Highlands on the first of the 11th month in the 40th year. Moses also spoke to the Israelites regarding all that God had commanded him for them. This was after he had defeated Sikon, king of the Amorites, who lived in Cheshman, and Og, king of the Bashan, who lived in Ashtarod, who was defeated in Edrei. Moses began to explain this law on the east bank of the Jordan in the land of Moab, saying, God our Lord spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have remained near this mountain too long. Turn around and head toward the Amorite Highlands and all its neighboring territories in the Arabah, the hill country, the lowlands, the Negev, the seashore, the Canaanite territory, and Lebanon as far as the Euphrates River Sea. I have placed the land before you. Come occupy the land that God swore he would give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. I then said to you, I cannot lead you all by myself. God, your Lord, has increased your numbers until you are now as many as the stars of the sky. May God, Lord of your fathers, increase your numbers a thousandfold and bless you as he promised. But how can I bear the burden, responsibility, and conflict that you present if I am all by myself? Designate for yourselves men who are wise, understanding, and known to your tribes, and I will appoint them as your leaders. You answered me. Yours is a good suggestion. I selected wise and well-known men from among your tribal leaders and appointed them as your leaders, captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, captains of fifties, captains of tens, and police for your tribes. I then gave your judges instructions, saying, Listen to every dispute among your brethren and judge honestly. Between each man and his brother, even where a proselyte is concerned, do not give anyone special consideration when rendering judgment. Listen to the great and small alike, and do not be impressed by any man since judgment belongs to God. If any case is too difficult, bring it to me, and I will hear it. At that time, I gave you instructions regarding everything that you must do. We then moved on from Horeb and traveled all through that great terrifying desert that you have seen going by way of the Amorite Highlands, as God our Lord commanded us. We finally came to Kadesh Barnea. I said to you, You have come to the Amorite Highlands, which God our Lord is giving us. See. God has placed the land before you head north and occupy it as God Lord of your fathers has told you do not be afraid and do not be concerned all of you then approached me and said send men ahead of us to explore the land let them bring back a report about the way ahead of us and the cities that we shall encounter I approved and appointed twelve men one for each tribe they set out and headed north toward the hill country going as far as Cluster Valley and exploring the territory they took samples of the area's fruit and brought it back to us the report that they brought back was the land that God our Lord is giving us is good you did not want to head north however and you rebelled against God your Lord you protested in your tents and said God brought us out of Egypt because he hated us he wanted to turn us over to the Amorites to destroy us where are we heading our brothers took away our courage by telling us that they saw their race that was larger and taller than we with great cities fortified to the skies as well as children of the giants I said to you don't be so impressed. Don't be afraid of them. God your Lord is going before you he will fight for you just as you watched him do in Egypt in the desert you also saw that God your Lord carried you along the road you traveled to this place just as a man carries his son but now here you have no faith in God your Lord. He goes before you in fire by night and in cloud by day to show you the path to follow just like a scout finding you a place to camp. When God heard what you said he angrily swore no man of this evil generation will see the good land that I swore to give your fathers the only exception will be Caleb son of Yephunneh since he followed God wholeheartedly not only will he see it but I will give him and his descendants the land he walked God also displayed anger at me because of you and he said you too will not enter the land Joshua son of Nun who stands before you will be the one to enter and he will give Israel their hereditary property the ones to enter the land will be the children whom you feared would be taken captive and your little ones who even now do not know good from bad to them I will give the land and they will occupy it you must now turn around and head into the desert toward the southern sea your answer to me was we have sinned to God we will head north and fight just as God our Lord commanded us each of you took his weapons and you made every effort to head north to the highlands God said to me tell them not to go
head north give the people the following instructions you are passing by the borders of your brothers the descendants of esau who live in seir although they fear you be very careful not to provoke them i will not give you even one foot of their land since i have given mount seir as esau's inheritance you may purchase from them with money food to eat and drinking water god your lord is blessing you in everything you do he knows your way in this great desert and for these forty years god your lord has been with you so that you lack nothing encountering moab we passed by our brothers the descendants of esau who lived in seir and headed through the arabah from elat and etzian we turned around and passed through the moab desert god said to me do not attack moab and do not provoke them to fight i will not give you their land as an inheritance since i have already given ar to lot's descendants as their heritage the emma lived there originally a powerful end Numerous race as tall as giants as giants they might be considered refame but the Moabites called them Ammon was like Seir where the Horites lived originally but were driven out by Esau's descendants who annihilated them and lived there in their place this is also what Israel is to do in the hereditary land that God gave them now get moving and cross the Zeer Brook. We thus crossed the Zeer Brook from the time that we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Zeer Brook 38 years had elapsed during which the generation of warriors had died out from the camp as God had sworn God's hand had been directed specifically against them crushing them so that they would be finished it was at this time that all the men of war among the people finished dying encountering Ammon God then spoke to me saying you are now about to pass through Ar which is Moabite territory you will be coming close to the Ammonites but do not attack or provoke them I will not let you occupy the land of the Ammonites since I have given it as a heritage to the descendants of Lot this might also be considered the territory of the Rephaim since the Rephaim lived there originally the Ammonites refer to them as Zamzamim the Rephaim were a powerful and numerous race as tall as the giants but God annihilated them before the Ammonites and drove them out and lived there in their place this was the same as God had done for Esau's descendants who lived in Seir when he annihilated the Horites before them allowing Esau's descendants to drive them out and live in their place to this very day this was also true of the Abba who lived from Chatzarim to Gaza the Kaptarim came from Kaptar and defeated them occupying their territories now set out and cross the Arnon Brooksy. I have given over Sikon the Amorite king of Chespon and his land into your hands begin the occupation. Provoke them into war. Today I am beginning to make all the nations under the heavens fear and dread you whoever hears of your reputation will tremble and be anxious because of you I sent emissaries from the Kadim off desert to Sikon king of Cheshbon with a peaceful message saying we wish to pass through your land we will travel along the main highway not turning to the right or the left we will buy the food we eat for cash and will pay for the drinking water you give us we only wish to pass through on foot. Just as we pass by the territory of Esau and Seir and Moab and Ar we only wish to cross the Jordan to the land that God our Lord is giving us but Sikon king of Cheshbon would not let us pass through his land God had hardened his spirit and made his heart firm so that he could give his land over to our hands as it is today last episodes in the desert God said to me see. I have begun to place Sikon and his land before you begin the occupation and take possession of his land Sikon and all his troops came out to meet us in battle at Yahitz God our Lord gave him over to us so that we killed him along with his sons and all his troops we then captured all his cities and we annihilated every city including the men women and children not leaving any survivors all that we took as our plunder were the animals and the goods of the cities we captured thus in the entire territory from Arrow on the edge of the Arnon Gorge and the city in the valley itself to the Gilead there was no city that could defend itself against us since God had placed everything at our disposal the only land that we did not approach was the Ammonite territory which included the area around the Jabbok the cities of the highlands and all the other areas that God our Lord had commanded us to avoid last episodes in the desert we then turned and traveled along the road to the Bashan where Og and his troops came to confront us in battle at Edra I God said to me do not be afraid of him since I have turned him over to you along with all his people and his land you will do the same to him as you did to the Amorite king Sikon who lived in Cheshbon God thus also turned Og king of the Bashan and all his people over to us and we defeated him not leaving any survivors we then captured all his cities not leaving a single city that we did not take from his people these included the entire Argo group of 60 cities that constituted Og's kingdom in the Bashan they were all cities fortified with high walls gates and bars and there were also very many open towns we destroyed these cities just as we had done to those of Sikon king of Cheshbon annihilating every man woman and child for ourselves we took as plunder all the animals and all the spoils of the cities at that time we thus took the lands of the two Amorite kings who lived to the East of the Jordan in the area between the Arnon Brook and Mount Hermon, the people of Sidon refer to Hermon as Syrian while the Amorites call it Sidir. The occupied territory included all the cities of the Flatlands, the entire Gilead, and the entire Bashan as far as Saka and Edrai, the cities of Oji's kingdom in the Bashan of all the Rephaim. Only Og had survived his bed was made of iron, it is in the Ammonite city of Rabbanite, standard cubits long and four cubits wide of the land. That we then captured, I gave the Rubenites and Gadites the territory between Arrow on the Arnon Gorge and the southern half of the Gilead Highlands along with the cities there, the rest of the Gilead and the entire Bashan which had been Oji's kingdom. I gave to half of the tribe of Manasseh, this included the entire Argo group and the entire Bashan which was known as the land of the Rephaim. Yadir, a descendant of Manasseh, took the Argo group as far as the borders of the Gishirites and Machatites and he gave that area in the Bashan the name Chabot Yadir, a name which is still used today to Machir. I gave the Gilead region to the Rubenites and Gadites. I gave the territory between the Gilead and the Arnon Gorge, including the interior of the gorge and its boundary. The territory extended as far as the gorge of the Jabot, the border of the Ammonites. It also included the Arab of the Jordan and its boundary from the Kinneret as far as the Arab Sea, which is the portion of the Dead Sea under the rapids on the cliff to the east. At that time, I gave you instruction, saying, God, your Lord has given you this land as a heritage. Let every able-bodied man among you go forth ahead of your fellow Israelites as a special force. I know that you have much livestock. Your wives, children, and livestock can remain in the cities I have given you until God gives your brethren the same haven that He has given you when they occupy the land that God, your Lord, is giving. Them across the Jordan each man will be able to return to his inheritance that I have given you at that time I gave instructions to Joshua saying your own eyes have seen all that God your Lord has done to these two kings God will do the same to all the kingdoms in the land to which you will be crossing do not fear them since God your Lord is the one who will be fighting for you Moses plead to enter the holy land at that time I pleaded with God saying O God Lord you have begun to show me your greatness and your display of power what forces there in heaven or earth who can perform deeds and mighty acts as you do please let me cross the Jordan let me see the good land across the Jordan the good mountain and the Lebanon but God had turned himself against me because of you and he would not listen to me God said to me enough do not speak to me anymore about this Climb to the top of the cliff and gaze to the west, north, south, and east. Let your eyes feast on it, since you will not cross the Jordan. Give Joshua instructions, strengthening him and giving him courage, since he will be the one to lead these people across, and he will parcel out to them the land that you will see. At that time, we were staying in the valley facing Beth Peer, foundations of the faith. Now, Israel, listen to the rules and laws that I am teaching you to do, so that you will remain alive and come to occupy the land that God, Lord of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to the word that I am commanding you, and do not subtract from it. You must keep all the commandments of God, your Lord, which I am instructing you. You have seen with your own eyes what God did at the Baal Peer episode. God, your Lord, annihilated every person among you who followed Baal Peer. Only you, the ones who remain attached to God, your Lord, are all alive today. See. I have taught you rules and laws as God my Lord has commanded me so that you will be able to keep them in the land to which you are coming and which you will be occupying safeguard and keep these rules since this is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the nations they will hear all these rules and say this great nation is certainly a wise and understanding people what nation is so great that they have God close to it as God our Lord is whenever we call him. What nation is so great that they have such righteous rules and laws like this entire Torah that I am presenting before you today. Only take heed and watch your
Bodies do not bow down to them or worship them. It was to all the other nations under the heavens that God made them a portion, but you God himself took and he brought you out of the iron crucible that was Egypt so that you would be his heritage nation as you are today. God displayed anger at me because of your words and he swore that I would not cross the Jordan and that I would not come to the good land that God your Lord is giving you as a heritage. I will die in this land and will not cross the Jordan while you will be the ones to cross and occupy the good land. Be careful that you not forget the covenant that God your Lord made with you. Do not make for yourself any statue image that is forbidden by God. God your Lord is like a consuming fire, a God demanding exclusive allegiance, allegiance to God when you have children and grandchildren and have been established in the land for a long time, you might become decadent and make a statue of some image committing an evil. Act in the eyes of God your Lord and making him angry I call heaven and earth as witnesses for you today that you will then quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to occupy you will not remain there very long since you will be utterly destroyed God will then scatter you among the nations and only a small number will remain among the nations to which God will lead you there you will serve gods that men have made out of wood and stone which cannot see hear, eat, or smell then you will begin to seek God your Lord and if you pursue him with all your heart and soul you will eventually find him when you are in distress and all these things have happened to you you will finally return to God your Lord and obey him God your Lord is a merciful power and he will not abandon you or destroy you he will not forget the oath he made upholding your father's covenant you might inquire about times long past going back to the time that God created man on earth exploring one end of the heavens to the other see if anything as great as this has ever happened or if the like has ever been heard has any nation ever heard God speaking out of fire as you have and still survive has God ever done miracles bringing one nation out of another nation with such tremendous miracles signs wonders wore a mighty hand and outstretched arm and terrifying phenomena as God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes you are the ones who have been shown so that you will know that God is the supreme being and there is none besides him from the heavens he let you hear his voice admonishing you and on earth he showed you his great fire so that you heard his words from the fire it was because he loved your fathers and chose their children after them that God himself brought you out of Egypt with his great power he will drive away before you nations that are greater and stronger than you so as to bring you to their lands and give them to you as a heritage as he is doing today realize it today and ponder it in your heart God is the supreme being in heaven above and on the earth beneath there is no other keep his decrees and commandments that I am presenting to you today so that he will be good to you and your children after you then you will endure for a long time in the land that God your Lord is giving you for all time refuge cities Moses then designated three cities on the east of the Jordan toward the rising sun where a murderer could escape if a person killed his neighbor without intent and without prior enmity he would be able to escape to one of these cities and live the cities were better in the desert flatlands for the Reubenites Ramoth in the Gilead for the Gadites and Golan invasion for the Monocytes this is a law that Moses presented before the Israelites these are the rituals rules and laws that Moses discussed with the Israelites when they left Egypt they were now on the east bank of the Jordan in the valley opposite Beth Pier in the land of Sikon king of Cheshbon whom Moses and the Israelites had defeated when they left Egypt the Israelites occupied Sikon's land as well as the land of Ak king of Bashan these were the two Amorite kings to the east of the Jordan the land extended from Aral on the edge of the, of the Arnon gorge to Mount Zion also known as Hermon as well as the entire floodplain on the east bank of the Jordan as far as the Arabah Sea under the rapids flowing from the cliff review of the Ten Commandments Moses summoned all Israel and said to them listen Israel to the rules and laws that I am publicly declaring to you today learn them and safeguard them so that you will be able to keep them God your Lord made a covenant with you at Horeb it was not with your ancestors that God made this covenant but with us those of us who are still alive here today on the mountain God spoke to you face to face out of the fire I stood between you and God at that time to tell you God's word since you were afraid of the fire and did not go up on the mountain God then declared the Ten Commandments the first two commandments I am God your Lord who brought you out of Egypt from the place of slavery do not have any other gods before me do not represent such gods by a statue or picture of anything in the heaven above on the earth below or in the water below the land do not bow down to such gods and do not worship them. My God, your Lord, am a God who demands exclusive worship where my enemies are concerned. I keep in mind the sin of the fathers for their descendants for three and four generations. But to those who love me and keep my commandments, I shall love for thousands of generations. The third commandment, do not take the name of God, your Lord, in vain. God will not allow the person who takes his name in vain to go unpunished. The fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath to keep it holy as God, your Lord, commanded you. You can work during the six weekdays and do all your tasks. But Saturday is the Sabbath to God, your Lord. So do not do anything that constitutes work. This includes you, your son, your daughter, your male and female slave, your ox, your donkey, your other animals, and the foreigner who is in your gates. Your male and female slaves will then be able to rest just as you do. You must remember that you were slaves in Egypt when God. Your Lord brought you out with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. It is for this reason that God your Lord has commanded you to keep the Sabbath. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother as God your Lord commanded you. You will then live long and have it well on the land that God your Lord is giving you. The sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth commandments, do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify as a perjurous witness against your neighbor. The tenth commandment, do not desire your neighbor's wife, do not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male or female slave, his ox, his donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. After the revelation, God spoke these words in a loud voice to your entire assembly from the mountain out of the fire cloud and mist, but he added no more. He wrote these words on two stone tablets and later gave them to me when you heard the voice out of the darkness with the mountain burning in flames. Your tribal leaders and elders approached me. You said it is true that God our Lord has showed us his glory and greatness and we have heard his voice out of the fire today. We have seen that when God speaks to man he can still survive but now why should we die? Why should this great fire consume us? If we hear the voice of God our Lord anymore we will die. What mortal has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of fire as we did and has survived? You approach God our Lord and listen to all he says you can transmit to us whatever God our Lord tells you and when we hear it we will do it. God heard what you said and God told me I have heard what this nation has said to you. They have spoken well if only their hearts would always remain this way where they are in such awe of me they would then keep all my commandments for all time so that it would go well with them and their children forever go tell them to return to their tents. You however must remain here with me I will declare to you all the rules and laws that you shall teach them so they will keep them in the land that I am giving them to occupy be careful to do what God your Lord has commanded you not turning to the right or left follow the entire way that God your Lord has commanded you so that you may live and do well enduring for a long time on the land that you are going to occupy after the revelation this is the mandate the rules and the laws that God your Lord commanded me to teach you so that you shall keep them in the land you are crossing over to occupy remain in awe of God your Lord so that you will keep all his rules and laws that I am prescribing to you your children and your children's children must keep them as long as they live so that you will long endure listen Israel and be careful to do it things will then go well for you and you will increase very much in the land flowing with milk and honey just as God Lord of your fathers promised you shma, the creed listen Israel God is our Lord God is one love God your Lord with all your heart with all your soul and with all your might these words which I am commanding you today must remain on your heart teach them to your children and speak of them when you are at home when traveling on the road when you lie down and when you get up find these words as a sign on your hand and let them be an emblem in the center of your head also write them on parchments affixed to the doorposts of your houses and gates dangers of prosperity when God your Lord brings you to the land that he swore to your fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob that he would give to you you will find great flourishing cities that you did not build you will also have houses filled with all good things that you did not put there finished cisterns that you did not quarry and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant you will eat and be satisfied but be careful that you do not forget God who is the one who brought you out of Egypt the place of slavery remain in awe of God serve him and swear by his name do not follow other deities such as the gods of the nations around
Keep this entire mandate before God our Lord as he commanded us warnings against assimilation when God your Lord brings you to the land you are entering so that you can occupy it he will uproot many nations before you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Yebusites, seven nations more numerous and powerful than you are when God your Lord places them at your disposal and you defeat them you must utterly destroy them not making any treaty with them or giving. The many consideration do not intermarry with them do not give your daughters to their sons and do not take their daughters for your sons if you do they will lead your children away from me causing them to worship other gods God will then display his anger against you and you will quickly be destroyed what you must do to them is tear down their altars break their sacred pillars cut down their asherah trees and burn their idols in fire you are a nation consecrated to God your Lord God. Your Lord chose you to be a special people among all the nations on the face of the earth it was not because you had greater numbers than all the other nations that God embraced you and chose you you are among the smallest of all the nations it was because of God's love for you and because he was keeping the oath that he made to your fathers God therefore brought you out with a mighty hand liberating you from the slave house and from the power of Pharaoh king of Egypt you must realize that God your Lord is the supreme being he is a faithful God who keeps in mind his covenant and love for a thousand generations when it comes to those who love him and keep his commandments but he pays back his enemies to their face to destroy them he does not delay the payment that he gives his enemies to their face so safeguard the mandate the rules and laws that I am teaching you today so that you will keep the rewards for obedience if only you listen to these laws safeguarding and keeping them and God your Lord will keep the covenant and love with which he made an oath to your fathers he will love you bless you and make you numerous he will bless the fruit of your womb the fruit of your land your grain your wine your oil the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks in the land that he promised your fathers that he would give to you you will be blessed above all nations among you and your livestock there will not be any sterile or barren God will take all sickness from you he will not allow any of the terrible Egyptian afflictions that you experience to affect you instead he will direct them against all your enemies when you consume all the nations that God your Lord is giving you do not show them any pity do not worship their gods since this will be a deadly trap for you confidence you might say to yourself these nations are more numerous than we are how will we be able to drive them out do not be afraid of them you must remember what God did to Pharaoh and all the rest of Egypt recall the great miracles that you saw with your own eyes, the signs the wonders the mighty hand and the outstretched arm with which God your Lord brought you out of Egypt God will do the same to all the nations whom you fear God your Lord will also send deadly hornets to attack them so that the survivors hiding from you will also be destroyed do not cringe before these nations God your Lord is with you, a great and awesome God God will uproot these nations before you little by little you will not be allowed to finish them off too quickly so that the wild animals not overwhelm you God will place these nations in your power he will throw them into utter panic until they are destroyed he will place their kings in your power and you will obliterate their names from under the heavens no man will stand up before you until you destroy them you must burn their idolatries. Statues in fire do not desire the gold and silver on these statues and take it for yourselves let it not bring you into a deadly trap since it is something offensive to God your Lord do not bring any offensive idol into your house since you may become just like it shut it totally and consider it absolutely offensive since it is taboo dangers of overconfidence you must safeguard and keep the entire mandate that I am prescribing to you today you will then survive flourish and come to Occupy the land that God swore to your fathers remember the entire path along which God your Lord led you these forty years in the desert he sent hardships to test you to determine what is in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not he made life difficult for you letting you go hungry and then he fed you the manna which neither you nor your ancestors had ever experienced this was to teach you that it is not by bread alone that man lives but by all that comes out of God's mouth the clothing you wore did not become tattered and your feet did not become bruised these forty years you must thus meditate on the fact that just as a man might chastise his child so God your Lord is chastising you safeguard the commandments of God your Lord so that you will walk in his ways and remain in awe of him God your Lord is bringing you to a good land a land with flowing streams and underground springs gushing out in valley and mountain it is a land of wheat barley Grapes, figs, and pomegranates, a land of oil, olives, and honey dash dates. It is a land where you will not eat rationed bread and you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and from whose mountains you will quarry copper when you eat and are satisfied. You must therefore bless God your Lord for the good land that He has given you. Be careful that you not forget God your Lord, not keeping His commandments, decrees, and laws which I am prescribing to you today. You may then eat and be satisfied building fine houses and living in them. Your herds and flocks may increase and you may amass much silver and gold. Everything you own may increase, but your heart may then grow haughty and you may forget God your Lord, the one who brought you out of the slave house that was Egypt. It was He who led you through the great terrifying desert where there were snakes, vipers, scorpions, and thirst. When there was no water, it was He who provided you water from a solid cliff in the desert. He fed you manna which was something that your ancestors never knew he may have been sending hardships to test you but it was so he would eventually do all the more good for you when you later have prosperity be careful that you not say to yourself it was my own strength and personal power that brought me all this prosperity you must remember that it is God your Lord who gives you the power to become prosperous he does this so as to keep the covenant that he made with an oath to your fathers even as he is keeping it today warnings against idolatry if you ever forget God your Lord and follow other gods worshipping them and bowing to them I bear witness to you today that you will be totally annihilated you will be destroyed just like the nations that God is destroying before you that will be the result if you do not obey God your Lord warnings against self-righteousness listen Israel today you are preparing to cross the Jordan when you arrive you will drive out nations greater and more powerful than you with great cities fortified to the skies they are a great nation as tall as giants you know that you have heard the expression who can stand up before a giant but you must realize today that God your Lord is the one who shall cross before you he is like a consuming fire and he will subjugate these nations before you rapidly driving them out and annihilating them as God promised you when God repulses them before you do not say to yourselves it was because of my virtue that God brought me to occupy this land it was because of the wickedness of these nations that God is driving them out before you it was not because of your virtue and basic integrity that you are coming to occupy their land but because of the wickedness of these nations whom God is driving out before you it is also because God is keeping the word that he swore to your ancestors Abraham Isaac and Jacob therefore realize that it is not because of your virtue that God your Lord is giving you this land to occupy since you are a very stubborn nation remember and never forget how you provoked God your Lord in the desert from the day you left Egypt until you came here you have been rebelling against God even at Horeb you provoked God and God was ready to display anger and destroy you I had climbed the mountain to get the stone tablets tablets of the covenant that God had made with you I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights without eating food or drinking water God gave me the two stone tablets written with God's finger upon them were written all the words that God declared to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of assembly at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights God gave me the two stone tablets as tablets of the covenant but God then said to me get moving and hurry down from here the nation that you brought out of Egypt has become corrupt they have been quick to turn aside from the path that I prescribed for them and they have made themselves a cast statue God then said to me I see that this is a very stubborn nation just leave me alone and I will destroy them obliterating their name from under the heavens I will then make you into a nation greater and more numerous than they I turned around and went down from the mountain the mountain was still burning with Fire and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands I immediately saw that you had sent to God your Lord making a cast calf you were so quick to turn from the path that God your Lord had prescribed. I grasped the two tablets and threw them down from my two hands breaking them before your eyes I then threw myself down before God and just as during the first forty days and forty nights I did not eat any food or drink water I dreaded the anger and rage that God was directing at you which had threatened to destroy you but God also listened to me this time God also expressed great anger toward Aaron threatening to destroy him so at that time I also prayed for Aaron I took the calf it. Simple thing that you had made and I burned it in fire I then pulverized it grinding it well
the second tablets at that time God said to me carve out two stone tablets like the first ones and come up to me on the mountain make yourself a wooden ark I will write on the tablets the words which were on the first tablets that you broke and you shall place them in the ark I made an ark out of acacia wood and carved out two tablets like the first I then climbed the mountain with the two tablets in my hand God wrote on the tablets the original script of the ten commandments which he declared to you from the mountain out of the fire on the day of assembly God gave them to me and I turned around and went down from the mountain I placed the tablets in the ark I made and they remained there as God had commanded later after the Israelites had left the wells of Bani and Moserah and died and was buried there so that Eliezer his son became priest in his stead from those areas they had traveled to Gajoda and from Gajoda to Yibat an area flowing Brooks after I came down from the mountain God designated the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of God's covenant to stand before God and serve him and to offer blessing in his name it is for this reason that Levi was not given any portion or inheritance along with his brethren God is his heritage as God promised him I had thus remained on the mountain forty days and forty nights just like the first time and God listened to me this time as well agreeing not to destroy you God then said to me get moving and resume the march at the head of the people let them come and occupy the land that I swore to their fathers that I would give to them following God's way and now Israel what does God want of you? Only that you remain in awe of God your Lord so that you will follow all his paths and love him serving God your Lord with all your heart and with all your soul you must keep God's commandments and decrees that I am prescribing for you today so that good will be yours the heaven the heaven of heaven the earth and everything in it all belong to God. Still it was only with your ancestors that God developed a closeness he loved them and therefore chose you their descendants from among all nations just as the situation is today remove the barriers from your heart and do not remain so stubborn anymore. God your Lord is the ultimate supreme being and the highest possible authority he is the great mighty and awesome God who does not give special consideration or take bribes he brings justice to the orphan and widow and loves the foreigner granting him food and clothing you must also show love toward the foreigner since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt remain in awe of God serve him cling to him and swear by his name he is your praise and your God the one who did for you these great and awesome deeds that you saw with your very eyes your ancestors emigrated to Egypt with only 70 individuals but now God your Lord has made you as numerous as the stars of the sky following God's way so love God your Lord and safeguard his trust his decrees laws and commandments for all time you must now realize that I am not speaking of your children who did not know and did not see the lesson that God your Lord taught through his greatness his mighty hand and his outstretched arm there were the signs and deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt and all his land there was what he did in Egypt's horses to their horses and chariots when he swamped them with the water of the Red Sea as they were pursuing you God destroyed them so that even now they have not recovered there was what he did in the desert until you came to this area there was what he did to David and Abiram the sons of Reuben son of went in the midst of all Israel the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them along with their houses, their tents, and all the living things that were with them. Thus, your own eyes have seen all the great deeds that God has done. Safeguard the entire mandate that I am prescribing to you today so that you will be strong and come to occupy the land which you are crossing to occupy. You will then long endure on the land that God swore to your fathers that He would give to them and their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey, a demanding land. The land which you are about to occupy is not like Egypt, the place you left where you could plant your seed and irrigate it by yourself, just like a vegetable garden. But the land which you are crossing to occupy is a land of mountains and valleys which can be irrigated only by the rain. It is therefore a land constantly under God, your Lord. Scrutiny the eyes of God, your Lord, are on it at all times from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. You could be Commandments if you are careful to pay heed to my commandments which I am prescribing to you today and if you love God your Lord with all your heart and soul and God has made this promise, I will grant the fall and spring rains in your land at their proper time so that you will have an ample harvest of grain oil and wine I will grant forage in your fields for your animals and you will eat and be satisfied be careful that your heart not be tempted to go astray and worship other gods. Bowing down to them God's anger will then be directed against you and he will lock up the sky so that there will not be any rain the land will not give forth its crops and you will rapidly vanish from the good land that God is giving you place these words of mine on your heart and soul bind them as a sign on your arm and let them be an insignia in the center of your head teach your children to speak of them when you are at home when traveling on the road when you lie down and when you Get up also write them on parchments affixed to the doorposts of your houses and gates if you do this you and your children will long endure on the land that God swore to your ancestors promising that he would give it to them as long as the heavens are above the earth promise of victory if you carefully safeguard and keep this entire mandate that I prescribe to you today and if you love God walk in all his ways and cling to him and God will drive out all these nations before you you will expel nations that are greater and stronger than you are every area upon which your feet tread shall belong to you your boundaries shall extend from the desert to the Lebanon from the tributary of the Euphrates river as far as the Mediterranean sea no man will stand up before you God your Lord will place the fear and dread of you upon the entire area you tread just as he promised you the choice between good and evil you can therefore see that I am placing before you both a Blessing and a curse the blessing will come if you obey the commandments of God your Lord which I am prescribing to you today the curse will come if you do not obey the commandments of God your Lord and you go astray from the path that I am prescribing for you today following other gods to have a novel spiritual experience unified worship when God your Lord brings you to the land which you are about to occupy you must declare the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. They are across the Jordan just beyond the sunset highway on the way to Gilgal near the plains of Morah in the territory of the Canaanites who live in the floodplain you must do this because you are crossing the Jordan to come to the land which God your Lord is giving you and occupy it when you have occupied it and you live there you must carefully keep all the rules and laws that I am prescribing to you today unified worship these are the rules and laws that you must carefully keep. In the land that God Lord of your fathers is giving you so that you will be able to occupy it as long as you live on earth, do away with all the places where the nations whom you are driving out worship their gods whether they are on the high mountains on the hills or under any luxuriant tree you must tear down their altars break up their sacred pillars burn their Asherah trees and chop down the statues of their gods obliterating their names from that place you may not worship God your Lord in such a manner this you may do only on the site that God your Lord will choose from among all your tribes as a place established in his name it is there that you shall go to seek his presence that shall be the place to which you must bring your burnt offerings and eaten sacrifices your special tithes your hand delivered elevated gifts your general and specific pledges and the firstborn of your cattle and flocks you and your families shall eat there before God your Lord and you shall rejoice in all your endeavors through which God your Lord shall bless you you will then not be able to do everything that we are now doing where each person does what is right in his eyes now you have not yet come to the resting place and hereditary land that God your Lord is giving you but you shall soon cross the Jordan and live in the land that God your Lord is allotting you when he has granted you safety from all your enemies around you and you live in security there will be a site that God will choose as the place dedicated to his name it is there that you will have to bring all that I am prescribing to you as your burnt offerings eaten sacrifices special tithes hand delivered elevated gifts and the choice general pledges that you may pledge to God you shall rejoice before God your Lord along with your sons your daughters your male and female slaves and the levites from your settlements who have no hereditary portion with you be careful not to offer your Burnt offerings in any place that you may see fit it must be done only in the place that God shall choose in the territory of one of your tribes only there shall you sacrifice burnt offerings and only there shall you prepare all the offerings that I am prescribing to you elsewhere in all your settlements you may only slaughter animals to satisfy your own wants so that you will be able to eat the meat that God gives you as his blessing there the clean and unclean may eat it like the deer and the gazelle the only thing you must not eat is the blood which you must spill on the ground like water however in your own settlements you may not eat the tithes of your grain wine and oil the firstborn of your cattle and flocks any general pledges you make your specific pledges or your hand delivered elevated gifts these you may eat only before God your Lord in the place that God your Lord
The ground like water if you do not eat it you and your descendants will have a good life since you will be doing what is morally right in God's eyes however when you have any sacred offerings and pledges you must take them and bring them to the place that God shall choose then when you prepare your burnt offerings both the flesh and blood shall be placed on the altar of God your Lord in the case of eaten sacrifices the blood shall be poured on the altar of God your Lord and the flesh shall be eaten carefully listen to all these words that I prescribe to you so that you and your descendants will have a good life forever since you will be doing that which is good and morally right in the eyes of God your Lord worshiping God with idolatrous practices when God excises the nations to which you are coming and drives them away before you you shall expel them and live in their land after they have been wiped out before you be very careful not to fall into a deadly trap by trying to follow them do not try to find out about their gods saying now how did these nations worship their gods I would also like to try such practices do not worship God your Lord with such practices in worshiping their gods these nations committed all sorts of perversions hated by God they would even burn their sons and daughters in fire as a means of worshiping their gods Worshiping God with idolatrous practices, it is enough that you carefully observe everything that I am prescribing to you. Do not add to it and do not subtract from it. The idolatrous prophet, this is what you must do when a prophet or a person who has visions in a dream arises among you. He may present you with a sign or miracle, and on the basis of that sign or miracle, say to you, Let us try out a different God, let us serve it and have a new spiritual experience. Do not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. God your Lord is testing you to see if you are truly able to love God your Lord with all your heart and all your soul. Follow God your Lord, remain in awe of him, keep his commandments, obey him, and serve him, and you will then be able to have a true spiritual experience through him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death for having spoken rebelliously against God your Lord, who brought you out of Egypt and liberated you from the place of slavery. He was trying to make you leave the path that God your Lord commanded you to walk in. You must destroy such evil from your midst. Idolatrous missionaries, this is what you must do if your blood brother, your son, your daughter, your bosom wife or your closest friend secretly tries to act as a missionary among you and says let us go worship a new god let us have a spiritual experience previously unknown by you or your fathers he may be enticing you with the gods of the nations around you far or near or those that are found at one end of the world or another do not agree with him and do not listen to him do not let your eyes pity him do not show him any mercy and do not try to cover up for him since you must be the one to put him to death your hand must be the first against him to kill him followed by the hands of the other people pelt him to death with stone since he has tried to make you abandon god your lord who brought you out of the slave house that was egypt when all Israel hears about it, they will be afraid, and they will never again do such an evil thing among you. The apostate city, this is what you must do if, with regard to one of your cities that God your Lord is giving you as a place to live, you hear a report stating that irresponsible men among you have been successful in leading the city's inhabitants astray by saying, Let us worship another God and have a novel spiritual experience. You must investigate and probe, making careful inquiry of it. Is established to be true, and such a revolting thing has occurred in your midst, and you must kill all the inhabitants of the city by the sword, destroy it, and everything in it as taboo, and kill all its animals by the sword, gather all the city's goods to its central square, and burn the city along with all its goods, almost like a sacrifice to God your Lord. The city shall then remain an eternal ruin, never again to be rebuilt. Let nothing that has been declared taboo there remain in. Your hands God will then have mercy on you and reverse any display of anger that might have existed in his mercy he will make you flourish just as he promised your fathers you will have obeyed God your Lord keeping all the commandments that I prescribe to you today and doing what is morally right in the eyes of God your Lord responsibilities of the chosen people you are children of God your Lord do not mutilate yourselves and do not make a bald patch in the middle of your head as a sign of mourning you are a nation consecrated to God your Lord God has chosen you from all nations on the face of the earth to be his own special nation do not eat any abomination forbidden animals these are the mammals that you may eat the ox the sheep the goat the gazelle the deer the antelope the ibex the chamois the bison and the giraffe you may thus eat every animal that has a true hoof that is cloven into two parts and which brings up its cut however among the animals that bring up their cut or have a true cloven hoof there are some that you may not eat these include the camel hyrax and hair which may bring up their cut but do not have true hooves and are therefore unclean to you also included is the pig which has a true hoof but does not have a cut and is therefore unclean to you do not eat the flesh of these animals and do not touch their carcasses aquatic creatures among that which is in the water you may eat anything that has fins and scales but those which have no fins and scales you may not eat since they are unclean to you birds you may eat every kosher bird the birds that you may not eat are the eagle the ossifrage the osprey the white vulture the black vulture the kite the entire raven family the ostrich owl gull and hawk families the falcon the ibis the swan the pelican the magpie the cormorant the stork the heron family the hoopoe and the bat every flying insect that is unclean to you shall not be eaten however you may Eat every kosher flying creature since you are a holy nation to God your Lord you may not eat any mammal or bird that has not been properly slaughtered you may give it to the resident alien in your settlement so that he can eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner do not cook meat and milk even that of its mother the second tithe take a second tithe of all the seed crops that come forth in the field each year you must eat this before God your Lord in the place that he will choose as dedicated to his name there you shall eat the second tithe of your grain wine and oil as well as the firstborn of your cattle and smaller animals you will then learn to remain in awe of God your Lord for all time if the journey is too great for you and God your Lord has blessed you so that the place that God your Lord has chosen as a site dedicated to his name is too far for you to carry it there you may redeem the tithe for silver the silver in your hand must consist of coinage which you can bring to the place that God your Lord will choose you may then spend the money on anything you desire whether it be cattle smaller animals wine brandy or anything else for which you have urged this however does not mean that you can abandon the Levite in your settlements you must give him your first tithe since he has no hereditary portion with you tithes for the poor at the end of each three-year period you must bring out all the tithes of that year's crop and place them in your settlements the Levite who does not have a hereditary portion with you shall then come along with the foreigner orphan and widow in your settlement and they will eat and be satisfied God your Lord will then bless you in everything that you do the remission year at the end of every seven years you shall celebrate the remission year the idea of the remission year is that every creditor shall remit any debt owed by his neighbor and brother when God's remission year comes around you may collect from the alien but if you have any claim against your brother for a debt you must relinquish it God will then bless you in the land that God your Lord is giving you to occupy as a heritage and there will not be any more poor among you this however will be true only if you obey the word of God your Lord carefully keeping this entire mandate that I am prescribing to you today God your Lord will then bless you as he promised you so that you will extend credit to many nations but you will not need any credit for yourselves you will thus dominate many nations but none will dominate you lending money when in a settlement in the land that God your Lord is giving you any of your brothers is poor do not harden your heart or shut your hand against your needy brother open your hand generously and extend to him any credit he needs to take care of his wants be very careful that you not have an irresponsible idea and say to yourself the seventh year is approaching and it will be the remission year you may then look unkindly at your impoverished brother and not give him anything if he then complains to God about you you will have a sin therefore make every effort to give him and do not feel bad about giving it since God your Lord will then bless you in all your endeavors no matter what you do the poor will never cease to exist in the land so I am commanding you to open your hand generously to your poor and destitute brother in your land the Israelite slave when your fellow Hebrew man or woman is sold to you he may serve as much as six years but in the seventh year you must send him away free when you send him away free do not send him empty-handed give him a severance gift from your flocks from your threshing floor and from your wine vat so that he will have a share of all the things through which God your Lord has blessed you you will thus remember that you were a slave in Egypt and God your Lord liberated you it is for this reason that I am commanding you today to do this if the slave likes you and your family and has it so good with you that he says I do not want to leave you then you must take an all and place it through his ear and the door he will then become your permanent slave you must also grant a severance gift to your female slave do not think it
The celebration you shall eat matzah for seven days. This shall be hardship bread since you left Egypt in a rush. You will then remember the day you left Egypt. All the days of your life no leavening shall be seen with you in all your borders for seven days. Do not let the flesh that you sacrificed in the evening of the first day remain overnight until morning. You may not slaughter the Passover offering in any of your settlements which God your Lord is giving you the only site where you may. Sacrifice the Passover offering is in the place that God will choose as a site designated in His name. There you shall sacrifice it in the evening as the sun is setting at the time of year that you left Egypt. You shall cook it and eat it in the place chosen by God your Lord, and then you may turn around in the morning and return to your tents for six additional days. You shall then eat matzah with the seventh day as a retreat dedicated to God your Lord when you may not do any work Shavuot. Then count seven weeks for yourself from the time that you first put the sickle to the standing grain. You must count seven weeks. You shall then celebrate the festival of Shavuot to God your Lord, presenting a hand delivered offering according to the extent of the blessing that God your Lord has granted you. You shall rejoice before God your Lord in the place that God your Lord shall choose to be designated in His name. You shall rejoice along with your sons, your daughters, your male and Female slaves, the levites from your settlements and the proselytes, orphans, and widows among you, you must remember that you were a slave in Egypt and thus carefully keep all these rules. Circus, when you bring in the products of your threshing floor and wine, that you shall celebrate the festival of Circus for seven days. You shall rejoice on your festival along with your son and daughter, your male and female slave, and the Levite, proselyte, orphan, and widow from your settlements. Celebrate to God your Lord for seven days in the place that God will choose, since God will then bless you in all your agricultural and other endeavors, so that you will be only happy three times each year. All your males shall thus be seen in the presence of God your Lord in the place that He will choose. On the festival of Matzahs, on the festival of Shavuot, and on the festival of Circus, in those times you shall not appear before God empty-handed. Each person shall bring his hand-delivered gift. Depending on the blessing that God your Lord grants you judges and justice appoint yourselves judges and police for your tribes in all your settlements that God your Lord is giving you and make sure that they administer honest judgment for the people do not bend justice and do not give special consideration to anyone do not take bribes since bribery makes the wise blind and perverts the words of the righteous pursue perfect honesty so that you will live and occupy the land that God your Lord is giving you sacred trees and pillars do not plant for yourself an asherah or any other tree near the altar that you will make yourselves for God your Lord do not erect a sacred pillar since this is something that God your Lord hates blemish sacrifice do not sacrifice to God your Lord any ox sheep or goat that has a serious blemish since to do so before God your Lord is considered revolting penalties for idolatry this is what you must do when you discover a man or Woman doing evil in the eyes of God your Lord in one of the settlements that God your Lord is giving you that person will have violated God's covenant by going and worshipping or bowing down to the sun moon or other heavenly bodies whose worship I prohibited when it is told to you you must listen and carefully interrogate the witnesses if the accusation is established to be true and this revolting practice has been done in Israel you shall take that man or woman who did the wicked act out to your gates you shall then help a man or woman to death with stones the accused shall be put to death only through the testimony of two or three witnesses he shall not be put to death through the testimony of one witness the hand of the witness shall be against him first to put him to death and only then shall the hand of all the other people be set against him you shall thus rid yourselves of evil the Supreme Court if you are unable to reach a decision in a case involving Capital punishment litigation leprous marks or any other case where there is a dispute in your territorial courts then you must set out and go up to the place that God your Lord shall choose you must approach the Levitical priests and other members of the Supreme Court that exist at the time when you make inquiry they will declare to you a legal decision since this decision comes from the place that God shall choose you must do as they tell you carefully following their every decision. Besides this in general you must keep the Torah as they interpret it for you and follow the laws that they legislate for you do not stray to the right or left from the word that they declare to you if there is any man who rebels and refuses to listen to the priest or other judge who is in charge of serving God your Lord there as leader of the Supreme Court then that man must be put to death thus ridding yourselves of evil in Israel when all the people hear about it they will fear and will not rebel again the monarch when you come to the land that God your Lord is giving you so that you have occupied it and settled it you will eventually say we would like to appoint a king just like all the nations around us you must then appoint the king whom God your Lord shall choose you must appoint a king from among your brethren you may not appoint a foreigner who is not one of your brethren the king however must not accumulate many horses so as not to bring the people back to Egypt to get more horses God has told you that you must never again return on that path he also must not have many wives so that they not make his heart go astray he shall likewise not accumulate very much silver and gold when the king is established on his royal throne he must write a copy of this Torah as a scroll edited by the Levitical priests the scroll must always be with him and he shall read from it all the days of his life he will then learn to be in awe of God his Lord and carefully keep every word of the Torah and these rules he will then also not begin to feel superior to his brethren and he will not stray from the mandate to the right or the left he and his descendants will thus have a long reign in the midst of Israel the Levitical priests the Levitical priests and the entire tribe of Levi shall not have a territorial portion with the rest of Israel and they shall therefore eat God's fire offerings and their hereditary gifts since God shall be their heritage as he promised them they shall not have any territorial heritage among their brethren the priestly portion this shall be the law of what the priests receive from the people when any ox sheep or goat is slaughtered as food you must give the priest the four the jaw and the maw you must also give him the first portion of your grain wine and oil and the first of your shearing this is because God your Lord has chosen him and his descendants out of all your Tribes to stand and serve in God's name for all time special service the Levitical priest no matter where he lives among all the Israelites can come to the place that God shall choose on a festival or whenever else he wishes to bring his own sacrifice he can then serve before God his Lord just the same as any of his fellow Levitical priests whose turn it is to serve before God on the festivals he shall receive the same portion that they do to eat the only exception is that which is theirs by ancestral right divination and prophecy when you come to the land that God your Lord is giving you do not learn to do the revolting practices of those nations among you there shall not be found anyone who passes his son or daughter through fire who practices stick divination who divines auspicious times who divines by omens who practices witchcraft who uses incantations who consults mediums and oracles or who attempts to communicate with the dead anyone involved in these practices is repulsive to God and it was because of repulsive practices such as these that God your Lord is driving out these nations before you you must therefore remain totally faithful to God your Lord the nations that you are driving out listen to astrologers and stick diviners but what God has given you is totally different in your midst God will set up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren and it is to him that you must listen this is a result of the request that you made of God your Lord at Horeb on the day of assembly when you said we cannot listen to the voice of God our Lord anymore we cannot look at this great fire anymore we do not want to die God then said to me they have spoken well I will set up a prophet for them from among their brethren just as you are I will place my word in his mouth and he will declare to them all that I command him if any person does not listen to the word that he declares in my name I will punish that person conversely if a prophet presumptuously makes a declaration in my name when I have not commanded him to do so or if he speaks in the name of other gods then that prophet shall die you may ask yourselves how shall we recognize that a declaration was not spoken by God if the prophet predicts something in God's name and the prediction does not materialize or come true then the message was not spoken by God that prophet has spoken deceitfully and you must not fear him refuge cities when God your Lord excises the nations in the land that God your Lord is giving you so that you can occupy it and live in their cities and houses you must separate three cities in the land which God your Lord is giving you to occupy establish yourself a road and divide the land area that God your Lord is allotting you into three parts the cities in each of these parts shall be places where a murderer can find refuge the murderer who seeks refuge in these cities shall be allowed to live if he accidentally killed his neighbor without prior hatred thus for example one may join his friend in the forest to cut wood and as his hand swings the axe to cut the wood the head
You must do if a person hates his neighbor and lays a trap for him doing something to wound him mortally if the victim then dies and the killer seeks refuge in one of these cities the elders of the city shall send messengers and take him from there they shall then place the murderer in the hand of the blood avenger and he shall die do not have pity on the killer if you rid Israel of those who have shed innocent blood things will go well for you preserving boundaries do not move your neighbor's boundary marker which was set in place by the first settlers who were allotted hereditary property in the land that God your Lord is giving you to occupy witnesses one witness must not testify against the person to inflict any punishment or penalty for a crime that he may have committed the case must be established through the testimony of at least two or three witnesses this is what you must do if a corrupt witness acts to testify falsely against the person two men who have testimony to refute the false witnesses shall stand before God before the priests and judges who are involved in that case the judges shall carefully interrogate the refuting witnesses and if the first two witnesses are found to have testified falsely against their brother you must do the same to them as they plotted to do to their brother thus removing evil from your midst when the other people hear about this they will have fear and never again do such an evil thing in your midst do not have pity in such a case since you must take a life for a life a tooth for a tooth a hand for a hand and a foot for a foot preparing for war when you go to battle against your enemies and see horses war chariots and an army larger than yours do not be afraid of them since God your Lord who brought you out of Egypt is with you when you approach the place of battle the priest shall step forward and speak to the people he shall say to them listen Israel today you are about to wage war against your enemies do not be faint-hearted do not be afraid do not panic and do not break ranks before them God your Lord is the one who is going with you he will fight for you against your enemies and he will deliver you the lower officers shall then speak to the people and say is there any man among you who has built a new house and has not begun to live in it let him go home so that he will not die in war and have another man live in it is there any man among you who has planted a vineyard and has not redeemed its first crop let him go home so that he not die in war and have another man redeem its crop is there any man among you who has betrothed a woman and not married her let him go home so that he not die in war and have another man marry her the lower officers shall then continue speaking to the people and say is there any man among you who is afraid or faint-hearted let him go home rather than have his cowardliness demoralize his brethren when the lower officers have finished speaking to the people then they shall appoint senior officers to lead the people taking captives when you approach a city to wage war against it you must propose a peaceful settlement if the city responds peacefully and opens its gates to you all the people inside shall become your subjects and serve you if they reject your peace offer and declare war you shall lay siege to the city when God your Lord gives it over into your hand you shall then strike down its adult males by the sword however the women children animals and all the goods in the city you shall take as your spoils you shall thus consume the spoils that God your Lord gives you from your enemies that is what you must do to the cities that are very far from you and which do not belong to the nations that are here however when dealing with the cities of these nations which God your Lord is Giving you as hereditary territory, you shall not allow any people to remain alive where the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Yebusites are involved. You must wipe them out completely as God your Lord commanded you. This is so that they will not teach you all the revolting practices with which they worship their gods, causing you to sin to God your Lord, conducting a siege when you lay siege to a city and wage war against it a long time to capture it. You must not destroy its trees, wielding an axe against any food producing tree. Do not cut down a tree in the field unless it is being used by the men who confront you in the siege. However, if you know that a tree does not produce food, then until you have subjugated the city, you may destroy the tree or cut off what you need to build siege machinery against the city, waging war with you. The unsolved murder. This is what you must do when a corpse is found fallen in the field in the land that God your Lord is. Giving you to occupy and it is not known who the murderer is your elders and judges must go out and measure the distance to the cities around the corpse the elders of the city closest to the corpse must then bring a female calf which has never been worked and which has never drawn a load with a yoke the elders of the city shall bring the calf to a swiftly flowing stream the land around which must never be worked or sown there at the stream they shall decapitate the calf the priests from the tribe of Levi shall then come forth it is these priests whom God has chosen to serve him and to pronounce blessings in God's name and who are entrusted to decide in cases of litigation and leper signs all the elders of the city closest to the corpse shall wash their hands over the decapitated calf at the stream the elders shall speak up and say our hands have not spilled this blood and our eyes have not witnessed it the priests shall then say forgive your people whom you God have liberated do not allow the guilt for innocent blood to remain with your people Israel the blood shall thus be atoned for you shall thus rid yourself of the guilt of innocent blood in your midst since you will have done that which is morally right in God's eyes women captives when you wage war against your enemies God will give you victory over them so that you will take captives if you see a beautiful woman among the prisoners and desire her you may take her as a wife in such a case when you bring her home she must shave off her head and let her fingernails grow she must take off her captive's garb and remain in your house a full month mourning for her father and mother only then may you be intimate with her and possess her making her your wife if you do not desire her however you must send her away free since you have had your way with her you may not sell her for cash or keep her as a servant the firstborn share this is the law when a man has Two wives, one whom he loves and one whom he dislikes, and both the loved and unloved wives have sons. But the firstborn is that of the unloved one. On the day that this man wills his property to his sons, he must not give the son of the beloved wife birthright preference over the firstborn who is the son of the unloved wife. Even if the firstborn is the son of the hated wife, the father must recognize him so as to give him a double portion of all his property, since the son is the first fruit of his father's manhood. The birthright is legally his rebellious son. When a man has a wayward, rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother, they shall have him flogged. If he still does not listen to them, then his father and mother must grasp him and bring him to the elders of his city, to that area supreme court. The parents must declare to the elders of his city, our son here is wayward and rebellious. He does not listen to us and is an exceptional glutton. And drunkard, all the men of the city shall then pelt him to death with stone, so that you will rid yourself of the evil in your midst. When all Israel hears about it, they will fear hanging and burial. When a man is legally sentenced to death and executed, you must then hang him on the gallows. However, you may not allow his body to remain on the gallows overnight, but you must bury it on the same day. Since a person who has been hanged is a curse to God, you must not let it defile the land that God your Lord is giving you as a heritage. Returning lost articles, if you see your brother's ox or sheep going astray, you must not ignore them. You must return them to your brother. If your brother is not near you, or if you do not know who the owner is, you must bring the animal home and keep it until your brother identifies it. Whereupon you must return it to him. You must do the same to a donkey, an article of clothing, or anything else that your brother loses, and you find you must not. Ignore it the fallen animal if you see your brother's donkey or ox fallen under its load on the road you must not ignore it you must help him pick up the load trans save a system no male article shall be on a woman and a man shall not wear a woman's garment whoever does such practices is revolting to God your lord the bird's nest if you come across a bird's nest on any tree or on the ground and it contains baby birds or eggs then if the mother is sitting on the chicks or eggs you must not take the mother along with her young you must first chase away the mother and only then may you take the young if you do this you will have it good and will live long guardrails mixed agriculture when you build a new house you must place a guardrail around your roof do not allow a dangerous situation to remain in your house since someone can fall from an unenclosed roof do not plant different species in your vineyard if you do so the yield of both the crops you planted and the fruit of the vineyard will be forfeit forbidden combinations do not plow with an ox and donkey together do not wear a forbidden mixture where wool and linen are together in a single garment bound tassels make yourself bound tassels on the four corners of the garment with which you cover yourself the defamed wife this is the law in the case where a man marries a woman cohabits with her and then finds himself hating her he therefore invents charges against her framing her and saying i have married this woman and have consummated the marriage but i have found evidence that she has not been faithful the girl's father and mother however then obtain evidence of their daughter's virtue and present it to the city elders in court the girl's father shall then declare to the elders i have given my daughter to this man as a wife but he has grown
Evidence of her innocence, then they shall take her out to the door of her father's house, and the people of her city shall put her to death by stoning. She has brought sexual immorality to her father's house, doing a shameful thing in Israel. You must therefore rid yourself of the evil in your midst. Penalty for adultery if a man is found lying with a married woman, both the woman and the man lying with her shall be put to death. You shall thus rid Israel of evil, the betrothed maiden. This is the law where a virgin girl is betrothed to one man, and another man comes across her in the city and has intercourse with her. Both of them shall be brought to the gates of that city, and they shall be put to death by stoning. The penalty shall be imposed on the girl because she did not cry out, even though she was in the city, and on the man because he violated his neighbor's wife. You shall thus rid yourselves of evil. Rape. However, if the man encountered the betrothed girl in the field and Rape her, then only the rapist shall be put to death. You must not impose any penalty whatsoever upon the girl since she has not committed a sin worthy of death. This is no different from a case where a man rises up against his neighbor and murders him after all the men attacked her in the field. And even if the betrothed girl had screamed out, there would have been no one to come to her aid. The unmarried girl, if a man encounters a virgin girl who is not betrothed and is caught raping her, then the rapist must give the girl's father fifty shekels of silver. He must then take the girl he violated as his wife, and he may not send her away as long as he lives. A father's woman, a man must not take his father's woman. He must not pervert that which is private to his father. Mutilated genitals, a man with crushed testicles or a cut member may not enter into God's marriage group. The bastard, a bastard, must not enter God's marriage group even after the tenth generation. He may. Not enter God's marriage group. Ammonites and Moabites and Ammonite or Moabite men may not enter God's marriage group. They may never enter God's marriage group even after the tenth generation. This is because they did not greet you with bread and water when you were on the way out of Egypt, and also because they hired Balaam son of Beer from Petra and Aram Naharim to curse you. Of course, God did not consent to listen to Balaam, and God your Lord transformed the curse into a blessing for you. Since God your Lord loves you, you must never seek peace or anything good with these nations as long as you exist. Edomites and Egyptians do not despise the Edomites since he is your brother. Do not despise the Egyptians since you were an immigrant in his land. Therefore, children born to members of these nations in the third generation after becoming proselytes may enter God's marriage group. The army camp when you go out as a camp against your enemies, you must avoid everything evil. Therefore, if a man is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he must leave the camp and remain outside toward evening. He must immerse in a mikvah, and then when the sun sets, he can enter the camp. You must designate a place outside the camp to use as a lavatory. You must also keep a spike with your weapon so that when you have to sit down to relieve yourself, you will first dig a hole with it and then sit down and finally cover your excrement. This is because God your Lord makes his presence known in your camp so as to deliver you and grant you victory over your enemy. Your camp must therefore be holy. Let him not see anything lascivious among you and turn away from you, sheltering slaves. If a slave seeks refuge with you from his master, you must not turn him back over to his master. He must be allowed to live alongside you wherever he chooses in your settlements. You must do nothing to hurt his feelings. Prostitution. There must not be any prostitutes among Israelite. Girls, similarly, there must be no male prostitutes among Israelite men. Do not bring a prostitute's fee or the price of a dog to the temple of God your Lord, since both are repugnant to God your Lord. Deducted interest. Do not deduct advance interest from your brother, whether it is interest for money, interest for food, or interest for anything else for which interest is normally taken. Although you may take such interest from a Gentile, you may not do so from your brother if you keep this rule. God will bless you in all your endeavors on the land to which you are coming to occupy, keeping vows when you make a pledge to God your Lord. Do not be late in paying it, since God will then demand it, and you will have committed a sin if you refrain from making vows completely, then you will not sin. But when you have spoken, be careful of your word and keep the pledge that you have vowed to God your Lord, the worker in a vineyard. When you come to work in your neighbor's vineyard, you may. Eat as many grapes as you desire to satisfy your hunger, however, you may not put any into a receptacle that you may have the field worker when you come to work in your neighbor's standing grain, you may take the ears with your hand, however, you may not lift the sickle for your own benefit in your neighbor's grain divorce and remarriage when a man marries a woman or possesses her if she is displeasing to him or if he has evidence of sexual misconduct on her part, he shall write her a bill of divorce and place it in her hand, thus releasing her from his household. When she thus leaves his household, she may go and marry another man, however, if her second husband hates her and therefore writes her a bill of divorce, placing it in her hand and releasing her from his household, or if her second husband dies, then her first husband who divorced her cannot remarry her since she is now forbidden to him to do so would be repulsive to God, and you must not bring immorality to the land. That God your Lord is giving you as a heritage the new bridegroom the millstone when a man takes a new bride he shall not enter military service or be assigned to any associated duty he must remain free for his family for one year when he can rejoice with his bride do not take an upper or lower millstone as security for a loan since that is like taking a life as security kidnapping if a man kidnaps a fellow Israelite forces him to serve and then sells him when the kidnapper is caught he shall be put to death you shall thus rid yourself of the evil in your midst leprosy be careful with regard to leprosy and carefully keep the rules be very careful to do all that the Levitical priests decide for you as I have commanded them remember what God did to Miriam on your way out of Egypt security for loans when you make any kind of loan to your neighbor do not go into his house to take something as security you must stand outside and the man who has a debt to you shall bring the security outside to you if the man is poor you may not go to sleep holding the security return it to him at sundown so that he will be able to sleep in his garment and bless you you will then have charitable merit before God your Lord paying wages on time do not withhold the wages due to your poor or destitute hired hand whether he is one of your brethren or a proselyte living in a settlement in your land you must give him his wage on the day it is due and not let the sunset with him waiting for it since he is a poor man and his life depends on it do not let him call out to God causing you to have a sin testimony of close relatives fathers shall not die through the testimony of their sons and sons shall not die through the testimony of their fathers since in any case every man shall die for his sins widows and orphans do not pervert justice for the proselyte or orphan do not take a widow's garment as security for a loan you must remember that you were a slave in Egypt and God your Lord then liberated you. It is for that reason that I am commanding you to do this forgotten sheets when you reap your grain harvest and forget a sheath in the field. You must not go back to get it. It must be left for the foreigner orphan and widow so that God your Lord will bless you no matter what you do. Leftover fruit when you beat the fruit from your olive tree. Do not pick the last remaining fruit since it must be left for the foreigner orphan and widow when you gather the grapes in your vineyard. Do not strip the last grapes but let them remain for the foreigner orphan and widow. I am commanding you to do this because you must remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Flogging a trial shall be an adversary proceeding where a verdict is handed down acquitting the innocent and convicting the guilty. If the guilty man has incurred the penalty of flogging, the judge shall make him lean over and have him flogged with a fixed number of Lashes for his crime do not go beyond the limit and give him forty lashes. You may not give him a more severe flogging, striking him any more than this, since your brother will then be degraded in your presence. Do not muzzle an ox when it is treading grain. The childless brother in law and brothers live together, and one of them dies childless. The dead man's wife shall not be allowed to marry an outsider. Her husband's brother must cohabit with her, making her his wife, and thus performing a brother in law's duty to her. The firstborn son whom she bears will then perpetuate the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be obliterated from Israel. If the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, the sister in law shall go up to the elders in court and declare, My brother in law refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel and will not consent to perform his brotherly duty with me. The elders of his city shall summon him and speak to him if he remains from he must say I do not want to take her his sister in law shall then approach him before the elders take off his shoe and spit toward his face she shall then declare this is what shall be done to the man who will not build up a family for his brother the name of that place shall then be known in Israel as the house where the shoe was removed the assailant if a man is fighting with his brother and the wife of one comes to defend her husband
shall then take the basket from your hand and place it before the altar of God your Lord. You shall then make the following declaration before God your Lord. My ancestor was a homeless Aramean. and he went to Egypt with a small number of men and lived there as an immigrant, but it was there that he became a great powerful and populous nation. The Egyptians were cruel to us, making us suffer and imposing harsh slavery on us. We cried out to God, Lord of our ancestors, and God heard our voicing. Our suffering, our harsh labor, and our distress, God then brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm with great visions and with signs and miracles. He brought us to this area, giving us this land flowing with milk and honey. I am now bringing the first fruit of the land that God has given me with that you shall set the basket down before God your Lord, and you shall then bow down before God your Lord, you the Levite, and the proselyte in your midst shall thus rejoice. In all the good that God your Lord has granted you and your family declaration for removing tithes when you have finished taking all the tithes of your grain for the third year, which is a special tithe year, you must give them to the Levite and to the foreigner orphan and widow so that they will eat their fill in your settlements. You must then make the following declaration before God your Lord. I have removed all the sacred portions from my house, I have given the appropriate ones to the Levite and to the orphan and widow following all the commandments you prescribed to us, I have not violated your commandment and have forgotten nothing, I have not eaten the second tithe while in mourning, I have not separated any of it while unclean, and I have not used any for the dead, I have obeyed you, God my Lord, and have done all that you commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation in heaven and bless your people Israel and the land that you have given us, the land flowing with milk and honey that you swore to our fathers, concluding the commandments today. God your Lord is commanding you to obey all these rules and laws, you must carefully keep them with all your heart and with all your soul today. You have declared allegiance to God, making him your God, and pledging to walk in his paths, keep his decrees, commandments, and laws, and to obey his voice. God has similarly declared allegiance to you today, making you his special nation as he promised you if you keep all. His commandments he will make you the highest of all the nations he brought into existence so that you will have praise, fame, and glory. You will remain a nation consecrated to God your Lord as he promised the written stones Moses and the elders of Israel gave the following instructions to the people. Keep the entire mandate that I am prescribing to you today on the day that you cross the Jordan to the land that God your Lord is giving you. You must erect large stones and plaster them. With lime when you then cross over you shall write on them all the words of the Torah. In this manner you shall come to the land that God your Lord is giving you the land flowing with milk and honey that God Lord of your fathers promised you. When you cross the Jordan you shall set up the stones that I am now describing to you on Mount Ebal and you shall plaster them with lime there. You shall then build an altar to God your Lord. It shall be a stone altar and you shall not lift up any iron. To it the altar that you build shall thus be made of whole stones. It is on this altar that you shall sacrifice burnt offerings. You shall also sacrifice peace offerings and eat there rejoicing before God your Lord on the stones. You shall write all the words of the story in a clear script becoming a nation. Moses and the Levitical priests spoke to all Israel saying, Pay attention and listen Israel today you have become a nation to God your Lord. You must therefore obey God your Lord. And keep his commandments and decrees as I am prescribing them to you today. Blessings and curses on that day. Moses gave the people the following instructions. When you cross the Jordan, the ones who shall stand on Mount Gerizim for the people's blessing shall be Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. The ones who shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse shall be Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. The Levites shall then speak up and say the following to every individual. Israelite in a loud voice, the first curse cursed is the person who makes a sculptured or cast idol which is repulsive to God your Lord even if it is a piece of fine sculpture and places it in a hidden place all the people shall respond and say amen the second curse cursed is he who shows disrespect for his father and mother all the people shall say amen the third curse cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary marker all the people shall say amen the fourth curse cursed is he who misdirects the blind on the way all the people shall say amen the fifth and sixth curses cursed is he who perverts justice for the foreigner orphan and widow all the people shall say amen cursed is he who lies with his father's wife thus violating his father's privacy all the people shall say amen the seventh curse cursed is he who lies with any animal all the people shall say amen the eighth curse cursed is he who lies with his sister whether she is the daughter of his father or of his mother. All the people shall say amen. The ninth curse cursed is he who lies with his mother in law. All the people shall say amen. The tenth curse cursed is he who strikes down his neighbor in secret. All the people shall say amen. The eleventh curse cursed is he who takes a bribe to put an innocent man to death. All the people shall say amen. The twelfth curse cursed is he who does not uphold and keep this entire Torah all. The people shall say amen. The blessing for obedience if you obey God your Lord carefully, keeping all his commandments as I am prescribing them to you today, then God will make you highest of all the nations on earth. As long as you listen to God your Lord, all these blessings will come to bear on you. Blessed will you be in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed will be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your soil, and the fruit of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs. Of your flock, blessed will be your food basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed will you be when you come and blessed when you go. If any enemies attack you, God will make them flee from you in panic. They may march against you on one road, but they will flee from you in seven directions. God will grant the blessing in your grand areas and all your other endeavors. He will bless you in the land that He, God your Lord, is giving you if only you keep the commandments of God your Lord and walk in. His paths, God will establish you as His holy nation as He promised you. All the nations of the world will realize that God's name is associated with you and they will be in awe of you. God will grant you good surplus in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your livestock, and the fruit of your land. You will thus flourish on the good land that God promised your ancestors to give you. God will open His good treasury in heaven to give your land rain at precisely the right time and to bless. Everything you do you will lend many nations but you will not have to borrow God will make you a leader and never a follower you will be on the top and never on the bottom you must merely obey the commandments of God your Lord as I am prescribing them to you today carefully keeping them do not stray to the right or left from all the words that I am commanding you today be especially careful not to follow other gods or serve them the curse of disobedience if you do not obey God your Lord and do not carefully keep all his commandments and decrees as I am prescribing them for you today then all these curses will come to bear on you curse will you be in the city and curse in the field curse will be your food basket and your kneading bowl curse will be the fruit of your womb the fruit of your land the calves of your herd and the lambs of your flock curse will you be when you come and curse when you go God will send misfortune confusion and frustration against you and all you undertake it will destroy you and make you rapidly vanish because of your evil ways in forsaking my teachings God will make disease attach itself to you until it wipes you out from on the land which you are about to occupy God will strike you with consumption fever delirium paralysis the sword the black blight and the yellow blight and these calamities will pursue you until they destroy you the skies above you will be like brass and the earth below you like iron God will turn your rain into powder and dust and it will come down from the skies to destroy you God will make you panic before your enemies you will march out in one column but flee from them in seven you will become a terrifying example to all the world's kingdoms your corpses will be food for all the birds of the sky and beasts of the land and no one will chase them away God will strike you with the Egyptian oil and with incurable tumors running sores and itch God will strike you with Insanity, blindness, and mental confusion, you will grope about in broad daylight just like a blind man gropes in the darkness, and you will have no success in any of your ways. You will be constantly cheated and robbed, and no one will help you when you betroth a woman. Another man will sleep with her when you build a house, you will not live in it. When you plant a vineyard, you will not enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will not eat from it. Your donkey will be stolen right in front of you, but you will not be able to get it back. Your sheep will be given to your enemies, and no one will come to your aid. Your sons and daughters will be given to a foreign nation. You will see it happening with your own eyes and will long for them all day long, but you will be powerless. A strange nation will consume the fruit of your land and all your toil. You will be constantly cheated and crushed. You will go insane from what you will have to witness. God will then. Strike you with a malignant skin dis
You would not serve God your Lord with happiness and a glad heart you will therefore serve your enemies when God sends them against you and it will be in hunger thirst nakedness and universal want your enemy will place an iron yoke on your neck so as to destroy you God will bring upon you a nation from afar from the end of the earth swooping down like an eagle it will be a nation whose language you do not understand a sadistic nation that has no respect for the old and no mercy for the young that nation will eat the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your land so as to destroy you it will leave you nothing of your grain wine oil calves in your herds and lambs in your flocks so as to annihilate you it will lay siege to you in all your settlements until it has brought down all your high fortified walls in which you trust throughout your land that nation will then persecute you in all the settlements throughout the land which God your Lord has given you you will then eat the fruit of your womb when your enemies are besieging you you will become so desperate that you will actually eat the flesh of your sons and daughters the most tender-hearted and dainty man among you will begrudge his brother his bosom wife and his surviving children not giving them the flesh of his children that he is eating this will be because nothing will remain for you and you will be desperate when your enemies besiege all your settlements the most pampered delicate woman who is so refined that she does not let her foot touch the ground will then begrudge her bosom husband her son and her daughter when she secretly eats the afterbirth that comes out from between her legs and the infant she has born so great will be her lack of all things and her desperation when your enemies besiege your settlements if you are not careful to keep all the words of this Torah as written in this book so as to fear this glorious awesome name of God your Lord and God will Strike you and your descendants with unimaginable plagues, the punishments will be terrible and relentless, and the diseases will be malignant and unyielding. God will bring back on you all the Egyptian diseases that you dread, and they will cling to you. God will also bring upon you every punishment that is not written in this book of the Torah, so as to destroy you where you were once as numerous as the stars of the sky. The survivors among you will be few in number, all because you did not obey God, your Lord, as happy as God was to be good to you and increase you, so will he be happy to exile you and destroy you. You will be torn up from the land which you are about to occupy. God will scatter you among the nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will serve idolaters who worship gods of wood and stone unknown to you and your fathers among those nations. You will feel insecure, and there will be no place for your foot to rest there. God will make you cowardly. Destroying your outlook and making life hopeless, your life will hang in suspense day and night. You will be so terrified that you will not believe that you are alive in the morning. You will say if it were only night and in the evening, you will say if it were only morning. Such will be the internal terror that you will experience and the sights that you will see. God will bring you back to Egypt in ships along the way that I promised you would never see again. You will try to sell yourselves as slaves and maids, but no one will want to buy you the covenant. The above are the words of the covenant that God instructed Moses to make with the Israelites in the land of Moab. Besides the covenant that was made with them at Horeb, Moses' final discourse, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that God did in Egypt before your very eyes to Pharaoh, to all his servants, and to all his land. Your own eyes saw the great miracle signs and wonders, but until this day God did not give you a heart to know eyes to see and ears to hear God is now declaring to you I brought you through the desert for forty years during which your clothes did not wear out on you and the shoes on your feet did not become tattered you neither ate bread nor drank wine so that you would know that I am God your Lord when you came to this area Sikon king of Cheshman and our king of Abishan came out to fight us but we defeated them we took their land and gave it as a heritage to the Reubenites the Gadites and half the tribe of the Monocytes if you safeguard the words of this covenant and keep them you will be successful in all you do the covenant renewed today you are all standing before God your Lord your leaders your tribal chiefs your elders your law enforcers every Israelite man your children your women and the proselytes in your camp even your woodcutters and water drawers you are thus being brought into the covenant of God your Lord and accepting the dread oath that he is making with you today he is establishing you as his nation so that he will be a god to you just as he promised you and as he swore to your ancestors Abraham Isaac and Jacob but it is not with you alone that I am making this covenant and this dread oath I am making it both with those who are standing here with us today before God our Lord and with those who are not yet here with us today you know full well that we lived in Egypt and that we also passed through the territories of the nations you encountered you saw the disgusting putrid idols that they have made of wood and stone gold and silver today there must not be among you any man woman family or tribe whose heart strays from God and who goes and worships the gods of those nations there must not be among you a root whose fruit is gall and wormwood when such a person hears the words of this dread curse he may rationalize and say I will have peace even if I do as I see fit let me add some moisture to this dry practice. God will not agree to forgive such a person God's anger and demand for exclusive worship will be directed like smoke against that person and the entire dread curse written in this book will lie at his door so that God will blot out his name from under the heavens God will separate him so that he will have more evil than any of the Israelite tribes and he will be subject to all the dread curses of the covenant which are written in this Torah scroll a future generation consisting of your descendants who rise up after you along with the foreigner from a distant land shall see the punishment directed against that land and the plague with which God has struck it and they will say sulfur and salt has burned all its soil nothing can be planted and nothing can grow not even grass can grow on it it is like the destruction of Sodom Gomorrah Edmah and Seboi in the cities that God overturned in his anger and rage all the nations will ask why did God do this to the land what was the reason for this great display of anger they shall answer it is because they abandoned the covenant that God Lord of their fathers made with them when he brought them out of Egypt they went and served foreign gods bowing down to them these were gods alien to them something that was not their portion God displayed anger against this nation bringing upon it the entire curse written in this book God drove them from their land with anger rage and great fury and he exiled them to another land where they remain even today hidden things may pertain to God our Lord but that which has been revealed applies to us and our children forever we must therefore keep all the words of this Torah repentance and restoration there shall come a time when you shall experience all the words of blessing and curse that I have presented to you there among the nations where God will have banished you you will reflect on the situation you will then return to God your Lord and you will obey him doing everything that I am commanding you Today you and your children will repent with all your heart and with all your soul God will then bring back your remnants and have mercy on you God your Lord will once again gather you from among all the nations where he scattered you even if your diaspora is at the ends of the heavens God your Lord will gather you up from there and he will take you back God your Lord will then bring you to the land that your ancestors occupied and you too will occupy it God will be good to you and make you flourish even more than your ancestors God will remove the barriers from your hearts and from the hearts of your descendants so that you will love God your Lord with all your heart and soul thus will you survive God will then direct all these curses against your enemies and against the foes who pursued you you will repent and obey God keeping all his commandments as I prescribed them to you today God will then grant you a good surplus in all the work of your hands and the fruit of your womb the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your land God will once again rejoice in you for good just as he rejoiced in your fathers all this will happen when you obey God your Lord keeping all his commandments and decrees as they are written in this book of the Torah and when you return to God your Lord with all your heart and soul availability of the Torah this mandate that I am prescribing to you today is not too mysterious or remote from you it is not in heaven so that you should say who shall go up to heaven and bring it to us so that we can hear it and keep it it is not over the sea so that you should say who will cross the sea and get it for us so that we will be able to hear it and keep it it is something that is very close to you it is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can keep it free choice see Today I have set before you a free choice between life and good on one side and death and evil on the other I have commanded you today to love God your Lord to walk in his paths and to keep his commandments decrees and laws you will then survive and flourish and God your Lord will bless you in the land that you are about to occupy but if your heart turns aside and you do not listen you will be led astray to bow down to foreign gods and worship them I am warning you today that if you do that you will be utterly exterminated you will not last very long in the land which you are crossing the Jordan and coming to occupy I call heaven and earth as witnesses before you I have placed life and death the blessing and the curse you must choose life so that you and your descendants will survive you must thus make the choice to love God
Power over these nations you must do to them everything required by this mandate that I have prescribed to you. Be strong and brave, do not be afraid or feel insecure before them. God your Lord is the one who is going with you and he will not fail you or forsake you. Joshua the Torah Moses summoned Joshua and in the presence of all Israel said to him, Be strong and brave since you will be the one to bring this nation to the land that God swore to their fathers that he would give it to them. You will be the one to parcel it out to them, but God will be the one who will go before you and he will be with you. He will never forsake you or abandon you, so do not be afraid and do not let your spirit be broken. Moses then wrote down this Torah. He gave it to Levi's descendants, the priests in charge of the Ark of God's covenant, and to the elders of Israel. Moses then gave them the following commandment at the end of each seven years at a fixed time on the festival of Sukkot after the year of release when all Israel comes to present themselves before God your Lord in the place that he will choose. You must read from this Torah before all Israel so that they will be able to hear it. You must gather together the people, the men, women, children, and proselytes from your settlements and let them hear it. They will thus learn to be in awe of God your Lord, carefully keeping all the words of this Torah. Their children who do not know will listen and learn to be in awe of God. Your Lord, as long as you live in the land which you are crossing the Jordan to occupy final preparations, God said to Moses, The time is coming for you to die. Summon Joshua and let him stand in meditation in the communion tent where I shall give him orders. Moses and Joshua went and they stood in meditation in the communion tent. God appeared in the tent in the pillar of cloud. The pillar of cloud stood at the tent entrance. God said to Moses, When you go and lie with your ancestors, this nation shall rise up and stray after the alien gods of the land into which they are coming. They will thus abandon me and violate the covenant that I have made with them. I will then display anger against them and abandon them. I will hide my face from them and they will be their enemies. Brave, beset by many evils and troubles, they will say, It is because my God is no longer with me that these evils have befallen us on that day. I will utterly hide my face because of all the evil that they have done in turning to alien gods. Now write for yourselves the song and teach it to the Israelites. Make them memorize it so that the song will be a witness for the Israelites. When I bring them to the land flowing with milk and honey that I promised their ancestors, they will eat, be satisfied, and live in luxury. They will then turn to foreign gods and worship them, despising me and violating my covenant. When they are then beset by many evils and troubles, the song shall testify for them. Like a witness, since it will not be forgotten by their descendants, I know their inclinations through what they are doing right now, even before I have brought them to the promised land. On that day, Moses wrote down the song and he taught it to the Israelites. God also gave Joshua orders, saying, Be strong and brave, since you will bring the Israelites to the land that I promised them, and I will be with you. Moses finished writing the words of the story in a scroll to the very end. Moses then gave orders to the Levites who carried the Ark of God's covenant, saying, Take the story scroll and place it to the side of the Ark of God, your Lord's covenant, leaving it there as a witness. I am aware of your rebellious spirit and your stubbornness, even while I am here alive with you, you are rebelling against God. What will you do after I am dead? Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your law enforcers, and I will proclaim these words to them. I will bring heaven and earth as witnesses for them. I know that after I die, you will become corrupt and turn away from the path that I have prescribed to you. You will eventually be beset with evil, since you will have done evil in God's eyes, angering him with the work of your hands. Moses then proclaimed the words of the song to the entire assembly of Israel until it was completed. Moses' song, listen, heaven. I will speak. Earth. Hear the words of my mouth. My lesson shall drop like rain. My saying shall flow down like the dew, like a downpour on the herb, like a shower on the grass. When I proclaim God's name, praise God for His greatness. The deeds of the mighty one are perfect. For all His ways are just. He is a faithful God, never unfair, righteous, and moral. Is He destruction? Is His children's fault? Not His own. You warped and twisted generation. Is this the way you repay God? You ungrateful, unwise nation? Is He not your father, your master, the one who made and established you? Remember days long gone by, ponder the years of each generation, ask your father and let him tell you and your grandfather who will explain it when the Most High gave nations their heritage and split up the sons of man. He set up the borders of nations to parallel the number of Israel's descendants, but his own nation remained God's portion. Jacob was a lot of his heritage. He brought them into being in a desert region in a desolate howling wasteland. He encompassed them and granted them wisdom, protecting them like the people of his eye, like an eagle arousing its nest, hovering over its young. He spread his wings and took them, carrying them on his pinions. God alone guided them. There was no alien power with him. He carried them over the earth's highest places to feast on the crops of the field. He let them suckle honey from the bedrock, oil from the plenty, clip. They had the cheese of cattle, milk of sheep, fat of lambs, rams of the patient, and luscious fat wheat. They drank it. Blood of grapes for wine, Jeshurun thus became fat and rebelled. You grew fat thick and gross. The nation abandoned the God who made it and spurned the mighty one who was its support. They provoked his jealousy with alien practices, made him angry with vile deeds. They sacrificed to demons who were non-God's deities. They never knew these were new things recently arrived, which their fathers would never consider. You thus ignored the mighty one who bore you, forgot the power who delivered you. When God saw this, he was offended, provoked by his sons and daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them and see what will be their end. They are a generation which reverses itself and cannot be trusted. They have been faithless to me with a non-God angering me with their meaningless acts. Now I will be unfaithful to them with a non-nation, provoking them with a nation devoid of gratitude. My anger has kindled a fire burning to the lowest depths. It shall consume the land and its crops. Setting fire to the foundations of mountains, I will heap evil upon them, striking them with my arrows. They will be bloated by famine, consumed by fever, cut down by bitter plague. I will send against them fanged beasts with venomous creatures who crawl in the dust outside the sword, shall butcher boys, girls, infants, white headed elders, while inside there shall be terror. I was prepared to exterminate them to make their memory vanish from among mankind, but I was concerned that their enemies would be provoked and their attackers alienated so that they would say our superior power and not God was what caused all this. But they are a nation who destroys good advice and they themselves have no understanding. If they were wise, they would contemplate this and understand what their end will be. How could one man pursue a thousand or two men ten thousand if their mighty one had not given them over and God had not trapped them? Their powers are not like our mighty one, although our enemies sit in judgment, but their vine is from the vine of Sodom and the shoot of Gemara. Their grapes are poison grapes, their great cluster is bitterness to them. Their vine is serpent's venom like the poison of the dreadful cobra, but it is concealed with me for the future sealed up in my treasury. I have vengeance and retribution waiting for their foot to slip. Their day of disaster is near and their time is about to come. God will then take up the cause of his people and comfort his servants. He will have seen that their power is gone with nothing left to keep or abandon. God will then say, Where is their God the power in which they trusted? Where are the gods who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their libations? Let them now get up and help you. Let them be your protector. But now see, it is I. I am the only one. There are no other gods with me. I kill and give life. If I crush, I will heal. But there is no protection from my power. I lift my hand to heaven and say, I am life forever, I will wet my lightning sword and grasp judgment in my hand, I will bring vengeance against my foes and repay those who hated me, I will make my arrows drunk with blood, my sword consuming flesh, the enemy's first punishment will be the blood of the slain and wounded, let the tribes of his nation sing praise for he will avenge his servants' blood, he will bring vengeance upon his foes and reconcile his people to his land, presenting the song Moses came and proclaimed all the words of the song to the people along with Hashiah son of Nun. When Moses had finished speaking all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Pay close attention to all the words through which I warn you today so that you will be able to instruct your children to keep all the words of the story carefully, it is not an empty teaching for you, it is your life and with it you will long endure on the land which you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Moses told to die on that very day. God spoke to Moses, saying, Climb the Avarim mountain here to Mount Nebo in the land of Moab, facing Jericho, and see the land of Canaan that I am giving the Israelites as a holding. Die on the mountain that you are climbing and be gathered up to your
Although his power suffices him, may you help him against his enemies, Levi to Levi, he said. Your Urim and Thummim belong to your pious one. You tested him at Massa and contended with him at the waters of dispute. He was the one who said of his father and mother, I do not see them not recognizing brother or child. They thus kept your word and safeguarded your covenant. They shall therefore teach your law to Jacob and your Torah to Israel. They shall place incense in your presence and consume sacrifices on your altar. May God bless his effort and favor the work of his hands. May he smash the loins of those who rise up against him so that his enemies rise no more. Benjamin to Benjamin, he said. God's beloved one shall dwell securely beside him. God protects him all day long and dwells among his slopes. Joseph to Joseph, he said. His land is a blessing of God with the sweetness of the heavens dew and the waters that lie below the sweetness of the sun's yield. It Sweetness of the moon's crop, the best of the ancient mountains, the sweetness of the eternal hills, the sweetness of the land, and its fullness, and the favor of the one who dwells in the thorn bush, it shall come upon Joseph's head on the brow of the elect of his brothers. His glory is like a firstborn ox, and his horns are the horns of the Aurochs. With both of them he shall gore nations to the end of the earth. They are the myriads of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. Zebulun is a to Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your excursions, and is in your tents. They shall summon nations to the mountain, and there they shall offer righteous sacrifice. They will be nourished by the bounty of the sea, and by what is hidden in the secret treasures of the sands. Gad to Gad, he said, Blessed is the one who helps Gad expand. He dwells at peace like a dread lion tearing as prey. The arm and head he saw the first portion for himself, for that is where the portion of the lawgiver is. Hidden he came with the first of his people doing what is just with God and lawful with Israel. Dan Naphtali to Dan he said, Dan is a young lion springing from a vision to Naphtali he said, Naphtali shall be totally satisfied and filled with God's blessing he shall occupy the land to the southwest of Dan Asher all Israel to Asher he said, blessed among the sons is Asher he shall be accepted by his brothers and dip his foot in oil iron and copper are your door bolts and your strength shall increase each day there is none like God Jeshurun your helper is he who controls the heavens and has his majesty in the skies the eternal God is a shelter above with his everlasting arms beneath he shall drive the enemy before you and shall proclaim destroy. Israel shall thus dwell securely alone in the land of grain and wine just like Jacob your heavens shall also drip with dew happy are you Israel. Who is like you? You are a nation delivered by God, the shield who helps you and your triumphant sword. Your enemies shall come cringing to you, and you shall crush their high altars underfoot. Moses dies. Moses climbed up from the western plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of the cliff facing Jericho. God showed him all the land of the Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, the land of Judah, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the flat plain, and the valley of Jericho. City of Gates, as far as Tsur. God said to him, This is the land regarding which I made an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross the river to enter it. It was there in the land of Moab that God's servant Moses died. At God's word, God buried him in the depression in the land of Moab opposite Beth Pier. No man knows the place that he was buried. Even to this day, Moses was one hundred and twenty. Years old when he died, but his eyes had not dimmed and his natural powers had not left him. The Israelites mourned Moses in the west plains of Moab for thirty days. The wailing period of Moses' mourning came to an end. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. The Israelites therefore listened to him, doing as God had commanded Moses. No other prophet like Moses has arisen in Israel who knew God face to face. No one else could reproduce the signs and miracles that God let him display in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his land, or any of the mighty acts or great sights that Moses displayed before the eyes of all Israel.